All righty, all righty, all righty. Ladies and gentlemen, we're about to go live. Uh, stick it out here. Just give me one second and uh, we'll get started here with our show. Okay, so the past few days, I defeated Leviathan as my intro. I destroyed Satan in his hellish uh, landscape beneath the earth. And I did fly into the heavens yesterday, but there wasn't any sound of that. So I figured let's go into a bar together. We are Myth Vision. Ladies and gentlemen, your host, Derek Lambert. I'm glad you guys are tuning in. People are going to start flowing in because this is a live. I've been doing a lot of them lately, and I know you guys appreciate that. I love hearing your guys' responses, especially during the conversation. Um, I hope you guys stay tuned for this because Dr. Richard Carrier, his specialty, like he is a historian. This is his PhD, guys. So, this is not just uh, you know a guy who's read a little history. He this is his expertise, and you guys are going to find out about science in the ancient world, Greek world, as well as the Roman. Uh, there's there's so much he goes into in this book, but let's go ahead and introduce our guest. And with that being said, welcome. Hey. <laughs> Hello. I'm glad you're back, man. This is great. Um, let's go ahead quickly with an intro plug, if that's okay with you. Yeah. I've uh, give whoever's uh, here, if they don't know who you are, I'm going to go ahead and give a, a little uh, intro. So Dr. Richard Carrier's PhD uh, is a philosopher and historian with degrees from Berkeley and Columbia, specializing in the contemporary philosophy of naturalism and Greco-Roman philosophy, science, and religion, including the origins of Christianity. He blogs and lectures worldwide, teaches monthly courses online through his website. So like if you want to take a college course, he teaches like actual college type courses online. Um, let's see. Uh, da, 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 da. He blogs and lectures worldwide, teaches monthly courses online through his website and is the author of many books. You're going to see those in a second, including his defense of a naturalist worldview and sense and goodness without God. His academic case for the non-existence of Jesus in On the Historicity of Jesus, as well as his colloquial, a colloquial summary in Jesus from Outer Space, which you guys could see over here behind me, uh, briefly a little bit, uh, his work on historical methodology, improving history, his study of ancient science, which we're going to talk about today, in both science education and the scientist in the early Roman Empire. The book we're going to talk about today is the second one, but he's going to kind of give you guys a, I think we're going to take like a, I'd say satellite view somewhat. We might zoom in, but uh, it'll be interesting to hear what you bring to the table. His responses to 21st century Christian apologetics in Why I Am Not a Christian and Not the Impossible Faith, an anthology of his papers on the subject of history in Hitler, Homer, Bible, Christ, which is actually free if you have like an Amazon Prime account right now. Got to get it. He has also authored chapters in many other books and articles and magazines and academic journals. And on his namesake, blog covering subjects from politics and history to philosophy and social justice. For more about Dr. Carrier and his work, see richardcarrier.info. So www.richardcarrier.info. Speaking of which, I'm going to need to update the description with that particular link separated from the rest of all the stuff that I wrote about you. But I maybe I did put it there. I'm not sure. But uh, let me go ahead and share something here, ladies and gentlemen. Go to his blog uh, his website, go check out his blogs. I've even had him hired for a project to tackle a uh, conspiracy theorist, I'll just say, uh, of, of pertaining to the idea of Israel only and stuff. Like, like you're awesome, man. You take your time. <laughs> and, and I ask everybody to go check you out, follow you on social media as you're recently posting on. You're on Twitter, Facebook. You're just about everywhere. Uh, are you on Instagram? Uh, technically, yes. I rarely post there, but <clears throat> yeah. Gotcha. Go check him out there. And then Amazon. He's on Audible. Most of your books are uh, 
on Audible, other than the new one, Jesus from Outer Space. Yeah, still working on that one. Yeah, why I'm not a Christian. This is what I was talking about here. Hitler, Homer, Bible, Christ. Kendall right here saying zero. So you guys jump on that. Anyway, now to the to the show. And this is this is super important. I guess we got to start somewhere because there's been a lot of controversy and it appears many historians suggest there weren't many advances in science during the Hellenistic times. Uh, like Dr. Green, you mentioned him often in your book. He seems to limit those things and suggest uh, yeah. you know, that th there's kind of a degradation of science in the ancient world. Whereas you're saying, I'm sorry, but the physical evidence, <laughs> it doesn't seem to match what you're trying to propose. And I'm interested yeah. to hear from you being an expert in this, you know, how are you treated in this field? Like what, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, t talk to me a little bit. Yeah, you mentioned Peter Green. Um, he's famous for, he's Alexander the Great historian, right? That's his specialty. And he wrote this classic textbook on the Hellenistic era uh, called From Alexander to Actium, which is goes all the way to the founding of the Roman Empire, the, the ultimate event, which was the Battle of Actium in the 30s BC, which kind of like decided the future of the Roman Empire. And so he does the whole history from Alexander the Great to there, explaining how classical Greece got completely transformed. Um, and you know, it's, it's decent as histories go, but it, his treatment of science and technology is just terrible. Uh, it, it's very uninformed. And he was basically relying on scholars from the early 20th century to mm. tell him the truth, right? Rather than doing his own investigation and finding out that those early historians of the early 20th century were completely wrong about everything. Uh, and, uh, and there are many other historians who have pointed this out. I'm not the first one to, to note this, but, uh, but I had to point that out in my book, uh, which was my dissertation at Columbia University. I had to have a whole section on this, citing all the scholars that have changed everything uh, since. Now, I just did a blog recently on this, like how, how uh, the consensus uh, in the field has completely shifted from Peter Green's view, which is very typical of the early 90s. Uh, that's really getting challenged in the 90s. And then at, in the 21st century, it's just been completely exploded. And so now the the consensus in the field has flipped the other way around. They're, they're all, everybody's against Green now. They, they all agree that he was completely wrong about this stuff. Uh, and, and of course, he was just repeating other historians. He wasn't, he himself was not a historian of science and technology. He was just, you know, repeating what the zeitgeist was at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, but since You're not then, just picking on one guy though, you're saying, yeah, the whole... yeah, I don't, I don't want to like blame him for coming up with this. Uh, okay. he, he, he was, he was, you know, he had his own snarky, uh, attitude, a little bit arrogant, uh, and gets, gets him, gets him in the, in the shit eventually. Cause you know, people can totally explode what he's, what he showed and said, but, um, but no, it's not his fault. That was, that was just the view of the field until, like I said, in the last 20 years, it's completely flipped around. So uh, so I did a whole blog just recently on that, like how that's changed and why that's changed. And my dissertation is a part of that vanguard of people basically now revealing, look, everything's changed. So you need to get back on, uh, you need to revise your uh, understanding of the consensus in the field. So first I want to say, Gary Stone, thank you for the super chat, my friend. Seriously, uh, he just showing love. And I really appreciate that. I will be taking questions. So if you guys are interested in throwing a super chat for the question, um, try to keep it related to the topic. I mean, I don't mind it, if you don't mind, Dr. Carrier, but I don't want to be rude because you talk so much about Jesus all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and look, I love that. Like, we're going to yeah. have you back on a hundred times more in the future about <laughs> debates. And I'd love to have you come back on. But I'm interested in finding out, you know, what happened to science? I mean, I guess like the I've heard this said. And, and it comes from people that I respect on both ends. Well, you know, the burning of Alexandria, a lot of myth is around that, you know, that oh, it was Christians. And, and, you know, some people are like, come on, mm -hmm. it, it wasn't Christians. But the, I guess you'd say the devolution of science was because of superstitious religious dogma and ideas about uh, like, oh, it's about faith, you know, w you know, you talk about this in your final chapter yeah. of your book. So yeah. maybe take us to like the golden age of science. And then, you know, how did the ancients who were philosophers actually delve in to what we would remotely call modern scientific method? You know, like, is there, you, you really, really go specific. So it's hard for me to pin down exactly yeah. where to start. It, it is. So here's the book for people who are, who are interested in that. Uh, 
Yeah, yeah the go. scientists <laughs> from the early Roman Empire. Uh, and this, of course, is the Alexandrian Pharos, which was the famous symbol of Alexandria, the great lighthouse. Um, but you can see how thick this book is. <laughs> it is very thorough. Uh, so it, it is definitely a detailed, thorough thing. I have, for people who are interested in education, I did the education chapter separately in this in this little, much tinier book um, uh, of the science education in the early Roman Empire, which is really about education and all together in the ancient world up to and including pop culture like the like how do illiterate people who don't go to school how do they learn things like how does stuff get filtered down and so i covered all of that in there and then focus on the science content but the the bigger book is is the scientists themselves so it's the history of the sci of science how it advanced uh, technologies in there as well because they're kind of interrelated and uh and there's a lot of mythology that from the early 20th century scholars about uh, how economics explains the failure of ancient science but they were wrong about the failure of ancient science so their their th economic theories were bogus as well so <laughs> but that's like i said it's all changed um the uh you'd mentioned earlier about the the jesus stuff but that there is one jesus story in this book uh, and it's one that people probably have not heard. And there's the the infancy, the famous infancy gospels of Jesus, uh, which is second century bizarre apocrypha. But there's a scene that that one of the versions of one of these has. Jesus is wowing everyone with his science knowledge, and they say like he's impressing them with his astronomy and impressing them with his like understanding of chemistry and all of this stuff. And of course, when it says like he said the most amazing thing that wowed everyone, it never says what that is. It just Right, because obviously there wasn't really anything that he said. <laughs> <laughs> but it's there, it's a thing. Let yeah, me yeah. tell you. Yeah, he said the most incredible things about astronomy. I was like, can you say one of them? I, like at yeah. least one. Um, but uh, but the, the important thing about this is that even when Christians were trying to invent their myths, science was so respectable uh, back then that that to have Jesus wow the scientists that just tells you something about the culture. It's like, this was a way to make your man look impressive. It's just, just say that he, he even outsmarted the sci the scientists, you know? Right. Uh, so it actually tells you something about the culture of the time. Uh, and and so th there's you can get these little hints of what's going on in terms of attitudes and, and cultural values and things. And you asked about like the superstition and that role in it. And very much like in the Roman Empire at its height, which would be like from at the Battle of Actium, but probably earlier, uh, but from, you know, the first century BC, right up to uh, the start of the third century AD. And that, that is the peak of the Roman Empire. And they were actually trending much more towards, there was a lot of supernaturalism and a lot of bunkum and you, you know, all sorts of things, but uh, they had their own version of Scientology and you know, things like that, but, uh, and flat earthers. And you know, they, had, they had struggled with this with that stuff. But, um, but at the same time, like the general movement of the intellectual elite was towards rationalism, towards a much more, naturalistic, deistic view of the world. And it was heading in that direction anyway. And then science was becoming more sophisticated, uh, finding more direct applications in engineering and, and things like that, and, and governing the empire, like the cartography, for example. But um, how do you map a, 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 a empire that is actually so large that it is affected by the curvature of the earth? If you're going to map it and wow. calculate distances, you have to like, well, what is the curvature of the earth? Which means you need to know how big is the earth. Uh, first of all, you have to know it's a sphere. And then secondly, you have to know how big it is. And how do you, how do, you do all of this? Uh, and you know, famously, Ptolemy is the second century astronomer and engineer of the Roman Empire. He solved this with, well, he found out like their measurements of the size of the earth were not wholly accurate. And he knew this, the scientists knew this. We like, they, they said, like, we know these measurements are not as accurate as you'd want them to be. Um, we want future astronomers to get better measurements. So like they have advice about how to do this in the future, like if you can get them. But in the meantime, what we can do, and this is what Ptolemy is saying, is that we can actually measure angles really well. So we can do like ast astronomical angular measurements, which means he invented the entire system that we now use of latitude and longitude. That's why mm. we talk about locations on earth using degrees, using angles, so angular measurements. So you can say, uh, you could figure out like where you were by latitude and longitude. And, and he set Greenwich line, I think in Alexandria, or, you know, maybe it was, uh, it was pillar of Hercules or somewhere around there, but he, he put it somewhere else. It was moved to Greenwich by the R British empire, because, you know, once you have an empire, you get to move where zero is. Yeah. Um, but uh, <laughs> everyone's the center of the universe. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> so anyway, he invented this system and, and his advice in it is like, well, this stuff we've got really down. So all we need to know is how how much distance there is between one degree of arc. 
And so once you configure that out, you can plug it in and you can solve for X for everything on my cartography. So I, he gives everything in degrees, thinking that, hoping that in future, someone will get a more, a more accurate measurement of how many miles there is per degree of arc in the latitude and longitude system, and then they could just have more accurate maps. And so this is the kind of sophisticated thing that Ptolemy is doing is like, what else is this? What is this for? This is for governing an empire, right? Is how do you, how do you accurately map the travel distances and, and various other things, but also for astronomy, like knowing you want to compare notes. If you're in Alexandria versus Cadiz, you know, in, in Spain, you want to compare notes with what you're seeing at what time so that you can do lots of these calculations for the curvature of the earth and and other and rising times of stars and how you can like write advice books for other scientists it's like so, so many things are doing with this stuff uh and so that's all very sophisticated and going on but it's based on what i what i show in the book uh are three fundamental values and this is like probably the biggest message of the whole book is like this is what drove science then and probably would have kept driving it had things not gone south. Uh, and it's what drives science today. It's, it's what defines really sort of the core of, of why the scientific revolution happened was the recovery of these values. And we lost them during the Middle Ages. They were not held in value then. And these three values are empiricism, that evidence trumps all authority. So fuck your pope, evidence, right? So it's like you don't, you don't have scripture, you don't have priests. You don't have any kind of authority telling you what to do. If you've got evidence, the evidence that's top rank, that outranks everybody. And that idea that you need evidence and how do you connect evidence to the truth? Like this whole concept of being passionate about that and valuing that and putting a priority on it, that is what's very central to science. And it was mm -hmm. abandoned in the Middle Ages. In the Middle Ages, no, Pope says that what the Pope says, Pope right. goes, right? Is that scripture, what scripture says, scripture goes. They were not empiricists they were not big on empiricism at all uh like they, they reduced science to a craft so like we want to calculate the day of easter so we need to use astronomy but they didn't like do any astronomy right they just used this old astronomy that was invented by people before them to calculate the day of easter like th that's mm -hmm. that's all they're doing right they're just using it as a craft like a a technique rather than an actual we want to learn more about the world through studying of evidence that they lost interest in that really so and, I, I want to mention, I'm going to yeah. be putting super chats up so you know, and don't feel like you're obligated to stop. But when you do, I will try to get the questions for the audience. Oh, yeah, let's do that. We'll do that next. Let me get to the yeah, two other I values. Definitely do. And, I just want uh, you to know, yeah. please don't feel perfect. disrespected, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, so. yeah, this is perfect, though. No, so the other two values are uh, curiosity, that it is actually a moral good and, and valuable for the world and yourself to pursue curiosity, to be curious, to ask questions. And that was hugely denigrated in the Middle Ages. Curiosity was a threat. It was of the devil. It was uh, it brings about heresy and it's kind of and doubt, rebellion. right? Kind of. Uh, not so much doubt, but just uh, no. It's the other way around. It's it's wanting to know things. Okay. Right. So like like asking like, well, why is it that way? You know, like the, it's not the question of doubting. It's the question of wanting to know. So it's actually a more positive, progressive value. And so that was very much in in value in vogue in in the Roman Empire. It was abandoned and vilified as a value in the Middle Ages. And then the other is progressivism, the belief that not only can you make progress in technology and scientific knowledge about the world, but that it is valuable and good to do so. Mm. So progressivism in that sense, in, in science. Uh, the Romans were big on this. They believed in progress. They saw progress. They thought it was valuable and worth pursuing. Um, this was anathema in the Middle Ages. Now, progress meant rebellion. It meant, uh, you know, like, you, you, we've got the perfect religion. We've got the perfect worldview. Progress means deviating from that, so therefore progress is evil. So they were very much against progress as a concept. It didn't mean they didn't make any progress, but they, they didn't actively pursue it or see it as a positive good. It was, it was newfangled things were bad was the, was the attitude. So we lost those three values in the Middle Ages, and we only got them back in the Renaissance. Renaissance meaning rebirth rebirth of pagan arts and sciences, but also rebirth of pagan values. They found these values in the text and tried promoting them back into society. So re-paganized Christianity, basically. Mm. And then, of course, eventually that led to the scientific revolution hundreds of years later and so on. So that, so we, and that pause button was about a thousand years. So we, we, we could be a thousand years more advanced in science and technology today had we not had that long thousand year pause of denigration of these three core values. Uh, and so that, that my book is, is it's, that's sort of the subtext of the entire book. I have whole explicit sections on that, but uh, all the rest of it is basically aiming towards that idea. Like I've got the entire chapter on progress, like is a very important uh, example of that. It's one of the values of things and so on. 
So anyway, that's the gist of that. Uh, but yeah, let's do some of these super chat questions. What so we got first, here? I want to say we could have been flying cars 500 years ago, ladies and gentlemen, and that's total BS. Uh, I just want to say that out loud. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just Jordan Kelt, thanks for the five, my friend. Which scientist of the period had the greatest impact, in your opinion, Dr. Carrier? And I think specifying Roman period, because we could talk Greek and that... Oh, there's so much there too. Well, they so. they hugely overlap. Uh, and to give you a good example, uh, the the answer to that question is Archimedes, right? So uh, Archimedes was probably the pivot pivotal scientist of the era, and he kind of represents both worlds because when Archimedes became famous and started producing all of his work that kind of like transformed many different fields, uh, he he was Syracusan, right? So he was a he was a a member of the royal family of Syracuse, which is that island right off of Italy, which at that time was an ally of Rome. So as Rome was growing into an empire, and this is around 200-ish uh, uh, BC. So this is before the Roman Empire was big, uh, but but Rome was expanding at this time. And, and Syracuse was an ally, but then they they turned on the, on the Romans. And so the Romans had to go and famously besieged Syracuse. And and there's a famous story that... that uh, uh, Archimedes was killed in that siege, and there are different mm -hmm. versions of of why. Uh, but but one of the legends is that there were there's this angry Roman because first of all the Archimedes technologies of defense of Syracuse really dealt a black eye to the Romans. So like the soldiers, rank and file soldiers, were not liking Archimedes because they had lost a lot of people to his technologies. And so uh, so the legend has it, you know, one of these Romans was going around slaughtering people in the city once they breached the walls. And uh, found Archimedes and said, fuck you, and killed him, basically, right? Uh, there's a different version of a legend where the soldier didn't understand who, the, who it was, and he just killed him. Uh, and But all, every version of the story portrays it as a tragedy. Uh, it's very, like, uh, no one says, yeah, we should have killed Archimedes. What that bad man? No, they're like, no, we should not have. That was terrible tragedy to kill Archimedes. That was a great mind we could have harnessed and brought. Uh, first of all, we should have honored, and then also we, should, we could have harnessed it for ourselves. And so, um, so it, this is another example of how the legends sort of show the value that was held for scientists. That even even their enemy, like as a great scientist, he's a valuable man that we should we should respect and revere. And so, uh, so even this is later Roman authors writing his story. So it's their hindsight view of this. So that's a good example. But Archimedes did lots of things. I mean, proto-calculus, uh, he, um, well, he developed, uh, so the theory of buoyancy, so um, hydrostatics. So he's the one who invented the idea of uh, how, you, how do you determine why things float? Uh, he discovered like things way less underwater and, and like how you do the mathematics of that. It's one of the earliest mathematical laws of physics he developed. And he chose the unit of water as the fundamental density, the specific density. So when you talk about specific units, it's like one means the density of water. Uh, he did that. And so we still do that today. So the, wow. you know, the specific density, our, our fundamental unit is water, and that's thanks to Archimedes. So that's a good example of that. But he did other things like work on the lever, uh, work on the Archimedes screw, um, various other things that he, he did in both mathematics and in empirical science uh, that were influential. And he became a model, kind of like a heroic model, uh, encouraging others to want to be like Archimedes, which is yeah. kind of one of the influential aspects of him. I think even Marcus Aurelius in his meditations, I think he talks about the great scientists that he would like to be like. Uh, and, uh, and Archimedes is on the list, right? So, <clears throat> so that I would say if I had to pick one, uh, I would say Archimedes. Um, but there are others that we, is, and I have to point out that we're limited in this because in the Middle Ages, almost all this literature was destroyed. We're, we're lucky, we're lucky to even have Archimedes, anything written by Archimedes. We almost lost it all together. I don't know if you know the story, but it was, uh, there was one book that survived in the Middle Ages, one left after everything. And Christian scraped all the ink off and wrote hymns to God over it. And the only reason we recovered it is we, could, we were able to put it in a particle accelerator in Stanford and reconstruct the missing ink using the cloud chamber calculator. Uh, so what? like that's wow. how close we came to losing all the, all the works of our community. We still don't have all the works of our communities, but we, we covered some of them this way. Uh, but this means that there's a lot of other scientists who we know the ancients themselves were talking about how impressive they were and how influential they were, but we don't have any of their stuff, right? So we don't, so that one of them is Posidonius. He's famous uh, Rome, well, Greek, but Roman era, uh, first century BC uh, scientist was one of the most famous scientists of his time, like even like exceeding Archimedes. 
Uh, we have nothing from him. We have not a single book from Posidonius. He wrote tons and tons of them. We have quotations, we have descriptions and things like that, but we have nothing actually survives. So it's possible Posidonius was more impressive than Archimedes. We don't know because wow. it, was, it was lost. Uh, but there's lots of other stuff I could name. I mean, uh, the things that were done in antiquity is amazing. And you've read the books. You've seen like the list is huge. Oh my <laughs> God. I can't even keep it. Look, ladies and gentlemen, get the book. Listen to it on Audible. But if you listen to it on Audible, I'm going to tell you, if, if you have the book, you might want to highlight every name that comes across with a certain color because and you'll you'll go through everything the rainbow 500 times by doing that but uh <laughs> you know I, seriously it's there's so much there really go check it out gary stone thank you for the super chat my friend i appreciate it a question did tertullian see hellenistic philosophy negatively and therefore science negatively is the opposite true for origin now i i want to say when you get in this book, get toward the end, you're going to see the whole Christian dilemma and you're going to see, <laughs> man, it sounds like modern kind of fundamentalist Christians who are talking about the earth being 7,000 years old. We listen to the word of God, you know, like, uh, I don't know. Yeah. Do you want to comment on this? Yeah. And it's obviously it's unpopular to say this because, you know, Christians hate it when you point out uh, how anti-science they actually originally were. Um, but uh but it's true. I obviously have a whole chapter on Christianity and I go through item by item of the examples. And yes, Tertullian's one of the worst. Like he's, he's, it really exemplifies the attitude that became the defining attitude in the Middle Ages, which is like, fuck your progress. That's evil and bad. We don't want any of that. Uh, you guys can't discover anything anyway. It's all wishy washy. There's no certainty. Who needs evidence? We've got God. Uh, Curiosity is bad for you. Like he's, he's the one who's doing all of this stuff. Uh, and he's the one who's famously said the line uh what what has Jerusalem or what has what has Athens to do with Jerusalem which is this mm. idea of like why why do we need science and philosophy with Jerusalem gave us everything the scripture basically we got God's word we don't need anything and one of the classic examples I point out is is Tertullian has this whole treatise he wrote on the soul which you know was linked with theory of mind back then right and he mentions that oh yeah there's been lots of science science done about you know neurophysics and and the actual how the brain works and relates to that and stuff so oh, we don't need any of that god doesn't want us to know any of that if god wanted us to know he would have told us uh so i all i need is just a few little things that i can infer from my theology that's all i need to do to answer the theory of mind in this so he's very dismissive of the actual science which was super impressive up to that point like that we had by the time he's writing we had extensive localization of function studies where they, they were actually, they, not only did they know that the mind was in the brain, but they had localized functions. So they knew like where vision was in the brain. They knew where, where sound was processed. They knew where voice was processed. They knew, so they were they where motor functions were. They'd, they'd distinguish motor and sensory nerves so they could tell the difference. Um, you know, one of the famous things Galen did was show how uh, the motor nerves and sensory nerves, but the, most importantly, the motor nerves come from the center of the brain that controls speech and thought goes to the tongue and the larynx. And so it's like, this proves that like voice represents thought and knowledge. And where does where do the wires go? They go fucking right up into the spot where we know all this stuff goes on in the brain. So uh, they've done a lot of that kind of thing. Uh, and and Tertullian just tosses it all out. It's like, I don't care about it. That's that's all wishy washy. It's all uncertain speculation. Uh, you know, it's it's, it's very anti. It's heading toward naturalism. I think you mentioned that in the book, and they, they didn't want that. What about origin? Yeah. Though did origin yeah. equally? And that's a know? good yeah, that's a good point to bring that up because that was the one remaining problem that origin still had with ancient science. Origin was more positive about ancient science than Tertullian, for example. Um, origin thought. I mean, origin's view was that you should at least know the letter you should at least know the scriptures of the enemy right so his view is like you should you should study science so you know how to rebut it when science gets used against the faith like that was origin's main thing and he also thought like there are a lot of things that that you could learn about god's plan by studying the science like you could you could the same way like you know very deeply christian scientists today would argue and say like well yes this just tells me how god designed things and so that's why right. science is important right so so he's giving a theological spin on science but it's, and so he was more positive than most. Now he got declared a heretic later. So his entire point of view lost, like he did not win out uh, for the middle ages, but, um, but the, the, the wall, the point where he went, it goes too far is that when these scientists start making it sound like we don't need God to explain anything, those guys are anathema. You should not even read them. Mm. Right. So that, that's, so that's, you gotta think how extreme a view that is, even for like, you think this is the most positive 
Christian we have for science. And he, even he's saying, don't read Aristotle. No, like Aristotle is, and don't read Strato, which is, that was the worst. So Strato was, uh, for people who don't, who don't know, uh, so Aristotle started the school, which was one of the most scientific philosophical schools. Um, and it was, they were called the peripatetics because they wandered around as they lectured. Basically, they walked while they lectured. And peripatetic means walking, basically, in, in Greek. So uh, so people who walk around, that's peripatetic, is someone who walks around a temple talking, you're an, you're an Aristotelian. But anyway, they, they were much more empirical, much more scientific, and very hardcore about like trying to explain everything in terms of natural laws and physics and stuff. And uh, the successor to his school is Theophrastus. A lot of people might know Theophrastus, but the successor to Theophrastus was Strato of Lampsacus. And Strato was renowned all the way up into the Roman Empire for centuries as the, one of the greatest scientists uh, uh, in their history. Like, so he was very revered uh, for this. And Strato did a lot of interesting science, but again, we have nothing. Not a single book he wrote survives. Um, yes. So we have quotes and, des oh. and descriptions and, and things like that. So we, we have some idea of the things he was doing. Like we know he did gravity studies where he was dropping objects and stuff. Like the one thing people said Aristotle didn't do. Strato did it, but we don't have the book. <laughs> That's right. So we just have like isolated quotes. We know he's doing some things, some experimental stuff with gravity, but we, we don't know exactly what his conclusions were and so on. Um, anyway, so uh, Strato of Lampsacus was renowned for coming like like uh, like Laplace, uh, you know, under Napoleon uh, saying like, well, we don't really need God to explain anything. Uh, really just, there's just nature. It's just a natural world. We can ex literally explain everything just by physics. Uh, and and he, that also, you know, got him a reputation, but th that's why the Christians are like, no, do not read straight out. Like this is, this guy's an atheist. He'll corrupt you. Uh, so like one of the greatest scientists, you're not, you can't read him. So like, and, and the atomists, the other, so the Epicureans, and the Democritians and stuff that tried to explain things in terms of atomic physics, um, their version of it, uh, yeah. is was were also considered atheists. And so that their their books were anathema. You were not to read them. And this is Origen even. So so yeah, he, Origen is love-hate with science. Uh, he's more positive than Tertullian, but he's still, he's still not on board. So uh, <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. this is awesome. Ladies and gentlemen, hit that like button. Help us grow. Uh, YouTube pays attention when you hit the like button. So I appreciate everyone showing us some love. We got a bunch of super chats. So before we get Scott Duke's question, I just want to shout out for a couple of uh, super chats that were just like showing some love. Jay Bundy, thank you for the two uh, $5 super chats. I really appreciate that, my friend. Um, it helps out making this possible. And thank you, Dr. Carrier, for joining me, of course, and doing this. This is so interesting um i've never had this conversation with you yet scott duke he asks how did the romans scientific method compare to modern science method how far behind is the world in science due to christian influence now that's a big question i think the second part of it like scott i would say just bear with the whole show because this whole show is going to kind of explain that as we go but the first part is interesting because you point out a difference early on how what they did is science like straight probably came the closest to what we would say anachronistically science is. But a lot of times it was like they weren't strictly scientific like we are. They had astrology. They were doing pre scientific methods to try and get at things. And maybe you can go into that. The scientific. Yeah. Now. Now, one, one thing to make clear is that a lot of the mythology today of, of the scientific revolution is built out of, only looking at the things that great scientists did right and ignoring everything they did that was stupid and silly. So if you were to look at like Galileo and Newton, uh, and I did a whole article actually on Galileo, uh, uh, how he, his method was mixed bag. It was not that scientific really. Like he had some really good scientific methods and then he had some really garbage armchair stuff and he was tre still treating them the same, right? Like, uh, so, uh, or at least largely the same, not necessarily exactly the same, but he, he was still giving, uh, the logical armchair arguments too much shrift, basically. And you get to Newton and that's sort of declined a little bit like the, okay, armchair arguments, less important, empirical, more important. But then Newton's still doing like, uh, you know, um, alchemy and, 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 and silly numerology and like this, this ton of stupid stuff that Newton did too. Uh, so like we see, if you look at the whole man and the whole period, scientists are still mixed bag, even in the scientific revolution. And, and really what we, we think of, 
science got rid of that stuff, we're really thinking of the 19th century. That's when science really became professionalized and really started to get rid of the supernatural and really mm -hmm. started to segregate uh, armchair arguments from empirical arguments and really got serious about scientific methods. That's when we start developing like controlled experiments and uh, blinded experiments and things like that. Um, so uh, and it, so it's by that point, by the end of the 19th century, we have science as you recognize it. And that's where, that's the time when philosophy and science were started to be divided. Scientists wanted to distance themselves from philosophy. And, and so that, that started to happen in the early 20th century. And I, my article, you can find it, Google it, it's, uh, is philosophy stupid? Uh, and, and that I tell the story, uh, it's a video lecture, but I, there's also a, a notes file that goes with it. But I, but yeah, that's, that's really the story. It used to be science was just the best philosophy. Science was the philosophy you did when you had good data. So it was, mm -hmm. a, part of, it was a part of philosophy. And so when we go back to antiquity, um, that's, that's how they saw it. It was actually a fundamental branch of philosophy was science. Uh, and, but what they meant by science, what they meant at that time, was this mixed bag of stuff where you could have these armchair arguments, you could have these empirical arguments, you pick and choose whatever methods you can use to get to the conclusions you want. So they were doing science in our sense. They had experiments, they had mathematical laws of physics, they had you know attempts at precision and all the things that we would classify as um, as science today. But they they were selling it right side by side with armchair arguments and well it has to be this way because you know rather than like actually testing the theory and so on so you have this so you have a lot of silly stuff alongside a lot uh, of the gaps mixed in with the yeah right that's a good way to put it uh, and uh, and then you had disputes that were ongoing so for instance you had the geocentrists and the heliocentrists you had two scientific camps who were competing for hundreds of years and never really getting a good answer between them. But at least the heliocentrists existed, right? So that, that theory was a respectable scientific theory and people recognize, you, you can look at like uh, Pliny the Elder and Seneca and others, recognize that this was an unresolved question in science, that, that we had not proved that geocentrism was true. It's the more popular theory, but there's really good arguments for heliocentrism, so we're not really sure. Uh, and then you learn like there was, there was actually three camps, right? There were the static geocentrists who held that the earth does not move at all. Right. Uh, and then there were the dynamic geocentrists who agreed that the earth spun. The diurnal motions were explained by the earth spinning, uh, and but it still was in the center. Uh, and so, this, and then you had the heliocentrists who were, it's both of those things. And so these are all three competing camps of, of scientists. And you could find that many other disputes in the ancient world, there were many competing camps uh, and among them, one of them did end up having the correct answer. But they, so th this is the kind of thing that was going on back then. But there was still like a lot of recognizable empirical science going on at the time. And you could see what real progress was made is when they started applying those methods. And I think they were starting to get the sense that that was the case, right? So by the time we get to Ptolemy and Galen, they're making arguments that's very much like maybe we should get rid of the armchair arguments and then focus on these ones that seem to make progress, but they're not fully there yet, right? So it looks like they were just on the cusp of getting there. Uh, and um, anyway, that that's that's the the best I can answer that question. I do give examples in the book of scientific methods and unscientific methods, uh, and even how the way scientific methods were applied to bullshit, right? So like uh, <laughs> there's uh, Artemidorus wrote this famous book in the ancient roman period about dream interpretation and she's like well this has got to be scientific right so it's like we can learn things from from dreams and we're not talking freud we're mostly talking like prophetic like understanding of what dreams right. what's going to happen next week or the, to, yeah yeah and so what he did what he did he did he took scientific method from, from a local scientist and he said i'm going to go and just build a huge case database of people's dreams and then a database of what happened to them in their lives after that. And then I'm gonna look for correlations. And so I'm gonna find the science of dream interpretation, right? So it's like, well, everybody who dreamed this thing like got promoted at this time, you know? It's like, it's like, like that's what he's doing. I mean, it, it's, it's ridiculous. But the fact that he thought that that was the method to use, that he even knew that that was a method you could use. He wasn't using it at the level of sophistication we would today, right? Like if we, you know, but he's trying at least the gist of the idea of what you're supposed to do. So even that's popular and going on back then. So that gives you an idea of what we're talking about. He's better than the uh, the palm readers today, at least. So uh, <laughs> I want to say, Dion, I can never pronounce your, your last name. I apologize. Thank you for the $5 super chat. Woo, Richard Carrier, guy that killed my faith in God. Can't thank him enough. So thank you, Dr. <laughs> Carrier, for helping kill their faith. <laughs> I want to say one thing 
That's um, my professional role. I'm I'm quite quite glad to hear that. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm trying to do. Get get rid of this. Get less of this in the world through persuasion. You want and more of argument. the scientific stuff. And I got a buddy, and this was his argument, mind you. He's not using any science. Uh, before I ask this question, I just want to mention that you're describing two different versions of the uh, geocentric model. Of course, topple that with flat Earth, and now you have the non-spinning flat Earth model where the everything goes around the earth and the earth is technically not moving. Cause do you feel like we're spinning? I don't feel like we're spinning. Do you? Yeah. <laughs> Therefore that's the argument. And it's like, Oh man. Where yeah. are we in? How can you even start to go like back and explain this? But anyway, yeah, um, and I point out they had flat earthers back then, but no scientists were flat earthers in the Roman empire. Like anyone who, who knew their science was an actual scientist knew that that was bogus. They had they had six different converging lines of evidence that were very conclusive. And the only people, that, the, the I mean, mostly the flat earthers were illiterate people uh, uh, or Christians. Uh, and not all Christians. Uh, many Christians bought the science and understood. Because really, like, even the Judaism out of which Christianity evolved had adopted a lot of this science. Like, the discovery of the sphericity of the earth infiltrated into Judaism. So Jewish theology is very much based on a geocentric model, but still a spherical earth model with concentric circles of heaven around it. And Christianity inherited that. <clears throat> but there were still like some Christians who were just not having it. And Lactantius is the famous example. I talk about this in the book, Lactantius is in there. Uh, and he's famous for, he wrote the textbook for Christian education that became one of the defining textbooks of the Middle Ages. Uh, and he has a whole section in there where he's just ranting against spherical earth people. Like, that's ridiculous. You're, if the earth was a sphere, that means there's upside down people on the other side of it. And that's just absurd. I reject it. Uh, and, you know, there's snow falling up. No, no, that can't happen. And so, like, you know, trees growing upside down. We can't have that. Uh, that that's his argument for, for flat earthism. Uh, and that's in a Christian author who happened to be the tutor of Constantine's children. So that tells you. Uh, so they we got the good path. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> this, imagine Ken Ham being the teacher of future presidents, right? Like that's, that's what we're talking about here. Um, now his ideas didn't win out. Like there, you look through the middle ages, most intellectuals reject hat or reject Lactantius on the flat earth theory, but he does exemplify kind of like the Ken Hams of the middle ages, if you, if you think, you know, so it was still a thing. Uh, but that was definitely not the thing of scientists. They, like they were like, no, that's a ridiculous idea. The earth isn't flat. We figured it out. It's round. So <laughs> everyone hit that like button. There's 189 and I got 89 likes. Come on. There's a hundred people not joining the club. Please hit that like button right now. And uh, me and Dr. Carrier will uh, grant you eternal life instead of eternal damnation. Uh, Mark's, Sokowski. I hope I'm pronouncing that correct. Please forgive me if I mispronounce that. I'm horrible with names, by the way. To what extent did pagans value a correct understanding of reality or did they value beauty or goodness over reality? Um, well, you had, it was a very diverse intellectual environment, right? So you had, you could find people in both categories. Uh, so you had, you had the Platonists who were much more into mathematical and logical beauty and less into empiricism. And so you don't have a lot of Platonist scientists. Uh, and then you had the Aristotelians who, who you know, they appreciate beauty. They under, they have a whole theory of beauty, uh, but they're much more interested in what's actually the case. Uh, and they would, you know, they would, after that, argue that what they found to be the case was beautiful. And like, here's why. Like this, they they would start with the evidence and the facts first, and then try to argue that that's beautiful. Like this, so it was a different. They flipped it upside down. Whereas the Platonists use beauty as a as an empirical for them as a method a methodology if something was beautiful it must be true so they started with beauty and then tried to argue to reality from it and that's where you get the ridiculous books like the timaeus uh which is that's a, that's the best place in a scientist you find out science that you find is timaeus's ridiculous theories of cosmology and it was that was one of the most popular books mm. uh in it, by the time of the roman empire the, the scraps we find of plato most of them are timaeus right so like uh so it was, it was an extremely popular book uh, and, and it's, uh, you have different camps, right? You have different, different, uh, different groups who you're thinking in different ways, uh, about how beauty and reality converge or don't. So, so you can't blame it. And this is one thing I want to say is like, people will accuse you of just trying to blame Christians. No, it was all like a bunch of people. It, you mentioned in the book, it wasn't just Christians. There were very, very superstitious pagans too, that did yeah. not contribute in a good way. Like everyone went downhill in many respects. So yeah. And it wasn't, it's important to note that, uh, and I, I do show this in the book and explain it is it, the Christians didn't cause everything to go to hell. 
they just didn't fix it. Right. So it's important to see like the, it's not like cr Christians caused the fall of the Roman Empire. Uh, the, the Roman Empire fell for other reasons, bad economic policy uh, um, the, and the complete lack of peaceful succession of power. They never had a they never had a working constitutional government. Uh, so they didn't have a, like what we do. Like so like today in, in modern countries. Um, and it was the, it was those two failures that led to the collapse and the crisis of the third century. And, and of course, when, when things go to hell, everybody goes to superstition. So both pagans and Christians, but that's also what made Christianity more popular because Christians were some of the most devout, devoted superstitious people, right? Like the most confident, arrogant people like saying, no, superstition is the way to go. Like God and angels and, and salvation and, you know, reject, reject the world. The world is of the devil. Like we, we want to get out of here, leave the world. Right. You know, uh, like I said, even in the book, even origin is saying that you don't really need to know science because when you die and go to heaven, then God will teach you all the science you need to know. Like, so this is the kind of attitude that, that arose. And so that actually contributed to the success of Christianity, that it was a, became more popular because these kinds of confident, overconfident, superstitious solutions to our crises became more popular. And, uh, mm. and, and then once the Christians acquired power through accidents of history, uh, you know, Lactantius just happened to be in the entourage of Constantine and convinced Constantine to, to choose Christianity as the vehicle to govern the empire through. And so we have Christian empire ever since. And, uh, and so once that happened, what came with them is that package of anti-scientific values, no more curiosity, no more empiricism, uh, no more progressivism. Mm -hmm. And so <clears throat> what, those are all the things that you needed to fix the things that had gone wrong, right? Like if you want to like figure out why did things collapse and go to shit in the third century, how do we turn it around? You fucking need science. You need those three values to actually figure out what will actually work. And of course they didn't. So, so when the Christians took power, they had all the wrong values and all the wrong reasons and did all the wrong things and just made things worse. And so you had the, basically the collapse of Western civilization resulted. Uh, and, and it was, it was really just Christians took power when things were bad and had the worst policy ideas for fixing it. And, and that's what led to about a thousand years. The, the question is how long, how far behind I would say roughly a thousand. So, so you could, you could dicker about how many, you know, a century or two, how long would it have taken Romans to have recovered from the collapse of the third century? Had they applied the correct values and the correct ideas, um, maybe a century or two, but even then, like you do the math, it, it comes out to roughly a thousand years, plus or minus a hundred. Arjun, thank you for the five forty nine. I think that's pounds or euros. What are Dr. Carrier's ancient sources for his research? Are there still many books left? Uh, there, I think there's more missing books than there are books <laughs> by a lot. Yeah. Uh, I, some studies have been done to try and estimate the losses and like studies of all ancient literature. Like, so we know we have tons and tons of references. Like people will talk about a book. They'll say a title of a book, right? And we don't have it. And so you can actually look at the list of all the books that get mentioned uh, in the literature that we have and then compare that to how the books that we have. And, and this is just for all literature, not just science, but for all literature, it's about, we've lost about at least 95% of ancient literature. Hmm. And we know that, 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 just the lucky chance of being mentioned in extant literature is not the defining feature. There were tons of other books that, that don't get those mentions. So just don't accidentally get mentioned in our literature. So we know the, the number of books is larger than that. Like it's huge. Uh, and this is all literature, but you look at, I, I did a study, my sort of crude study myself for my book, um, for my dissertation. And, and it was about that uh, for science. Like it probably worse actually for scientific literature. So we probably lost more than 95%. And if you look at the books that we have, for example, you can see the huge prejudice and bias in the selection of what survived the middle ages. And when you look at the ancient sciences, let's say there's, I can't remember the exact number I came up with this, something like four or 500 scientific books have survived out of what have been thousands, right? Uh, and 200 of them were written by Galen. Okay, so so hmm. half of all the science that was preserved were the books written by one dude. Uh, and that's because Christians liked him because uh, he was very pro-God, you know, and uh, in medicine they wanted to use they, they, you know, they, in, as a craft skill throughout the Middle Ages. So they s saved a lot of his books. They didn't Luke even preserve did all medicine. of his books. I think I'll do medicine. Luke was a mental... <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, that might might actually have been part of the thinking. But but no, of course, doctors and medicine are always in demand, right, even in the Middle yeah. Ages. So, uh, and Galen was deemed the safest 
uh, one to read because he was pro God, oh, right? He was a very, very pro God guy. Um, but uh, so, but so they preserved tons of his stuff. But even all of his stuff, they didn't preserve. We have stuff he wrote that we don't have. He wrote some things like uh, we know on uh, uh, on magnetism. He wrote some things on uh, uh, animal physiology that that weren't preserved. So we know there's a lot of stuff even of Galen's that didn't survive. Uh, but th but th that gives you an illustration. Is they just cho chose one guy's library that they liked. And that's half the literature from of the sciences that they preserve, all on medicine, right? And so if you look at like Ptolemy, if you, you know, Ptolemy, they preserve a few of Ptolemy's books, sort of. Like you look at the optics, like only half of it survived in the West, the other half survived in Arabic in the East. And it was only now that we can put them back together and create a whole book, right? So uh, that gives you an idea of, of how barely things survived uh, through the Middle Ages. I think it's but, fascinating too, though, that how uh, the the Arabic speaking people actually tried to preserve some of the stuff. And yeah. You would, yeah, you would think like we the Western or Eastern Orthodox Christian church or someone would try, and you said more was actually preserved by Eastern Orthodoxy. Yeah, it, well, see, the thing is that the science under the East mostly just decayed, right. whereas in the West, it was just, just ravaged, uh, right? The West just collapsed. The East remained wealthy, but shrank over time. Uh, and so they, there were books that survived. But you, to give you an illustration of this point is that almost everything disappeared in the West, like almost everything. So when I say like we have about 400 books now, most of those actually come from the East. And what happened was when, when Islam was like basically destroying the Byzantine Empire, uh, you had scholars fleeing with piles of books in their arms West, right? So like, so a lot of this stuff was preserved uh, from sieges of cities and stuff, they went west, and then that introduced these books. Uh, so there were a lot of books that didn't even weren't even there, but but made it there uh, this way. But to give you an example, that Archimedes Codex I mentioned that that's an Eastern book that was in a library in the East, you know, in the Eastern Empire in a monastery, and even they that was the last one in the world. Wow. And even they scraped it off and put hymns to God over, right? <laughs> so, uh, so that, that that's what I'm. That's what we're talking about here. Like even in the wow. East, they they weren't that enthusiastic for this stuff. Now there was a moment when Islam was. There was about two hundred years about. Um, so it's roughly like eight hundred to about a thousand. There's this pe moment in Islamic history where they're super enthusiastic for science. They loved Greek stuff. They couldn't get enough of it, and they they were actually starting to do things that was could have advanced the sciences. Uh, they were once again interested in speculating and arguing about different theories of things, and it looked great. But then by about the 11th century, you had this huge clampdown by the imams, the religious uh, side of things, and said, no, this intellectual stuff is fucking a threat to Islam. And so they shut it down, basically, which sealed the fate of the Middle East for the next for the rest of history, basically. It, it put the Islamic world behind everybody because um, they, they just basically just shut it down. Uh, and so that, it, once again, for religious reasons, right? Like the science was a threat, intellectualism, I should say more broadly, was a threat, perceived as a threat to Islam. And so the, the religious authorities put a stop to it. Uh, and wow. uh, in, in, in a lot of ways, like it's lucky that we, our Renaissance succeeded where theirs failed, right? Like uh, it, it really it's flip of the coin. It could have gone either way in terms of, which events occurred when and so on. But um, I think a lot of what happened with us is that we had a very monopolistic church that controlled everything in the West. And right when the Renaissance hits, like within a hundred years or 200 years of that, you have the Reformation, which completely wrecked the central authority of the church and created a power gap that allowed all these radical ideas to get through. Because now you don't have a single authority shutting things down. You've got people fighting over who's in charge of religion and scholars can kind of slip through uh, and, and maintain their positions, right. And, main, and so keep books alive and things like that. Just so put the hat on and say, Oh yeah, I'm, I'm clergy. Don't worry. I said, yeah. So I think the, the unique power of the Catholic church coupled with the sudden collapse of its central authority when, when Christianity in the West schismed and there was no central authority anymore and you could play political parties off of each other that made that opened the door for uh, the scientific revolution in a, in a way that didn't happen under Islam. Wow. Interesting. Jay Bundy. Thank you for the five super. I'm a total carrier dome. Do you have any thoughts on how academic culture regalia doctor equals apostle teacher comes from religion, temple culture? Is there something in that? 
Uh, I do not know the answer to this question. Um, and the reason is, is everything that they're referencing there it was a, arose at some point in the late Middle Ages. And I've not studied the history of that, uh, of, of like, for example, where, for example, um, uh, caps and gowns come from. Uh, you know, I, I don't, I don't know where I, I haven't looked into that. I don't, I have no, no idea or even like using doctor of philosophy. So doctor philosophiae is what a PhD means, right? It's philosophia doctor, which means a, do a teacher of philosophy. And so, but that's because everything was a philosophy of, so like philosophy, if you did biology, it was philosophy of biology. If you did history, it was philosophy of history and so on. So you'd be a doctor philosophiae historiae, you know, be a historian it means you, you now are a teacher, a master of of the philosophy of history and so you have a phd right so um that is all medieval stuff that that those concepts didn't exist in the ancient world um now like look the word doctor existed and you would have professors who would be called doctor but you didn't have that specific structure of a phd as a as a degree granted by an institution we didn't have that back then and that did grow out uh there is it's a complicated history though so for when you look at colleges the truth is that universities in particular, universities began outside the church system. Because uh, what was happening is you had, once once you get to the Renaissance, you have, <clears throat> and the, or I should say the high middle ages, <clears throat> the economic recovery was slowly happening. So you have cities are finally being built up again. And now you have people going to school and you have people teaching, but they were loose hodgepodges. You just have this scatter of professors around one neighborhood of town and students would pay each one and go around and stuff like that. And then eventually like the teachers would unionize and then eventually the students would unionize uh, to represent their interests. And this is all secular shit going on. Uh, and by the time all of that happened, that's when you get the universities that when you have the, the, the competing unions of teachers and students, but now the church is getting involved because they're like, whoa, whoa okay. Uh, we've looked at what you guys are teaching and we're a little concerned. Uh, right. So you had, that's when you had like the 13th century, uh, reconciliation where the church is really trying to put a stop to things that they don't like. And then you have the pushback from the independently wealthy secular professors and students. And so they, 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 they had a diplomatic detente where they came out with like, okay, there's certain things you can't teach certain things you can. Uh, and so like it sort of worked out basically, but that's when the church is sort of taking control of the universities. So no, we are in charge of these now. Uh, and, and then of course they started making their own over time. And so like, mm -hmm. so that's, so basically universities started a sort of secular ad hoc economic thing. Uh, but then the church took them over in order to control doctrine. And then they became a church thing. So that, so it's like wow. I said, it's a complicated storyline, mm. you know? And so like, and then there's, you know, if you're gonna pick any particular, for example, regalia or tradition, it, you have to go look for what its particular history is. It's probably meandering and complicated too. So uh, that, that's all I can, I can tell you about that. Well, appreciate that. Thanks for the super chat. Thank you, Joel Pearson, everybody who's super chatting. I'm going to try and get your questions and we'll try of course, to uh, keep it focused on the topic. Of course, Joel Pearson, uh, Dr. Carrier is the reason I grew to love history. Can he talk about Vera's version of germ theory? Yeah. Uh, so for people who don't know, uh, Varro was one of the great Roman intellectuals, highly revered <clears throat> for centuries. He was highly revered um, of the early or of, <clears throat> of the first century BC, like roughly the turn of the second and first century BC. <clears throat> he wrote a lot of important books uh, that we don't have once again. Uh, <laughs> but <clears throat> one of them, by the way, was uh, he wrote an Institutes of Religion where he wrote about ancient religions, including stuff about the mystery cults and stuff. So uh, I would love to have that, uh, but we don't have that. He wrote, so it's basically wrote an encyclopedia of religion, which would have been super valuable for us to have. But he also wrote an encyclopedia of science, so uh, where he himself was not a scientist, uh, but he was an interested scholar and enthusiast, and he wrote this encyclopedia to make a pot, sort of basically just what encyclopedias are today. It's like a popular resource for anybody to go look like, well, I want to understand what this geometry thing I'm hearing about is. And you can look up geometry and get the history of geometry and what sorts of things are known in geometry and stuff like that. So he wrote that. We don't have that either. Um, <clears throat> but it illustrates the kind of stuff uh, that we're talking about. He wrote a bunch of other things as well. And uh, I can't remember if germ theory originates with him. I'm going to quickly check. I remember you talking about some of these interesting things in the book, but you, you really go deep. I mean, yeah. Yeah, and it each is animal a certain person studied like and why it's important. And yeah, OK, I got it. So it's, I just I just searched my uh, electronic version of the scientist in the early Roman Empire and it's on page 109 uh, where, yes, yeah, so I talk about germ theory. Um, there are various different 
uh, authors who you see this crop up in various different authors. So we know it was a going idea that people were talking about. Um, but the earliest we can trace it, uh, it comes from a book of Varro's, which again, we don't have, or we do, wait, we do have agricultural matters. Yeah, this is one of the few that we have of his. He wrote this uh, textbook on, on agriculture, basically like, you know, for, if you're gonna run a farm, here's my book on it. And that's because Varro was an agriculturalist as all aristocrats of the time were. They were very big on how to make farms productive and, uh, and efficient and so on. And so he wrote his own treatise on this, but there's a section in it where he talks about germ theory. And the, the idea is um, like, he, he talks about it as, um, <clears throat> there are different versions of this theory. You run into them in Plutarch and stuff like that. One is like, there's just, there's just seeds that are too small to see that are floating around in the air that can get into you and cause disease. Um, there's also the theory that there were like tiny little animals that were too small for you to see, but that's closer to true. Right. Uh, and, and because I mean, animals, you know, not in our scientific sense today, but they're living organisms, you know, germs are living organisms, but at least they had the idea that these are biological things that are smaller than the eye can see. And they can be transferred through, through touch, through drink and things like this. So they, they had the concept, uh, they hadn't worked it out to the level that Louis Pasteur had done. Um, but, uh, and they weren't making vaccines either, which is for viruses, which is a whole other uh, storyline. You know, germs can be inclusive of both bacteria and viruses, which are very different uh, entities. But um, but we didn't know about that stuff in the West or in the world until like the 18th century, right? Like that's the earliest we even got close to anything like this. But the, the gist of the idea, the, the basic notion that there are ent living things that are too small that can get into us and transfer in various ways that cause diseases, uh, that was a going theory back then. Uh, and, and there were competing theories, like the humoral theory was a competing one too. So Galen was a humoralist, so he's very big on like, well, it's a dis disbalance of your humors that causes disease. Uh, so he was less interested in germ theory. However, I should say, even Galen wrote extensively on uh, 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 sterilization. So the use of sterilizing instruments, the importance of washing hands, they were aware of this. They, they knew that you could, you could pass contagion in various ways if you didn't sterilize. What they didn't know is how fastidious you needed to be. Uh, they, so they hadn't worked out that you, you better freaking boil your instruments, right? <clears throat> you can't just wash your hands. That's not going to be good enough. Uh, so th they didn't know that, but they did at least have, understand the concept of sanitation and, and hygiene in, in medicine and surgery. Uh, and that's why you can have the Galen Wright's first person accounts of him engaging in successful open heart surgery. So if you think like that, if you think that through, like what that entails, like that, you know, the actually saving lives with that. Um, so they were, you know, they, they were pretty sophisticated, like more than we think they were. Interesting. Joel Pearson. Thank you, my friend. And thank you, Nikolai Dimov. I hope I'm saying that correct. More shows with Dr. Carrier. We got to do this more. We got to do this more. All right. Here's another one. Drew T Trox. Thank you for the five. Have there been any new experimental history projects on the, the Roman empire that would be your dream project? Oh, <laughs> okay. So uh, some of the audience might not know what this is a reference to. I, I did a whole blog article, which I put in Hitler, Homer, Bible, Christ, by the way. So this article is in that book, if you're interested in looking at it, um, where I talk about experimental history as an actual subfield. It's a real thing, um, which we do today. And one of the examples I put in there is uh, trireme studies. So triremes were ancient warships, um, Greek design, but they got used up into the Roman period. And uh, there's a lot of mentions of these monstrous triremes, like in these naval fleets have these ridiculously huge triremes and but we don't know a lot about them we, we sort of they're conjecturing like what do the what do the names mean what do they refer to and um and also things like how how fast do they go how how maneuverable are they like how destructive uh, were their ramming speeds and things like that so what have we done the historians today get engineers together and they built one right so they built a trireme and then uh when you like actually are doing it you can see like oh well the rowers have to work like this. They have to be in these kinds of rows. You have to have this much space. They can go this fast. So they were able to do tons of what you call experimental history. So they can understand more about ancient triremes by building one and just moving it around, right? And it's like learning what you can from it. Uh, another example is, uh, which is in the news recently because there's new discoveries about the Antikythera machine. Uh, and th this is a computer. It's probably the world's first computer that we know of. Uh, gear powered, not electronic, but it, it's still a computer. It does com computations. Uh, it's an analog computer. So um, it was built about 100, 120 BC 
Uh, it's It was on a ship that sank around 88 BC that we know because of the coins uh, are dated that are in the, um, the coins have the dates stamped on them that are in the ship uh, that sank. And, <clears throat> and it was discovered by sponge divers uh, off the island of Antikythera in Greece uh, in like 1910 or something like that, like the early 20th century. And they found these, it was, and it was shattered, right? So this is basically this box, this bronze and wood box that had a knob and a bunch of dials and readouts, as well as the instruction manual it was written all over this thing. Uh, and you turn the dial and, or you turn the knob and it would, you could pick any date using four different calendars. So it reconciled four different calendars. Uh, you could pick any date up to, I think it was 200, about 250 years ahead of when it was built. So it's a predictive device. And um, you pick any date and all the dials and stuff, once you've set it to that date, all the dials would read out what phase the moon would be in, uh, what constellation the sun would be rising in, the position in the sky of all the five known planets at the time, uh, and um, various other things like that. And it would also tell you like I, when, when an eclipse is possible, lunar and solar. So it would say like an eclipse is possible here, lunar or solar. So it told you all that stuff. All that data was re read out on dials and, and, and readouts on this device. Yeah, there's, that was an example. That's one of, that's the drive wheel. That's the main drive wheel of then this I'm going to show what it, the re, like what they made it look like. If right. They, if it was raw, like, you know, the actual thing, hold on, here we go. Share, yeah. share screen just to compare it. But yeah, so right here. Yes, that that's a good, that's, that's a digital reproduction of some of the gearing mechanism. Actually, we've gone beyond that now. There's recently, uh, there's been advances and they figured out some pieces of the gearing that they hadn't for a while. But that's mm. that shows you what it looked like. And that's what it would look like inside the box. Now you wouldn't see all those gears. It would, you would just see the dial readouts. Um, <clears throat> you might be able to find some of those on the internet too. But but this is another example, experimental history. They, so they got all these gears and they're all melted together, not melted, but you know, uh, rusted together and shattered and broken and pieces are missing and stuff. So they tried to reconstruct wow. it, but what do you do? Well, you build one, right? So experimental history, you build some of these things. So a lot of modern historians have built uh, these Antikythera machines to try and see how they work and what they do. Uh, and that's an example uh, of experimental history. That, so the question is, uh, what is, are there any other projects like this that I would want to be involved in? And uh, the answer is yes. It's probably way less exciting than the ones I just mentioned. Um, and, and in fact, I've long had a plan to do this, and I may yet do it. It's something that I can actually do. Um, <clears throat> so there's, in the early 20th century, there's a lot of bagging on ancient science. We've already went over that a little bit, right? There's this negative attitude that they, oh, they sucked at science and they didn't make advances and so on. One of the lingering uh, myth, myths from that period of American scholarship, mostly American scholarship, is that ancient time reckoning was not very accurate. And this is important for astronomy. So like a lot of astronomy, even like cartography, like measuring degrees of arc in terms of figuring out the size of the earth, um, how accurate your clocks are matters, right? It's, it's important. And so there's, there's the sort of going mythology that they were, their clocks were no more accurate than plus minus five minutes. And, uh, and I'm absolutely certain that that is hogwash. So, uh, and what I wanna do is, disprove it. And I think it being disproved even with uh, just a diopter, you don't even need a clock. Uh, and one of the most ways, the diopter is a device that they had for, it's an astronomical instrument, um, got very sophisticated by the time. It had a lot of small gearing and stuff by the time of uh, the Roman empire. We have a description uh, in Heron of Alexandria writes a whole section on uh, building a diopter. But basically you think of, a, a, imagine a clock face uh, you know, so you've got it's divided into 12, just like a clock. And uh, and then it's got a bunch of gears underneath. So you could set it up like a tripod and you set it up and you can angle it so that it's right in the angle of the ecliptic. So it's like it, per perpendicular to the movement of the stars. And then you could sight along it. So you could go like to the bottom and, and see where a particular star is on the clock face. And you can actually use this to tell time, right? Because you Because it's basically you're using the stars as the hand on a clock. So you've basically got a, a, a clock the size of the universe that you're using to tell time. Mm -hmm. And so the, the question is how accurate is this? It's a question of like the, the error margin, right? Of like, the, so the mark, there's the mark. How accurately can you mark it? How accurately can you make the circle? Uh, you know, and, and when you're citing it, like what's the error in terms of like the, the visual acuity of the star? And because they don't have, at this point, they don't have, um, magnification yet, uh, or at least they're not using it for this purpose. So um, I think it can be 
pretty accurate, way better than plus minus five minutes. And hmm. so I want to build one uh, and and do some like controlled blind, double blind studies uh, and, and go up in some place where you've got a beautiful starry sky, spend the night, you know, pop a tent <clears throat> and, you know, with a couple of people and like, and then run the experiments. I would, I would love to do that. <clears throat> and then the next step after that would be to, to build and test a mechanical clock. So we have also very good descriptions of their mechanical clocks as well, uh, which were water powered and they had very sophisticated like pressure regulation and stuff in terms of maintaining consistent ticking time, if you want to call it that. Uh, I think those clocks are much more accurate than plus minus five. So I, I want to, but that's harder. That's building one of those is a much bigger uh, craft project. Interesting. But I do, I want to build one and then, and actually, and then test it and then publish the results, right? To show like, this is how accurate these, these timekeeping methods are. So that is something I actually do want to do and may yet do at some point. Interesting. Good question. And thank you for taking the time to answer that. There's 222 people watching and we got 134 likes. I always bring this up, ladies and gentlemen. Hit that <laughs> like. Hit that like button. We can keep doing this, man. Yeah. Keep Myth Vision growing. And obviously, it shows the guest respect. Uh, I really do appreciate you, man, so much. And look, uh, this typically happens as we get started on a project. People are excited. They have questions. They super chat. And I ain't about to turn down no tithes, okay? This is the church, and we do take tithes. So <laughs> I'm just saying. I seriously, yeah. uh, I love seeing the interaction from the audience, too. So that's one of the things that makes me passionate about wanting to fly and see you, which I got to make a quick little commercial break here yeah. and say, I'm going to put a GoFundMe out there at some point, and I'm going to fly to Dr. Carrier's house as long as we meet that goal and interview you in person and harass you for two days, getting as much <laughs> material on camera in high definition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it'll be the questions of the people who want to participate. And of course, that are patrons of me, whatnot. And like your questions matter and we will get those on film and make history because there's not enough of those with you. I've got a million with Dr. Bob, but I'd like to get some with you. Yeah, yeah, right. No, that makes sense. Yeah, that, that would be good. And and yeah, you know, you and I have been talking about this. It's It's definitely going to be a possibility by summer or fall so absolutely um yeah yes sir uh how do you pronounce your name i'm gonna say leaf loan loan i don't know i'm trying here i apologize uh how renowned was philo during his life and after dr richard carrier and thank you for the great books and inspiration yeah i assume that means well there's two philos so uh of, well i should say there are lots of philos but i mean there are two <laughs> particularly famous philos uh, one is Philo Judaeus, you know, Philo of Alexandria, who's the right. Jewish theologian, um, who's not scientist, so it doesn't really apply there. Um, <clears throat> and and to answer that question, that that Philo was was certainly renowned in his own community. Like he he was literally the the um, the Alexandrian Jews ambassador to Rome. Uh, so like, and he was and he was one of the most revered uh, scholars of his time. <clears throat> and and the Christians loved him too, like later, like this, so that we have a lot of that. And we can see influences of Philo, possibly influences of Philo on Paul. So I think even Paul was probably reading the works of Philo, or at least they were reading common books in common, Philo and himself, but we can't prove it exactly. You know, uh, Paul doesn't say I read Philo and, and so on, but we can see hints right. of influence of, of similar doctrine, weird doctrines even. Uh, but there's in science, there's another Philo, Philo of Byzantium. Uh, who dates centuries earlier, uh, and he's famous for launching the literature on uh, uh, basically textbooks on building things, um, in particular machines. So he's, he's as far as we know, Philo of Byzantium wrote one of the first uh, textbooks on building machines, uh, building machines, and uh, the, the one that, you know, he influenced the tradition that led to Harold of Alexandria, who's also writing in that tradition. He's writing his own machine building books uh, in the first century AD. Philo of Byzantium's like, I think third or fourth century BC. Uh, but we have some, we don't, I can't remember if we have, how much we have of Philo. We have a lot of like references to him and stuff, but he's also the first person to start building uh, vending machines. Wow. Uh, and, uh, and, and in Philo's case, it's uh, soap dispensers. He actually invented the soap dispenser. By the time we get to Her Heron of Alexandria, uh, Heron actually has um, literally uh, vending machines in the truest sense where you get a certain quantity of, you drop a coin in and you get a certain quantity of holy water out. Uh, and so <laughs> like, yeah, so it's like really like a, a beverage machine. Wow. Um, so, uh, but anyways, Dionysus an turned this water into wine. Oh, wine <laughs> just came. <laughs> well, that, that was also a thing, although we don't yeah. have that in the, in the literature that we've got. Well, I heard Heron did. 
Yeah, Heron, I heard, did like door a mechanical. Well, door he has, yeah. He so Heron of Alexandria, and that's the book that we have. Uh, and he wrote a book called Pneumatics, which is um, basically uh, machines that run on air or water um, or steam. Uh, so anything that moves off of a, you know, a, a different, uh, basically a, any kind of substance that pushes it or drives it or whatever, pneumatics. And so he has this entire treatise on this, and he. He opens a treatise. First of all, he opens it with science, like empirical science proving like that uh, a vacuum is the rarefication of air, uh, basically like principles of uh, pressure, like heat causes air to expand, cold causes it to shrink. You know, it's like, right. uh, so like he's doing this whole thing, which we think he gets a lot from Strato of Lampsacus, who's the character we introduced earlier. Um, but after that, he says, well, then I'm going to get just go list a bunch of machines that you can build. And and I want to make clear, you know, he says this, and I want to make clear that, that these are just sample machines. They're not all the machines you can build. And they're just pieces of machines. You can take all the machines I'm about to describe and you can conjoin them into more complicated machines and make better, more interesting machines. So, hmm. so the textbook does not is not a survey of everything they could do. It's really just a sample. Uh, and it shows that they did actually take a lot of these devices and combine them into more complicated things. We just don't have examples of that surviving very often. Correct but, me if I'm wrong <clears throat> about this, though, with this whole uh, hair on of, of Al is Alexandria. Yeah, he yeah. he would. Uh, and I could be wrong. So this is probably I don't know, legend or if this is fact, he would get paid top dollar from like priest of temples and whatnot. And they would kind of trick their their people who believe in the God. And like if I was going to the temple of Serapis or Dionysus or something, mm -hmm. the doors would open automatically as I approach by hydraulics or some sort or something, or there would be like a moving altar or something yeah. that would make them go, the gods live here. Pay right, them right. money or you'll get cursed yeah. or you'll get blessed. Or We don't have any direct evidence that Her Heron himself was employed to do this, but he must have been. Uh, you know, it's, it was a thing that engineers did and he was one of the leading experts the published experts on this. So he would definitely have been one of the highest demand guys building this stuff. We have other references to temple machinery. So we know temples were buying this stuff. And so we know that was a fact. It's not just him speculating on machines that didn't get used. We know a lot of these machines did get used and were actually part of the e religious economy of the ancient world. So we know that economy existed and it would be inconceivable that he wasn't one of the top dogs in, in that, right? right? Um, but, but yeah, so he's written... Now, we don't have... When he talks about steam-powered automatic doors, which he does, he describes how to build them, um, the, the device he describes is a model. So he, he it's like a thing that would sit on top of a pedestal. It's not like doors you would go through, but you, you, would, you would see this kind of like miniature temple and then the doors would mysteriously open through steam. However, like it's clear the way he's describing is that if you wanted to build a full scale model of this, you could, right? So uh, the model is just a demonstration device essentially. And so, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it, it could have been that there were steam powered uh, automated doors in some temple somewhere. We don't have direct evidence of that. We do have a lot of evidence of these miniature theaters, these automated theaters. And in fact, uh, he wrote a whole separate treatise on automated theaters, uh, and these are super. These are super popular, and had been since the time of Aristotle, but got really sophisticated by the time of Heron. And these were basically programmable um, auto automated theaters. Uh, so if you think like if you, I don't know, if, gosh, this might be a reference no one gets anymore, but um, you go to Disney and you go to the Small World, and then you go in there and there's all of this people dancing and moving around and running and stuff, and there's this machines moving and stuff. There's this whole miniature city that you go by that's all automated, right? Hmm. And they're singing songs and they're like act, acting out plays and stuff like this. Oh yeah. Uh, that, that's, what we're, that's what we're talking about. And so they were built and they built these, they could do whole five act plays, right? So they would, you know, sh the curtain would open and then there would be like the action would happen and then the curtain would close and then the curtain would open and you have second act and, uh, and, and very elaborate. And all you do is you would basically just flip a switch and it would just run. Now after that, you it was a chore to like reset it. Uh, but but it, it would just run automatically. So there was a lot of these automated theaters, and uh, Heron writes about these, but a lot of these were popular in, in temples, we know, too. So like this idea of you would have this elaborate miniature of something uh, that would just engage in some sort of automated behavior that would wow the crowds. Um, and we also know that they, they built like elaborate town clocks this way. There's the famous Tower of the Winds in Athens was this huge clock mechanism that you could go in and watch all of the fabulous clock mechanism doing its thing. And it would be not just a clock, but an astronomical clock as well. So it would show like, 
doing basically what the Antikythera does, you know, showing you when the moon is going to be in full and all of this stuff. Um, but it was designed specifically to be impressive. Like you see all the moving parts and you're just wowed by it. Right. Um, so that, yeah, that was a thing they, they did. They did that stuff, but yeah, a lot of it is steam powered or water powered or air powered. Uh, and, um, and that his vending machine is in the pneumatics, right? So that's the, that's a water powered uh, mechanism. So when these when these critics of what you're suggesting, and you said that a lot of them are outdated, are there any contemporary PhDs in this research that are in at odds against you and think you're wrong about your idea that this was all progressing in an upward, <laughs> you know, motion? But you're saying, dude, we've lost a thousand years of advancement due to uh, horrible methods of how we view the world and the way we view science and stuff like that. Is there anyone who competes with you on that in this field? Well, there's two, two questions there really. So like the one is the thousand year gap, right? I think a lot of historians don't even want to touch that third rail, right? So they, they just won't talk about it, right? So they'll, they'll dismiss it as saying, well, it's too speculative. It's counterfactual history. You know, what can we, we can't really do, can't really answer that question because they don't want to piss off Christians. They don't want to piss off Christian donors and Christian parents of the students they teach and all of that. So that there's no particular reason to advance that argument. So I, I'm the one that goes in and says, actually, if you look at the evidence, do the math, that's what it comes out to. Cause I don't care uh, who I offend, but um, you are known for that. <laughs> right. <yeah. laughs> right. Right. But the, the other question is this, this flip and consensus to the view that the ancient science was very sophisticated and was moving ahead uh, and, and all of that, that is definitely the mainstream now. And you will not find any uh, living expert in ancient science uh, who contravenes that. They, they all agree on that now. Now you might find historians who specialize in other fields and thus aren't up on the literature of ancient science that who might still be repeating the old stuff because they're just reading the old books and they're not checking the latest literature. Uh, so you'll still find those. And then of course you'll find Christian apologists who still try to push their narrative, although you're finding that less because they've gotten beaten down by evidence so much by now. Um, but uh, but you but you did see that like in the early 21st century, you saw um, Rodney Stark was still publishing these books, pushing the old narrative. Is this uh, a Stark from Iron Man? No, I'm just kidding with you. <laughs> uh, no, this is this is the this is the Catholic apologist uh, sociologist of religion. Um, so in, uh, hang on a sec, this phone should not be going on. It's okay, don't worry, it's Heron trying to call you from the first century. <laughs> um, but yeah, so 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 you find, but he's not, an, he's a sociologist, first of all, so he's not even a historian. And secondly, uh, he's not a specialist in ancient science, and that was the, also when the consensus was changing. <clears throat> but the point is, is he was reading the old literature, he was not checking out the latest stuff. Mm. Uh, and so you, well, you will start find some historians, mostly Christian apologists, still repeating the old party line, but you you can tell by looking at their citations that they're quoting people from ages and ages ago, or they're quoting people who are quoting people from ages and ages ago. Like they'll, right. they'll cite someone and then you go check that and they're like, no, that person's citing like 1962, like Sam Bursky and, and uh, you know, uh, Jockey and these other guys have been dead for ages. Um, but, uh, but if you look at the literature of actual specialists in this field, and, and I am one of them, um, but that's how there's Tracy Real, um, uh, there's, um, um, mayor, uh, there, there's, there's just tons of new experts now that, uh, doing this stuff is a, it's a burgeoning field, uh, and, yeah. um, of ancient science studies. So, uh, yeah, all those experts are on board. With, you dabble with uh, so yeah. much. I don't expect you to remember everything. Cause you just, there's too many yeah. names. There's too many things. Uh, <laughs> look, I read, I like to say I read, but I think it's just read between two brackets here. I could be wrong. Uh, just saying hi to you both. I've just started Richard's latest book, Jesus from outer space so far. So good. Be well. And awesome. I do plan on obviously wanting to talk about that in a future show. Uh, you had a really good one you did recently with our good buddy, uh, Jason folks from dragons and Genesis. On yeah. The, uh, yeah. So yeah, yeah. I really appreciate that. And then crossover maniac. Thank you for the super chat. My friend is the image of the beast in revelation 13, 15 refer or referencing the machines created by Heron of Alexandria. Could it be, could it be? Okay. Hold on. I've never heard of this. So let's see. So we're revelation. What was it again? Uh, 1315. 13, it could just be, 15. you know, apocalyptic lang or some type of a revela revelatory language. But what are your thoughts? I've Should never I run this into this question. Screen? Revelation 13, 15, correct? Rising out of the sea, the beast, a complicated beast. Oh, it's the 10 horns and seven heads. Yeah. I think. Oh, no. That, oh, no. That's, that's sorry. I'm not even looking at the reference exactly. 
the second beast was permitted to give breath to the image of the first beast so that the image could speak and cause all who refused to worship the image to be killed. Interesting. Could um, a Roman empire, <clears throat> like could the Romans have had a breathing statue, a moving speaking statue that they uh, expected people to worship? I mean, the answer is absolutely yes. And we have actual attestations of these things. Um, so yeah, I, I talk about it in the book. There's a brief section where I mention um, uh, parade robots. So, so they have, they had a lot of parade robots. Some, some were self-propelled um, others, others, they were powered by people inside. And then it was basically like a float, you know, like a float in a parade that would have all of this automated theater stuff going on on top of it. Like that was a, that was a thing. Um, they had a self-propelled snail. This was a giant snail that would proceed, you know, uh, promenade. Um, it was probably not self-propelled. They're probably human powered, but they're, they are like kind of these robotic, uh, machines and it would have like, you know, moving antenna and stuff like that. So, uh, it's conceivable that, that I hadn't even thought of that. I mean, it, it that's there's interesting. Not, there's, there's obviously, cause it's revelation. It's, it's highly symbolic. So I don't think they're really referring to literal things. I think it's all weird mumbo jumbo symbolism that they're inventing in their heads. But, um, it is conceivable that you could, you, that they're riffing on this idea of these parade floats, uh, like which, I've heard it were say pagan, right? These were very pagan, uh, religious ceremonies that would have these these robotic floats in them. Uh, so so it would be a way to kind of like evoke uh, the sort of pagan terrors that that the reader of this book would be familiar with from these scary processions of pagan robots. But um, so yeah. it, it's possible. I, I can't say whether that's actually the case of what's going on. There. That's why, I, and I'm, I'm going to get your super chat, Dharma Defender. I appreciate that, by the way, for the five there. And um, real quick, before we get to this, I'd like to, to just mention... Um, I've heard about the whole turning water into wine. There was a trick and it's well known even today that they would trick people with the whole water to wine and that John might be, I don't know if this is completely literary or if it is riffing off of somewhere around the right. late first, <laughs> early second century that mm -hmm. there were charlatans running around that were, you know, Oh, drink this, look at that wine. And they're holding their thumb over a, a seal. <laughs> yeah. Actually, have evidence of that. This. I think that, device is in Heron's pneumatica. I think he, he describes yeah. uh, that in there. Um, but the, um, the more similar tricks are actually temple tricks, getting back to this, these complicated machines that temple magic, the uh, temples would build. So I think we even found archeologically some of the piping for one of these. I, I can't remember for sure, uh, but we have descriptions of them. So there are temples to Dionysus. I mean, one of the, the, the famous story is that there are these temples that you they would bring pots of water in and leave them there and seal the temple. Like mm -hmm. it, so no one can go in and then in the morning they would go in there and oh it's all wine now right like that's an easy scam to run like that's that's not even an impressive vegas show uh <laughs> but um but the idea was there right and so um and, and like i said uh, uh heron just does describe the use of piping and things like that to do tricks like these so you could do it like before people's eyes like where you drain the water and wine shows up right like like it, it, it is it was definitely within their means and the kind of thing that they would do back then uh we don't have any direct descriptions of that specific mechanism but uh but it is possible and when john is of course writing that story obviously his readers are familiar with the wine miracles in dionysian temples because that was just a common thing at the time you know it was this pop culture really uh and, and of course he's using it to convey a different kind of symbolism for a different kind of purpose but it's the same way that dennis mcdonald argues uh that um the gospel of mark <clears throat> is using taking stories from from homer and updating them and judaizing them and making them like so they're making better versions to kind of both to criticize homer's versions but also to like sell a better story that has a better moral right like so they're right. and, and and in a sense they're commenting on homer in many ways uh, and dennis mcdonald does a really good job of showing this uh it, everybody hates it because they, they it's very shocking and, and unsettling yeah. for christians to see that this is what was going on uh but it, it definitely it, he's got a strong argument and uh i think what john is doing is very similar to that he's taking a very popular miracle you know a con really uh but he's representing it as real and but he's using it to sell a, what he would consider a better message. So it's kind of like, it's both simultaneously a criticism of this familiar uh, miracle technique, but and also using it to sort of forward message uh, what he wants to sell, essentially. Hmm. Thank you for taking the time with that. Uh, Dharma Defender, thank you for the five. Love to see you have Dr. Carry on to talk about his older works in anthologies and not the impossible faith. I think that would be so useful. So we can yeah, definitely... I mean, 
Hitler, yeah. Homer, Bible, Christ has a lot of topics in it that you could you could explore. Um, one of the most famous, I think, people is the empty tomb, right? So um, this is the first anthology that I published in, and still the three chapters I contributed to it are still, I think, important chapters. Like they right. they hold up basically, and and they're on the three different rational theories for the resurrection claim. One is um, that, uh, that, that it was all made up, uh, there was visions and not, there was no empty tomb. Uh, the other is theft. The body was stolen and this caused belief in the resurrection. And the other is misplacement. The body was moved and, and someone, and it, this led to a sort of false religious belief in the resurrection. Uh, and mm -hmm. I, I explore, I explore all of the actual contextual evidence that would support each of these theories. And, you know, I don't actually take a position in saying which one is correct. My point is that any one of these is vastly more likely than the actual resurrection from the dead. Right. Uh, and, um, and in the process of that, I, I touch on a lot of interesting topics. So like the theft chapter uh, in Empty Tomb uh, goes into a lot of why would people steal a body? And, and there's like the, and one of the examples is that it's necromancy, like magic and wizards, which were an actual, as an actual market back then, right? Uh, they actually liked, not only use, had a lot of use for corpses, but particularly the corpses of crucifixion victims and the corpses of holy men. These, so this basically hits the trifecta, right? Was, so this is a prime target for sorcerers to steal this, the body of Jesus, uh, if, if there was a body of Jesus, right? But, um, but yeah, and, and you know, once once I started pointing this out, William Lane Craig sort of like trying to denigrate it. It's like, oh, there were no wizards in Judea. And I was like, actually, we got lots of evidence of wizards in Judea. Uh, it, you know, it's one of those things that you don't outlaw something if it doesn't exist. Right. So like if, if you have all these laws and repeatedly in the Talmud, we're mentioning like we're fighting all of these, we're hunting down all these wizards doing necromancy and stuff. I was like, it shows us it's real. Right. Like, I mean, Jesus yes. himself was accused of being, it's yes. kind of weird to think. Correct. That, yeah. 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 He was accused of being a sorcerer. And so right. no, no one said, well, you can't be a sorcerer. There are no sorcerers in Judea. Right. Like that. <laughs> no, no. They're like, yeah, he could be a sorcerer. There's too many sorcerers in Judea. Uh, but, uh, but anyways, that's, Sort of topics like that's an example of some random weird thing like we could go into ancient sorcery uh, uh, on on how that relates to resurrection apologetics, which was before I became one of the leading uh, experts in historicity, I was a resurrection apologist, right? I was a leading one of the leading experts in resurrection apologetics, right? Like knew every argument they had, and I studied all of the ancient history underlying it or not, uh, and. So that, that that book represents that. That's one of my early anthologies that uh, that, that your your guest was referring to. And this which book is this exactly? Uh, that's the Empty Tomb. Uh, okay. So that's edited by uh, Robert Price uh, and Jeff Louder. Is it? Can I get the? Interesting. I didn't see that on the. Uh, that's oldie. Okay. It, yes, two thousand five. So <laughs> that's okay. a long time ago. Um, the empty tomb, ladies and gentlemen. Remember but then, that. then there's all the Loftus anthology. So I did, I did chapters in the first three of Loftus's series. So that's the Christian delusion, the end of Christianity, and Christianity is not great. Uh, and I have chapters in all of those. Like one of them is on the Dark Ages, uh, for example. One is on the design argument, why uh, actually fine-tuning is proof of atheism and not theism. Uh, and, and things like that. And, and that's not even my, I didn't even come up with that. I actually found it argued by mathematicians and scientists and brought their work together and expanded on it for the chapter to, to introduce it to people and to show that they're right. Uh, and so there's lots of, there's tons of stuff. And then you go into like Hitler Homer and there's like the Nazareth inscription, which is like, there's a whole, all this stuff about, more stuff about stealing bodies and more reasons to steal bodies and how bad the problem was that they had to keep passing laws uh, to, stop people from stealing bodies. Um, but it was, it was a rampant problem actually, uh, the theft of corpses. Uh, and yeah, I've got other chapters in there. My, the stuff on ancient aliens. I, I did an article for a skeptical inquirer long ago on the ancient alien stuff. Uh, and so you could find tons of interesting things in the ghost theory. I have a whole chapter in Hitler Homer on um, comparing the role, the, the interconnection between ghosts, what people think about ghosts and heroism, what people think makes a hero uh, and comparing Roman, Greek, and Chinese uh, ancient cultures. Interesting. So, this, like I said, like the anthologies do have a lot of a wealth of interesting subjects to go digging into that are, go beyond the usual "Did Jesus exist?" stuff. Yeah, I mean, I mean, look, that's that's always fun, but it's like I like that's why I wanted to do this book, and I'm and I'm finding more interest recently. I'm going to be interviewing Dr. Mark Solms here on the 19th. And he puts forth a proposition that, um, or his thesis is, 
everyone who thinks consciousness is coming from the cortex is mistaken. And he proves why it comes from the brain stem. But he mm. goes into, and he believes he's cracked the hard problem of other minds philosophically. <laughs> okay. and, and it's all purely like what I love about him is it isn't like getting into woo woo land. It's not non duality. Right. Mm -hmm. It's not like it's an abstract thing out there. And this, right, like, right. He's trying to solve like where in the brain and what happened. How do you experience you and how do you yeah. know all that? So I'm looking forward to that. But, um, Interesting. yeah, cool. Yeah. Wow. And I know that you'd like it if, if you checked it out. I know you'd be like, oh, shit, you know, because <laughs> you're just into this stuff. Um, so, okay. We ran out of super chats, which is cool. And I, I want to ask you personally, this is a question, really not a question for me to have you answer, but out of your book, what would you say is the most, what was your biggest goal out of this book on educating the, the audience? What were you trying to do with showing this? Well, I mean, there's, just, there's so much stuff in the field that most people don't know about. And we were just talking about like Stark and he's still quoting and re using historians from the sixties, man. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, but, so there's a lot of this stuff going on that that's even experts aren't reading and aren't aware of uh, or supposed experts anyway, PhD scholars in various fields. Um, but if even they don't know, like the public is definitely not informed of this stuff. So I want to bring that information out there. So you have it uh, and know about it. And plus it's, fascinating as fuck right so like the, the, this everything i found was amazing but the the genesis of this was actually my dissertation and so how did i get to there is the more interesting question um i so when i was so there comes a point when you're doing your phd work you get to a point where you have to develop a prospectus where you have to say this is the thesis that i'm going to pursue and then you run the prospectus by uh your advisors and then they tell you what to change or wh whether it's a viable thesis or not etc um but so you, but you're still doing like your masters. For me, it was masters and master philosophy. You're doing these other for a few years. You're doing all your other coursework, your teaching work because you have to. Part of your training is to teach as well, so you have to do some teaching, and you're doing all of this stuff, and, and you're learning more. And then you're trying to think, you're pondering, what is well, what am I going to do my dissertation on? And um, and of course, at that point in my career, I'm very much involved in counter apologetics and dealing with <clears throat> helping the atheist community uh, address the sort of sometimes absurd, often false claims that Christian apologists make about the ancient world, because that's my field, right? I was studying ancient history. <clears throat> and that's like part of why I went into it, is uh, uh, it would do double duty. One, I loved the Roman Empire as a culture and was fascinated by it and wanted to study it. But also it gave me the languages and cultural context that would be useful, super useful, mm. to be to do good counter apologetics. So, uh, so that's I, double duty doing that. Well, in the, in the process, I kept running into various different uh, Christian apologetics and things that I, that I knew were just absurdly wrong. And I was like, oh, my God, I want to do a dissertation on that. <clears throat> at, at first, I was thinking of doing <clears throat> a dissertation on ancient miracle theory. So looking at, like, what did pagans think miracles were or were not? And what does that tell us about their culture? And uh, how did they? What did they think the metaphysics was behind miracles and things like that? Um, I considered doing an, one a dissertation on skepticism, ancient skepticism in general, um, <clears throat> and, uh, and those weren't really coming together as like uh, really viable thesis. I didn't really have a thesis. Like I could just do the history of, and right. it's less interesting. But um, but what one thing that I got very involved in right around this time was the Rodney Stark stuff. So Rodney Stark, Stanley Yaki. Uh, these books were being pushed. Of Thaxton was pushing this. These various Christian apologists were lately pushing this idea of the the ancient pagans were mind blocked. They didn't have science. They just they failed at science. And it took Christians to come along and give us science. Right? And you needed Christianity. You needed the Bible. You needed God. If you didn't have all this, you couldn't get science. This this is their argument, and it's just patently absurd and ridiculous. Mm -hmm. But people are buying it because they don't know. Uh, why it's bogus. And so <clears throat> my, and, and so I was like, no, that I want to do something on that. Right. I want to do something on that. And at first I was thinking like one of the key questions in all of this is why did the scientific revolution or what we call now the scientific revolution, why did that not happen under the Roman empire? <clears throat> Interesting question. And in fact, H. Flores Cohen, a, a really, you know, a significant historian wrote a whole book on this. Basically he wrote a whole book on the scientific revolution that has a whole section on why didn't it happen? And he, he has no answers. He says, well, there's competing theories and let me describe you to the theories. And this is what we know so far. We really don't know the answer to this question. I was like, oh, well that that's, I can do a dissertation on that. That's an interesting topic. <clears throat> and so I organized it using Cohen's model of, of like all the different explanations. And so I presented a prospectus to my dissertation advisor and there, 
And I said, like, here's, I want to do this. Why was there no scientific revolution in the ancient world? Here are the things I need to study. Cohen has organized it for me and stuff. And so, uh, so I said that, and he looked it over, and he says, okay, this is 10 dissertations. You need to pick one. <laughs> I already knew. I already knew. Oh, so, uh, and so what I picked was attitudes. Um, so one of the arguments was that the ancients denigrated scientists. They didn't really value them that much. There was a negative attitude. Uh, and that, that led to the failure of science in, in the ancient world. Um, oh. That's massively false, obviously, as you now know. You've read my book, which is right. that's the main thrust of it is, no, the evidence is exactly the opposite of that. Uh, and so I, that's what I did. But that allowed me to touch on all the other nine subjects, right? So I, I did get to do a chapter on ancient progress and, and there's a section on technology. And so I really hit on everything, uh, even like slave three, the slavery thesis. I have like a whole section little section on the slavery thesis, which is another one like, well, they had slaves because they had slaves, they were not really interested in innovation and therefore there was no technological or scientific advance. Completely false. This is not even logical, but it, it, but it, it, it was a theory that it was around. So I had to like have a section explaining why it's false. And there are other, in, in that section, I cite other historians who've debunked it. It's not like just, I'm the first guy to come along and do this, but putting it all together in one book, no one had done that before. Like I, there's not, there's no book like mine out. Uh, there's, no one has done anything like it. Um, and so, uh, and so it does have that valuable perspective of touching on all of the, the false theories that were plaguing the field and why they've been overturned. It stood out to me after reading, um, ancient, or ancient atheism in the ancient world by Tim Whitmarsh, uh, that book really popped out and I said, I've got to continue this theme. And you wrote on mm -hmm. this. So I said, dude, this is right in the alley of what I'm looking for. Uh, water Blanc, uh, I hope I'm saying that correct. Thank you for the super chat. Can Dr. Carrier determine for certain that no contemporary records of Jesus exist that got lost to time along with the earliest Greek manuscripts? Do you want to comment on that real quick? I know it's not yeah. on the topic of this, but... Uh, I mean, it, it does tangentially relate. We were talking earlier about the loss of science uh, right. treatises, right? So, um, and and so that, that's, it's, you know, preservation of manuscripts. We had, a, there were a lot more. And I do some calculations in... I can't remember if it's in science education or the scientist, but one of them, I do calculations on how much, uh, how many scientists were there, right? Like, so figuring out like, were, were there too few of them or whatever? And we also know like how much literature was written. Mm. We know there was, you can do some math, simple math from stats we have to show that there was a lot more being written than we even know about, than we even have mentions of. Uh, and I actually go into this in On the Historicity of Jesus, uh, which is my, you know, for those who don't know, um, my historicity book. Uh, let me get the. Yep, uh, there you go. Yeah, um, the thick, footnoted yeah. academic one. The twenty-four um, hour audio book. Yeah, yeah. that one. <laughs> uh, so I, I do go into that um, in chapter eight. I go. I go through all of the places, and not only do I go through all the places where we know the books existed that could have mentioned Jesus, uh, but I also talk about this general categories of literature where there might have been books that we don't know about that would have, that could have mentioned Jesus. Um, now the, we don't know the answer to this question, obviously we, we, if, if someone had quoted or mentioned it, then we would know, but since no one does, and uh, it's clear that the second century Christians have lost all track of their own history. Like they, they can't cite anything from the first century to support anything they say. Like they have no books. After they, the war, it's like. It's after the war. I think also the decline of the religion. I think it really was in crisis. It was, it was disappearing and was revived in the early second century. So it, there was this sort of bottleneck where they lost a lot of their, their history and had to invent it basically they had to invent history for themselves. And um, so, so we don't know, we don't know the answer to that, but there, there is, there are tons of places that could have mentioned Jesus. And one of the ones that I, uh, that I have talked about on other shows before is this, that is one that we actually theoretically might be able to get. Uh, and that's the history of Rome by Pliny the elder or Pliny, yeah, Pliny the elder. Now, so there's there is a library sitting unexcavated uh, in Herculaneum. It was buried oh. in ash by the, uh, the uh, by the volcano of Vesuvius in 79 A.D. 79. So it's pretty close, right, to to the time of Jesus. Um, <clears throat> and we did start excavating it, but uh, the scrolls were all charred, and so the, the it was we we're destroying more than we were recovering. So they just reburied it and they just left it there. Uh, now there's been some rumblings lately of going back in. Uh, there's people developing technologies to like recover the text from the scrolls without unrolling them. And so that that's, that's in the news and in science lately. Um, what we need is like an Elon Musk or uh, somebody, some rich, crazy dude to spend like 
hundred million dollars on excavating the library of Herculaneum. <clears throat> and this is, this would be my elevator speech to Elon Musk. If I would ever run into him and there's like, okay, I've got a story. It starts with a lost ancient library that we could recover and ends with particle accelerators. Are you interested? <laughs> <laughs> you would uh, be like, yeah. 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 So, um, cause we could do the same thing to the scrolls that we did to the Archimedes codex. We could put them in the Stanford uh, accelerator and then have a computer unroll the scroll. Right. Wow. So, um, and just by, just by mapping where the iron atoms are, because iron is, is the principal ingredient of ink, uh, or ancient ink anyway. And so we could go back in there. Now, the key thing is that Pliny the Elder was famously the naval commander of that region. Uh, in fact, he's famously died trying to rescue people during the eruption of Vesuvius because uh, he marshaled his fleet, went out there. Like he was, he has line of sight to uh, Pompeii. Like he could actually see it from his villa where he was stationed. And um, <clears throat> Herculaneum is nearby there. So it see, and he was also a famous scholar, right? So he wrote a lot of famous stuff. Uh, and um, one of which was this history of Rome and he had an entire volume on the reign of Nero Right, so you see where I'm going with this. With people who know know uh, this stuff, but um, it's highly likely. It seems unreasonable that the Herculaneum librarian, um, and this is a private library, it's a rich guy's library, not a public library, but still, it seems unlikely that he would live so close to this famous scholar, Pliny the Elder, and not have any of his books. Right, so there's there is a decent chance, like not a guarantee, but there's a decent chance that Pliny's history is in there which means we have a whole volume mm. written by an eyewitness to the reign of Nero, uh, right? So, which means that the Neronian persecution has to be in there or it's not, <laughs> right? So like th this is a, this would be a crucial source to read uh, to recover what actually happened at the history of Christianity. Uh, and, wow. and I have theories about what's actually in that book, but the point is, we don't have to theorize. We, we we could go in there and see, and and if it's there, uh, th it could be an earth shattering discovery in terms of what's in there, and it, it could produce evidence that confirms the historicity of Jesus and overthrows my theory, which would be great. Like I would I would find that super valuable and useful, um, or it could go the other way. So uh, so we don't know. We don't know. If it's more silence than that. You know, it doesn't. Uh, yeah, I mean, it obviously, help either way. What I yeah. what I think it it has because I think Tacitus used. Well, we know Tacitus used Pliny the Elder's history of Nero's reign for Tacitus's Annals of Rome, uh, so we we know he's using them as a source. I think that the line in Tacitus that mentions Christ being under Tiberius and stuff, I think that's a later edition. I don't think Tacitus wrote it. I think originally Tacitus wrote the story about a completely different Jewish group that has nothing to do with Christians, uh, and uh, and and. What I suspect is if we get this scroll out of uh, Herculaneum, if it's there and we get it out, uh, Pliny the Elder's eyewitness account will be a much more detailed account. And I think it'll make it very clear that he's talking about these Messianic Jews that have no connection to Christianity. I don't think Pliny, I suspect Pliny the Elders will never have heard of Christians. Uh, mm. And so uh, it'll be this completely different thing, which will show, it will prove that the Christians were inventing their own history over time. And they were so fringe and so unknown that they just, they weren't really even on the radar of an eyewitness to the brain of Nero. Right. So um, that's what I suspect, but I don't know. I can't, I can't prove it. I, I need to, I want to go see this. I want to see this too. <laughs> Hopefully we can see it. I definitely want to see it. Um, hold on one second here. Let me. Do, 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 do. Okay. Sorry about that. No worries. Fix, fixing something. Okay. Um, now we got a question from Scott Duke. Thank you for the super chat. What lost authors works would you would you be the most excited to see discovered? Also, did Rome have any philosophies like presuppositionalism? And real quick, guys, we got 260 people watching, 128 likes. I don't know how many times I need to. I'm just kidding. <laughs> hit that like button. Go ahead yeah. and just press. If you're that watching damn. and enjoying, yeah, for sure. Just, uh, just hit yeah. the like button. Show me some love. You know what I mean? It matters a lot, and that that is probably the cheapest way to support someone. Uh, it is it's the platform, algorithm, so. man. Yeah, there's a mathematical thing. Trust me. Ask Richard. He'll he'll go through yeah. the math and the Bayesian theory <laughs> and. The <laughs> Seriously, though. I mean, um, actually, it, the algorithm probably is Bayesian. Uh, if you go talk to the text, you actually built it. But anyway, um, so uh, what authors works? I, I have a hard time answering this because there are so many subjects I'm interested in. Like, yeah. I would I would suck if I had to pick only one, right? Like, like oh! Because, um, like, really, like, in, in the historicity subject, uh, what I want is the original dossier of Paul's epistles, 
right? Like the original epistles, not not the edited uh, hash marked version that we have. Um, because there's, and then we could answer so many questions about what's been interpolated, what's been cut out, what's been lost, et cetera. Uh, what did Paul really say about stuff? Um, I would love to have the original dossier of Paul's epistles. Mm. We're not going to get that. I'm sure that's gone. Uh, good and gone. Um, the other, but that, next are that like in ancient science, right? So there's tons of treatises. There's the two treatises on gravity written, one written by Strato and one by Hipparchus. Uh, I want those. I want to see what's in them. I want to see what they did. Uh, like, well, what were they arguing about gravitational theory? Um, there's uh, the treatise of Seleucus. So Plutarch has this line, and it is the most tantalizing of lines. It's the most frustrating lines, uh, where he says, um, Aristarchus hypothesized heliocentrism, and his pupil Seleucus proved it. And then he goes on and something else. I'm like, whoa, whoa, hold on. <laughs> I want to hear the rest of that story. The pupil of Aristarchus named Seleucus proved heliocentrism. What are you talking about? Uh, I want to know what that, I want to know more about that. And one thing we do know about Seleucus is that he's famous for discovering lunisolar tide theory. He developed the idea that the sun and the moon, their positions re regulate the tides. And we have some hints that he even might have posited a universal gravitation as the causal reason. Now, once you have those, those components, it's, hop, skip, and a jump to proving heliocentrism, right? And Galileo is famous for one of his most failed theories. Uh, he tried to use lunisolar tide theory to prove heliocentrism. Now it's like, that's, you know, it doesn't work, right? You can't do it. And his theory was bogus and, and dumb, but why did he even think he could do it? Mm. He read Plutarch, right? He either read Plutarch and put two and two together. Seleucus, lunar solar tide theory proved heliocentrism. Well, maybe I found something there and I'm, I'm going to figure it out. Or it could have been possible that Galileo had access to manuscripts like lost treatises of Seleucus that were still around in his day but haven't survived since. That's also possible. So I would like, I want to see Seleucus's book on lunar solar tide theory, right? That's another one. Um, but there, there are others that might be more sweeping. So like Varro's Encyclopedia of Religion, I think would be important. Uh, and even, and not Varro's Encyclopedia of Science, but Celsus's. So there's another author in the first century AD who wrote, he wrote his own Encyclopedia of Science and we have the medicine section uh, and it's really good. Uh, so it would be interesting to see his section on engineering and other sciences. Like I'd love to have the complete Encyclopedia of Celsus on- Is this uh, the same Celsus that argued with Christians? No, uh, okay. different okay. different century. They're a century apart. Uh, mm -hmm. Celsus is a common name. There's there's a Celsus who did this. There's a different Celsus who wrote some engineering and surveying treatises. There's the Celsus you just mentioned, who is the friend of Lucian of Samosata, uh, who wrote the Against Christians, the true. I can't remember the title, but uh, but yeah, he wrote the one of the first, probably the first treatise arguing against Christianity. Uh, but yeah, there's a bunch of Celsuses that did different different things. But no, it's a different one. This is first century. Celsus, but um, his on medicine survives. So we actually have that. And he, he wrote a book on agriculture as well. He wrote a textbook on agriculture, um, but uh, which we have is my point. Um, but yeah, I would love to have that. Uh, there are the two lost books of Hippolytus. So Hippolytus is this um, Christian apologist who wrote against heresies in the early third century. And uh, somehow volume chapters two and three have been cut out and destroyed. And he, he at the end of chapter one, he says what he's going to do. He says, I'm going to go through all the mystery religions and show all how bogus and, and debunk them they are. And then I'll move on to these other things. And so we, he, it, what happens is after book one, we go straight to chapter three and he's doing the other stuff. Those two chapters on mystery religions are gone. Well, I mean... It's interesting to guess what happened to them. Why are they not there? Uh, but uh, the other interesting, like the, pertaining to the present question, I want those freaking books, right? right. So, uh, so that's that's an example. So that's why I can't pick and choose. Like any one of these would be amazing. To have. Wow, you got me wanting them too. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> did Rome have any philosophies like presuppositionalism? And then we'll get to our next super chat. Yeah, I, I you know, that's a tough question. Um, I don't think so. I, don't, I can't answer that question. I, I haven't really, because that's a really esoteric question about the ontology of logic. Mm. And I don't think I've run into the ontology of logic as a subject field in ancient writings. <clears throat> I mean, it, yeah, like even, like does Plato count as presuppositionalist? I, I, I don't, 
Um, like probably it, not in the of. same way, you know what I mean? Yeah, not well. He, 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 yeah, not in the same way. Like, he, he kind of argues that the only way we know anything is that everything pre exists us and we're accessing it psychically. Um, <clears throat> and that's sort of a presupposition, it's not presupposition of apologetics, but it's uh, sort of like his idea is that there has to be a world of forms or else no logic or reason or facts would exist now. It's kind of so like modern kind of like versions that. of non-dualism that say consciousness and we could not exist no matter how much biological particles or whatever you want to describe existence to be without a consciousness beyond or right. consciousness encompassing yeah. all existence. And therefore, it's kind of like that kind of presupposition, so, right? Which, like you said, is not exactly what we mean today by presuppositionalist apologetics. Right. Um, but it's in the same vein. So anyway, this is not a question I've examined. So I don't know if there's better answers to this question available or not. Interesting. Well, thank you, Jay Bund Bundy. Sorry, five. Thank you for the super chat, my friend. Man, he's been looking out the whole show. What are the prospects of Dr. Carrier taking an academic position? Also, if you're serious about your ancient clock, I'll help you write a proposal. <laughs> <laughs> uh, wait, so when you say help write a proposal, are, are you saying you've done this before? Like you've written grant proposals? I, if, if the answer is yes, email me and uh, I'll put you on my list of people to talk to. Um, <clears throat> it's not going to happen soon, but it, it, down the line, I'm, I'm interested in this. Uh, yeah, I, I would be interested in anyone. Like if you, well, I actually have a good friend who's an astronomer, um, although he, he specializes in radio astronomy, but, um, or not, or whatever the other lights, the non, non-visible light astronomy. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, I would love to get a team together of like actual astronomers, especially if like practical instrument user, um, people who could, who have experience writing, uh, grant proposals for this sort of thing. Um, Love to get a team together and have a multi-authored paper uh, result. That would be great. Uh, and also craftsmen, uh, people who can make things really well. Like if you're, if you're like a classic uh, uh, Renaissance fair, I can make stuff person, or metalsmith too. Like the, the, any of these things, you can email me. I, I like nothing will happen soon, but I will put you on a list of people I might get in touch with years down the line. Who knows? Um, so it's a quick question of that uh, academic position. Hell no. I, I have no interest whatsoever in enslaving myself to the shitty system of academia. Um, yeah, I, by the time, so that's what I wanted to do, right? So when I went to the PhD, I said, I'm going to be a professor. That sounds like a great job. Uh, I can teach, do research, et cetera. By the time I finished my PhD, I had completely soured on academia as a profession. It sucks. It's one of the worst jobs you could ever have. I mean, even, even if you get past the shitty layer of adjunct positions, which pay less than minimum wage, uh, and you can actually get one of the very, very few rare actual professorships, which everybody fights for tooth and nail, so you can't get them. Um, there, And even like community college, which is actually a better job, by the way, community college professor is way better than a, than a prestigious college professor. Um, and, and I mean, like, as in terms of like work quality, like quality of life, okay. uh, right. because there's no, there's, you, you aren't put on a million committees. If you go, if you go to, uh, to teach at community college, you have much more independence, much more control, you can just teach and do research and that's it. And then you pay, get, you get paid decently and you have decent hours, real, like prestigious universities. They bury you in committee work. It's a bunch of bullshit politics that you have to deal with. There's tons of backstabbing, all the drama. I mean, it's just the, it's unbelievable. It's miserable. Like I saw the, the professors in there like that, that I don't want this. Right. Uh, and then there's like all of the ways that colleges can control you. You know, they have this idea of like academic freedom, but there's, Technically, even if you get tenure, by the way, which is not easy to get, like it takes a long time, you basically have to play the party line for years and years and years, even to get tenure. So by then you've already sold your soul, right? So tenure is useless at that point. Um, <clears throat> but even with tenure, there's a million ways they can punish you for saying things they don't like uh, mm -hmm. and um, that, that bypass the, the protections of tenure. Uh, and I saw that happen too. So I was like, I, I don't see any use, I see zero utility in becoming an academic. Uh, professionally, if I can make it as an independent scholar, that is a much better job. Uh, I think you and so Dr. Price both agree on that same thing. And I've talked to quite a few PhDs um, just this past few months, for example. I've been really hitting PhDs up, and they most of them share this same uh, 
it, it, they have a friend who was hired wonderful people. They were hired for a specific job. They're done with them. They literally kick them out. They have no time with tenure. They can't get retirement. Like just a lot of yeah. politics crap and just, yeah. So yeah. Even just like misery over fighting over who gets what office. Like it's just, it's unbelievable. Like I, I just, <laughs> and yeah. And then the, the God, the, the, the petty, the pettiness, like the, like I even had this problem uh, as a graduate student. Like I dealt with a lot of prejudice against me. So I, you know, Columbia University's Ivy League's big, you know, one of those highfalutin universities. But there was a lot of classism against me. I was a blue collar, come from a poor background. Um, someone come, a veteran, you know, military veteran, the whole thing. And I, I, there were a few people in the department who looked down on me, like thought, thought mm -hmm. I couldn't do. I can't. Oh well, well I didn't go to. Uh, I didn't take Greek and Latin in high school for four years right so I, I didn't go to eaton so i can't be like a serious scholar and i'm like what are you talking about I, I had one guy tell me when i was doing my dissertation i won't name names here but uh he said i, I couldn't i have no experience in doing ancient science so i couldn't do it or i had no experience in science like so I, I couldn't do ancient science i'm not going to support you doing this and i found other scholars and departments who totally supported me so that that's i don't want to like blame the entire university system but there was this one fucking arrogant motherfucker who said that one and it, you know i i just made a mental note. Okay. Don't have him on my committee. But, uh, but in my head, I'm thinking like, I wanted to like fucking tell him off. I was like, dude, I have more experience in actual science than you do. I have literally like 12 college units of electronics engineering. I was, I was in the coast guard doing a science subject. Right. And I, I mastered wow. science in, uh, in, in high school, like all my electives are science. I know more science than you do. What are you talking about? Right. <laughs> and anyway, so it's, it's, but you run into that, right. That's kind of the arrogance. And then you have people who, who try to like fuck up your career because you piss them off at some point. And then they just do all kinds of things to make your life miserable. And uh, you can't do that to me now. I'm an independent scholar. There ain't nothing you can do to touch me. So uh, I like being able to do what I want to do. I can do the research I want to do. I can write on what I want to write. Um, and I don't have any of this pressure to shut me up. Uh, and so, um, so it does come with a disadvantage that prestige attaches to getting a professorship. So independent scholars, are taken less seriously, um, right. but I think that's that's a a holdover from the old culture of this this elitist society where somehow professorship meant more. Um, I don't really think it does anymore, um, but but people think it does, and so the, the perception is still there. It's interesting, you know. You, Doctor Price. I mean, he's got two PhDs. You've got you've got so much. You're you've written on the historicity, for example, and you've had this peer reviewed, which people ask me all the time. Hey, did he, did he write a peer? Yes, he did. Yeah. I, I say this. I mean, if you look at my CV, I have a ton of peer reviewed work, right? It's not right. just that. Right. So I, I, I do serious peer reviewed scholarship. Um, I, there's limits to that. Like I think there's the value of peer review, but also there's a lot that you can't get published that should be published because peer review has, sometimes has weird standards. Like if they think something is, well, that's too redundant. It's already been done, right? And I was like, yeah, but I'm trying to write for a popular audience. I said, well, then go write for a popular audience. Well, okay. Mm. Uh, and so that's what I do, right? So like a lot of people, I, a lot of stuff I do on my blog because it's easier to just get it out there and and I can you know try to meet peer review standards in the construction of it. Uh, but, but there's no point in going through actual peer review, especially for monographs, like, or even uh, journal articles. We don't get paid for that. Peer, if you get a peer-reviewed article, you get no money. The fucking journal makes bank. Like they, they, they'll sell your article for thirty-five dollars a pop. You don't get a dime. And uh, and academic monographs, the contracts they offer are shit. Like you just can't make money off of academic monographs. So like like I got lucky with historicity uh, on the historicity of Jesus because Sheffield Phoenix is a little bit progressive in their understanding like they think scholars should like have a decent contract on their books and that, that's not a lot of academic publishers do not give the contract of the quality that, that sheffield phoenix does uh mm -hmm. and so i actually i actually make decent money off of on the history of city of jesus it's, it's a rare example however i only do that because i am a business person and i made right. a social justice argument to them to not do their usual business model which is to come out with a 200 dollar book in hardcover uh, well, in their case, ninety dollars. So they're they're but still ninety dollars, uh, and then only go to cheaper paperback if the hardcover sells well. And I was like, that's shitty business model. You're pricing yourself out of the market. You're guaranteeing you're not going to sell. No one's going to buy ninety dollar 
hardcovers, like you're, you're guaranteeing it's going to fail. So, I, and, and you're also making the knowledge inaccessible to people. There's tons right. of people who don't have $90 to spend. Like they could barely come up with a 35 that would pay for the soft cover. So I made this argument like, look, this knowledge, I want this knowledge to be more available. There's no reason I want it to be more accessible to people. There's no exactly. reason to not come out simultaneously with the hardcover and the soft cover. Um, and so I had to argue that and, and they listened, they were persuaded. And so they did, they came out with both versions simultaneously. And then of course, you know, it's skyrockets and sales, right? So like, cause you know, it's an accessible book. That's an exciting subject that people want to read. I think academics underestimate how much average people will read academic books, right? Like, oh, that's why publishers hate footnotes. So don't put footnotes. It'll kill sales. And it's like, no, actually, well, I mean, it might kill sales if, if what you're going for is huge pop market stuff, but yeah, there's a huge niche market you can make money off of from people who will who want the books with the footnotes because the footnotes are the things that make the book worthwhile uh, that That's you're establishing your, 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 you can actually do further research from them. They're proving that you have sources and so on. Um, Anyway, I, that's a big soapbox rant on. No, uh, it's, it's important. Publishing. <laughs> I was just gonna say, man, take it from me. Just, just start an OnlyFans, and uh, <laughs> I'm teasing. There's Nicole Mitchell. Have you heard of her? The ex pastor that was like, she was a female pastor, drop dead gorgeous, and uh, and uh, I guess things just her faith and things started changing, and now she's like banking off only fans and went all the way the opposite direction. Interesting. I'm, trying to, yeah. I'm yeah, yeah. trying to interview her, by the way, that I'm would be saying, great. I would be interested to hear her story. Basically, If so. academia doesn't work, just join and get an only fans. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Jay Bundy, man. Thank you again for the $5 super chat. I really appreciate you. I'll email you. I'm an evolutionary biologist, but I'm interested in the history of science. I'm finishing my PhD. I want to be independent. Thanks. So cool. yeah. yeah. Awesome. Email him and look, that's a perfect place to, to veer off the way that Dr. Richard Carrier uh, makes it is his independent research is his blog article is his Patreon. So if you guys appreciate what he does, join him on the Patreon, become a, a student of his on his online classes. You can ask as many questions as you want pertaining to the subject matter. Like it's really, yeah. really cool. Like what you offer. I ask everyone to go down in the description and uh, it's all down there. You guys just join him, help him, join the Patreon. You got other options as well. Yeah, if you if you go to my website, uh, one of the top menu items is how to help. Uh, and if you go in there, I list like a dozen different ways that you can help support my work. And and that's I am running my life as a business, right? So this is my own. So yeah, any any means that I can monetize the way I help people and educate people and, and do the work I do, I go go see what you can do to to help out with that. Buying my books is an example. Like I'm very big on trying to make sure I'm making decent royalties off of the books that I produce. Um, and, and that matters to me. Like a lot of academics don't care about the royalties they get, but I do like, cause that's my living. Uh, and Patreon support me on Patreon. That is right now my biggest supporter uh, financially. And it, it really helps immensely. Uh, and that gets me going producing four substantive blogs, uh, blog posts every month. That's what, that's what Patreon, my Patreon supporters help produce and then of course once you're in there you can do suggestions on things although i got a huge backlog of stuff i want to do so uh you can do comments to too, yeah you can comment also ask that, questions yeah. about the blog yeah and so patreon uh supporters if you're on patreon or paypal anybody just recurring uh donation on paypal i count as patreon because some people don't like patreon specifically uh but either one of those uh if you've done that like let me know uh, and then i could put your the email that you use i can put it on the whitelist on my blog and that people who are on the whitelist, they, their comments go directly published. There's no, no moderation queue. So your comments can come out right away, which does allow you to like respond to people much more directly and quickly uh, on my right. blog. If you want to like comment there. Uh, so that's one of the, the perks of being a Patreon supporter. And there are other perks as well. If you go to my Patreon, you can see some other benefits to, uh, to supporting me. Absolutely. Go down there. You guys help support him. Someone asked how to super chat. It's down there near the comment thing. And there's like a money symbol that like lights up. If you ever want to super chat, you can do it that way. Uh, and that obviously helps me out. Of course, you could join our Patreon as well. But uh, look, uh, helping support the scholars I bring on, helping support us to bring the scholars on, man. Patreon's how I survive now, too. And I'm like trying to make this thing a full time gig and to keep mm -hmm. educating people, bring brilliant people like you on. Um, I really ask that everybody hit that like button on the way out. Like I said, YouTube's paying attention to this and 
they see those likes, they they go, hmm, people actually not only watch the content, they appreciated the content. So if you're on like a TV and you don't have an option to hit the like button, I heard someone tell me, man, I would like to like it, but the TV won't allow me to do it. After we get off, get on a phone, get on a computer, just go hit like on the video. It doesn't, it's not going to hurt anything. I think they see the IP address anyway. Yeah, probably yeah, yeah. Know, you know, so uh, help yeah. us, help us both in any way you can. Dr. Carrier, we've got many other books to cover. Now that I know you have a, a book written back when <laughs> Jesus was in third grade, <laughs> I'm going to have to read that and then we're going to have to do yeah. more. Right, right. And debates. Right I want to have you debating more people, maybe some mm -hmm. Christians on the channel as well, on the resurrection. Who knows? So, right on. Yeah. Awesome, man. Well, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Richard Carrier, if you have forgotten and cognitive dissonance has just always kicked in, uh, that happens often. Don't forget. Hold on. Super chat. Love your work, Dr. Carrier. Thanks for spoiling us, Derek. We <laughs> are Myth Vision. Thanks for the super chat. Oh, hey, hey, no, 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 no. Don't leave. Don't leave. I, I, I know it's scary. The title really, especially if you're, you're somebody who believes this, um, just be patient uh, and look, I'm not going to hurt you. I promise. Uh, we're not going to hurt you, but I really want you guys to stay tuned because <laughs> is Daniel really a forgery? I mean, this is a huge, huge question before we get into this. You know, I was reading Dr. Richard Carrier's book and, uh, you really should go down in the description and get this thing, but uh, don't go anywhere. Don't go anywhere because Jonathan Sheffield created an intro. And if you don't know who he is, I'll show you his YouTube channel in just a second, but I've been up to some things. Let's just put it this way. The gods are really interested in myth vision. So if you don't believe me, take a look. Ladies and gentlemen, we are Myth Vision. This will be an epic show, just like that introduction. All thanks to my good friend, Jonathan Sheffield, who plays a role in this actual uh, situation here. There was a debate not too long ago, a modern day debate between Dr. Joshua Bowen, um, Jim Majors, who's a PhD student and his expertise is in the focus of Daniel, Jonathan Sheffield and Dr. Boyce. I hope I'm saying that correctly. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, let's go ahead and I'm not going to wait any longer. We have Dr. Richard Carrier joining us today. What is happening? Hey, uh, it's, it's, I'm enjoying uh, warm springtime weather up on the mountain today. So Awesome. Well, you know, you hurt my feelings with that article. Um, actually, you hurt my feelings from nine years ago. No longer do my feelings get hurt over this subject matter. I'm just teasing. So... <laughs> Uh, you really, something about you before we get started, Dr. Carrier, I don't know if you did like a lot of practicing on throat jabbing when you were younger, you just like, <laughs> like, don't mess with me. And you just go straight to the Adam's apple and you want people to like, eh. so your article doesn't play games. It gets like right to the thing and it strangles you and makes you really have to face the reality of my, what, what's happening. So yeah. I had to title this book. I had to or title this video exactly after your article, which is like not a is Daniel forgery. It's like here's the evidence right. it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Be before we get started, Jonathan Sheffield's uh, YouTube video, uh, YouTube channel is here. Jonathan is a Christian. Okay, he's my friend. This is what we should have: interfaith dialogue. He's a really, really nice guy. He created that intro, and I put his YouTube channel in the description. Tons of different videos he's done. One I love about the Matrix. I had to give him a shout out for spending so much time after having a newborn baby 
creating this intro for me, man. Thanks a lot. I really appreciate, I really appreciate your help. And then we also have Dr. Richard Carrier's books. All of these books, if you go down, I have the Amazon link down below. You guys can go there or go to amazon.com. You can go to his website. All of that's in the description. You can find his books. It's a must get. And then the most recent that I was looking at, Jesus from Outer Space. So that one's going to be a lot less time to consume than his On the Historicity. I recommend you guys check that out. Like really go and look at that because it's powerful. If you don't mind, I'm going to give a short brief bio about you and let's get into Daniel being a forgery. Dr. Yeah. Richard Carrier is the author of Sense and Goodness Without God on the Historicity of Jesus, The Scientist in the Early Roman Empire, and many other books, including Jesus from Outer Space, of course, uh, chapters and articles. With a PhD in ancient history from Columbia University, he specializes in the modern philosophy of naturalism, the origins of Christianity, and the intellectual history of Greece and Rome. For more about him and his work, visit www.richardcarrier.info. www.richardcarrier.info in the description right now. Go support him. Join his Patreon. Help him out because that's how he makes a living. It's how he survives. And I've actually, you know, Help, had you do projects, you know, I yeah. hired you to do projects. So right. yeah, and that, that's what I do. I actually do contract work. Uh, so I, you're not my only client. So yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, uh, it's, I, I prefer this, like, like doing, being an independent scholar who works on contract, uh, who, who's making his own income through his own revenue streams, blogging. Uh, so Patreon is a major uh, supporter of my life and, and work now. Uh, so I, I prefer that because it gives me total freedom. I don't, don't have to kowtow to, any academic committees or whatever and limiting what I can and can't talk about and what I can and can't say. So, uh, or, or time even, I, I find like uh, professorships just hog all of your time with useless committee work and tons of other things. And I have a lot more time to actually focus on the work. Uh, less and, and politics, bring, right. Less, less politics as well. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. So, um, so yeah, so I, I, but yes, that the result is that, uh, I cobble together an income through various sources, and one of them is contract work to uh, do uh, research and things for people. So, and awesome. I'm always always glad for getting work from you or anyone else. So, yeah. So, if anyone's interested, you guys go down there. You could find a way to contact him, of course. Joining, checking out his blog, stuff like that. Yesterday, I was interviewing Dr. Goodacre, and he had nothing but good things to say about you, by the way. And I mean that with sincerity. I'm not just saying that. Um, it was really wonderful. He cites you in an upcoming work as his first footnote footnote. He said, and he was shocked to find <laughs> that you were the guy who actually said this. He's like, I thought nobody out there had ever seen this. And he goes, this guy, Richard Carrier <laughs> has an eye. So, um, the, the mainstream is obviously looking and going, you know what? And I like him because he respects where good scholarship is. He admits it. And he points that out. Uh, Dr. Carrier, look, Daniel is a heated area. Christians rely on it. Jews rely on it. It's an extremely religious, I like to call, um, it's like an elbow. It's the elbow in this whole thing. And, and, and without it, you have a problem on in many directions that you had like Orthodox uh, Judaism as well as Christianity. Um, many groups that I was part of as well hinge on this. Well, the prophecy was fulfilled in the first century. But anyway. Dr. Carrier, take us into why is this important if Daniel's a forgery, and then we'll we'll delve into this further. You froze up. There you are. Did you catch me? Yeah, I'm waiting to see if we... Yeah, okay, so... Uh, He's freezing up, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, silly mountain internet again. Uh, <laughs> yes, yeah, so uh, why, why is Daniel a forgery? Uh, what is the significance of it? He disappeared. Hold on. He'll be back. Please be patient. Hit that like button if you guys are tuning in right now. Uh, he is in the mountains in California. And so, <laughs> look, there he is. There he is. Yeah. All right. Internet is dodgy. Yeah, yeah. Internet is unreliable up here. But anyway, uh, where I was, so Christianity is very much founded on Daniel and the book of Enoch, people forget like how much the book of Enoch is a foundational scripture for, for uh, Christianity because that scripture wasn't preserved in what we now call the Old Testament. So people forget that that was actually an important one. But Daniel's another really important one and that did get into the Old Testament, the later Old Testament that so declared um, because it claims or Christians claimed it claimed 
uh, that it would predict the Messiah, their Messiah. You know, they they think G, they see Jesus in Daniel nine, and uh, that is not what the book originally meant. Uh, the original authors of Daniel nine meant a completely different person. They, they were their their Messiah, their their anointed one. Uh, that they talk about as dying, uh, being killed, uh, is Onias the Third, who was a uh, high priest of the Jewish Temple in uh, the one, in 171. He was killed in 171 BC, uh, and so this Daniel was written as propaganda. We have tons of evidence for this, and you can I cover it all in the article if people want to go into it. We might get into some of the details in yeah. today. Uh, it's obvious that whoever wrote this sort of created it as like a forgery, so that people think that this is an ancient prophetic text that predicted their victory against Antiochus in the civil war, the, the rebellion, uh, the Jewish rebellion against their Greek overlords. And part of this storyline was the killing of Onias, who was a very revered, almost saintly like figure. So for so his assassination was like the thing, the, you know, the match that lit the fire basically it's like that really like, that's it. We're done here. Uh, and so they used that as to motivate people. So they, they sort of made it look like Daniel, this prophet uh, had hundreds of years ago predicted uh, that Onias would be assassinated and predicted that soon after God would come and vanquish their enemies and paradise would reign on earth kind of thing. Uh, so, you know, so that, that was what they wrote it for originally. Uh, and that explains some of the weird details in it. Like Daniel 9 has some very convoluted, strange mathematics in it. Uh, and uh, that the Onias thing, trying to make it fit Onias is, is the reason. Uh, for that but uh but when it failed like it predicted you know the end of the world was coming paradise would come and it didn't come now they won they won the war they so so that there was a partial success but the the prophecy still did not the rest of the prophecy wasn't fulfilled so uh what happens when prophecies fail all the time all religions they don't abandon the prophecy they don't declare it false no they reinterpret it right they say well it must it must have meant something else. And so then they reinterpret it as referring to some other future Messiah. And we have examples in the Dead Sea Scrolls and various other places uh, of where all these Jewish sects were trying to figure out what the real what, what the real prediction was, right? Now, the reality right. is that th there was never any intended prediction beyond this, right? It was, it was only intended for the war, uh, the Maccabean War. It was only intended for refer to Onias and so on. But continuing to try and make the you know, make the Bible code work for them to try and find a new Messiah. Lots of groups were doing this and they were trying to figure out what date would fit. Uh, and one of the best fits, like the easiest way to do it is, is the thirties AD, which actually like is what the Christians did, right? Is it's, they said, that's, you know, we can make the math work the thirties AD. Our guy died in thirties AD. Uh, therefore we have the real guy, our guy is the Messiah who was predicted, right? That's is this like pin the tail on the donkey kind of sort of? Like yeah. Uh, with no actual donkey. Uh, <laughs> but you, you claim that there's a donkey there and then you pin the tail on and say, that's the, where the tail goes. Okay. Right. <laughs> it's more like right. that. Uh, and, and the funny thing is I did a whole video for people who want like some sort of humorous and educational backstory on this for Wichita. And I've talked about this before, but uh, in, in my Wichita talk, uh, when Harold Camping predicted the end of the world, uh, and it was all, it was called Rapture Day, right? Like it was gonna be the end of the world. Uh, on Rapture Day, uh, Wichita, the atheist group in Wichita had me come out and give a speech on Doomsday. And my speech was, you're all gonna die. And and so you, if you if you Google, you're all gonna die, uh, uh, <clears throat> maybe we're all gonna die. I think it was, you're all gonna die. But anyway, it doesn't matter, you'll find it. Wichita, uh, uh, Rapture Day talk. And I go into how uh, the Jews kept trying to predict the end of the world and failing repeatedly, uh, and that this process led to Christianity. Christianity was caused by this. So it started with Jeremiah. <clears throat> That's a classic example of the origin of cognitive dissonance theory. Yeah, for this study of prophets, uh, the same thing, right? When prophecy fails, they just reinterpret it. They get stronger belief uh, rather than running away and giving up on it, right? So right. contrary to intuition, I think is the, is the thing there. But um, it started with Jeremiah. Jeremiah had a prediction about when the exile would end. He, the prediction was failed. It didn't come true. The exile ended earlier than he claimed it would. Uh, and so in Daniel 9, you see the first thing that happens is Daniel is begging God to explain how, why, how did you let the, Jeremiah get it wrong? What's going on? I don't understand. And then Gabriel comes down and says, let me tell you the secret. And then he like reinterprets uh, Jeremiah's prophecy. So it's a failed prophecy being reinterpreted. Uh, and of course, it conveniently works out to be Onias. Pre he was actually predicting Onias, yada, yada, and the victory over the, the Antiochenes and so on. Uh, and so that was the the Seleucids, so the victory over the Seleucids. So it was predicting all of that. Uh, then that prophecy failed because it predicted various things would happen that didn't happen. Uh, the end of the world didn't come, et cetera. So then 
the attempts to reinterpret the reinterpretation of the, the failed prophecy, you know, so it's got multiple failed prophecies, multiple failed reinterpretations that eventually ended up creating Christianity. So Christianity is actually a product of, it's another attempt to fix a broken failed prophecy. Uh, and so that's why Daniel is really important. They need that to be true because if Daniel's a forgery, uh, then the whole basis originally for Christianity kind of goes away. Like it, it, and it also like, creates the problem that if you're admitting that Christianity was started by a forgery, and if you're admitting that Christians revere a book that has forgeries in it, um, that undermines the whole religion because it's, well, what else is unreliable? What else is fallible? What else is a human creation in this? Uh, so Christians you really also bring up Maccabees. You also bring up like Maccabees wholeheartedly supports Daniel as if it's authentic. So now you've got yeah, Maccabees. And it's the first, the right, right. And that's the first time we hear of the book outside of the book, right? So it's conveniently right. It's created by propaganda for the Maccabees, and then immediately in Maccabean propaganda literature, they're plugging the book, right? Yeah. So it's like, you know, it's like social media. It's like, okay, we've we've created our fake fake news now. Let's promote the fake news uh, in our other channels. Basically, is what's going on there. Wow. So that that's that's the role of of that. So that, that's the impact of it. Um, and then then of course you get into the evidence as to how we know this. How did we figure this out? Basically. And it is I, the mainstream view, I have to say, like, that's why I say how we know rather than is, because the mainstream consensus is solidly on this, like only fundamentalists, only literalists, only desperate, hardcore believing Christians are against this conclusion. All, all the mainstream scholars, all, you know, the mainstream literature, all the mainstream uh, commentaries and the academic peer reviewed commentaries, they all agree it's a forgery. The evidence is overwhelming case so it, it's one of the clearest cases we have interesting look you you go through so much detail and i took lots of notes because i said there's no way i'll remember to actually go into some of these things and, and to have you maybe elaborate mm -hmm. for those who haven't read his article maybe it'll be good to have you kind of touch on some of these details i really recommend they go read it but if they just don't go read it at least they can see this and and actually know what the arguments are for daniel being a forgery um, the first thing I'd like to ask though, number one, let's start with the Jeremiah thing real quick. You did mention that he had a 70 year prophecy. This is happening back during the exile time that, Hey, after 70 years, you'll come back into the land. This is the idea, or at least God's going to keep his promise and do these things. Yeah. However, it takes it, according to this logic, it takes to the second century BC to kind of backdate and say we're fixing this problem because for hundreds of hundreds of years this isn't hasn't fulfilled so they're correcting a fellow prophet named uh uh jeremiah yeah. and they're keeping him as their good uh, we got to keep jeremiah on our side yeah uh, even though <laughs> jeremiah is fighting with other prophets during his own time yeah yeah these guys sure. get killed by the babylonians because he's saying look and i just did this with dr kip recently dr uh, kip davis he said, look, uh, Jeremiah is like talking about these false prophets. They're talking about we're going back to the land. And Jeremiah is saying, plant your, your vineyard. Do not try and mess with these dudes. Sure enough, whichever prophet, I guess, was on the right side of history, just like uh, Josephus. Um, they're the right guys. They're the guys you thumbs up because they're the ones who are correct. It's like a guessing game. But anyway, Daniel's yeah. fixing this problem. Daniel yeah. fixes this problem. And he thinks the world's going to end in his day, or at least something's going to happen. Yeah, well, I mean, think is, I mean, that's, uh, who are we talking about, the fictional character or the authors? I, I think the authors didn't really believe uh, that the end was going to transpire. They, they wanted they wanted people to believe that. Like, that's how you inspire people to war, uh, to fight harder and so on. Uh, so they definitely wanted people to believe that. But they, they obviously knew they were lying. They were making this up. So they, they, it wasn't like they thought that this was a genuine rescue of the Jeremiah prophecy. Uh, and they might have thought that maybe the Jeremiah prophecy could be rescued this way. Uh, and then they just inferred rather than knew <clears throat> what that meant, right? And so the rest is like, well, well we think it's going to be this. But we're going to sell it as a vision from the angel Gabriel. Uh, right? And, and I in my book, Not the Impossible Faith, I have a whole chapter, chapter 10 of that. Right, going to the anthropology of this is that this is how you sold ideas back then. Um, the the idea of selling ideas with evidence and reason, like you come up and make a like a valid argument for it, that's actually an invention of the Greeks, right? Like they, they started that notion uh, before that, and even outside that, concurrent with it. Most people and most people were very suspicious of that method. You had the idea like, well, we think it's just trickery. All rhetoric is just tricks. Uh, so they, they're very suspicious of the elite reason based, evidence based uh, mode of persuasion. 
most people bought the divine revelation. So you said, if God said it, right? And so you would come out and you would say, God told me this. And then if you demonstrate through your moral character and, and a charisma and things like that, that you must have God on your side, then people say, yes, God must have said this to them. And so Joseph that's how Smith. you sell things. Right. That's, I mean, that's an example of this phenomenon where if you, people are more trusting, ironically, or have been uh, up until recently, are more trusting of a visionary prophet who comes and says God told them something. And so you have to couch it as a revelation. It's the book of Revelation is another example uh, that that is completely fake. Um, that no, no such vision, I'm sure, occurred. Like you, I, someone asked me, like how we know that. And it's, you can look at the structure of it. It is very, it's very long, and it's very elegantly literarily constructed. Visions don't work like that. That is a work of fiction, um, and it was designed to sell a particular political point of view. Uh, and that, but that's how you package it. You said I was taken up to heaven, and God told me these things. It's that's like, how you sold it, right? Did that's you how ever you sold read? Did you ever read those books? They're not academic, but it's a divine revelation of heaven, a divine revelation of hell. This lady takes you like it's a whole book down to the details of how many heads were on the dogs, how many demons <laughs> had pitchforks. Like, and you're thinking, how do you remember all of these details? Duh, Jesus, the Holy Spirit taught me. Like, yeah. it's it's like, come on. So I'm with you, real quick. Shout out to Jonathan. Sheffield, yeah, I was, man. Gonna, I was gonna say that myself. Yeah. That Hey, Jonathan, how's it going? Yeah, Jonathan's a good guy. I like, I like hanging out with him and talking to him. He is a good guy. You've debated him a couple times. And of course, he's the guy, the YouTube channel. I ask you guys to go check out. I don't care if you disagree with him. Go there. His graphics and stuff are amazing. And it's good to know the counter arguments of things, as well as P Constellation Pegasus for giving me that super chat earlier. He said he's excited about this uh, show here. Jehovah's Witnesses have a book on Daniel and kept the kept me motivated for years. I'm very wow. interested in this talk. He said, okay. so, mm -hmm. so this is important for so many reasons, what you're talking about here, Dr. Carrier. And I think the first question we need to ask is who the hell is Daniel? Does Daniel even exist? And you mentioned yeah. something about a, a Ugaritic, uh, name for Daniel. He's similar to this, to these fictional characters like Noah and, and, um, Enoch, yeah, is he I, someone found in the Mesopotamian literature as well? Like, yeah, what is I mean, so basically, yeah, in the same way Noah is, right? So most people are more familiar with Noah is a character who's a ripoff of Babylonian Sumerian heroes. Uh, so the whole flood myth, right, is just right out of Gilgamesh and, and other related flood myths. It, it is an adaptation of it. And so Noah is just a reiteration of previous mythical heroes who did the same thing Noah does in the story, right? So, so that this is definitely a pre- Israelite thing that the Israelites just created their own version of the myth, right? So uh, that's pe more people. People are usually more familiar with that story. Uh, they're usually less familiar with the fact that Job is is clearly has a precedent in Jobab, which is another pre-Israelite. Uh, and and notably in Job, the book of Job, Job is not depicted as an Israelite. He is a foreigner, uh, and in fact uh, is a foreigner of the exact roughly the same culture and cultural region as Jobab that he's based on. So, uh, so that's a fictional mythical character, right? And and, uh, and then there's uh, Danel, and Danel is is a similar kind of like a a, cl a clever wise guy, a, a judge. Uh, I mean, wise guy, not wise guy, um, and uh, and and a, a good judge and of uh, people and things like that. So so for Daniel to be ported into. Uh, the Jewish pantheon, essentially, the Jewish mythology uh, is another example of it's just like what happened with Noah, just like what happened with Job, right? So, and it, when Ezekiel is the first one to reference Daniel, and he, he lists three men as the great wise men of yore, uh, and he lists Daniel, Noah, and Job. And so that's a dead giveaway. These are all foreigners. They're all sort of mythical heroes. They exist in a mythical time. They're not historical persons. And Ezekiel knows nothing about this Daniel being a contemporary of his. Uh, he has, knows nothing about him being Jewish, knows nothing about him being a prophet. So, so the earliest reference to Daniel is of these foreign, the foreigner, basically. So when Dan, and I, there are probably lots of stories circulating around this mythic hero, the same way there was for Utnapishtim and and the the other pre-Noah characters, right? They get changed and evolved and, and attached to the Israelite version of it. So there may have been myths developed over time, over hundreds of years. For after Ezekiel, attaching more like uh, co-opt Daniel as a Jewish hero, uh, attaching stories to him, or picking up the old story 
or is it from the other culture and then Judaizing them and so on? That's possible. We, we don't know because there's no like continuous record to show us what was going on in these hundreds of years. Uh, and um, But ultimately, yes, I, I, I lead with this. I only, I only do one paragraph on it and then I don't bring it up again because, or at least except by reference, because I don't think this is the key argument like this doesn't this isn't the reason we conclude daniel right. is a forgery um uh, but it is it is a piece of evidence that we need to take into consideration that you're being a little gullible and trusting that there even was a daniel uh right so uh so it is important to look at this history because we have the precedence of a lot of the old testament is really just rewrites of pre-israelite religious cultural myths and stuff and so daniel's appears to be a part of that tradition although it's a later edition uh, to it. Um, I think, I think, uh, right. the Prince of Persia was literally just trying to, um, fight us right now with your internet connection, but Gabriel oh. won out. <laughs> right. Let's hope he can continue to win out for this, <laughs> this interview here because what I lose what, what, what dropped. I didn't notice. Nope. Uh, I think they caught it, but, but it was like so <laughs> close. It was like almost 21 days. You know what I mean? Okay. And, uh, <laughs> but, but we're fasting still. So don't worry. We're good. Dennis R. Lecker. Thank you for the super chat. Just a shout out for the content, Derek regards to Dr. Carrier of whom I am a fan. Many people watching of course are definitely, uh, Awesome. Big fans. And Jim Jim Majors uh, is in the comment section. He's the gentleman. You need to go subscribe to his channel, which is Jim Majors, YouTube. And he's a PhD student on this specific topic. So you know he knows a thing or two. Which manuscript family does Dr. Carey prefer to use and why? LXX, Masoretic, et cetera. How does it uh, affect his interpretation of Daniel 9? Yeah, I don't. I don't really uh, have an opinion on that. I, I for this, I rely on Daniel experts. So I'm going by what's in the commentaries. Uh, the, you know, the Hermeneia commentary is like a, a prominent one. I follow Andrew Lecoq, for example, and I, so I, I look at the experts on this because I'm actually my field, my expertise is in Greek and Hellenistic, uh, uh, not in Hebrew uh, or Aramaic. So I, I have to rely on the experts in Hebrew and Aramaic for anything that I say. Uh, about those things so that that stuff is not coming from me that's that's coming from other experts who are actually are experts in that stuff uh so i don't rely necessarily on any particular manuscript family i look at what what are what reconstruction amongst all of them are the scholars uh relying on or if there's a dispute then uh, i either don't use it uh or i mention the dispute if that's the case right as to which manuscript to rely, to count on and so on um and so there's a lot of like disputes as to what exactly is in daniel 9 even from like uh, uh the, the dead sea scrolls which have lots of holes in them and traps so that the it, it, frustratingly there's pieces where we'd want to see what actual letter was in this exact spot uh, and it's missing so we can't answer the question so there's a lot of frustrating questions about reconstructing the exact text of daniel uh what what i do is i just rely on the broad strokes and and what we can reconstruct reliably and not rely on things that are uncertain, uh, essentially. Interesting. Okay. Thank you for that super chat real quick, Jim, uh, Steven Sorison. He says, how do you define Dr. Carrier? How do you define forgery? And then before you answer that dragons and Genesis podcast, which has interviewed you before Good as question. well, he says, Dr. Carrier is an, is an Android and the recent voice distortion proves it. So, Everybody watching, like, I this is that, evidence yeah. he's not really a human. <laughs> You're not even real. Uh, thank you for the super chat, though. Seriously, how do you define forgery before we even get to showing what it is? Yeah, I follow uh, Bart Ehrman on this. Uh, he, he wrote his book, Forgery and Counterforgery, which is the peer-reviewed academic uh, version of his popular book, Forged. Uh, he, it's a really excellent study on ancient forgery. It's probably the best, and it is actually the best study of ancient forgery that you'll find uh, today. Um, it, it means a text that is written deliberately it, as if coming from a person who did not actually write it. Uh, so, so I don't count as a forgery a book that's anonymous. So like if it's not claiming to be by anyone, then it's not necessarily a forgery. Uh, if it's claiming to have been written in a particular time that it was not, even if there's not a name attached to it, that's still a forgery because you're basically pretending to be an author you are not even if you don't, even not claiming who, whose name it is. Uh, so a forgery is basically pretending to be the author that you're not uh, and, and expecting to get away with it, uh, right? It's, so it's not like an exercise in fiction. Uh, so that's, that's what I call a forgery. And ultimately, for anyone who hasn't read that book, Dr. Ehrman shows in antiquity, this was not like a thumbs up thing to do. This was actually right, frowned yeah. upon, very negative. Uh, it was not a common practice. It was not good. And he goes extensively into this in his book. Yeah. By the way, Mark, very well done. Yeah. 
<clears throat> thank you for the super chat, but we're going to get this question at the end. Uh, if you want to super chat your question in the vein of the dialogue on Daniel and pertaining to the subject matter we're discussing, feel free to, I will reserve these super chats. Don't get me wrong. I'll, I'll make sure I get your question asked for super chatting at the end, but let's reserve it on the topic of Daniel as a forgery and how this has influenced uh, these topics. And I'll make sure I get it. I screenshot your question though. So, all right, <laughs> Dr. Carrier. Let's move into something here. If someone lived contemporary to the events taking place in Babylon, they would have never made this many historical mistakes. This is almost verbatim what you said in your article. Yeah. Darius the Great versus Cyrus the Great. Can you give us some details as to what, like, it's almost like someone in the cabinet of our current president not knowing what the president actually did or does or anything like that. So can you can you go yeah. into the details of what happened that makes you go, what? This does, like, how can you say he lived when he's saying he lived? Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, right. And, and, and I, I discuss like the different sides of this argument too, in the article, if people want to go in there, like the, the, the attempt to say like, well, Herodotus got things wrong. Do we say the Herodotus is a forgery? And the reason we don't is because the things Herodotus gets wrong are things we expect him to get wrong. Like there are things that he's not a direct witness to that he's getting to secondhand, thirdhand hearsay and so on. Um, but what we're talking about Daniel, Daniel, the author, purports to be an actual top ranking official in the Babylonian and then Persian kingdoms at the time that this material, these events are going on. That person could not possibly make all these mistakes. Like the mistakes are just too numerous, too extreme, uh, and, and are largely like they're hard to explain in any plausible way. Like you can come up with just so stories to explain them away, but they're, they're not probable. They're, they're not plausible stories, stories for why, why it is. Um, whereas, you know, he gets a lot of things wrong and they're the kinds of things you would expect someone to get wrong. Who's writing hundreds of years after the fact and doesn't quite, uh, doesn't have the history down uh, really well, which is expected at that time because history books, like really good spot on history books were not quite a thing yet. Uh, when mm -hmm. this, like they were just like, it was the, practice of history in this sense had just been invented right uh in the in the fourth or fifth century uh and and it only it gotten better a few hundred years later in the greek in the greek world so so the idea of 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 daniel like being able to find a reliable uh babylonian persian historical record with lots of good data like that that kind of stuff just wasn't easily available back then so it was easy to get things wrong uh, and because he's not a contemporary of the event. So he does. And then he has this whole long, like chapter 11, where he has this whole long prediction of the future uh, from, you know, Daniel's perspective, from, from you know, the, the sixth, fifth and sixth century BC, predicts the next several hundred years. And as you go through this prediction sequence, the details get more reliable as you get closer to the last 10 years of the reign of Antiochus and then get everything wrong uh, just before and after his death, right? So like it, it's the it's super accurate and, and also gets more detailed, right? So the details get more specific and get super accurate and reliable uh, in accounting events in that last 10 year period. So, so if you're looking at like gets everything wrong in the past, gets everything right in this 10 year period and then gets everything wrong after that 10 year period, that's a dead giveaway for when the book was written Right. So, right, so like, right, right. like we know, like, come on, like the, it's the probabilities are hugely weighted uh, yeah, because of this, that, that that is when they wrote. They wrote probably towards the end of that decade. Um, they wrote uh, not quite in 165. They had to have written sometime in 164 because they predict a war. Uh, they predict that Antiochus was going to go into Africa and conquer a bunch of Africa. And, and, and that didn't happen. Uh, and, uh, all, so, so the, the last part of Antiochus's life went differently than they predicted it would go because they did not foresee a particular historical event, which is that Antiochus probably would have conquered a lot of Africa, except Rome did not want that to happen. Uh, and basically, so Roman, the Romans sent an ambassador that basically told him like, yeah, if you do that, we're, we're coming after you like that. That's, you know, you're done basically you're cooked. So here's the line. You do not cross this. And it was just, it was like, they didn't send troops or anything. He sent the ambassador just to tell him this. Uh, and he says, well, all right. <laughs> Cause he knew like, there's a lot of backstory there. Like the, 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 the story of Pyrrhus uh, from which we get the Pyrrhic victory. It was a famous story by this time. 
Uh, and you know the term Pyrrhic victory is a victory that you won, but it cost you so much you may as well have mm -hmm. lost. Well, that comes from Pyrrhus, uh, who was uh, another one of the successors of, of Alexander the Great, um, who tried to conquer Rome. He tried to conquer Italy and stuff in the West. And uh, and he went and he, he invaded Italy. The Romans sent a legion, he wiped out the legion. And so the Romans sent two legions. And so he wipes out those two legions. And so the Romans raise and send out three legions. And I think he like barely like narrowly defeats those those legions. But then he famously equipped the line is like one more victory against the Romans and I'm done for. Uh, it, it was the thing, <laughs> right? So it's like uh, so he he failed, like he he didn't succeed. And so this created this sort of legend uh, of of undefeatable Rome, uh, basically. It's like, don't piss off the Romans was the this is the basic message of it. So and Antiochus gets this ambassadorial message, like uh, he, so he retires his whole plan to invade Africa. And no one could have foreseen that. Like the the uh, the authors of Daniel just did not foresee that Rome would do this, basically. And so uh, so this intervening event. So it shows that like this isn't a prophet writing this book. This is someone who knew the, those ten years really well, made that up as a prediction, then tried to guess at what was coming up next, and got it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and tried to get right what happened in the past and got it wrong. Uh, and so that's how we know that. Now, I noticed earlier uh, in the comment feed, someone did mention, uh, or no, it wasn't the comment feed. It was in um, on Facebook comments uh, on your post uh, announcing the uh, the show. Someone did mention um, that there is uh, two sections of Daniel. There's one to, chapter 1 to 6 and chapter 7 to 12. I think uh, I and, can go into this question, too, if you don't mind. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the super chat, too, because he's oh, like, yeah, that's, the that's perfectly book. right. Yeah, is yeah, that yeah, entire yeah. book of Daniel a forgery or some chapters? Maybe you can give us... Yeah, I do go yeah. into this. I, I have a paragraph on it in my article for people who want to go into it more. Uh, but the, the answer is yes, it's all a forgery, um, but it might not have all been made by the same person at the same time. So uh, the, the first six chapters, uh, there is a case to be made. It's not a decisive case, but I, it's an intriguing case. Like I... You know, I think it's a it's a plausible argument. I don't know if it's conclusive, but it's plausible uh, that the first six chapters were forged in the fourth century BC, um, uh, which is still a couple hundred years after the fact. It's still not really Daniel. So it's someone pretending to be Daniel telling these stories for some other purpose that we don't know because we know less about the historical context at that time. Uh, and then the chapters seven to twelve, those are very clearly originated in the second century BC. So some so if if the first six chapters were forged in the fourth century, then the the next six chapters were forged in the second century. So it's still all a forgery, but it's basically you think of it as two separate forgeries that got stuck together. Uh, and and we have a lot of examples of those kinds of things happening. And, and you, I mean, Daniel, they kept sticking more forgeries onto Daniel. So you have Bell and the Dragon, you have uh, Susanna, you have all these other. Daniel kept growing. People kept forging more Daniel and adding it on. Uh, so, so the idea of like accumulating more and more forgery over time is already established precedent. We already know for a fact that that was happening to Daniel a lot. Wow. So, um, so yes, it's still a forgery, but it, it could, it is possible that the first section was forged a few centuries earlier. Um, but uh, if you want to go into that more, there's a lot of good writings on this, commentaries and so on that cover the reasons why we suspect that might be the case. Thank you, Dr. Carrier. My my good friend Stephen says, if the Qumran sect considered Daniel to be authoritative, making at least eight copies, did they have no way to determine that it was a recent forgery? Um, well, to an extent, no. Like, how would you uh, without modern forensic methods? Uh, the in, in ancient times, the generally the only method you see for people just determining something as a forgery uh, is stylistic analysis. So, the, and they had a primitive form of stylistic analysis. We have much more advanced computational stylistic analysis now, uh, but they they had a primitive form of it where they, so they, a classic example is Hippocrates. Tons of Hippocr Hippocratic literature was forged. Uh, and this is a big problem in the medical community. They were really annoyed by this. Well, some defended it as no, no big deal, but others like saw it as a serious problem. And the way they would tell is like, if they would, they would pick what was the most reliable, like the earliest attested, Hippocratic texts, and they have a consistent style. So you say, well, okay, this is clearly written by one author. It The best bet, it, it is Hippocrates, because it clearly comes from that time. And then they would find forgeries that are written in a different style. And they say, well, this is clearly not written by that guy. So this is therefore a forgery. So that was the way they did it. Now, you couldn't do this with Daniel, because there's no previous Danielic literature. Uh, and ironically, uh, even if you had the first six chapters still floating around, they're in a different language than the next six chapters, right? So, uh, so this the stylistic analysis is kind of blocked there, right? Like you, it's you can't really do 
uh, stylistic analysis from, from analysis from uh, from Hebrew to Aramaic, like or at least you could today. But back then they didn't have the the skills or, or, or knowledge for how to do that effectively. But method is a separate question. Would they even want to? That's the more important question. I, I don't think they would have any interest at all in testing whether it was a forgery. And this is the big problem you have with apologetics throughout history from even the most ancient of times all the way up to now is that and I've been talking about this last month. A lot of my articles were about this is the idea that apologetics is actually specifically designed to avoid discovering the truth about things. It's designed to specifically justify things you want to believe. So it's clear that the Qumran community wanted to believe that Daniel was an authentic scripture. So they would never have bothered. They would never dared test whether it was a forgery. If they would do anything about it, they would write treatises, apologetic treatises, defending it as authentic right, uh, against anyone who would accuse it as being a forgery. But there wouldn't have been anyone accusing it as, who, of it being a forgery who wasn't on the other side of the Civil War, that, that in other words, the losing side of the Civil War. So no one's going to be listening to them if they're even alive at this point, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, so, so they're, they're just, we don't have um, newspapers. We don't have uh, letters to the editor of this battle over the authenticity of Daniel at the right. time of the publication. We don't get to hear the conversations. We don't get to hear what people in are light of the it. fact that so. it's trying to give an optimistic look for their people. It's like me and you hearing really good news about us in a very bad situation. And we're going to, Oh, you know what? This is, this is a fake news. Like you want to believe it. You, yeah, you, it's, um, <clears throat> it, yeah, it's right? more like, it's more like the fake news that comes out of OAN or Fox now, right? Like they just, people just believe it like gospel even though it's actually a lot of it's bogus uh, because they want to believe it. It's important for them that it be true. And Daniel was a crucial text legitimizing the Maccabean and Hasmonean reign. So the Jewish elite, priesthood and uh, political elite, definitely backed its authenticity they, because they needed to. Their legitimacy rested on it being an authentic document. So it had the full backing of the elite. Uh, including the most, you know, would have had the backing of the most prestigious priests and so on. So, so yeah, the, the, it would be very unlikely uh, to find a sect who was still around after that war that would be against the authenticity of Daniel. So, um, so the question is of, of about the Dead Sea Scroll sect. Like, clearly, they just they bought this as authentic, and they, they would have had no interest in trying to find out if it wasn't. Like, it would not have even occurred to them as a thing to admit to or look into. I think this is so interesting. Real quick, Dragons in Genesis is asking, you have any recommendation on books and articles to help us understand Daniel? Something yes. Like, yeah. um, I, I cite many. In fact, the best ones uh, in my article itself and with links sometimes. So uh, right early on, I talk about which commentaries are the best ones. Um, the Hermeneia commentary, I think, is is a really good one uh, if you can get a hold of it. Um, I think that Hermeneia commentaries tend to be expensive. Uh, but if when public libraries open up again, uh, you can usually get them through interlibrary loan if they don't already have a Hermeneia set. Um, and I recommend to people like uh, if you uh, just in general, like this is there are often um, if you find a seminary that you can get to. Uh, now, pandemic may have changed everything, but but normally uh, and possibly in future when things return to normal. Um, seminaries often have open libraries, like anybody can come in and use their library there. You can't check things out necessarily. They're research libraries. So you have to leave things there. Um, but I, I use seminaries all over the country, uh, to do, uh, work on this. So like, and they'll have all the commentaries, right? Both bogus and, uh, the best, right? So, uh, so all kinds of stuff. So uh, good journal collections in religious studies and in Christian apologetics and so on. So seminaries are a thing to look at. Look, see if there is a, a, a library in a seminary near you that is open to the public. If you want to do this kind of looking up things, like if you want to check the best commentaries on the Bible and, you know, those commentaries cost one, $200 if you're going to buy them. Uh, but if you want to just go peruse them, uh, there might be a seminary around that has them. But even if not, your local public library can interlibrary loan it for you uh, from anywhere in the world. So um, but that's what I recommend to people who want to dive into this, unless you're going to bankroll it, like you go buy the books, uh, yeah, yeah. you know, if, if, if you're that interested. Uh, but anyways, yeah, so best articles, best books, they're they're listed throughout my article on my website. Um, so that's Thank the best place to go. Thank you so much. That. Appreciate the super chat. Dragons and Genesis, go subscribe. Check it out, ladies and gentlemen. I need to ask you this one here. Maybe you could spend a little time giving us the detail. You do this in your article, and I know that this is just kind of recapping in a way, but there's also yeah. things you're going to mention that you don't say in your article, I'm sure. Yeah, of course. Um, you talk about the Sal, the Sal Trap. I hope I'm saying that right. Sal Trap. Uh, that King Cyrus Say Trap. Or say say trap. Yeah, the Say Traps. Okay, explain what that is, because when I read that, I don't even know. I'm not 
look, it's I'm a, not it's a, a Persian, it's a Persian term. So it's, it's not, it doesn't correspond to any English word. Can you uh, tell me what that is and what the problem is with the whole Darius, the great Cyrus, the great who made yeah, it? It's, what? So a satrap just, is just a means governor. Like, so like the, uh, you know, in the way that the Romans, they would assign proconsuls as governors of provinces. And we today would use the word governor. So we'd say that so-and-so is the governor of Syria or so-and-so is the governor of Spain under the Romans. Um, the Persian word is satrap, but it just means governor, basically. It's, it's, it's someone that you appoint to run a province. Uh, so um, so that's, that's all it means. And the, the question about the satrapies, the, the provinces, is how many there were and who created them. Uh, and you know, in a historical reality, uh, Cyrus the Great, who actually was the Persian conqueror who set this whole system up, uh, he started the idea of satrapies and satraps. Darius the Great, who was several uh, successions later, he was not the successor to Cyrus, but you know, there were a few other kings in between, but eventually then Darius the Great took, took over. Uh, and then he did an important reorganization of the satrapies that, that made the history books with some confusion as to the details. Um, and so, uh, the, uh, author of Daniel just point blank says Darius created the satrapies, which is not a entirely accurate way to put it. Uh, and also, um, uh, it, uh, it incorrectly states the number of satrapies. It says 120 of them, but there were not even more than two dozen really. Uh, so, uh, and, and so the, the it gets the number of satrapies wrong. It gets wrong the, the exact history of how they were developed and who made them and so on. Um, and so, but it, it's, it makes sense for someone to like confuse these things and confusing Darius the Great with, the important thing is Darius the Great uh, did do an important reorganization of this. So his name was associated with this development. So when Daniel says Darius the Mede did this, uh, that's the clue that, that, that they have mistaken Darius the Great for Darius the Mede, which is, there's no such thing as Darius the Mede. It's a fictional character. Uh, they've got confused, I think, possibly on purpose because there's a prophecy about how the Medes would conquer Babylon, and that didn't happen. It was the Persians. So I think whoever's authoring Daniel might have deliberately made Daniel a Mede and argued for it, him being a Mede in order to also satisfy the prophecy, right? It's kind of like mm -hmm. inventing history to satisfy the prophecy. It's like inventing the nativity to make Jesus fit prophecies of the birth of Messiah, right? Like the, it's all fake right. history, um, but you know, like the, you know, it, but it's the, uh, it's, so it's not real history, but it's designed to satisfy prophecy. It's possible that Darius the Mede was invented as a character uh, for that. And he's based on Darius the Great. Like, so it's, so they've conflated different rulers and they've, they've made, basically made Darius the Great into Darius the Mede and then changed when he reigned and then changed the exact details of what he did and uh, in order to fit their narrative of what they wanted to sell. Some of that might've been just historical error. Some of it might've been deliberate. I think in your apologetics uh, section of the article, you mentioned something about uh, the canon being closed potentially in the fifth century BC and that this would be the reason why someone who's writing this might uh, try to mm -hmm. push us back into the sixth century and act like, no, 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 this was, this is before everything was like yeah, closed. It's, or... it's important to get the, that distinction correct. The The idea of closing the canon did not occur in the 5th century BC. It occurred probably right around the time that Daniel uh, is, or possibly a century before the, when Daniel was forced. So we're talking like 3rd century BC, maybe. Uh, the, the idea started arising in the 3rd, maybe 2nd century BC. The, the idea started arising that anything written after the fifth century couldn't be scripture. It, it could only be man-made human stuff. Uh, and so, and so the idea that's hundreds of years later. And so they kind of like blocked the canon then, right? And they said, anything, anything, anything after fifth century, we're not going to count as scripture. <clears throat> now there was no official decision. This wasn't like something someone just said. Right. Uh, it was just a general sense of like this idea. Eventually it coalesces a few more centuries later until into an actual doctrine. Uh, but that was like after even the Jewish, the second Jewish war, like the Roman Jewish war. Uh, so, um, but the idea was floating around around the time of Daniel. So the, the idea was there that anything that claimed to have been written after the fifth century would be suspect. Right. So, mm -hmm. so at that, in that atmosphere, yes, of course, you're going to create a document that purports to be written in the sixth century or fifth century to be conveniently meet the, the deadline. Um, so, so yeah, that, that, that there is a causal explanation there that, that fits. And uh, so I, I think that that makes sense of it.
So you're telling me Daniel did not predict the Roman Jewish war. How the heck did no. he not do that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know apologists want this to be the case, but uh, you really have to twist uh, the original context and uh, to get it to fit that way, basically. So, I mean, this is an, a valid point because you mentioned Onias the third. I believe I saw Jim Major's comment that there were two uh, priests mentioned in it was it Daniel nine where this is mentioned or eleven or well anointed. Let's be clear. Anointed. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so it, it, using the language of prophecy, which is always deliberately vague, so you can match more things. It, it sounds like prophecy if you're not hyper specific, right? So, right. so they they try to be use these vague terms like you know, the prince and the anointed. And like, what do you mean exactly? And I was like, well, you know what we mean. But um, so that sounds more authentic as prophecy if you use these vague terms. Uh, so uh, so anointed and anointed, like priests were considered anointed. So they were Christ's in that sense because they were uh, the, you know, priests and kings were often considered anointed uh, people. So, um, so that was a, a legitimate way to refer to a priest and to call, a, you know, the principal anointed that is just sort of like prophecy speak for chief priest, high priest, right? So yeah, that's that's going on there. But in in the mathematics in Daniel nine, there, it that's does what I was going to ask you to get it. It, it refers mind. to two anointed figures, and so it kind of links them with two different overlapping periods of time. One is a forty nine year period of time. One is a four hundred thirty four period year period of time. And why they're doing this, you got to you got to read my article to get understand them why they're trying to make the Jeremiah prophecy work all this legitimate they had to do to get it to work, to make it sound impressive and, and so on. Uh, and, and in fact, this shows that they're writing for this period. Like they, they're writing for the Seleucid period because they tried so convolutedly hard to get this Jeremiah prophecy and to explode out all this complicated math to try and get it to fit Onias. And it does exactly fit Onias, right? But there's two periods. The one is the 434 years, which fits Onias. And then the other is the 49 year period. Uh, and so there's still dispute in the commentaries as to which anointed that one refers to, right? Um, and in my opinion, the, the math works out, the exact 49 year period works out for Cyrus the Great. Uh, and we know Cyrus the Great was considered an anointed. He was considered the Messiah because he rescued the Jews, basically. He restored the temple and so on. So they, they actually gave him sort of honorary messianic status. Uh, and, and and we know this. This is in the Bible, right? It actually right. says this, right? So um, so I think the first anointed is meant to be Cyrus. So it's the 49-year period between, I can't remember, the the, the final exile, the, the, the final event that exiled the Jews, which is 484 or whatever, um, in the 480s, when they were finally pulled out of Jerusalem and, and brought out of uh, Israel uh, and in, in the exile. And 49 years later, Cyrus the Great comes in and conquers and, and issues his decree that returned, it, it releases the Jews and returns them to their home and rebuilds their temple. And that 49 year period lines up with Cyrus the Great. So I think the first anointed the authors intended to mean to be a reference to Cyrus. Uh, and then the second one is to Onias. Uh, and and the, the convoluted ways that that works out is you have to read uh, read my article and then the commentaries that I'm basing it on. So. Yeah, your article really deals with this issue bad. And I wanted to ask about this time gap that I think is important when people try to stretch us to the New Testament real quick. But mm -hmm. uh, Arian, my friend, actually has a super chat. I appreciate the super chat, brother. How do fundamentalist Christian scholars deal with the historical second century BC mistakes? Now, in your article, you mentioned yeah. some of this. Oh, yeah. I go, the whole article is designed to address exactly what you're talking about, uh, what uh, uh, Arjun is talking about, which is. Um, yes, obviously they have elaborate just so stories to explain away all of this evidence, right? And to make it be an authentic text. Um, and so I go into what those arguments are. And, and not only do I show that why they're wrong, but I go into the, the general principle behind the, even making these arguments is illustrative of apologetics as a methodology. And so I go mm -hmm. into like, like how this differs from history as a methodology. And so I, I use these as teaching examples of that, but I go into all of the main arguments that they try to pull. I, I mean, there, there's a variety, there's a whole ton of them. Um, like trying to get Darius the Mede to be someone else, uh, right? For like, they, they find another actual historical figure and say, well, that was Darius the Mede. And Daniel's talking about that guy. And like, it doesn't really fit, doesn't really work, uh, but it's what they try. And there's other things like they say, like, um, you know, really Nabata, Nab Nabodinus? Am I saying that right? I don't, uh, Babylonian I don't, here. Don't I don't speak Babylonian, me, but um, Nabodinus was the father of Belshazzar. Belshazzar was just the regent for the actual king uh, of Nabodinus. And so Daniel, uh, the author of Daniel, doesn't know about Nabodinus, and he thinks Belshazzar was the king. And he also thinks Belshazzar was the son of someone else. Uh, like, like gets the, these details wrong. And so uh, uh, fundamentalists will uh, go in and try to 
come up with just so stories such that this could still be true, right? Like, so they, they, right. the various excuses and ways that they try to get it to, to, to go and work out that way. And so if you want to see what those arguments are, and I even linked to some of them, so you can actually go read uh, the original apologetics themselves and not just take my word for it um, uh, in my article. So you can go through detail by detail if you're, if you're interested in those things. But they, what I show in there is that none of them are historical logic. Like at no point do they actually argue like a historian. They, they are, they're trying to rationalize a preconceived right. conclusion uh, and then coming up with just so stories to explain all the evidence without presenting any evidence that those just so stories are true or even probable. Uh, and and that's that's the difference between apologetics and history. Uh, and and that's I what I use the article to explain. I think it's useful for people to like see that distinction so you can start seeing it in other arguments and other uh, places for other things. Thank you, Dr. Carrier. There's so much more we can add to that about this, just this idea of cognitive dissonance, because I know I've experienced it before. So mm -hmm. uh, Stephen's back at that six dollars and sixty six cents. I appreciate it. Since, <laughs> yeah, I love it. <laughs> since Christians connected Onias the third to Christ, Daniel nine, might they have also connected Michael's rising, Daniel 12, with Christ's resurrection? This, this is an interesting question. So um, yeah. Uh, I, I think yes. Uh, do I at this moment, as I speak now, do I think I can prove it? No. Uh, so it is a suspicion that I have. Uh, and you know, the, the Jehovah's Witnesses actually do say this, right? They they say that Michael is Jesus, like they've made that equation. Um, and uh, but when I look at the text of Daniel, I think Daniel, the authors of Daniel, are making that equation. I think they're saying that the the Messiah is well. Like they, they list three anointed or three three princes, basically. You know, one is the Cyrus, one is Onias, and the one that comes to enact everything. Uh, you know, the end of the world is Michael. But um, but the way it's written, it sounds like the, there's an overlap between the last mm -hmm. two anointed, so they're meant to be the same person. So like Michael is the return of Onias or something. I don't I don't know. But uh, when the Christians wrote. Uh, when the Christians reinterpreted this, I do suspect the Christians thought that Daniel was saying that Michael and Jesus Christ are the same. Uh, and, and, and so, um, and I, I have a footnote in On the Historicity of Jesus where I lay out why I suspect this, but it's only in a footnote. I never rely on it as an argument. Uh, I, so I, I, don't, I don't use it as data because it's, it's not something we can prove. However, someone sent me a book recently that I'm, it's in my stack of things, um, which is this book, which is a peer-reviewed uh, book, Michael and Michael Christ. Christ. Hmm. Um, and, uh, th this is actually good scholarly text that I'm, I haven't gotten into yet, but I, he, he explores this theory in detail and, and I think he comes down on my side on this. So I, I'm super excited to go read that book and see if he proves the case. Cause I, I think that's what, I think that's what was really going on. It's, and if you do that, you can actually draw a lot of other connections between Jewish and Christian theology, once you've done that, once you've made the equation between Jesus and Michael, a lot of other stuff starts to make sense. Uh, and we know there were these esoteric teachings. So we know, like Ignatius talks about, there's some sort of complex angelology that's part of the secret mystery teachings of Christianity that he can't go into. Like he mentions it. He'd, so, and uh, you know, there's a lot of other these these kinds of parallels, these sort of secret teachings. And even in before this, Judaism had this idea that the uh, the supreme archangel of archangels, who was the high priest of God's temple, is called the angel of many names, right? So they're, they're so even they they're admitting that this there's this angel is represented in their literature under many different names. So they're starting to pile these angels together and equate them as one angel, um, and that happens to be the same angel that Paul is equating Jesus with in the epistles, and that's demonstrably true. I, I show that in on the on the historicity of Jesus. Uh, that doesn't tie directly to Michael, but there is a route from there to Michael because the angel of angels that uh, that that Paul is linking Jesus to. Uh, was also the high priest of God's celestial temple, the real temple, the true one in the seventh heaven. All Michael in tradition is the high priest of God's temple uh, in uh, some Jewish traditions around the same time. So you, you can you can draw the lines, right? So uh, uh, I, I think there's something there. I, I just at this point I, I haven't seen a proof of it, um, but it is a plausible theory. That's the same. So real quick, uh, I think um, this is a comment, but maybe we can address this after we're done with the Daniel focus. Most, uh, and thank you for the super chat too. Notice it's six one six. I was someone just going to say, someone is a real trivia hound there. Uh, someone you know is the variant, the variant exactly. reading, there, right? <laughs> Most common objection I get to forgeries in the New Testament gospels being anonymous, Jesus not existing, is the people back then had no doubt about these things. So. Um, thank you for the yeah, super chat, my friend. That's always a strange argument. Um, 
it's it's like saying you you go to a, to a gullible person who just believes all kinds of crazy stuff, and then you ask them why do you believe this stuff, and they say because those gullible people over there believe it. Um, yeah. That's not a good argument. <laughs> well, because my yes, ancestors, of course, uh, it. People, you know, yeah, but be believers had motivated reasoning. They believed things because they wanted to believe them, not not because of evidence based reasoning. That I mean, that hadn't even been invented really until the Greeks started doing it, and the Christians were very Christians and Jews are very suspicious of it as a methodology. Like it only sort of filtered into Christianity over time. Like it, it wasn't it wasn't an original doctrine. Uh, in fact, they're very hostile to evidence based reasoning. I, I have a whole chapter on this in. Uh, the Scientist in the Early Roman Empire, which is my book on um, ancient that science. Book, uh, if dude, are that in book that. was so um, much. Oh my gosh, that book was so much on Audible. It I is a wow, thorough book. Yes, it's very thorough. Um, but I have a whole section in there on um, the anti-intellectualism of the early Christian movement, uh, and that it softened over time. But originally, like they were very, very antithetical to what we would call critical thinking and evidence-based reasoning. They, they saw it as more demonic, as something untrustworthy. Uh, wow. Like, how dare you? How dare you question, uh, right, is the is the attitude. Uh, so when people who are like you, oh man, to answer back these, to God, right? Yeah, the people who believe these things, they believe them because they want to, <laughs> not necessarily because there was good evidence to believe them. Uh, and so you find, a, I have a lot of articles on, on my blog about showing how Christians just back then just made up stories and then people just believed them like they, they they shouldn't have there wasn't any good reason to believe them but they just did because they wanted to it sounded right uh and so that's how people thought back then so it, it that isn't reliable another side of this is that all the people we could have consulted who would have fact checked these things we don't get to hear from them like none of their books are preserved we, or even if they wrote books right so like if if anyone questioned this stuff we don't know what they said we don't know what they found uh, so, uh, because that stuff wasn't preserved, that wasn't in the interests of medieval Christians to preserve any of that stuff. Uh, so, so we don't know, right? So like, like the, the, you can't say that, well, no one gainsaid it. No one challenged it. And so, well, actually they might've, uh, we don't know. We don't, we don't have the books and literature that would tell us whether or what. So, uh, we can't make statements about what wasn't said, uh, at any given time. Thank you, Dr. Carrier. Constellation Pegasus. Thank you, my friend. I forgot about Jehovah's Witnesses saying <laughs> Michael is Jesus. Happy I forgot, I forgot about, about that. that. <laughs> yeah, this channel is great. Thank you so much, man. I appreciate it. And then uh, Black Lion Supreme, my friend from the Dagger Squad team, uh, yeah. which you were on the Dagger Squad, yeah. of course. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Hello, Derek and Dr. Carrier. Is it true that the last consensus on historical Jesus was done in the 1920s and what is the source of the criteria of reliability? Thank you both. Now we're now yeah. we're going off into historicity. We're going off into other things. But uh, that's I, true. I, can I add to that and just say that I was trying to use Daniel when I interviewed Dr. John J. Collins to kind of ask Dr. Mm -hmm. Collins, like, do you think this angelic Christ figure could, because he believes that the son of man in Daniel, one that looks like the son of man, Mm -hmm. He said he wouldn't look like if he really was a human. He says he right. thinks it's an angel. That's why it says he looks like a son of man and tries to get over into the New Testament. Anyway, address his yeah. super chat. Thank you for the 10. But uh, you know what I mean? I tried to see what he said. And he said, no, 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 that didn't happen. So, <laughs> yeah. uh, so, uh, so two things here on this one. Um, so the consensus has been around, f you know, since then. But what, what I think is being referred to here is the last time a peer-reviewed book was written specifically defending the historicity of Jesus as a axiom, right? Ever since then, it's been an axiom, but no one has really written a book defending it. They just assume it's the case and then argue for a particular kind of historical Jesus. That's what most literature has been since then. But the last book that even addressed the historicity issue, uh, actually the last peer-reviewed academic book, like, like last not amateur, like serious uh, address of this debate, uh, and it came out on the side of historicity. The last one made was 1923. Uh, and that's Shirley Jackson Case uh, wrote the, the, the classic book. Uh, and that is, that's just been repeated over and over again. People keep will either keep citing that book or will cite people who cite that book. Uh, and that, that's it. They just keep like citing. There's this endless line of citations that ends at Shirley Jackson Case 1923. Um, no one has really done a proper peer reviewed uh, defense of historicity. Uh, and the only books that have been peer reviewed that have addressed historicity are both now uh, on the side of non historicity. So uh, it's high time uh, for the field to wake up and actually do a proper peer reviewed book that actually addresses the two peer reviewed books against uh, so that we can finally have a good 
like best case for historicity. I want to see this. I thought Did Jesus Exist by Bart Ehrman would be this, but he, he it's not a peer reviewed book. It's kind of like something he just wrote off the seat of his pants really quickly. And it's really sloppily argued and really sloppily constructed. I was shocked and surprised by this. Uh, it's different from a lot of his other work and that is poorer quality than his other work. Um, he doesn't like it when I say this, but uh, that that's, it's just true. And if people want to see this, I actually demonstrate this uh, in my article, um, Bart Ehrman recap. So people go to that article, they can see I itemize 31 points where he's just not following sound methodology or even saying true things, uh, which is alarming. Um, wow. But th that's it, right? And then there was K uh, Casey came out with another non-peer reviewed popular market, almost like a tabloid trash book. Uh, and, and so no one has really done a serious treatment of this uh, in, in a proper sense, right? Of really analyzing the pros and cons and coming out on either I, side uh, or for historicity. Say, if I could say, um, just for those who are watching who might be historicists and whatnot, you literally cited uh, Ehrman earlier about, so you're not yeah. like, you're not a, you don't have a chip on your shoulder toward the guy. Right. So yeah, no, he, he produces good popular market summaries of uh, consensus of the mainstream consensus. Like Jesus interrupted uh, is that that is the book you should read. There's no better book to read. If you want to catch up yourself to what is the mainstream consensus in Jesus studies, not the fundamentalist consensus, not, you know, but what, what is the actual mainstream scholarly consensus on things? Uh, even when he's wrong, even when the things he says in that book are wrong, uh, they are at least, ac they're accurately representing what the consensus is, right? So I think, so in that sense, the book is valuable, right? So if you wanna know, so I always pair it with Bible Unearthed. The Bible Unearthed is the, is the version of that for the Old Testament. Uh, by Finkelstein and Silberman. Uh, they, they wrote a book that's on the mainstream consensus regarding the Old Testament. Uh, and then, you know, Ehrman has basically written the equivalent for New Testament studies. Those are those are two good books. And a lot of his other popular market books are good as well. Uh, but his peer-reviewed work is is pretty solid. Like So like Forgery and Counterforgery is an excellent work. Um, and, um, you know, Orthodox Corruption of Scripture is another really good uh, good book that I recommend. I enjoyed people. misquoting Jesus, too. That was a really good one. Um, yeah, and that's another example where he's relaying what the mainstream consensus is. He's not doing some radical new thing. Like, he's just saying, this is what we, we as scholars already know or think. Uh, and it, this is not being communicated to the public. The pulpits right. aren't telling you. So so he's writing books, communicating it. So he's done a very good service in doing that. Uh, I, I have issues mm -hmm. a lot with his historical methodology. Um I think when he does it under peer review, he does a better job uh, when he than when he does his own historical reasoning. Um, he's a much better textual critic. That's his actual field uh, is textual criticism. Like he's a master of that. He studied under Bruce Metzger, like the great Bruce Metzger, which is you know the greatest textual critic of the Bible uh, in the 20th century. So um, he, that he has nailed. Like that he that he usually has pretty well done. Um, but as a historian, it's hit or miss, except for his peer reviewed work, which tends to be pretty pretty good. Thank you so much for that 10 Black Line Supreme. Aryan, thank you. Even your friend Tovia Singer admits that Daniel 1 through 6 were written by the Great Assembly. The G Great Assembly apparently also wrote on behalf of Nebuchadnezzar. Um, yeah, and I am, look, I, I'm friends <laughs> I, with I don't know where any of this is coming from, but uh, uh, this always mystifies He's me. Orthodox like, Jew, by the way. Yeah, uh, like there's no evidence for this. This is just a story someone is telling. Uh, there's no evidence for this at all. Uh, so um, that's an example of a just so story. Like people just start telling stories about how these books got written or whatever. But when you go look at the time, the actual centuries when these things were going on, like, these stories don't exist. Like there, so this is there's no evidence for this. Um, so yeah, I, we we can't really we can't really buy that. Thank you, Doctor Carrier. Thank you, Arian. Thank you so much. I hope I'm like pronouncing your name with that J there. I'm not trying to say Arjun anymore. David Stevens says Carrier is Jesus made flesh. You rock, Carrier. <laughs> All right, that's an exaggeration. Uh, let's let's not get let's not get too crazy here. <clears throat> yeah, well, I appreciate. Thank you so much for the super chat, David. Throwing a whole fifty at me. Nice, I appreciate it, man. Do I need to take a, a clothing article off? I mean, what's up? <laughs> <laughs> Look, my friend, I read between the lines. Is his name? He actually wrote me. He's like, Derek. It's it's literally read and between lines. And I was like, awesome. <laughs> so thank you for the ten, man. Good nice. luck. I appreciate nice. it. Always uh, looking out for you, for your friend here, man. Thank you. If Christianity was a mystery, Cole. Okay, here we go. Dude, we're getting off. We're getting off track here. So <laughs> I'm gonna screenshot. I'm gonna screenshot this Indo, and we're gonna deal with this in just a moment when we finish up with Daniel. If that's okay, I just have a few more things I want to touch on. If that's okay, 
um, Daniel's use in Christianity. Yeah. Like, how do they calculate? Because you're the math guy. You're the Bayesian theory guy. You're the big, like, I can't even keep up with you on this Bayesian <laughs> uh, methodology of, like, prior probabilities and stuff. Um, one day maybe, but I just don't have that mathematics skill. The furthest I went is calculus in high school. <laughs> and that was before I did many drugs in between then and now. And so I just have lost memory if it comes to that idea. So <laughs> math <laughs> and calculus is a completely different, completely I'm just different saying, mathematical field. So that's literally, theory, yes. So, and, but anyway, uh, proceed. You're, you're getting to Daniel. What? Yeah. What the math, the math, like how did Christians, what did they do? Where did they, how did they calculate this and say, look, we got to make sure this lands on Jesus in the thirties. And somehow it relates to the temple's destruction, especially when you look at Mark and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah. 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 You, you can easily okay. find this online. There's a million internet pages where Christians are showing you this. Um, but it, it, what they do is that, so the original authors in Daniel, they, they separate out a 49 year period and a 434 year period. Um, so what Christians do is they don't separate them out. They take it as one continuous period of those, uh, sequentially. So that's one whole period of those together. Uh, and then they, then they start looking for how to interpret, cause it, it says the clock starts from the time the word went out. And so they can reinterpret, they can choose which word went out, right? Like which, which thing are we talking about here? Now the authors meant when Jeremiah published his prophecy. That, that, that's clear from the context and the original intent of it. Um, but if you can change that and say, well, it was like the, when the decree that Cyrus gave that freed the Jews, or you could pick a variety of different starting points right. and, then pick a, and then choose your calendar because there's different, there's lunar calendar, there's solar calendar, there are different lunar calendars. And so what constitutes a year you can dicker around with. And so you can convert one lunar calendar into a solar calendar and thus gets a few more years out of it. So you can, you can really play around with how the math works out and get a date. Uh, and the date can be, it, can, it lands in various places. There's a lot the Christians who make these arguments often make mistakes in the arguments. Um, but uh, you know, like mistakenly start wrong starting point or wrong year or adding the math wrong or whatever. Um, so that it get, you get a bunch of different results depending on what you plug in. Um, but the results, when you do this particular Christian approach, uh, come between like 28 and 38 AD, I think somewhere in like it falls in that, that area. And, you know, some claim they can get exactly the 30 or exactly the 33 or something like that. I, I that might be a little dodgy, but, um, that's what they do. And so I, I did talk about this ages ago. It's on uh, secular web. One of my articles on, uh, Oh, Newman on prophecy. So my article on Newman on prophecy which talks about the methodology of evaluating prophecy. So people who want methods on this will, will find that useful. It's even though it's, I wrote it ages and ages ago. Uh, it has some, it has a section on the 77's, pro 77's prophecy and with footnotes that talk about how the math works and different ways to do the math. Uh, so we really, really want to like dig into that. And I, that's not even complete. Like there are more ways to like arrange the math than, than the ones I even talk about. Um, but uh, but the, the ones I talk about are the more popular ones. Like Julius Africanus is like the first, the third century Christian apologist who, who really is the first one to publish a version of this math, uh, right? So, um, so that that's like the earliest version of it. Uh, but you can you can see my article on Newman on prophecy covers some of the angles on that. It's interesting because like modern ideas, if you will, we saw Harold Camping. How did he know, or what was he doing in his head to make him think that day? Like, <laughs> you know, you know and, I, I didn't, I never looked into that because I didn't care. <laughs> it, it would just be interesting um, in light of what you're right. saying. And in 1840 something, the Millerite movement, I can't remember exactly, but they thought 4,000 years or some calculation directly from a day for whatever yeah. reason, this was right. going to be the day, you know, yeah, what, yeah, what yeah, made yeah. them think that? I, I mean, yeah, you could go into it and find a, a convoluted logic of some kind uh, and, and how they keep changing it. Yeah. These things disinterest me, so I, I never really yeah. look into those details. Uh, there are a couple books, by the way, on apocalypticism. Um, I can't remember their titles right now. I, I do reference them. I reference them in my Wichita talk, I think. Uh, but uh, so, so people want to look at there, there are two good books that cover the whole history of predicting the end of the world. Uh, and so if you want to like get a dive in on all the different ways that was done and why and so on, uh, one or both of those books would be the way to go. I, I unfortunately, off the top of my head, I can't remember their names, but you're not um, omniscient <laughs> nor infallible. Yes. Yeah. My, <laughs> my memory is, it has limitations. Well, 
Sean, thanks a lot, man. I'll keep my shirt on just for you guys. I appreciate it. And uh, <laughs> thanks for the super chat. Uh, look, Crossover Maniac, thank you for the super chat. Is there some parallels mm -hmm. in the creation of the Gospel of Mark and the Book of Daniel? Do you see similarity in how they were created? Um, I don't know how to answer that. Uh, literarily, I, perhaps. I was going to say, can I add something to that? Like, yeah. you know how the temple is destroyed and we see what we would call ex eventu. Like, it seems like it knows something already, even though it's putting it into the 30s. We know it was written after the temple's war, right. uh, the, the, this destruction. However, there are like this anticipation of the parousia and stuff that's supposed to come too. So some of that's this didn't point. happen and some of it did. Yeah, that's a good point. That is one similarity, is that Mark is pretending... Well, he doesn't really say when he's written. He's not pretending to be a particular person. He's not... Pre so so Mark is not a forgery, per se, because when it was originally published, it was attributed to nobody. Uh, and and it nowhere in there says that they were a witness or they talked to a witness or anything. They, it's just... They just tell a story. They're like a, a bard with a leer, and they're just... Or a bard with a liar. They're just, they're just telling their story. Um, that, that's how Mark is written. Mark is written very much in the classic model of, of myth at the time, the way, the way, right. uh, the way you would just tell stories, the way storytellers would just tell stories, not the way it's not written the way histories were written back then. Um, so, uh, so it's very much in that vein, uh, and it's much more in the, the mythic biography genre. So it's, it's different from Daniel. Um, Mark has a lot of different literary models. So like Mark is using the, what we call the pericope model, but that's a word that, uh, in, this from biblical studies in uh, when they weren't talking to classicists, classicists had a, their own word for it, which comes from the ancient rhetorical manuals, which is, it's called crayi, which is these, these are the same things where you tell a little unit of a story and then you stack these units together to tell a bigger story. And then even the arrangement of the units tells a story un, un, unto itself. So you have sandwiches and circular uh, ring structure and so on. Um, Mark is definitely using Greek rhetorical techniques uh, in, in a way that the authors of right. Daniel did not. Um, so, uh, so, so there's, I see more differences and similarities, but you, you can point to similarities. Obviously Mark is aware of Daniel. So, so Mark is like riffing on Daniel in some ways. Uh, so there's a lot of different threads you could pick at in terms of what their connections are. Uh, but I, I wouldn't say that they're like strongly paralleled, uh, in literally. Revelation in is, and, and the King below says you're the goat. No question. <laughs> Just letting you know. And I, you know what that means, I'm sure, by now, right? No, I don't know what that means. I'm you out do of not way. know? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. That means you live on a farm. No, I'm just kidding. Um, no, you're, you're the man. Let's put it that way, bro. You're okay. The, you're you're yeah. a beast. You're a beast. Okay? They don't want none. none of, but nobody wants none of that. You know what I'm saying? Uh, <laughs> no, the book of Revelation, I think we, we need to – um, couple more points. And then I'd like to get into these other super chats and any other questions. I don't give a crap mm -hmm. what the question is. If you want to super chat it, you can, we got a couple on the side just because our time's running out and you and me, like time goes by so quick. So yeah, I know, right. The, the book of revelation, <laughs> we had a good question earlier and it, it was just in passing, but it was irrelevant to the topic at that very moment when I didn't want to interrupt you. What is the political agenda of Revelation? It's using Daniel for sure. But what would you say is the political uh, motivation to it since Daniel's a political motivation and it's it's apocalyptic? Yeah, it's um, right. So Revelation wasn't written to promote a war, for example. So it's definitely a different context. Um, the best book on this was Elaine Pagel's recent book, uh, Revelations, uh, which is about the book of Revelation. Um, where she goes into like what is the social agenda of the author, and um, and I think it, broad strokes here, uh, it, it is a critique of Roman imperial power. So a lot of what's going on in there is basically uh, explaining uh, what Rome is doing is immoral and, and bad and so on, uh, and then predicting why this why God is going to take it all out. Uh, and it is predicting uh, various other things that it, it wants to sort of like. It's, it's one of those examples of getting people excited by the evangelism, getting excited to join the church and be saved because time is running out. So, so its political agenda is to bring in the flock. Now, the, the controversial part of this is that uh, I think, and I think more scholars now agree, the author of Revelation is a member of the Torah observance sect of Christianity. So this is actually an anti-Gentile Christian uh, thing. So it's actually saying only Jews are going to be saved. Uh, is revelation is like it, it, it the idea is like only the only observant Jews who are Christians are going to get salvation. It doesn't explicitly say that it doesn't just outright say that, uh, but it, it tells a sort of political narrative of how that's how they think it's going to go uh, and, and try to get people 
into the church, into specifically the Torah observant church. In other, in other words, to convert to Judaism and, uh, and, and then become a practicing Christian within the Jewish tradition. Uh, so that, that's, so it, it's, it's, if in so far, in so far as political, it's a critique of the secular political situation and a defense and advertisement for the subpolitics of the church. Uh, so that it's actually a political infighting between the different factions of the church. Uh, so it represents a particular faction in that battle of uh, trying to control the narrative. And that's, uh, and that, that's why it's very similar. Thing. Right. Right. And that's very similar to, to Matthew, right? So uh, Revelation and Matthew really, they come from the same sectarian angle. Uh, and so there's a lot of overlap between those texts and vocabulary and concepts and stuff like that. So they, they really represent the same point of view. Wow. Okay. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Carrier. That's one of the things I noticed in like the angel that comes to one of the churches in chapter two. He's talking about, oh, you did some things right, but we're going to correct this issue. If you're you're practicing this, this, that. You're eating meat, sacrificed to idols, stuff like that. And it's like, Paul taught that. Hmm, I wonder if they're jabbing at a Pauline Christianity. Hmm, anyway, um, so Mark, uh, thank you for the super chat. How do you interpret Psalms 82.6? I said, you are gods. You are all sons of the most high. Dr. Carrier? Oh, it's been ages since I've looked at that verse. So I, I don't really have an opinion on it right now. <laughs> oh. I, have to, I have to go back and look at uh, what I've, what I've, what my notes have said on, on studying that. So okay. um, I can't help you there right now. Okay. And you don't want to get, I, I get it. I don't blame you. Um, goat means uh, greatest of all time, by the way. And uh, making sure oh. you saw that. <laughs> I yeah. did not get, boy, I am. Yeah. I'm definitely a, a noob when it comes to pop culture. Okay. What we Indo, got thank you again for the 616. I think we already addressed this someone, but I said most common objection I get to forgeries. You already addressed this one. I just yeah, took yeah. a screenshot. Okay, cool. So then we're caught yeah. up on that. Okay, cool. Then we're gonna then we're gonna read between the lines here with my friend. Richard, do you think there's a realistic chance that a sitting professor will employ on the historicity of Jesus as a text for an upper level class or senior seminar? Yeah, there's a chance someday. Uh, I, I don't know when, like probably not soon. Uh, but you know, like, uh, in, in, you know, let's say 10 years from now, uh, if someone wants to teach a seminar on the historicity of Jesus, it's going to have to be OHJ and Lotaster's book. Right. Uh, unless someone writes something else in between now and then the, the, those are the only peer reviewed books that are the latest. And if they have then throw in the last, the other one, the next most recent one, which is, uh, Shirley Jackson cases pro historicity book, it's going to suffer by comparison. So I, I I'm really hoping someone will produce a good history city defense book uh, that would be. Why don't you write person. one? Why don't you play devil's oh, no, advocate no, no, and I, actually no, I can't. try? I, I, really, I really couldn't do that. I, I think it should be someone who actually believes in the conclusion um, okay. or, or is taking it seriously so that um, they, first of all, that they have credibility. Uh, you know, if I write the best, if I write a pro history city book, everybody will, you know, dismiss it as uh, tanking the case, right? Um, whereas uh, if someone who who's actually like on the fence or uh, actually is pro-historicity, if they write it, that they'll have, coming from that will have more credibility. And it also means that they will have the higher motive to like look for maybe arguments that I've overlooked, for example. Um, and so, so I wanna see someone who's either fence sitting or pro-historicity do it. Uh, and someone who has a PhD in a relevant field and, and who does gets it through peer review and does it all correctly. Um, uh, I, 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 ha I have like my, my dream list of who I'd want to write these things, but, um, but I, it doesn't matter. Like I, it doesn't have to be someone of particular prominence. It's just anybody who's qualified uh, and, and, and through any publisher that is a legitimate academic press. Like, like I want to see this happen. Thank you, Dr. Carrier. My friend, Dennis R. Lecker. Thank you for the super chat, Dennis. Appreciate it, bro. Love you, man. How might one respond to Bart Ehrman? And I do like him appeal or Bart Ehrman's appeal to academic consensus when he argues that no person of cons consequence uh, would tolerate address answer the idea that Jesus did not exist. Yeah, uh, I mean, first of all, it's a bad argument. Um, but so, so that's this is an example of of Ehrman relying on fallacious reasoning rather than sound historical argument. Um, so it's a bad argument to begin with, uh, and that's even if it were true, uh, it's factually false. There's, uh, so I list actually uh, a dozen uh, significant qualified uh, historians who either agree with mythicism or uh, who admit that it is plausible and worth considering, uh, uh, you know, who, who either agree or are agnostic or who admit that it's plausible and worth considering. Um, and, and I had linked, so that's in my Airman recap article. I have, I think it's item 22. 
Uh, I have the whole list of these people with links uh, to their credentials and links to uh, their affirmation of, of taking it seriously. So, so his idea that no one would take it seriously, no one you know, of consequence would take it seriously is false. So the premise is false. But even if the premise were true, the, the argument is fallacious. Uh, this is not how consensus arguments should work. If, if someone publishes a peer reviewed challenge to the consensus, it is a circular argument to cite the consensus against it, right? Like the, the whole point of getting a challenge of the consensus through peer review is that now we need to review this argument. So you, you actually have to address the arguments as to why the consensus is wrong. You can't just keep citing the consensus. Like that, that, that is not valid or legitimate methodology and actually refutes and repudiates the entire point of consensus, right? The consensus is of no value if all it means is dogma, if it's just something we just, well, wh whatever the opinion is, we'll just cite it. It's not based on anything. It's not based on evidence. It's not based on argumentation. It can never be questioned. Uh, that's dogma, not consensus, right? So the only reason consensus is worth citing is that we're believe we're trusting that the scholars who are having this opinion have actually examined the arguments pro and con and have come to a conclusion that's informed uh, and and based on their professional understanding of the field. So the consensus is useless. It, it has no value if that's not happening. So when there's a challenge to a consensus, it does have to be addressed. Uh, and, and I do mean like a proper peer review challenge, not just some wacko on the internet uh, coming up with stuff. A reference to the <laughs> beginning of the show. There, there are a lot of amateur, terrible arguments for mythicism uh, that, that are incompetent or badly argued and so on. Uh, and so I, I, it's very important to say, like, I don't think historians are obligated to address those. Uh, uh, but a peer, proper peer reviewed study that's within the field uh, methods and principles yeah, you need to you need to actually address the arguments. You can't just keep citing the cons consensus again, uh, and so th so that's that's a fallacious argument. Even if the premise were true, and the premise isn't even true, so uh, and, and you know, so we'll see. We'll also see where things are 10, 20 years from now as well. Well, since we've ran out of super chats, I have a little surprise for everybody watching. This is on Patreon, so if anyone has not joined it. You haven't seen this clip. It, you've probably seen it if you saw my Bart Ehrman interview, but I figure why not let you hear the horse's mouth say what yeah. he says when I ask him this and have you address it real quick. Yeah. Um, if you have any super chats, feel free to, but we're going to we're gonna go ahead and play this here and hope you could see this. Let me know if you can. So far. So that's really me, by the way, who beats <laughs> Leviathan in case anyone's wondering. Oh, is that so, what that is? Okay, excellent. 100%. So here we go. <laughs> Can you hear it? <laughs> yes. Hundreds of videos not released, early access, join the Patreon. Myth Vision. Shameless. Another donor says, I have a special request. Dr. Airman, please blink twice, twice if you're simply a mythicist. <laughs> Uh, Would you like to comment? I'm gonna, guys some, opened up even more. I'm gonna get some toothpicks. <laughs> no, I think the mythicists are completely wrong, and they, you know, and I think they're shooting themselves in the foot. Does everybody know what a mythicist is on your program? Yeah, everyone, yeah, pretty much. So, um, look, you're just doing yourself a disservice because people who are not mythicists are laughing at you. You're you're ignoring historical evidence in order to assert a point. And you might think it's great, but it's like, you know, look, if you're a big fan of Fox News or of MSNBC, you think it's great. But anybody who's not, who listens to this, says this is just crazy. And so, look, I'm, I'm a fan of MSNBC, I'm, but, you know, I, I, I'm a liberal. But, but you know, the evidence is so overwhelming that I'm just like, why, why, why not argue something that is going to make a difference instead of, like, trying – so I know why people do it. They like to get a name from themselves or they like to get a book published or they like having a following. And then it's cool to say Jesus never existed, but it's just bollocks to quote my English wife. <laughs> could, could we, and by, any, by any chance, before we leave this one to the next question, is it possible to say that some of the academic mythicists aren't on the same playing field as some of the guys who are, let's say, I'm trying to get him to budge really, really, really out yeah, there yeah. theories that don't even go into the vein of academia at all. Like for, for example, Dr. Richard Carrier, Dr. Robert McNair Price, would they be, you don't equate them to Holocaust deniers the same way you would someone else, right? Not generally. Cause I mean, those when, guys, yeah, they know a lot, but they know a lot, but they're completely wrong on this. Have you seen my debate with Robert yes. Price? Yes. So 
I mean, I just think they're completely wrong. And Carrier, you know, Carrier's a smart enough fellow, um, but I think he does himself a disservice. He know he knows a lot. He's published, you know, he's got published, you know, a, an article or two in a peer-reviewed journal. He he brags about how many things he publishes in peer-reviewed journals. But I mean, it's not like a big deal. This is what scholars do. But you know, there's nobody. There there is no professor of New Testament in the world that I know of in a, an accredited university. And there are thousands of people like this. Who's a mythicist? I don't I don't know. Uh, do you know of one? I don't know of one. I am not aware. I mean, and that's not an accident. And it's not, you know, they say, well, they're yeah. prejudiced against us. Well, they're prejudiced against you for the same reason that the biology department is prejudiced against somebody who doesn't believe in evolution, but believes in Adam and Eve. They, they think you don't have any evidence. And so, but you know, they get offended when I say that. I know they get offended, but I'm just telling you the reality is this is this is the problem. So why not why not like use your intelligence to it? I don't know what your goal, I don't know what the goal is. I don't know what the goal is, but um because right. I never really kind of asked them the goal. But if the goal is to to help to help people realize that Christianity is not true, you're not gonna get there by saying things that people are just gonna think are silly. You know, I, I have it's to funny that last point of his, we'll by the way, is question. I yeah. myself make that point. Uh, so, so this just illustrates like he's not even paying attention to anything I'm saying, right? So I myself wrote a whole article on uh, why you can't argue against Christianity with mythicism. Mythicism is not not as much of a smoking gun. It's not as certain a conclusion, right? So, uh, so I actually have said the thing that he just said there. And so the fact that he doesn't know that means he's not even paying attention to anything that I do. And when he said earlier on, like we're ignoring evidence, what evidence are we ignoring? Uh, point out what is not in on the historicity of Jesus. What evidence is I didn't put in there that I don't address? Uh, so, he, he, which he can't do because he he refuses to read the book. So this is why like his position is entirely irrational. Uh, that he refuses to even look at what the argument is. He just dismisses it and comes up with all these excuses about motives and whatever as a reason not to even look at the argument, much less address the argument. Uh, and uh, so that's appalling to me. And, and, and that actually begs for an explanation. So what is his motive? Uh, why is he so resistant to even just looking at the case? He even won't even he, look at the case. He, like, I, I don't even understand. This uh, is amazing, which is Dr. really Carrier, irrational to do. If I may, and I want to say this, I said this publicly on my channel, right? I lean historicist right now. Not because I am exhaustively understanding or that I think mythicism is stupid. Absolutely not. And in fact, I, that's right. when yeah. I did this, didn't like you don't see me going <laughs> yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's the I'm thing like, with uh yeah like like him denigrating and saying like there's nobody no there's actually almost a dozen examples that he incorrectly claims don't exist uh you know like and and like uh and i list them i pointed out this item 22 an airman recap article uh no these are sitting professors some cases emeritus professors but that's the same uh and uh with full qualifications uh, the, and, you know, so that like they at least will say what no, not what he's saying. They'll say, well, this is a plausible argument that's worth considering, even if they themselves, like you, like lean historicist. Right. This, right. And, so, like, uh, you know, Philip Davies uh, Davies is an example uh, where he, he says, well, I'm a historicist, but I think there's something like this is a plausible argument. It deserves a seat at the table. Same as anything else. Like if you're going to argue Jesus was a zealot, you know, it's a violent revolutionary that's yeah. respectable, even though it's not plausible, but it is respectable. Like they're saying, There's this a is lot a, of... we can have this debate, right? And so like, so Davies is an example of that, but then there are others who are admitted agnosticism about it. Hector Avalos, uh, who just passed away recently, uh, he came out as saying like, I, I'm on the fence, like, and he's a sitting biblical professor. Uh, I mean, if you right, were to so... pin me down, if you pinned me, like if you, if you really pin me, I guess I would be ultimately agnostic because I can't put any weight of certainty on any of this. I'd say what sounds to me, what makes more sense in my head to me, right? So that's it. But real yeah, quick. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, actually, that's worth pointing out. Uh, you and someone in the comments also uh, reminded me. Like The other thing is like he, he keeps conflating me with, like you tried to get him to disassociate uh, my work from internet randos, right, uh, right. which he wouldn't do. Uh, but he keeps assuming that like we're going around saying, no, it's absolutely certain Jesus didn't exist and this destroys Christianity. I mean, A, I've repudiated that 
perspective. I do not argue that at all. In fact, I tell people you shouldn't argue that. Uh, and, and secondly, my position is one in three, like, as much as one in three chance there's a historical Jesus. So I'm admitting like there's a huge amount of uncertainty here. Like I'm not going around saying I absolutely know for sure there right. was no Jesus. All I say is the preponderance of evidence seems to lean the other way. Um, but I'm not going around confidently saying he definitely didn't exist. Uh, and so he doesn't even know what my position is. Uh, right. that, that, that's, that's, that's really shocking to me. And, uh, and it's a shame. Uh, well, that's why when he said what he said, yeah. that's why I was like, okay, let me at least try to get him to say they're not yeah. Holocaust <laughs> deniers, you know, that kind of thing. I did yeah, try I and, and, uh, he didn't quite say you guys were, but it, you could tell he didn't want mm. nothing to do with it real quick. What yeah. is the definition yeah. of a mythicist? How do you define it, Derek? Well, from <laughs> there's different kinds, if you will, of mythicist, but ultimately someone who does not believe in the historicity of Jesus is how we commonly use it here. Yeah. Even though I've used this, I've seen people use the term. It's very rare that it's used for other historical people. Uh, like to say True. that this, I'm a mythicist yeah. of this person in history or something, but, but mainly it's like a coin right. term for Jesus. And did this guy exist in history as an actual guy? Was there yeah. a Colonel there? Um, not, is this guy a, uh, you know, configuration of multiple other historical people that make him into this or something. Uh, was there a colonel? Was there a guy potentially at the start? And to me, yeah. uh, Mythesis says even that isn't the case or most probably isn't the case. So right. it's someone yeah. who leans in that direction ultimately more so than sits on the fence or actually leans historicity. Yep. I'd say that's that accurate. answers it. Yeah. I try to, you know, and one more, we got uh, the, the King below. Thank you for the super chat. Bart really embarrassed himself in that clip. He continues to avoid actual arguments and instead resorts to pettiness and bizarre personal attacks. You yeah, know, I, I, I would I love to see you and him have a talk one day. I don't know how much money it would take. Well, he won't, but, uh, right? Yeah, he's he's adamantly against it uh, and gets angry at any suggestion that it happened. And, and he's refused already thousands of dollars to do this. I, I think there was a group that offered him five grand uh, to do to have it to, to do the actually the Bart, Robert Price debate that was going to be me and him, but he refused uh, to have me as the opponent in that debate. Wow. I always said I wondered what it would have been like if you did debate him on that. I always wondered. I, I still to well, this I day mean, kind of know because I, I wrote my post post action report blog, right? Like which we did some uh, on your show too to summarize some of that. Uh, but um, but the the whole the whole idea of that, of like what it would look like. You can see like where I critique what I wouldn't have done. I even say like what I wouldn't have said if I were price. Uh, and then what I would have said if I were in that position uh, and how I would have run the debate is pretty clear when you read my analysis of the Bart Ehrman, Robert price debate. Interesting. Uh, we got a few more super chats. I did miss your, your, uh, let me get this question here real quick. Uh, and then I'm going to get you guys here. I got to share the screen for this one. Um, <laughs> sorry it's from the past indo actually did uh a thing on mystery yeah i remember religion. that i thought i thought that got dropped there um it did total accident bart yeah uh, let's see so if christianity was a mystery cult why did paul and the gospel writers try to spread the message and save everyone does this contradict mark 11 through 12 no right mark so 11? the whole point of mystery all mystery religions are evangelist right the whole point of them was to spread uh, and grow and bring more people in for salvation um, the, the thing that makes them a mystery cult is not that they, the cults hide. Uh, the thing that makes them a mystery cult is that the, to get your salvation, there's some sort of mystery, a secret that you have to know, and you have to be an insider. You have to be like sworn to secrecy and, and so on. And, and a, like an established insider to be given that, to be told what that is. And there might even be levels. Like, so the higher up, it's like the, the Masons, for example, the, the higher up you go, or Scientology is another example. The higher up you go, the more secrets you're told. Uh, and, and I actually, I show the evidence that Christianity was structured this way. There were higher levels of mysteries in Christianity, the higher up, higher ranking you were, the more you were told about these secrets, secrets, and these secrets you were sworn to keep, and they were never written down usually because, uh, uh th that would be, that would run the risk of them coming out and being revealed. So, um, so, and, and what was kept secret? what the secrets were probably changed over time because this is secret oral lore. That's the easiest shit to change, right? So uh, so you, there's no stability for it, um, which is why the sex of Christianity exploded so quickly. It's like you could have all these sex, they, they can radically change the, the secret teachings in any way they wanted. There's no real way to like out them uh, unless you like like a spy, you go infiltrate and whatever. Um, so, uh, so, and certainly for the first century, we don't know what the <laughs> mysteries were, but the mist, but Paul refers to these mysteries a lot. So in, um, 
elements gosh i think it's 13 to 15 no 13 to 14 13 and 14 uh in chapter four of on the history of city of jesus i go into all the evidence for these their mysteries that existed uh and what we do know about them which is very little and in in christianity and the different the fact that there were different levels of them uh paul refers to these mysteries and he hints at them sometimes he reveals them a little bit we're not sure like how much he's giving away um, so he mentions, for example, marriage is a mystery about, there's something about Jesus, some teaching about Jesus as a husband that is a mystery in the church. He alludes to it, but he doesn't tell you what it is. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of this stuff. So the mysteries were just kept for insiders. So when Mark wrote, Mark is actually illustrating this point. Mark is illustrating, he has Jesus going around evangelizing. He's trying to get people to be saved and whatever. So he's evangelizing, but he's doing it by telling stories, you know, parables, uh, that are not true. Uh, and Mark Mark has Jesus explain this. It's like, yeah, the parables that I'm telling you, you're not supposed to take them literally true. They're 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 they mean something else, but the secret meaning, I'm only gonna tell you the insiders, the apostles. And so this is a model for the how the church ran. So that their public facing storyline would be the gospel Jesus. But the mystery would be you'd come in and, and you'd learn like, oh, well, actually, this is a, a metaphor for cosmic events and stuff like that, right? So that, that's how that would actually operate. Uh, and so you had to understand the secret meaning and the literal meaning. If you took the literal meaning, it, Jesus says the people who take the literal meaning are damned. Like he says, those people will not be saved. So <laughs> so the, the whole, so it's like, so you're not supposed to take the literal meaning. You're, you're supposed to take the secret meaning. But the only way you only learn the secret meaning is by joining. Right, so that and this was actually this was a standard model. This is how all mystery religions worked. This isn't something new that Mark invented or, or Christians invented. Is there uh, a book and, you could so, recommend on reading uh, other than on the historicity that delves with mystery cults? You think is important? Uh, oh, mystery cults in general, uh, or, what would be or the mystery religions, one? if you will, like the in this vein um, of the first century. Before we get to the super chat, yeah, I'm, try I'm trying to think of what uh, I've got it jumbled in my head of what the latest one. Clauk has a decent book, I think. Um, you know, obviously in the historicity of Jesus, I have, I cite the the leading literature. I'd have to go digging in there to find okay. out what it was. Oh, yeah. but, um, but but there's Clauk, which is K-L-A-U-C-K. He wrote a book on the mystery religions. I can't remember if that's the best one or the most recent one, but it is one of the top ones. Um, there's a few others uh, that I cite in, in OHJ. If I cite it in OHJ, uh, that means I'm recommending it, uh, unless I specifically okay. give a qualifier in there. Um, like there's an old one, it's like from the early 20th or late 19th century that I think is valuable, but I don't recommend it. And I say in the book, like it's obsolete in many ways, but it does have useful data in it. Uh, so I don't recommend that for people who want to get an intro. I would go to something modern, uh, something contemporary, which is, you know, Klauk's book, for example, but there are others. I, I'm not remembering them off the top of my head, but they are, no they are the best ones are listed in uh, the, those, that chapter four of on the history of Jesus. Thank you, Carrier. Donnie Springer, thank you. Putting aside the text and lack of traditional historical evidence, how would you account for the rise of a religion based around a man named Jesus in this time frame with no buildup? I don't understand what no buildup means. Putting uh, aside the text and lack of traditional historical evidence, how would you account for the rise of a religion based around a man? Maybe he'll, named maybe he'll add a comment. Uh, fill us in. I, I'm not All sure. Right. I don't understand the question. So, uh, are, are we asking like how could a historical Jesus have launched this religion? Where are we asking how could the religion have launched without a historical Jesus? That, that that's what I'm not. I'm that getting. this religion riz arose around or based around a man named Jesus in this time frame with no buildup. So that's a good question. Like I don't know. Well, I, so I, I, the best. Like, so there's two ways to take that. If if it's about mythicism, then my book, Jesus from Outer Space answers the question because it talks about, it's a whole chapter in there about how the religion began and so far without a Jesus and why why that happened. Uh, but if the question is, how could a historical Jesus have done this? Um, that, uh, that I answer, um, uh, I have answered. So I, I have talked about like how that would occur uh, in various places. Um, I'm trying to think of what was the one that was, that would be the most relevant uh, in answering this. Um, uh, oh, well, so on the history of Jesus, I have a section on revolution cults. There's a whole anthropology of revolution cults. Uh, and now those revolution cults were usually not led by someone. They're usually spontaneous arisal, ar arrivals of groups of people. So like the cargo cults, you had a bunch of different shamans hearing secret spirit messages and telegraph poles. Like they would put their ear up to a telegraph pole and spirits would talk to them. Uh, and there would be a bunch of them. And then a, a view sort of coalesced 
And then eventually they attributed all those teachings to a guy who showed up on the island named John Frum or Tom Navy or there's various different ones. Uh, one of them said Prince Philip, who's an actual historical person, but he never went <laughs> to the island and never started the religion. Uh, but these are made up people. So that, that, that that's actually a good model for mythicism is it starts like spontaneously and it is very sudden. Uh, it, it is a, cause it's a revolution cult. So it is like a, what'd you say? Like a tipping point. It's like a tipping point religion. Like things come to a head and spill over. And so you have a sudden radical change and this new radical religion gets pushed. And if it's successful, it becomes a, a significant religion. If it gets crushed then, uh, or it becomes unpopular, then it doesn't. And so we have a lot of examples throughout history of these revolution cults. It's Christianity is just fits the model perfectly. It fits the anthropological model to a T. Uh, and I show that in On the Historicity of Jesus. And, and that's what it is. It's very much a response to the failure of Judaism in, in a way. So it's like a, a, there were people who were dissatisfied with what Judaism was doing. It wasn't meeting their needs. And there are a variety of reasons why. A lot of that had to do with the Roman conquest, uh, had to do with the fact that the Jewish elite was collaborating with the Romans. People didn't like that. Uh, it had to do with the fact that a lot of Judaism was obsolete. Uh, it didn't really address contemporary problems and contemporary needs. Uh, and it, at least it, people perceive, there are people who perceive that as being the case, right? So, uh, and those are the people who were looking for something new. Uh, and those, that's the, those are the people who spilled over into this new revolution. And so we would say this, like Peter and the original apostles would be the, the tipping point. Like they started this religion. It wasn't really, even if it's a historical Jesus, I don't think he meant there to be a religion uh, based around him. I think it's his apostles created that to market the ideas both that they had and that they got from Jesus. So even if it was a historical Jesus, I don't think it really was Jesus trying to start a religion. He was right. just a prophet trying to get people to uh, come to a particular sectarian point of view that right so that uh and 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 reject certain things and accept certain things and practice judaism the way that he thought would be the appropriate and proper way but his followers after his death it, they are the ones who constructed this whole religion complete with like resurrection theology and all the cosmic elements and the, the incarnationism and all of that stuff that comes right out of the gate and so they, they're building all of that to sell their religion uh, and, and some of that is based on, would have been based on the teachings of Jesus. Some of that would have been their own stuff that they wanted to push. Uh, and there would be a political angle to it, which is, you know, uh, it's resistance to the Jewish elite, resistance to the Roman powers, uh, but through nonviolent means. So it mm -hmm. is, and, and I talk about the logic of this in the beginning of chapter five of On the History of City of Jesus. When you understand the actual political context in which Christianity arose, it perfectly makes sense. And you should totally have expected it to have arisen uh, around that time. So if you want to understand that, that I do cover that in that book. It's all down in the description, baby topic discussed by really good friend, Gary. We're going to try and push through these super chats because we're coming out of, we're running out of time. I'm throwing you a donation after this, Dr. Carrier for your time too, by well, the thank way. You. I appreciate uh, that. We, we, yeah. We didn't expect this to go so long and I know a lot it's of fine. people. Yeah. Are, it's all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's good. We have, we have a lot of interest and good questions too. I, I'm, well, it's I'm, Myth Vision like podcast. You know what I'm saying? Come on. Thank you so much, Gary, for the super chat. I really appreciate it. To be a historicist, does that mean you have to believe there is a historic person? Is that the same as a historical nature of Santa Claus in that there might have been a saint named Nicholas? What would you say to that, Dr. Carrier? Yeah, I, um, so I, I have a problem with the analogy in, in that there, there isn't really any adult who thinks there's a historical Santa Claus in the, the mythic sense, right? So, right. so uh, it's not like Jesus, it, it would be more like the angel Moroni, right? So the, the Mormons believe that the angel Moroni was an actual historical in fact, an actual man, like Moroni was used to be a human and then he was ascended to angelhood or whatever. And then, uh, hit, you know, centuries later came down to like reveal everything to Joseph Smith. They think that's a re real historical person. And they think those are real historical events. Uh, and, but, but obviously not, there's no such angel Moroni. Um, if you were to say you were a mythicist with regard to angel Moroni, that would be accurate. Uh, it's just that everybody who's not a Mormon is a mythicist with regard to angel Moroni. Um, so, uh, so it's usually not a significant statement. Right. So it's, people don't go around having to call themselves mythicists because Mormons are essentially a, a minor cult. They're or a minor sect. They're not uh, they're not uh, a, they're not like white evangelicals in America. They don't dominate the narrative. And and most people, even Christian evangelicals, uh, rarely take Mormon theology seriously. So uh, it's not as an issue as G denying Jesus mythicism. And also there's no mainstream historian who thinks Moroni was an actual historical person. So so there's no need for mythicism as a concept there. So uh, it, it's not a, a challenge to any concept. Um, uh, but so yeah, to be a historicist, uh, I think a more interesting way to answer that question is how much of a Jesus do you need 
for you to be a historicist. Uh, and right. so, uh, and I do talk, I have a whole chapter, obviously chapter two and on the historicity of Jesus specifically about answering this question. Uh, but uh, to really like summarize it, um, there are aspects of like the gospel of Mark, like the whole crucifixion narrative is largely modeled on the, the death, uh, the, the, the narrative of this other Jesus uh, who died during the Jewish war uh, and Jesus Ben Ananias. Now the religion was not founded based on this. Like the, the gospel is taking a guy who lived long after the religion began. Uh, and then he had this similar narrative and Mark just emulates that narrative and packs in the material he wants, which is a lot of stuff about Christianity, a lot of stuff from the Bible that he wants to associate with his Jesus and so on. So he is borrowing, a, a there was a historical Jesus Ben Ananias probably, uh, or at least more likely than not. Uh, and um, he is borrowing his story to tell the story of this other Jesus. But that doesn't make you a historicist to say that because the religion wasn't founded, wasn't begun by this Jesus Ben Ananias. He wasn't probably, might not even been alive then, or if he was, he wasn't a, a known figure. Uh, and, uh, and, and the religion isn't based on that. And only a, only a piece of the myth that Mark constructs is based on Jesus Ben Ananias. And, and then you could say there's other people that he's drawing ideas from, Elijah and Moses and so on, uh, that he's constructing his Jesus out of. So if you believed in a historical Elijah, um, I think that's 50-50 on there. If you believed in a historical Elijah, that would not make you a historicist in and of itself because you're saying, well, his, the mythical Jesus is based on Elijah, but they're not claiming that he was Elijah in the literal sense, uh, right? So they're not claiming that Jesus wandered the earth in whatever century Elijah wandered the earth, right? They're not saying Jesus is Elijah. <laughs> uh, so, so historicists, you do have to believe that there's at least some dude who got himself killed, crucified specifically, um, so he got himself executed. And when Paul and the early apostles are going around claiming, if you believe in this guy, you'll go to heaven or, or you'll be resurrected or whatever, they are referring to an actual man who was actually executed by the state, whether Roman or Jewish, doesn't matter. Um, that's what, that's the minimal you have. You have to at least believe it didn't even have to be named Jesus, by the way, Jesus could be a theological name. They assigned him after, but as long as there was an actual man who got taught some stuff, got himself executed and that's the guy that these first apostles are going around saying is the messiah and that he resurrected and all of this stuff that's enough to be a historicist uh you, you don't even have to like it, say that he was named jesus in life he might have had some other name um because jesus means savior of god it's a very convenient name uh to assign it's it's, it sounds like Joshua. an assigned yes it sounds like an assigned name it was a common jewish name so there were people really called that um, but it's also a really weirdly convenient name to call him right. the, the savior of God to call him savior of God is, you know, suspect, but also we have the example in Josephus of several of Jesus Christ's. He never calls them Jesus. He never calls them Christ. There are lots of Jesuses in, uh, Josephus's history, but I'm talking about the messianic figures. He never calls any of the messianic figures, Jesus specifically, um, or Joshua is what we mean. Uh, but he talks about them, tells stories about them where they were representing themselves as the new Joshua. It's like, like this new Messiah was going to come along and he claimed that he was going to part the Jordan. Well, that's what Joshua did, the original Joshua, right? So this is a Joshua. He's claiming he's a new Joshua and he's claiming that he's going to bring victory over the world and, you know, bring in paradise or, or you know, bring victory over the Romans and, uh, satisfy the prophecies of Judaism which means he's claiming to be a Messiah. So he's claiming to be a Jesus Christ, which is mm -hmm. just not his name. It's just a, it's, it's a role that the person is representing. And there are six of these uh, in Josephus, six guys who fit this model where they're representing themselves as Joshua and they're representing themselves as a Messiah. So they're both, they're all representing themselves as a Jesus Christ. So historicity wise, a, a plausible case could be made that our Jesus Christ that's also a fake name, but there, but there was a real guy that that name is being assigned to, that a real guy who is purporting to be the new Joshua, just like Josephus records, uh, and purporting to be the Messiah, and that this new guy was just not anywhere near as popular as the six that Josephus decided to cover, right? So there, the, so you see this whole rash of these guys doing this. So like, the, so a historicity, a historical Jesus fits in here. Like, it, it's definitely a plausible. Uh, it, it just means that he was one of the minor ones that just barely got, didn't even get on Josephus' radar. Uh, and that of all these attempts to create a new revolution in, in Judaism, only one of them randomly, one of them succeeded. And that just happened to be the one that we ended up being Christ, called, Christ, called Christianity. So I think there's entirely plausible theories to, to build about historical Jesus that don't require a lot of details. You can reject right. a lot of details about the historical Jesus and still have 
a historical core there and call yourself a historicist. I do think uh, it's funny in Acts how the, there's the equivocation to these other guys, and they're like one of them saying, you know, like the walls of Jericho, so to speak, the walls of the temple are going to fall, or other examples that could be made, like go out here, mm -hmm. I'm going to split the river just like Joshua did. So I'm wondering yeah. if this is kind of saying, now this is the real Joshua. It's kind of a right. theological. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting. Yeah, Thank no, you. probably. Yeah, I mean, I mean, that would make sense. Let's put it that way. That would be a plausible theory. Either side can use that data, though. That's the that's yeah, the problem that's right. that we have. So. <laughs> well, yes. it is a problem. Yeah, it's epistemic. Yeah. Creates an epistemic ambiguity, and we, that's a common state to be in for ancient history, where we're not often not certain. About and I want to say this, and I want this to be like, please absorb this. This is why either side, it's important not to be dogmatic mm -hmm. and to approach this, like. In, enjoying this, especially if you're not someone who is an apologist, as we've been talking about with Daniel, where you have to have this be true or else if you're showing this like mm -hmm. you're not open minded and having this dialogue and he did not exist. He did not prove it. If he, you know, yeah, you're like showing right. you're a fundamentalist on the opposite side or vice versa. He had to have existed historically. You're a complete. It's like, let's let's calm down. And say, <laughs> right, yeah, they, both are hyperbolic. Uh, I, I don't I don't endorse either position. Uh, right. whereas I'm, I'm sympathetic to both of the lesser positions. You know, the reasonable historicity is a, re is a plausible position to take. Uh, and as is reasonable mythicism. So, uh, I, I, yeah, I reject these extreme, uh, absolutist points of view. Thank you for saying that. Thank you. Crossover maniac. Thank you for the five follow-up question. Was the book of Mark originally intended to be just a story like Ben Hur that was later declared to have actually taken place? And real quick before you answer yeah. that. Uh, thank you, Dion. Thank you so much. Love having Dr. Carrier on. I appreciate that love. Thank you for the super awesome. chat. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I, I love the word intended, right? So that <laughs> now we're talking psychology. We don't really know what was in the mind of the author of Mark, right? So we, we what his intentions were, we don't know. Um, we can guess at, and we can guess at based on clues he's left and based on what was typical of the time. Uh, and, and the guesses are somewhat reliable, but not, I wouldn't assert as known fact, but, uh, so like Mark four has been brought up in this, in this conversation where, where he has Jesus explain the doctrine of double truth, where there's a, like, the parables you're not supposed to take literally, but I'm telling them, uh, the outsiders are supposed to take them literally and that that's bad. And then the, but the insiders are supposed to get the real meaning. So Mark is cluing you in as that's what, that's probably how he intended his gospel. I, I think, I think he intended that as the, the key to the whole gospel. He's telling you that this is just an extended parable about Jesus. If you're taking it literally, you're an outsider, you're doomed. But if you if you join us, we will tell you the secret meaning of all this stuff. I think that was the original intent of Mark. Uh, gradually over time, as gospels kept to be written, they really started pushing more the historical angle of it. So it, the gospels actually become more historicized over time. But by the time you get to Luke, like he's actually trying to make it look like a history with details and things like that. And then when you, and he's even got like a preface, you know, a methodological preface, it's sort of, it's a bad one, but it's at least it's, he's attempting to sound like he's writing a history, which is not what Mark does at all. Uh, Matthew is trying to sound like a book of the Bible. He's trying to make his book sound like Deuteronomy, uh, right? Or Exodus or something like that. Uh, he's trying to make it look familiar uh, like scripture. And then when you get to John, John's outright saying, no, this is literally historically true and you're blessed if you believe it and you're doomed if you don't. So he's completely flipped from what Mark is doing, right? Mark is doing the exact opposite of what John is doing. The authors of John, by the way, I, I don't think an actual John wrote it. Um, but yeah. uh, so, so you see this progression of this desire to make it more historicized and to push the historicity, whereas Mark isn't doing that. He's doing the opposite of that. That's what I think. So that's what I right. think isn't, so I don't think he intends insiders. I don't think he intends Christians to take the story literally, but he mm -hmm. might have intended outsiders to take it literally as, as a fake, right. As a, as a distraction uh, to mislead. Uh, and cause we know this is what's going on in the other mystery religions. Like the Osiris cult is a classic example. Tall or uh, Plutarch wrote a book on this and he's wrote it for a priestess in, in the cult. So like someone who knew what she was talking about. Uh, so he couldn't make stuff up. Uh, but so he points it out like the, the outward stories about Osiris being on earth, being a Pharaoh and doing all these things are meant to deceive or trick outsiders. They're meant for outsiders. Um, but insiders know the truth that this is all an allegory for cosmic events. There was no actual historical Osiris. So uh, Plutarch's talking about this is just a normal way to run a mystery religion. So I, I suspect when you put these two pieces of evidence together, I suspect 
that's what Mark is doing. Uh, I can't prove it. Like I don't, I can't, we can't interview Mark and ask him. There's no secret letter where he confesses. So it's we don't know. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, but, but that, that's what I suspect is the case is going on with Mark. And now later gospels, they start changing up the way they want to do things. But right. Uh, one thing on Mark, I love sneaking my little questions into these super chats, but the last thing I wanted to ask is, do you think that Mark's making, and this is all like, there's many different ways to look at this, but do you think Mark's making the apostles look really ridiculous because of Paul, Paul's animosity between the original apostles and Mark's using Paul's ideas that he's like, they're dummies. They don't know what they're talking. They miss this. Uh, or do you think there's other reasons? You see what I'm saying? Yeah. um, That's another one of those examples where I don't know the psychology of Mark. So I don't really know what he's doing. Um, And and the the only reason I don't fully endorse what you're saying, because it's plausible what you're talking about, right? It's it's a plausible position to take. Um, There are two reasons why. One is Matthew doesn't get rid of it. Uh, So Matthew is the Petrine sect. So, So clearly the Petrine sect themselves saw a value in that version of the narrative. So they were doing something with it and they kept it. So they they they, they saw something that, that was usable. Uh, so that leads me to suspect that there was some point to it. And then when we look at the at the external evidence, so like Dennis McDonald has talked about this, where um, Mark is, and one of the things, Mark is doing two things. He's emulating Deuteronomy, just as Matthew is doing. More uh, focused on the Exodus. He's emulating um, the Jews. If you notice the story of the Exodus, the bumbling Jews that don't trust Moses and constantly betray him and don't, you know, like walk away or like risk him or whatever, and then bad things happen to them and they just never come around and trust him. Uh, and all these amazing miracles happen and they still don't trust that God's going to help them. So they're exactly like the apostles in Mark. Like it's just type typecast, right? So, so it's clearly he's creating a model of Moses and the bumbling Jews following and not trusting him. So they're, they're represented as a, a model for how not to be just at in Exodus. The, the, the whole narrative is a model for don't act like these, these, you know, fickle, untrusting, uh, never learning anything. Jews. like, trust Moses, right? Like that's the whole story is like, the method, message of the story is you should have trusted Moses all the time. You've been all, you're much better off. Um, and so the, using the bumbling people uh, is is a device for doing that. Um, and uh, another aspect of that is, uh, as Dennis McDonald also points out, is that this also emulates Odysseus and his crew. Uh, the, the whole myth of, of the Odyssey has the exact same model. Where Odysseus's crew are a bunch of bumbling idiots that Odysseus has to constantly save from. You know, so it's it's a similar model. So it's clearly a motif that was very popular. Uh, it, it had a resonance, a cultural resonance at that time as a narrative to tell about heroes. And then the other side of it is that the whole point of Christianity was that this was a secret that no one understood. And only after the resurrection did people finally get it, right? So like mm. that's that, that you find in, you know, 1 Corinthians 15, like the apostles... Paul doesn't even mention the ministry of Jesus, right? Uh, and which I think <laughs> is curious, but if you're a historicist, right. you still have to admit Paul thought that was, not only did Paul think this, but the creed that he's quoting, which is the original creed developed by the apostles, it's, it's, it's that he's quoting, it's not his creed. That creed has no ministry in it. Like, so they didn't give a shit about the ministry right. of Jesus. Uh, the only thing that mattered <laughs> right out of the gate is scripture predicted the resurrection, well, the death and resurrection. Scripture predicted the death and resurrection and we saw Jesus resurrected. That's it. That's the whole creed. Uh, and so the whole idea is based on people were ignorant and didn't know. And th- you see this First Corinthians 2 as well. So like the idea of uh, God hid the secret to fool everyone uh, and, and particularly fool Satan and his demons. Uh, and then only the particularly wise, the only the particularly chosen and wise learned the truth and realized the truth. That's all part of Christianity. So Mark is reifying this Pauline storyline. So like the apostles are bumbling idiots until, uh, you know, up, up until the resurrection. Now in Mark's case, he doesn't narrate the resurrection, but Mark's writing from the assumption that you, that your reader knows the story from then on, right? That he knows that, well, then the appearances happen, then the resurrection appearances happen, then the creed started and so on. So that the apostles turned around when they were convinced. And so Mark is creating this model of, of people who weren't convinced uh, and, and so it's not necessarily a critique of the apostles. The apostles might have actually originated this notion uh, that they were bumbling fools until the, they were enlightened, right? So like, so this this concept may have already existed. And then Mark just turns it into a narrative, like builds it into a story. Uh, so so, I don't, so I, this all makes sense. So the, the idea that he's criticizing the apostles, 
which is a mainstream, like it's, it's a theory out there. Like it's taken seriously. It's not, I don't think it's proven. Um, I lean more towards the other, the theory that I just elaborately explained. You than made I it do sound really the, good too, by right. the way. Um, I want to say to 553 people watching right now, please hit that like button. Uh, this is, this yeah. has been a heck of a live. Seriously. You've got a lot of attention and go in the description, get his books. I'm telling you they're worth it. And he's on audible. So if you're driving, yeah. you got a trip coming up three hours, four hours, don't matter. A couple hours, get on audible, start chipping away and get this information. Even if you don't agree, I want to hear why. That's why I love this stuff. Like it's so cool to learn converse contender. He's, um, he's a good friend. Actually, he's been on the live. He's a cool guy. He's a Christian. We disagree, but nonetheless, he says, will you debate future Christian historian <laughs> Camille? <laughs> Camille, uh, yeah, uh, anytime, anytime uh, Camille wants to. Uh, we've had exchange of blog articles on on the subject, uh, so people can go to my blog and look at what I've written uh, in response to Camille Gregor's uh, treatment of this. Gregor takes at least a lot of this more seriously than uh, than, like for example, Bart Ehrman does. Like he's actually understands the math and and is trying to like uh, interpret how I'm using the math. I think he gets things wrong, uh, but but they're not because of incompetence or. Uh, um, uh, resistance to discussing it like he's uh like bart Ehrman, for example but uh I, I think i think gregor's got some interesting things to say and then uh, I, so i can explain why why he's getting things wrong about the way i argue in my book but if you want to learn about that you can find my article on the blog um right. and then i think you know once i'm assuming he's read that and so he knows where i'm coming from there uh so that we could actually have a productive debate that builds on that exchange um definitely i don't myself organize debates though so yeah, someone well, else would me. have to organize I'll, that. I'd be the guy, but he said he wanted to first get a PhD. And yes, make that's right. I have heard. I have heard that. And, I and, and that's, that. that's totally legit. Yeah I, yeah, I I have no criticism for that approach. Yeah, and I mean he's a smart, smart guy. Uh, so you know, I really would love to do that in the future. Thank you for the super chat, Converse. Let's talk in the future, man. Uh, you can also email me. You can find me on Facebook. I'm all over the place. Alan, thank you for the super chat. If we accept Harold Lloyd was the prototype for Superman, is it reasonable to call Superman a historical character? <laughs> no, that, Superman... that, wouldn't, that wouldn't constitute historicity, right? That would be another Elijah comparison, right? So uh, even if Elijah existed, that wouldn't make mean Jesus existed um, just because Jesus was based on Elijah, for example. Um, so so no, that, that, that the answer would be no. <laughs> thank you for the super <laughs> chat. Question. No, I appreciate you sticking this extra time. Uh, everybody hit that like button. Share this out. Someone needs to see this. Look, this thumbnail that I made, I, I went on YouTube and I looked up uh, specific titles for Daniel is a forgery. And in fact, I saw mostly Christian videos. Right. I saw a pastor. I saw a two minute video of a pastor saying people are saying Daniel's a forgery and that it was written in 90 AD or sometime like that. And I'm like, Wait, that what? is like the worst. <laughs> Nobody serious is saying that. So he must have went in front of his audience and said, yeah. I'm going to preach this really wacky theory here to let everyone know, don't worry, Daniel's not a forgery right, and not right. address the serious situation of why it really is. And so um, I had to have you come on. This is going to be on YouTube. Anyone that thinks Daniel's not a forgery, I was going to ask you about Porphyry, but a uh, third century uh, historian who literally says he thinks it's a it's a forgery. But uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, you I, I, I so I didn't. I don't talk about this in my article. Um, the reason being is, and as I mentioned in the video I did, the post game analysis video I did with uh, Jonathan Sheffield and Boyce and so on. Um, the uh, uh, so. Porphyry did notice some of the things that we now notice about Daniel. Um, but Porphyry himself is not a modern historian. He didn't get everything right. Uh, so I, I don't, I, I mean, it's interesting that he noticed these things and published it. Uh, but I, I don't see him as someone to go to as the, as the source for this idea. Uh, go, go to contemporary historians. There's, you know, the, you know, current commentaries, peer reviewed commentaries. That's where you go now for current scholarship on this. You don't need to rely on anything Porphyry said. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Kerr. Oh, my good friend, Craig and Ford, we're doing a mythology show coming up about Odin and Thor. So be on nice. the lookout for that. And we're not talking about like just the movies or something like he actually wants to tell you the history of these myths yeah, and, awesome. and how they actually in the proto-European world, like how this played a part. So go subscribe to his channel. He's going to be live on Myth Vision. You guys will see it. Thank you. Yeah, for I, I've been on his show too. Uh, he, he's really cool. Uh, so I recommend checking out his channel for sure. Seriously, if you want to go see that interview, it's on his channel right now. So Craig and Ford, thank you so much, man. I love you guys. And uh, thank you, Dr. Carrier. I'm going to be shooting you that uh, 
that uh, money here for spending this time with me. And everyone who doesn't know, I have to say this before we go. I know everything keeps added, but get on Myth Vision Patreon. Help Dr. Carrier too. When I go and fly in, in uh, July... August. Oh gosh. Uh, no, no. It's September. Uh, um, I September. Think. September. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm going to so many places. Yeah, yeah. Um, September, awesome. I'm going to be there and I'm interviewing you for two full days. I hope you'll let me harass you and get everything sure. I can. Yeah, We're going to promote you like crazy, all your content, asking tons and tons of questions. I'm taking Patreon questions. Go join. All of that will be early on Patreon and slowly released yeah. on YouTube. So uh, I'm looking forward to that one, Dr. Carrier. Yeah, me too. And with that being said, ladies and gentlemen, never forget, if you have cognitive dissonance and you think that Daniel was written in the 6th century BC, then you might not remember that we are Myth Vision. Myth Vision. Welcome back to Myth Vision Podcast. How's everybody doing in the chat? I hope you're doing well. Let me know you can hear me. I hope uh, everything's coming through clear. I have Dr. Richard Carrier here joining me in person. Um, I'm not a docetist when it comes to Richard Carrier. I think he is, yeah, he's solid. Definitely, definitely exists, yeah. Yeah, you're not too hard. Uh, you're not You're not uh, corporeal like I, I can actually physically... Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no cast for the ghost here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> um, so today we're going to have an interesting discussion. I don't think we've ever done this on Myth Vision. Really? This particular, we, you've brought it up. Oh, you mean with me specifically? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. No, we, you and I have never talked about we've this. We've never done this. So, I've talked about this many times, but not on this show before. Right, right. And one of the things I wanted to do for those who are caught up in the recent stuff that's going on with mythicist and historicist is to give uh, Dr. Carrier... Uh, a chance to just give us a historical model mm -hmm. that works. Yeah. Cause I, I want to paint the picture. I think a lot of people who read your work, right. They, they see you as this guy who's like, I'm a dogmatic atheist or a uh, atheist dogmatic mythicist right. yeah. who just can't even picture a historical Jesus being on yeah, the scene, which is weird. Cause that's not what's positioned in the book, but anyway, and I <laughs> wonder if it's because of the debates that go on. There's always a dick measuring contest online. So what yeah. happens is there's overcompensation on both sides from historicist or mythicist. Yeah, I think it's no, it's just people just have a hard time actually paying attention to what someone says. So so if you like advocate a theory, they add all of these other assumptions on top of what you said, right? Like the, so just because you didn't bring up the plausibility of Jesus, they'll assume that you don't think it's plausible. Okay. Um that is a false assumption. It's like doesn't follow from anything what someone is saying, but people will leap to that conclusion because they have these preconceived ideas of what mythicists are about. And that's largely because of the internet, right? You have all of these amateur mythicist groups, like Arcaria S's fan base, for example, right. is like religiously fanatic. At Joseph Atwill, it's the same thing, right? Like these are like- Oh, by the way, he's fanatical. not a mythicist anymore. Is he not? No. I, I haven't heard this. <laughs> yeah, this is new stuff and it hasn't come out, so I can't say anything yet. Oh, okay. But Atwill has changed his I position? I think he's changed his mind on Jesus possibly being a mundane Jewish guy who got killed. Wow, That would okay. change his entire book. Of course, would, so yeah, he... that would change his whole marketing plan. Um, I, don't know. I yeah. mean, I'm curious. I yeah, I figure I'd give you a teaser. But today, <laughs> we have a historicist joining us. <laughs> so a priori, we're going to assume, because, I mean, look, I'm a historicist. I think there was probably a guy. Yeah, and even I give it, like, top odds of one and three, right? Okay. So, so well within the realm of plausibility, right? We're going to pretend so it's like— We're going like, to just assume, well, if he did exist, then what? Yeah, That's the thing. exactly. Yeah. So I'm, I'm painting—you're going to see a historicist carrier today. How does that yeah. sound? Yeah, all right. All right. <laughs> 
it's what I do as a historian. So right. you, you have to model hypotheses and, you know, be able to, you have to be able to take them seriously and contemplate them and work out like how much do they fit the evidence? How much do they predict the evidence? Like okay. there's no way to actually defend mythicism without actually being able to do this with historicism and vice versa, by the way, like you can't criticize mythicism if you can't actually get in the head of mythicism and actually use it as a model and say, well, how does, how well does it perform in predicting the evidence? Right. 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 Um, so you have to take the opposite theory seriously uh, in order to defend the theory that, that you want. Right. Well, so, so yeah, taking historicism today, theory seriously is what I do. Yeah, exactly. And you'll be able to flex your knowledge of like a, mm -hmm. approaching the historical Jesus model today. And I think we might start with like the ridiculous models. Yeah. Or, or models that seem less, let, we'll, we'll put it that I way. Yeah. Let's not be so. You <laughs> well, know. people who read my book know uh, the <laughs> example of Bruce Chilton, right? And I had Bruce Chilton's, like, he, he says, like, he has this whole long list of just beliefs he has about Jesus that he thinks you can, that he says you must believe given the sources. And it's like, it's absurd, right? So it's, it's right. a huge list that almost no mainstream scholar believes is true, right? <laughs> like some of the things they do, but not, yeah. all, not the whole list, right? And so the more you stack up all these hyper specific statements and beliefs about Jesus, like that he was, he was actually an illegitimate child and had problems as a kid in, 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 in Nazareth. You know, like, we have, there was yeah, no like reason to that believe that. So <laughs> over the top. So I'm. A, so I'm, that, that kind of stuff, I think, is no, look, you're going way beyond the evidence, right? right? So, right. Um, so, but anyway, no, we're going to look at, I think you, have, you brought up Wikipedia and it had like a list of kind of the standard ones, right. really, right? So there's, there's many competing ones are taken seriously in the field. And I think like- Those are the ones we're gonna bring right. up. And, and I think actually, some did less the list likely. even include the sorcerer of Jesus? Cause I think it's not even on there. Um, it mentions the the charismatic killer, but not the sorcerer, but yeah, we'll, we'll okay, get so into no, that. No, but I think that's, a, I think we should do that now. Uh, so okay. Morton Smith's Jesus the Magician, right? It's, yeah, I got It's another that. one of these that's- um, Somewhere about here. Yeah. That, that's one that's, that is very fringe. It's not, doesn't have a lot of adherence um, in uh, Jesus studies today. And with good reason, like he, the book is valuable. Like there's a ton of research on ancient magic and sorcerers right. and stuff. And it does situate Jesus in the world he would have been moving in. Right. So like, you can see like, well, well who are Jesus's competition? Like, right. And so like seeing, seeing the way people write about him, like the gospels and things, you can understand it more if you understand the context of the magic and stuff. But the evidence that Jesus himself was positioning himself as a sorcerer is weak tea. Right. So well, like, like you really can't. Wouldn't sorcerer too, as I've been looking into this magician, there's like this in-group, out-group language going on here. And like, if you say someone's a magician, oh, it's like you're a actually pejorative. saying that they're, yeah, you know, yeah. a, a, a curse crank, word. A crank right. or a quack. Or, yes, they're absolutely. More, they if that if way. you say they're a prophet or you say that they're doing something and it's within your confines of your religion, then yeah. it's kosher. It's, That's it's right. orthodox. Yeah, yeah, no, it's no, good. No. But if they're not your friend, or they're yeah. your opponent, then they're a magician or a sorcerer yeah, or something yeah. like no, that. No, absolutely. It's, it's used as a pejorative, but also like just as it's a regular word, right? So it isn't always right. a pejorative. Um, it's like psychic, you know, like saying, oh, they, she, you know, she goes to that psychic. Where psychics right. call themselves psychics, but we also use it as a pejorative, like right. psychics. We, you know, we roll our eyes. Reader. You're a palm right. reader. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's, it's like, but that's literally what they claim <laughs> to do, right? So, um, uh, so anyway, that the Jesus as sorcerer model isn't plausible. The the only actual ancient attestation we have of something like that uh, is in the Talmud, right? Like, because in the Talmud, it's, it places Jesus a hundred years earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, he's stoned to death in Joppa by the Sanhedrin, and this is Jesus of Nazareth, or Jesus the Nazarene, in any case, mm -hmm. uh, with a mother named Mary, etc. So we know it's, they're talking about the same Jesus, and they have him stoned to death by the Sanhedrin in Joppa for sorcery, right? And so they talk, they have all these like weird beliefs that he liked. I think something like he tattooed spells on him or something. Like there, there's a lot of like weird claims, <laughs> <clears throat> but that comes so late, uh, and that's obviously a polemic against. That, that doesn't come from the Christian teaching they're attacking. Right. They're just laying that on it, right? So so that doesn't really, you can't really reconstruct Jesus the sorcerer from that. And like if this. that were, and I'm just saying this, if that were the most, if that was Jesus, damn, our sources are so <laughs> really screwed up. bad, yeah. So yeah. yeah. Well, Martin Smith took things like Jesus takes spit to like- Oh, there is the some interesting things. So, uh, so yeah, so like the, the, he, he does try to find things in the gospels that track that, but we actually have- other explanations of those things that, that are that don't track back to Jesus being a sorcerer. Um, in particular, to speak of uh, the course that I just filmed with you and that you're going to be editing up, mm -hmm. eventually will come out next myth year. Of sometime. The Gospels. Yeah, myth of the Gospels. I think uh, maybe the myth, the mythology of the Gospel according to Mark. So we're doing okay. two courses. One is the mythology of the Gospels, where I just do myth and the Gospels, and then the other is just focus on Mark mythology according of the Gospel according to Mark. And uh, I think that's the one where I go into Jesus using spit. Uh, and the thing is, is when you, when you line it up in the internal literary structure of where that appears, 
uh, it appears in a certain doublet and, that matches a water from a rock narrative in Moses. Okay. Okay. So, so what you're looking at is, is you have an equal explanation here. Is like, well, that might just be water is flowing from the rock because the rock is Christ, as Paul says, right? The, the okay. water that followed the or the rock that followed the Jews and water flowed right. from it. Weird, he says that was Christ. Passage, yeah, right? yeah. He says that was Christ. So here we have this, you know, allegorical. Jesus is using spit to like replicate water from the rock and bring healing to the masses and stuff. See, I thought so, that the explanation that he had, which was really interesting to me, and I don't rule it out. I mean, it's still on the table to me. It's just, there's so many other ways uh -huh. to look at this. It's yeah, yeah, the absolutely, idea that right. He attempts the first time, and then he has to come back again, like, damn it, my, it didn't work. Yeah, now, but then you have to explain, the curious... right, you have to explain why does the author preserve that detail, or why did they right, invent the detail? Right. So even if it's a historical detail, like it's the story told to him, he'd say, oh, that doesn't make Jesus look good. I'm going to just erase that and retell the story. So you have to explain, like, why did he choose to include that detail? And then once you have a reason why he would include it, well, now you have that same reason for him to invent it, right? And so that's that's why you have to, like, it's difficult to reconstruct the historical Jesus because there's, it's easy to show that there are reasons to make up these stories. Right. And then you can't rule that out is the main thing. It doesn't mean that they did make them up necessarily. Mm -hmm. It just means you can't rule that out. There's no evidence for us to like work that out. It's, it's kind of right. like, so it's like trying to peek behind the, the, the made up uh, material. Yeah. Even if there was something historically kernel, we can't reconstruct it because it's been fudged. Exactly. A perfect example that I use in the book is Haile Selassie, which is, you know, Rastafarianism believes that Rastafari is the, you know, the, the royal name of Haile Selassie, who was the Ethiopian mm -hmm. royalty at the time. Uh, and he like, he did, had nothing to do with the religion and like, you know, renounced like denounced it to his death, right? So he's like, I, I don't know what you people are doing. I had nothing to do with this. But they had all of the they had this whole Bible with their gospels about him and these like wild stories about miracles and stuff like that. And like if all we had was the Rastafari Bible, um, and they call it the Rastafari Bible, what would you how would you know what was historical? Like we can figure that out because we can go to external records mm -hmm. and confirm mm -hmm. what is true about Haile Selassie. Um, but if all you have is the religious literature, well, that's a lot harder to do because you, you don't know what they're making up. And even if they're choosing historical details, the reason that they're choosing them is because they it favors their religion in some way, right? Got it. So, so they have a reason to they have just as much a reason to make that stuff up as to just and lift it. We see that in the gospels. There's a constant building of legend between gospels where well, yeah, that's even also the true. one yeah. version of it has to beat the earlier version, which already may be a made up point about right, it so yeah. now you've got like cake on cake <laughs> yeah, layer yeah, yeah, of yeah, bullshit yeah. Right, that's right. trying to say about so it's hard to know what actually is um i do want to yeah. hit these super chats yeah, if you it. don't mind reality and me thank you for the super chat good to see everybody in the house here today i hope you're uh, in tune for a fun ride we're going to talk about the historical jesus and if there was one what are the best ways to getting at it and we all know that dr carrier of course leans and goes in the direction of there being no Jesus, historically speaking, but it's mostly a mythos or a created figure. Um, obviously, they believed he was real. Right. But, but uh, let's yeah, not get An lost. imaginary Jesus versus a historical Jesus. Right, yeah, right. Like, like people believe in angels, yeah, but yeah. are they really there? You know, that kind of thing. So, But like I said, I still think there are plausible historical Jesus models, too. So. We're going to get into that today, and I hope, hope to do that. So thank you, Reality and Me. I didn't see a question from you there, so I know you super chatted again. Scott Daniels said, I don't care what kind of hologram tech you have, Derek. I am a staunch Richard Carrier <laughs> mythicist. <laughs> <laughs> thank you scott daniel for being yeah uh, it's fan. it's ai ai has gotten that good we're that AI, good it's, yeah i'm telling you i'm not even real yeah i'm like, actually this is bob price and ai is like replacing me <laughs> see i'm actually richer you don't even know what's going on That's right thank yeah. you so much AI video reality and me what do you think of the roman provenance theory specifically about creating christ by james Vine? okay so i didn't want to get sidetrack into <laughs> right the historical that. jesus thing yeah. can we save let's save these i guess let's get through our rant and then come back to super chats what do you say because this is going to take us off asking, course but you mean talking about valiance theory yeah uh, i, I figure let's hold off on yeah uh, quite simply ask him to get it passed through peer review that's that's all i'm asking you're right? definitely like, not so, a, no uh, it's not plausible at all um and he's making a lot of claims that are deeply suspect and his argumentation is really convoluted so it's really hard to even figure out what he's arguing or how it follows from the facts he presents. So uh, so that's a challenge. Uh, I would like to see him produce it in such a fashion that it would pass peer review. And then I could like spend my time to like examine it in detail to see what, what survived peer review. Then uh, then we can take that seriously okay. and go into it. Um, but for him to keep doing this, you know, uh, amateur style, uh, what he's, he's making a lot of claims about like what symbols mean on coins and stuff like that without discussing any of the numismatic literature or iconographic literature in, in the field. So um, 
he, he needs to be doing a lot more work that would be done if he was an actual historian making this claim, right? So, uh, so no, I don't, I don't think that's believable. The Roman provenance theory, though, usually means at will or something like at will. Or at will, of course, his theory goes back to the Paizo conspiracy theory, which is not the actual Paizo conspiracy theory. Um, the actual Paizo conspiracy was actual, where he conspired to execute or conspired to assassinate Nero. No, but there's another Paizo conspiracy theory that dates way back about how somehow the Paizo family was involved in uh inventing christianity mm -hmm. and it connects josephus and all these other there's things. people who still circulate yeah this, uh, well atwell's version right At atwell's version is the one that most people know where he's right. he's kind of like gotten rid of the piezo part and he's just focusing on the flavian part mm -hmm. right so mm -hmm. um anyway so that that is a popular thing again it, it's it's deeply implausible like th there, there's no good evidence to argue that the roman empire deliberately invented christianity uh it usually is based on a lot of you know speculation essentially okay. and and really like arguing against the evidence the lean of the evidence so anyway if they want to get it taken seriously they really need to get a version through peer review like that's that's, that's what i would want hey, and I'll there's a lot of other theories of the historical jesus that are implausible that have passed peer review so you can totally do this yeah just got to do the work man okay well reality me appreciate the super chat i'd love to have some super chats that are in the vein of like historical jesus stuff but i'll take anything i can get you know it is what it is um We'll, we'll, we'll get to Super Chats here in a minute. All right. I, yeah. I see you're already distracted yeah, here. Yeah. So we'll, 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 we'll take it off so you don't see any in sure, the chat sure. for now because it might distract you. Um, mm -hmm. We will come back to you. Now let's go to the next Jesus here. We talked about the charismatic healing Jesus. I've even seen early art with him having a wand and stuff like that. Yeah, uh, the art is portraying him in that role. That's actually a sorcery role, right? Like mm -hmm. it's, it's the idea of using a wand to cast your miracles. So yeah, Jesus does get depicted, but this is Jesus Deus here, right? Mm -hmm. So like, if you go to uh, Litwa's book on this, where he talks about that, there's also um, Matthew's book, uh, uh, Battle of the Gods, Clash of the Gods, I mm -hmm. think is the name of it. Where he, he does the same thing, he goes through the artwork, and, and I, Litwa probably even cites Matthew's, I'm not sure, but um, Matthew's and Litwa do this same analysis, looking at the iconography and show that it is pagan iconography. They're basically stealing ideas from putting it uh, on to Jesus. right and then just make it poor using that as the way to portray Jesus to the public it's you know it's kind of a way if you're doing advertising you use like whatever the popular thing is to do to advertise your guy um but that's all really late right the art starts like the earliest art we have for Christians is like third century so this is Got this it. is so late that it doesn't really inform the origins of Christianity and that's, that's why it isn't really usable for for things like Morton Smith's theory I just figured I'd, I'd mention that because that did see, that seems a bit late, but there were Jewish people like Honey the Circle Drawer. Yeah, there was right. Weird... Josephus writes about the weird exorcist spellcaster guy. Yeah, there, there's there's definitely or even there Simon was, Magus, right? There was a whole tradition of Jewish magic, and it was often based on power words. Like if you learn the secret language of the angels, you you can uh, you you can create things and basically do things that God does, mm -hmm. right? Because uh, they, they take seriously that God spoke and then created. So they think, oh, if you just know the right words, you can do what God does, right? It's the, it's the Jewish magic idea. Um, for those who want a B-movie, a fun, silly B-movie version of this is, is Warlock. Uh, mm -hmm. So there's a movie called Warlock where that's the whole plot. Wow. Is, is that he's trying Jesus to find. Or it's he's, well, he's a... trying. There's a secret book that has the secret language that, that God spoke oh, at the okay. beginning of creation. He says, well, if you speak it in reverse, you can undo creation or whatever. Oh, <laughs> and, sounds like a scene. And that, 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 that idea, <laughs> right. That idea is right out of ancient Jewish magic principles. So so it's kind of funny. Like, whoever did that, like, did a little bit of research, I think. I'm going to. Um, let's do um, Prophet of Social Change. Yeah. Well, that's a. <laughs> That's, I think, kind of maybe a reference to like John Dominic Crossan's model. And there have okay. been a few other people who've argued that Jesus is basically, you know, this Martin Luther King character. He's like, you know, I'm going to come and I'm a social reformer and I've got these great ideas about how to reform society. Uh, and they always conveniently line up with the politics of the scholar. Who's right. right. That's <laughs> kind of, I did a yeah. 48 minute video yeah. recently. It's really good, but it is exactly. Um, Dennis McDonald is actually in this camp now. Like he's, he's pushing the idea that there, Jesus was this, this uh, Deuteronomic, you know, Torah reformer. And and his whole his whole model of Q supports of course Dennis McDonald's religious message and it just happens to align with the message that McDonald wants to spread to like both atheists and theists and saying hey Jesus was this Torah reformer we can actually learn from the message here etc <clears throat> but you know he has to go through this extremely elaborate process to extract that out of the evidence and I think generally that's not how it would have worked like even insofar as someone what would be a social reformer mm -hmm. back then in that particular model you would do it in the form of an apocalyptic prophet right so like you would 
it, it, it actually doesn't get rid of the apocalyptic prophet thing. So you have examples of We're like, going to get to that, I think. Yeah, if you look at the Jewish, like the, the Hillelites and the Shammites, you have mm -hmm. Hillel and Shammai, the two rabbis that argued with each other about how strict or liberal should you approach the Torah <clears throat> and the Mishnah. Uh, that's an example of the kind of arguments they have with each other as ordinary rabbis, but that isn't what we see from Christianity. We see like right out of the gate, this is like an, an urgent apocalyptic movement, right? right? So, right. so you got to figure out where would that have come from if it didn't come from Jesus, is, is, is my thinking. And I know there's like some scholars and there's kind of, you were mentioning the Jesus, uh, Jesus seminar seems to trend towards the getting rid I of the could apocalyptic be wrong. prophet. I, it depends I have on seen who... some scholars do this. Yeah, like yeah. say like, oh no, that was all invented later. And it's like, I mean, Did maybe? Paul, yeah, is Pauline like, theology being tacked on to Paul? Yeah, is Paul Jesus? having visions? Yeah, it, the thing that I have, the problem I have with that is even if you get Paul out of it, and you look at the original apostles, they clearly have this idea of there's an urgent message. The world, the end of the world has begun. We have to like urgently get this stuff out. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is easier to explain. It's more probable if that's the message that Jesus was preaching, right? Right. Um, if it's not impossible that they would just wake up after he was dead and go, you know what? I got this idea. I'm going to claim that he like re revealed to me that the end is nigh, et cetera. Right. Um, that is entirely re possible. How can we reconstruct that? Yeah, yeah. right. Exactly. That's a good yeah. point. Like it's plausible, but it, kind of strains against the evidence so it would go okay. low on the list is what i would put it i wouldn't say it's like something you have to knock off the list like a roman providence theory for instance yeah, I or, think or the, jesus the sorcerer like the zeitgeist even of their own christian fictional literature like acts when they paint jesus in line with similar figures mm -hmm. that gives me i would say on my predictive scale of things i would put <clears throat> jesus in a category yeah similar you're you're, you're anticipating my my concluding to new yeah we're not there yet so <laughs> we're not there yet but yeah <laughs> Pause on that conclusion. <laughs> um, so I do want to mention one thing, and maybe you know the name. I can't remember. There's a scholar who said, and this is like a well-known critical scholar in history who pretty much said, like, everybody has a Jesus in their own image. It's like yeah, they can't quite. Yeah, a few scholars have said great lines on this. Hector Avalos was one. Um, Cr Cross on himself was another who said, like, everybody just seems to see themselves in Jesus. And and there's just as many Jesus models as there are scholars. Right. One of the other lines. Right. Uh, that. Yeah, yeah. That, that, and that does indicate that there's a problem that needs to be solved here. A uh, methodological problem. Right, right. And, uh, and even... I'm not the only one to say that, by the way. I should say, like, every scholar who's done an examination of methodology. I just mentioned Crossan and Avalos have both pointed this out. James Crossley. Oh, James Crossley wrote like three books now on this, Chris. So he, he's been studying like how are Jesus is being invented. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, he has a book on like the earlier stuff. And he he's big on this idea that scholars are seeing in Jesus what they want to see, right? And so he, he documents this and stuff. And then he even gets to the zealot Jesus. That idea starts to become popular right around when Islamic terrorism becomes like a major social issue. Now, now we're talking about Jesus the zealot. Now, the theory predates all that. But it, when it becomes like more scholars are now into it all of a sudden, um, there's a weird like political social lineup that's kind of like leads you to like, well, what's why are we suddenly going to this theory, basically? Why now when, when it wasn't popular, you know, 20, 30 years ago? Uh, and so anyway, so James Crossley's done this too. So like James Crossley's talked about this, Avalos and Crossan have talked about this. And every, every scholarly work studying the methodology uh, specifically has come out with a conclusion that this methodology is problematic, right? So, right. so this, the, the field is aware of the problems that they have with their methodology. They're just not implementing very well in terms of solving it. So when I recorded the course <clears throat> and it should be edited sometime in the next few weeks, my goal is to hit the ground running with these courses. Mm -hmm. We did five, by the way. So for those of you who are looking forward to hearing more from Carrier and taking college level courses with him, We've got some courses that'll be coming out, and uh, that'll be a while though. Because yeah, it's so a much... lot of editing work to do. So yeah, it's it's anyway, it'll be out there. Yeah, though. yeah. be on the lookout. <laughs> but I did do a, a course on the quest for the historical Jesus with Delcy Allison Jr. The historical quest from oh, the scholarship. Yeah. That's what I was just talking to you about. You're you're asking about the idea of how do we talk about the history of the history of Jesus, exactly. right? So and that's the historiography of the field. Yeah, he does the historiography. It's so much fun, and then he ends the final eighth course on Dominic Crossan. Mm -hmm. And I had this, I, this is not just like a sixth sense thing. It was like kind of like the conclusion <laughs> to me was what scholarship wants and what really is attractive to scholars who are in peer review. First of all, when they're doing their dissertation, they're trying to find something that undermines previous scholarship. So they're actually hunting. Their purpose is to right, hunt right, for a right. Jesus yeah. <laughs> that might be different from yeah, what it's, the it's the same. It's a similar problem in all the sciences, which is the idea of replicating someone else's work gets less grant money and, and less attention and stuff. Whereas refuting someone else's work gets a lot more money and attention. So, so yeah, science has this problem too 
Uh, but you're right. Yeah, the, the idea is like, how do I make my mark? I got to do something. And you now, know, really, I'm the curious. real thing is you got you do have to do something new, right? So right, like, you can't right. just replicate. That's the problem. So this um, is what I'm and saying. And so, like, how do you find a new thing? If everyone's paved the road, the, for right? If the road is paved, Jesus, <laughs> why, John Dominic Crossan sticks out like a sore thumb in yeah. a good way. I mean, he's a great scholar, but even. Allison, while he gave the lecture, you can see his tendencies. You can see him uh, go, yeah. see, Dom has this political <laughs> world from Ireland. Yeah. And he says, and what is going on in Ireland, he sees happening yeah, in his right. Jesus mm -hmm. study. Yeah, so, yeah. That's, that's, that's Crossley's theme as well. So like Crossley right. does that. Um, I know I think there's something to that uh, because normally I'd be suspicious of those kinds of explanations, except for it lines up with the, ob the observation that they're, why do all these scholars find a Jesus that just happens to line up with their politics and their political mm -hmm. situation, right? Like, that's a weird coincidence, let's just right. say. So it begs explanation. And, and so, um, yeah, so anyway, a lot of other scholars have noticed this and talked about it, yeah. I just figure we're painting See, that's this... Allison, you just mentioned. We got Allison to add to the list. He's Allison. doing the same kind of analysis, yeah. Yeah, and, and listen, this is why I really got a lot of respect for him. Like, I really do. Here's a man who in 1970-something had an experience. He can't explain it, and he says, I don't think my mental faculties are all screwed up, which I don't think people who have experiences yeah. either. I mean, well, the I, brain is a I goofy had, little machine anyway, I had full-on hallucinations when I was a Taoist, right? right? So that convinced me that Taoism was true. So I, I know what that's like. But he has a conviction, right, of faith. And he's writing books, and I've got a list of them back here. In fact, I think they're right <coughs> – they're, they're back here. They're yeah. all, I've got yeah. so many. Yeah. Um, and in every single one of these books, he talks about the fellow – apocalyptic prophet jesus but he has faith in this so like if someone is drawing a conclusion that's kind of contradictory to their faith conclusion to me yeah, yeah. It's, to me it's kind of like how do you do both yeah there's an honesty yeah, yeah. in his scholarship that you right. have to at least i'm not saying everything is honestly there. some of the best scholarship is when that's what happens right mm -hmm. so like when, when you have instead of the habermas model the gary habermas oh model, he is bending and twisting. you have someone like allison or even Cross News, I, I think, is a genuine believer. But there's yes. Uh, so there's there's a lot of these. And James Crossley is another example, I think. Um, I could be wrong, but um, when you have these believers who are willing to admit that, well, okay, all the things we want to believe aren't really historically supportable. Right. Um, and a good example of this actually is the classic Raymond Brown, right, the Catholic great Catholic scholar, and he did like two massive commentaries on the birth of Jesus and the death of Jesus, and he like clearly demarcates all the way through. It's like, okay, these are the faith beliefs I have. I believe in the virgin birth, et cetera. But he goes through and like with eyes of objective historian and says, but based on the principles of objective history, I, I can't justify it, right? So like, yeah. so then he goes and is willing to admit like, yeah, there's mythological reasons for this, et cetera. You know, I believe it as a faith thing, but like the methods of history don't get you there. It's right. basically, so, and that actually produced like some of the greatest commentaries on the nativity and the resurrection of Jesus, right? So when you have that particular attitude, um, I think you get better work, but then I think the same effect happens with secular scholars too. Right, so, right. Um, cause they don't have a, a dog in the race essentially. Right. So it's easier for them to see things maybe clearly in that respect. That's so true. I just, I want, that's an important thing as we go along that I think is really cool about learning, um, in Jesus studies. So, all right. Our next, uh, Jesus, we dealt with, well, we talked about profit of social change and that doesn't mean that there aren't involvement of things that might be yeah, changing. Yeah. Any, any kind of social, any kind of, any messianic pretender, anyone who's pretending to be a messiah mm -hmm. is by definition in that way, advocating some sort of social change. Like they see some sort of social problem that they, they think they can solve in some way. And that's true for like all the like major rabbis who are talking right. about social issues and even and, Hillel and, 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 and uh, both of them are yeah disagreeing. exactly right that, that, so 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 there is always some aspect of profit for social profit of social change even the old testament prophets you can find that model in them right, right like so right. so um so that there's nothing inherently wrong about that it's just that is sort of like the, the tack on to whatever the fundamental thing it is they're doing like what is driving them it's not like they're just gonna go out there like a philosopher and say well the philosophy is on here cynic philosopher we're gonna get into that um the cynic philosopher oh, i'll just drop drop it right now okay so, go ahead a uh, cynic philosopher is very much like that. Is like I'm just going to rationally analyze social culture and point out how it's because uh, the cynic philosophy was very much countercultural philosophy. Is like stepping out in postmodern style, examining the culture and saying, you know, we made up all this culture stuff and it's bullshit, right? Is, mm -hmm. is the way they go through it. Uh, and you know, they so they they like criticize institutions like marriage and and all those sort of other social assumptions. Um, and so they're very much the hippies, right? Like the 60 hip, 60s style hippies of the time. But they're using rational discourse. You know, they, they analyze uh, what things look like and they say, like, this is why this is all cultural. It's all made up and why we need to abandon all of these cult human made cultural things. 
Um, Jesus can't have been that because like that would not have been a message that would resonate at all in Judea mm -hmm. because that, it's if you're not giving the voice of God, then get out of town basically is their yeah. idea, right? So you could be influenced by cynic philosophy, but you would have to reframe it as God said or something like that, right? Like saying, I, I have the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and I'm reading these texts and this is what I'm finding. So you would have to do something like you see at Qumran, where they're like they're they're seeing things, you know, hidden messages, hidden messages in scripture, and are coming up with a new form of Judaism, and so and they feel like they're inspired by the Holy Spirit, God's guiding them, etc. Right. They're so taking you, their experience yeah, too, and then kind of like the the things. rational argument model doesn't work in this environment. So um, so is it fair to why. say the cynic stuff is really um, we get, we need to go to the Gospels technically? I think um, I think this. So there's a the truth to the cynic philosophy or the cynic influence hypothesis, which mm -hmm. is that a lot of the ideas of cynicism found their way into Judaism well before Christianity came along. And they're already there. So by the okay. time that Christianity comes along, um, insofar as, you know, let's say there's a real Jesus and he's really doing like teaching and he's doing this parabolic type of teaching, right? That we, which is actually comes from the rabbinical tradition, but it looks a lot like cynic philosophy, the way cynics talk about things. And he could have a lot of ideas in there that you can, oh, well, you know what? That lines up right with the cynics. But that doesn't mean that like Jesus went and read a cynic and mm -hmm. then said, oh, I'm going to borrow these ideas. He might be getting these, these ideas from other Jewish preachers. It's just, it's the, in the, you know, in the air basically. Right. And not even realize that that goes back a couple hundred years to like cynic influence on Judaism and Jewish thought. Right. right. So, right. so they're trying to trace the exact influence of cynic philosophy is one thing. And then there's also a parallel development, right? Like if a cynic, thinks a certain way and sees something, well, someone who thinks the same way is going to see it as well. And it doesn't mean that they know each other. They're just independently coming up with it. And if you look at, for instance, Wang Chung, uh, he's a Han Dynasty Chinese philosopher. Um, he's a naturalist philosopher. So like he's someone saying, oh, there's no gods, there's no supernatural. And he's basically naturalist philosophy is what he's promoting. And it looks a lot like naturalist philosophy in ancient Greece and with no communication really between them, right? They independently come to the same conclusion. So, so seeing parallels does not entail necessarily yeah, influence. But we can't, you we, have to argue for it. I don't think the independent thing would work here. I love the Jesus days. Of course, we brought up Dr. Litwa's work and I think it's brilliant. And he shows using much of the scholarship that like Hellenism had already seeped into the pores yeah. for centuries before yeah, we talk about absolutely. And that's, that's been denied by Christian apologists, but I think there's a number of enough scholars now on the vanguard who are just who are breaking that paradigm down and saying, no, 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 there's actually Jews were borrowing a lot from the Greeks and, 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 you know, Judaizing it. So they're turning it into something that is uh, Jewish compatible, but yeah, the influence is definitely there. And it's for hundreds of years before Christianity, comes along, right? So, so we technically right now, as we've come, we've got social change, a prophet of social change, which could overlap. It's not like it has to be a single category. Cynic philosopher doesn't have to be a single category, especially if Hellenism's already seeped in yeah. the course of all the Jews. Um, charismatic killer. Could we, could we so far, could we have a Frankenstein here where there, yeah. he could have been running around doing weird little. Certainly. Little I mean, yeah. I, oh, Look, Paul, right? Paul mm -hmm. says that, like, what are the miracles they do? Basically, healing and exorcism or, and uh, speaking in tongues. Like, those are the, I think those are the top three, right? So they're somehow supposed to, being able to speak to spirits, being able to heal, and being able to expel demons are like, that's that's the Christian missionary toolbox, right? Mm -hmm. And and so, yeah, Jesus, almost certainly, you would think, if he was historical, did those things. Now, it is peculiar that Paul says in Philippians 2 that Jesus gave up all his powers. He became a slave. And that's obviously doesn't mean like he was bought on the slave market, but it means like he became a slave to the world order, which mm -hmm. means he's giving up his supernatural powers, humbling himself to the level of an ordinary human. Right. Um, that suggests that Jesus didn't perform any miracles. And or that could. He, uh, yeah, right. It I could. mean, yeah, it could suggest that. And then when Paul talks about the miracles, it seems to be that what he's talking about is this, the breaking out of these miracles is the proof that Jesus conquered satan which is means that it happened after his resurrection okay and that this outflowing of the holy spirit so is this proof. post hoc right it becomes stuff. proof that their jesus story is true right uh, and this could be the case with historical jesus easily right so the historical jesus didn't necessarily do healings and exorcisms and stuff but he might have been this you know really charismatically inspiring pro and prophetic speaker talking about the end of the world let's say and then it inspires his followers to like carry his message on and then of course they have this belief that Yes, you know, I, now I'm in, you know, the power of God is in me proving that he has conquered uh, the elements of the world and now is ascended to be, you know, God's right hand man kind of thing. Um, that is totally plausible. In fact, gets close to what I think is the most plausible theory. Okay, we're, we're, we're putting a composite Jesus. Now we're talking about and a rabbi, Jewish Messiah and rabbi. Yeah, rabbi would mean, of course, <clears throat> educated, um, literate, uh, and 
uh, oftentimes people, as an argument against this, they'll say, well, he was a carpenter. And I was like, well, actually, all rabbis, yeah, which is actually vague. It could, it be, could be any kind of craftsman. I thought That's maybe right. a stonemason, because all of his parables, if you grant them uh, yeah, to go uh -huh. back, you know, put your house on a, a real foundation, the foundation right, stone, the yeah, stone, yeah. there's all the stone imagery. Yeah. He's a okay. carpenter. You That's imagine. actually a good point. I hadn't really thought of that. But, yeah. um, anyway. but it is true that tecton is vague. You normally put the other, tecton of what? Right. Of wood, stone, metal, etc. cetera. Uh, so it really just means craftsman, which I think is an allegorical thing. This craftsman means God. Anyway, okay. um, the creator. Actually, not God specifically, but the creator, which we know from Paul is Jesus, because God appointed Jesus to do the create, affect the creation. You know, it's 1 Corinthians 8. Um, so I think uh, so I think craftsman is just kind of like a pun, essentially. Uh, but anyway, if we take it seriously, if it's an actual artifact of history, right, that he actually was a carpenter, um, rabbis were actually required to ply a manual trade. So we have rabbis who are carpenters, sandal makers, fishermen, and so on. So so being a, let's say, something that looks like a peasant job uh, doesn't rule out being an educated rabbi because they all had those jobs. Um, so, and Jesus is repeatedly called rabbi in the gospels, like yeah. repeatedly. So, um, so, you know, if, if, you know, carpenter is a survival uh, from a historical fact, rabbi could be a survival from a historical fact. Isn't and it he could be just a rabbi. rabbi can just simply be a colloquial, you're just a teacher. It means master, teacher, um, but it's like calling yourself a PhD doctor, philosophy or whatever. I thought that was anachronistic to like rabbinic Judaism to do that. I didn't know because some people also oh, try no. to say if you're a rabbi, then you must be married because that's another thing that goes along. Oh, it's, with yeah, people. it's expected. Um, I don't, I don't know to what extent that was true back then. Okay. I, I've seen debates about this. But, I'm just throwing um, stuff out there. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, but no, um, normally you, like, it would be kind of a bit like the Pharisees would constantly point out that this is inappropriate to call him a rabbi because he's, he's not properly educated. He's not properly mm -hmm. trained to be a rabbi. He can't even read the scriptures. What are you talking about? Right. Um, so the fact that, like, you don't see any, like, that kind of challenge, like, and, you know, and Luke gets rid of this challenge by having Jesus read and people be surprised that he could read. Um, I think that is, and I think that's a made up myth later, but you could totally have had Jesus was an educated rabbi and, you know, was this at the same time, kind of like this really alarmist apocalyptic prophet kind of dude. Mm -hmm. um, that's, there's a totally compatible and totally plausible in context. So, uh, but we, you know, we can't prove it, but we have as much evidence for that as we have of almost anything else you might claim about Jesus. Right. Um, Jewish Messiah. So, this, I feel like many of these categories could be true simultaneously. Yeah, and it's also like, like Jewish Messiah, you mean like literally, actually. <laughs> right, like kind of like Schweitzer or, seems to, what I think was so magical about what he did is he finally like wanted to cut out the fluff of Christian theology, which is super developed over time. Mm -hmm. And he said, this guy, if we look at other Jewish material, and this is before the Dead Sea Scrolls come in, mm -hmm. and he's like, like he fits in many ways and we're kind of getting to the apocalyptic Jesus yeah, here. Right. But like, I feel like Jewish Messiah and apocalyptic is. Yeah. Similar. So like, like let's, let's take this in a, like a non-supernaturalist direction. So um, what this theory would mean, the Jewish Messiah is the idea that Jesus actually believed and taught that he was the Messiah. Right. Mm -hmm. Cause this is a, this is debated in the field. Like ah, a lot of scholars disagree as to whether Jesus himself called himself. That's true. The Messiah. Um, whether or that was assigned to him by his followers after his death, right? Um, that's debated. Uh, the debate is both sides of that debate.
did we get raptured or what what happened there <laughs> hello <laughs> there it is. if at least if at least two of them pray it'll come back now have we come back i don't someone... know how long we were gone yeah can someone can someone say something in comments please let us know how... we're back okay thank you joel <laughs> yeah like i'm telling you god's like took us for a minute yeah, we don't we, know what we, we were we seeing that, and then that. he was like you are not worthy. And there's then, actually been a weird, a few weird inter internet things this week. So uh, that's it was probably on your two to three gone about four. Shh, are you kidding me? Whoa, two, two to three, three minutes? minutes? Oh, that's longer we than we thought. We literally went into the Mystic Jesus. Did you guys hear the Mystic Jesus? And <laughs> what Paul? was the last thing we said before? Yeah, uh, before help me out. Help I didn't me realize out. it was that long a drop. Help us out here in the chat. Yeah, but what was the last thing we talked about before we? Froze? That's the best thing we could do. <laughs> They're, they're not answering. Someone um, asked, I wish praying Derek would reappear with Robin. <laughs> oh, well. Well, we lost Mystic Jesus. Help us out. Help us out. Because I want to get into what was Jewish Messiah I Jesus. Though, like, so, like, it was still showing that recording for all that time. So it might actually show up. No, in the if recording. we got kicked, then it's blank for a minute there. Yeah, even the recording of this. Okay. Yeah, but so so the recording. Because our screen didn't go blank for a while. That's that's. Okay, so yeah. someone said Messiah Jesus. So we did the Messiah. Let's just recap Messiah Jesus getting into mystic. Yeah, because uh, we we went from Messiah Jesus, the supernatural. He really was the Messiah. Uh, to what would that mean, like in an objective historical sense? Uh, and that was the you idea. You were that saying that he would be like, did he believe even claim believe and claim right? And and yeah, and there's a dispute in the field whether he claimed that he was Messiah or that was claimed of him later. Like the Hasidic Jews view the one rabbi in uh, Brooklyn. Oh, there's yeah, there's that uh, Sabbatai Sevi, for example. So, anyway. Right. I just wanted to use that as an so, example. So right, um, he didn't claim himself to be one. It was the Jews. Right. It's him. exactly. It's the. It could be either model. Both are plausible. Right. right. So um, I I trend towards the he was claiming it. And, he might have been a, secretly going, hey, I am the Messiah. He could also have been doing that. I think that's less likely, okay, but it, okay. it's a possible thing. So, but the idea, of course, of mysticism is inherent in Christianity, and it, because it goes all the way back to Qumran, right? So, Qumran. Um, and Tabor's book, um, uh, Words Unutterable, something like that. Yeah, um, I love his is, work. Yeah, it's all about the halakhic literature and the idea. Like, mysticism was inherent in Judaism. And, so, and you see it in Paul. And so, like, if it's Judaism and Paul... And the link between them are the apostles and Jesus. Like it would, it, it probably runs causally straight through, right? right? So you would expect that the mysticism goes straight through Jesus to the apostles to, to, to Paul, right? Um, so mysticism, I think, is a plausible component. And this led us to talk about Frankenstein's models, where it could be that a lot of the little pieces of all of these theories are true, um, but they are subordinate to one organizing right theory of the historical jesus and, and we were just talking about how many plausible models like paul that. has secret teachings um there are things that some people can't handle the book of revelation even talks about some of these things like there's a lot of weird mystical stuff that happens there and we were wondering excuse me can the mystical model just fit into any of these technically and i mm -hmm. think it could in some sense um okay do we want to go ahead and just spearhead apocalyptic and then get into super chats or do we yeah, want to let's do that okay um, so out of all of the Jesus models, while they all can be like cherry picked from to fit some way, shape, or form, yeah, because um, they may all, they may all be true. And it, it we, we didn't cover one, which was militant Jesus. Z um, yeah, the, yeah, the idea that Jesus, like, like like Bruce Chilton says, that Jesus had an army and captured the temple for briefly, and there was a battle. Um, like, there's no way that happened without Josephus mentioning it. So, uh, right. so we can rule that out. But there are like Fernando Bermejo Rubio and other like there there are major scholars today who are advocating the idea that Jesus was actually trying to get an army together that he was actually advocating like physical violence to retake. Uh... So Bar Kokhba would be an example of this kind yeah. of messianic figure where he thinks you know I'm picking up swords, getting an army, we're kicking butt, God's going to be have our back, etc. Uh, so that's like the militant Messiah model, which totally existed. Uh, so yeah. so that's so the idea though there's not really good evidence that. Christianity ever fit this model. Uh, so like, if you look in like the letters of Paul, there's no, um, there's no effort that needs to be made to kind of distance themselves from this complaint, right? So like if Jesus was this militant Messiah, this would create all kinds of attacks against their movement. It's like, oh, are you trying to re recreate sort of military thing? And then you don't see any discussion of this. It just seems like they're just based on, oh no, this is all, this is an all, let's all get along religion, right? Like right out of the gate, like immediately after, uh, immediately as Christianity starts, it doesn't seem to be militantly based. So I don't think Jesus was that kind of Messiah necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, but if he was, it wasn't that he was gathering an army and getting into violence. 
uh, it was that he was sort of predicting that that was going to happen, right? like a prophetic, oh yeah, there's going to be a great war kind of thing. That That's possible. I think Jesus was trying to do something else, and this, this gets to what I think is the most probable theory. And we're going to get to that. I just want to mention real quick what, what the zealot model uh, or the militant Jesus model will do is say that the Gospels are whitewashing to, yeah, exactly. to kind of like cast yeah, yeah, yeah. to the Romans. But because... they'll contradictorily say that, and, and yet they let leak through evidence of the Messiah. Right, like going by a sword. Going by a sword, yeah. Cloak and, like... and here's the problem I have with that is that there's no way an author would put that in there. If, if their goal is to whitewash Jesus, they're not going to let that stuff leak through. So the only way that stuff would end up in there is if the author wanted it there. He has to want that saying there for some reason. And so that doesn't fit the messianic militarist model. Uh, that's that's why I think it's 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 plausible in context and the idea that there were these guys, but it's not plausible in the context of the evidence we have. So I, I think that's that goes pretty low, but probably the bottom or near the bottom of the list of plausible Jesuses in my in my estimation. Okay. Well I just we, I'm glad you reminded me to bring that up and and to discuss Yeah, I, I forgot about it. But um I think it's covered under the messianism, the Jewish messiah model that they list there. Yeah, and we did rabbi. <laughs> so we did rabbi, we did prophet of social change, we did mystic, we did Jewish messiah, we did cynic philosopher, we did charismatic killer. And now for one that we would both say is the most plausible even though each of these could have a tinge of truth to Going back, reconstructing yeah. it is the difficult part, but is there something to it? Maybe is the apocalyptic prophet. <clears throat> yeah. And, you know, you have the Bart Ehrman model. Uh, he has a, his book about the apocalyptic prophet, which is, I think, kind of like the most the most mainstream model that there is. Um, I would go a little further uh, than that, actually. And that is, um, and I've talked about this before. I talk about it in my book on the historicity of Jesus, uh, which is the idea that, so Josephus writes about a bunch of messiahs. <laughs> Um, and, and this, this I'm getting from the scholarship. This is just something I've noted. Other scholars have noted it. And I cite the scholars in, on the history of city of Jesus, but, um, <clears throat> Josephus describes a bunch of these guys. He never calls them messiahs, but he describes them in terms that a Jewish reader would immediately know what he's talking about. Like, this, these guys are messianic figures. They're going to bring about, you're right. They're claimants, pretenders, he says, right. Mm -hmm. I'm like, pretending mm -hmm. to what, right. Pretending to be what, uh, yeah, is the question. yeah good question. Uh, uh the, a Jewish reader would go, Oh, pretending to be the messiah. So, um, so they're definitely messiahs, and Josephus understood and stand this, and his Jewish audience would understand this. He's concealing it a bit from his Gentile audience by not going into the whole uh, Jewish support for messianism. He's just depicting it as the, in the the Gentile model of someone who's going to conquer Israel and rule it or something. And that isn't, of course, what these guys were about. Like right. that, that I mean, they might have had that idea, but really, their idea was something else. And uh, well, they thought God was going to come in. By right. They thought that God's angels would come down and right. and. and and do the business themselves. But uh, so anyway, um, so Jesus, ta he talks about these guys, they're all messiahs, but he never uses the word Christ, which would be the Greek word for Messiah, uh, which means anointed, right? So Messiah means anointed. Christ is the Greek word for anointed. And so these are all Christs, definitely. And there's like uh, four to six of them that Josephus talks about. And, um, but they all, he also says they each did something that resembles and replicates what the original Joshua did. And Joshua, of course, is, Jesus, it's the same name, right? So, um, uh, so, and so they're all like, so the original Joshua was the conqueror of Israel. So it makes sense as a messianic model to portray yourself as the new Joshua. Like you're going right. to reconquer Israel, right? That totally makes synergistic sense. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and because Josephus is very clearly saying they do uh, Joshua like things, like they're going to part the Jordan, they're going to topple the walls of a city magically and like do things that Joshua did. A Jewish reader, again, like he's not saying anything. He's not calling them Jesus. He never says they named themselves Joshua or anyone, anybody compared them to Joshua. But he gives this description where a Jewish reader would go, oh, that's Joshua stuff, right? So they, right. so Josephus has put multiple Jesus Christs in his text. It's plain there. It's just, there's no dispute. It's Jesus, Messiah, or a uh, Joshua Messiah figures for those who that's right. understand. Jesus right. Christ, right. Jesus Joshua Christ Messiah means Joshua, Joshua the Messiah, right? right? So like, so Josephus already has these models. And, and you know, you could say maybe he's making this up. Um, I don't see any particular reason to think that he's making these stories right. up. I think these are probably actual, this is an actual phenomenon, which means that it was a phenomenon. Like there's a bunch of it's these the dudes, zeitgeist. right? There's a bunch of these dudes trying to basically representing themselves as Jesus Christ. And I think they're deliberately trying to get themselves killed in order to fulfill the Daniel nine uh, prophecy. I think the connection of Daniel nine to Isaiah 52 to 53 had already happened. You see hints of it at Qumran. So this idea, they think that there's a, Daniel nine says that the reason God, 
uh, hasn't brought about his promise to deliver Israel from all of its enemies is that Israel keeps sinning. And then Daniel 9 goes on to talk about how, well, there will be this Messiah who will be killed. There'll be some sort of atonement uh, result. And uh, and then, of course, atonement means that the sins are wiped clean. Mm -hmm. So now God's reason for not bringing on the apocalypse doesn't exist anymore. So this will unlock God's power to just come in and deliver the promise. So I think these guys are just reading Daniel 9 this way. They're reading Isaiah this way. Um, and they're thinking, well, okay, so what we need is we need the Messiah to get himself killed to atone for the sins of Israel. And then God's reason for not delivering us will be wiped out, right? Magically, essentially. And then God will finally bring about the end of the world that we want. So I think, I, and I think that's what all the guys are doing in Josephus. They all end up getting, well, most of them end up getting themselves killed. Uh, and uh, I think they're all doing this on purpose, right? And so I think um, if Jesus, it, it would make sense, then Jesus would fit right into this model our Jesus, I mean, mm -hmm. uh, if he was doing the same thing, going around claiming to be the new Joshua, the Messiah, and deliberately trying to do things to get himself killed, in the and telling his followers this, like, yeah, when I when I get killed, uh, that will unlock the end time clock, and you that, just wait for it, right? Basically, that's, that's I think that's what he's doing. That's why. Uh, yeah, so I, I think that is the most plausible Jesus model because it has a perfect model already sitting in Josephus. And, you know, why? What are the odds that you have all these Jesus Christs? And then another Jesus Christ, and they're not the same. They're not doing the same thing, right? right. So, uh, so that's why I think it, the most plausible model for Jesus is that he's one of these particular kinds of figures, and that fits the, the apocalyptic prophet model mostly. But it also fits the Messiah model. That's... It isn't necessarily that they're an army to reconquer Israel kind of Messiah. It's a magical, mystical. I'm going to get myself killed so that my blood atones for Israel kind of Messiah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's more magical thinking than military thinking. Uh, and that that lines up with the fact that there's no real good evidence of any kind of military action by early Christians or by right, Jesus. And things. Right, right. That would kind uh, of de defunct the whole idea of... And Zion. it would also explain why Josephus doesn't talk about him, right? And uh, so, like, Josephus talks about the guys in this model who, like, got a lot of attention. Basically, major military actions were involved. Um, if Jesus just, like, got himself crucified, and, like, that's the amount of violence, you know, maybe he over, maybe he threw over some tables, he got angry in the maybe. temple and got chased out, you know, like, there's some minor stuff like that. That wouldn't show up on Josephus's radar, right? Like he, he might not have even heard the story, or if he did, it's, like, eh, it's too minor. Like a, there's no point in bringing it up. Right. Um, so, uh, so anyway, I think Jesus is this kind of like minor figure. He's just way less famous than the other mo versions of this model. What right? I like about your, if you don't mind me jumping yeah, into this, right this it, is yeah. what I like about what you're painting here is if we look at the model of both Paul and the Gospels, and we're trying to explain what we're looking at. Yeah. Um, if you're looking at it with the non-mythical explanation, mm -hmm. you are trying yeah. to see, are there fragments, are there fossils here that go back to right. Jesus? Yeah. That would fit <clears throat> the death, why he died. He's telling yeah. them he's going to die. Right, right. If he's reading scripture and he's thinking, I'm the guy, or they think he's the guy and they've convinced him, who knows? He might have a little... Yeah, it would explain why they're already talking about, uh, you know... Uh, they're already using Daniel and Isaiah as their base text for understanding right. what happened. Um, it would explain why the creed right out of the gate is he's atoning for the sins of Israel, right? Uh, and and started the doomsday Jason clock. Staples the other day, right? He, yeah. So it's the idea of how did he start? How did that start the doomsday clock? Why did that do that? Why is Paul so, using that as part of his? Yeah, he's the first fruits of the resurrection. Yeah, I don't. Clock. Now there are some scholars who think Paul did innovate all that. Um, that a lot of that comes from Paul. I, but I think it makes more sense as just that's what Christians were preaching, right? Like, mm -hmm. and, and then Paul is just in on the game. He just joins the game, right. right? He doesn't create that game. He did create a new version of the game. Uh, but I think he's really just adopting a lot of what the Christians were already teaching. He's he's joined the movement because there's something about it that it's teaching that he likes, right? And even even though he was like supposedly a persecutor, like he says he's persecuted the church. He's never clear on what he means by that. Um, like. Legally, or he just argued with them in the street. Like it, it doesn't, it doesn't specify. Paul never gets into specifics of what he actually did, but clearly something, you know, switched in his mind. Is that like, you know what? Actually, I'm freaking wrong. These guys are have a better model. I need to join in. And so then something convinced him to do this. It could have been a vision. You know, he clearly has. He's clearly schizotypal. He talks, Something's up. He talks to spirits and stuff. So that, like that totally could have happened. But I think even if it happened in that sense, there had to be some sort of like inner subconscious reasoning that led to that. And I think there's something about Christianity that became attractive to him. And so I think it is this model. Okay. Just so you know, when we did freeze, like, yeah. what are you doing now? I'm just scrolling up. I'm trying to figure out, I'm going to have to go into my, um, just to get these super chats. Oh, I see. 
Gotcha. Yeah. We lost them? Oh. Um, well, we, we didn't lose them. I will find them, but I'll have okay. to do it a different way because I see. we... Is everybody watching us talk tech right now? Is that... uh, <laughs> um, yes. Yes. Let me see something here. Supers. Supers. Okay, here we are. So this, I oh, think... okay. So this should let us see everything cool. that we've yeah. done. So that's that's what I think is the most plausible model um, for the historical Jesus. And it would also note for people who discuss the Testimonium Flavianum, you'll notice that Josephus, does. there's nothing in that Testimonium that matches the Jesus up with these guys. So I think if Josephus would have written about Jesus, he would have totally written about him, lining him up with these the guys. Same, that's what I think. It would, it would have followed that model. And so that becomes an argument against the testimonial problem. The other explanation, it, yours has a lot of thrust, and I like it because on a historical model, uh, because it, it does explain a lot of data, and it has a lot of predictive points that yeah. would make a lot of sense, that pre-existent messianic, I need to die figure in, in Daniel, but also Isaiah would like mm -hmm. the reinterpretation. And by the way, uh, this debate that goes on with Rabbi Toby Singer and other Christians about Jesus being Isaiah 53. And I've talked to rabbis, another one, A.J. Levine, who said, well, let me try and bridge this gap ecumenically and show Jews didn't always interpret Isaiah 53 as Israel. Right. Yeah. It is a majority Jewish interpretation, but there are individual well, you, claimants. You already that, have it in the Talmud, right? right? So they're already they're already reading 52 and 53 as a future messianic claim and not not talking about Cyrus and Israel because the original Isaiah is writing about Cyrus and Israel, right? right? Like that's, it's all an allegory for Cyrus and Israel. There's, there's nothing well, really, and the <clears throat> but yes, by the, and you know, in Staples, like I said, like he would be a good interview on this because he's clearly done a lot of research on it, that, that there's already before Christianity, there's already a reading of this that is imagining it as some sort of a secret code for something that's going to happen in the mm -hmm. future. And, and it's not, it's not what Isaiah re originally wrote. And that's how actually Jews are reading that's all scripture. scripture. Anyone who believes. Everything, every passage in scripture had some other new meaning that wasn't what the original author Exactly. Meant. Um, it's, it's modern scholarship that's more interested in getting at what the original authors meant. Most Jews at this time are not. They don't care, right? Or, or at least. How does this matter to That's me? the wrong way to frame it. It's not that they don't care. It's that they believe that the original intention was this mystical meaning. Uh, and so they want to find the mystical meaning and not the literal meaning. So they're doing the opposite of what modern scholars are doing. Well, just, just mentioning that to say I like the thrust because the other explanation for the historical Jesus model is the post hoc one where after he dies, cognitive dissonance They come is up with the so, interpretation, yeah. Right, and that doesn't mean they didn't come up with some Which interpretation. Which the, the Sabbatai Sebi model is a good good analogy for mm -hmm, that, yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that's a respectable model. There are a lot of scholars who support that as well. Um, I just think in terms of probabilities, the one I was talking about I think floats to the top of the list. And, and that one would probably fall you know, close to the top, but... Uh, it's not, it's not my top plausibility. Got it. Okay. There's a lot there and I'm sure there's so much more we could get into about the apocalyptic Jesus. I think there's some predictive stuff there too. The way we talked about this earlier at breakfast was, um, first of all, we have John, the I'm Baptist. seeing some good super chat. Yeah. There's some really yeah. good ones we're going to get into. Don't worry. And I'm saving the juicy stuff. So, um, just one last thing and then we'll get into that Yeah, mm -hmm. is John the Baptist is painted in the Gospels as kind of like the teacher or the head of Jesus, especially if he's being baptized in Mark. If we grant this historical kernel as valid, then you would have John the Baptist being kind of the leader of Jesus, baptizing him under him. And then Jesus continues the movement in his own way after John's out of the yeah, picture. Yeah, right, Which right. we do think John That's, that's a totally plausible. Yeah, totally Was plausible that Jesus though? comes from the Baptist movement. Right. Right. Uh, uh, yeah, exactly. I, I think that that would fit a lot of historical precedents and models. So so that's plausible, too. I do think it's going a step beyond what we can actually prove. Mm -hmm. So so it's like it's more speculative than just getting to the basics of what. You, that's why I think, like, if you have a basic model of, I think Jesus is one of these Joseph and Christ. Right. I'm not getting very elaborate on the specifics of that, because once you start adding claims, you're actually reducing the probability of your theory. Because uh, each additional claim has some sort of a probability to it that's going to be less than 100%. Mm -hmm. And when you multiply probabilities, the probability goes down, right? Mm -hmm. So like, so like getting more elaborate is starting to get more in the speculative category, which is fine as long as that you say that's what you're doing, right? So That's what um, I do a lot. Right, yeah. So that, that's that's what I think is important, caution. The, a caution that Bruce Chilton does not follow. That's why, like, for me <laughs> and, and Richard, we've talked since being here, but I think it's important to kind of convey this. I'm trying to create an attitude and an atmosphere on the internet where both camps, whether you think there was a Jesus or not, can communicate without dogmatism and being overzealous to the yeah. point where it's like, 
they're hating on each other. It's like, no, disagree, debate your issues. But yeah, and you know, don't black and white everything, right? right. So like this idea, like just because I think there's only a one in three chance Jesus existed, that's one in three. That's like those are good odds. Like that's a good poker hand, frankly. Yeah, I haven't done any math. <laughs> so. I'm not the math guy. You're the math guy. But I, I like I would say a bare bones basic. Here's a Jewish guy. In some sense, I think he's apocalyptic, and he gets killed. And I think he was crucified. Yeah, but I mean, I, I just, I'm just saying, like, this. if you have, if you have, you know, one in three odds of winning a hand on on the draw, then you're gonna you're gonna buy your pot. You're gonna buy into the flop, basically. <laughs> <laughs> so that's not low odds, is what I'm saying. Okay. One in three. So that's it's, so I'm not. Even, there's no way you could say that I'm dogmatically against a historical Jesus. Not at all. All right. Are these all gonna, today? This is right. No, no. no oh, okay. Scroll up. This is right here. <laughs> All right, so we did the will leaving separate you from the family. Okay, it's, nope, that's a different one. Sorry, wrong. Wow. Okay, I went down way too far. Oh, too I see. What you're doing. I don't care what kind of hologram tech you have. Derek. There it is. Scott we did that one. Okay, now we Got know where it. we are. In Let time. me zoom in a little. Yeah, that make it easier. Because I'm like squinting my yeah, eyes. Yeah, we're 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 using a tech I'm workaround here to find the super chats. Okay. I can't <laughs> see. All right, reality me. We did this. Yep. Uh, what do you think? Okay. We're at Sages and Pages. Thank you for the super chat, Sages and Pages. What is the exact source for a pre-Christian angel named Jesus so we can look it up ourselves? Yeah. Importantly, it's the pre-Christian angel, which has all the attributes. That's the key thing that's indisputable. Whether that angel was already named Jesus is something that has to be argued for. So one needs to keep these two things distinct because I think people confuse them a lot. Uh, in, in my book on the history of the city of Jesus, Element 40, Element 40 uh, in Chapter 5, uh, lists all the passages in Philo, but the one of the texts, the most relevant text to what's being asked, is on confusion of tongues by Philo of Alexandria, um, chapters or section sixty-two and sixty-three. Uh, so, if, and you can find that online. Uh, the Young translation is available online. Uh, that's that's where it's what it's based on, uh, because he's citing a passage where uh, one can read it as he thinks that the person called Jesus is the one that, that is the angel he's ident identifying. This is debatable, I totally admit. Like you'd have to like go through some steps of argument to get to the Jesus part. But what you don't have to do any steps of argument to get to is all the rest of it. So like the the firstborn son of God, um, creator of the universe, high priest of God's celestial temple, image of God, all of these attributes, and that's a short list, all of these attributes that are given to Jesus in the epistles, for example, uh, even the logos, which is assigned to Jesus later, is also an attribute of this angel. All these attributes are absolutely, definitely attributes of the angel Philo talks about. So this angel definitely existed. Um, the question of whether the angel was already to, called Jesus. According to Philo, it exists. According to, oh, yes. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, we yeah, do not I mean, think it that existed, angels exist. Let me finish that sentence. Yeah, <laughs> it, it, it existed in Jewish lore at the time. Right, right. So um, I just want to clarify in case someone tries to clip that. You know. Right, yeah. Uh, yeah, it existed in Jewish lore at the time. And so it's entirely plausible, and I, I discussed this on uh, live with Neil, is the idea that it's totally plausible that Jesus wasn't Jesus's name, right? Like that that is actually that. a code name that he adopted precisely because it's the name above all names. It means Yahweh's savior. Uh, and, uh, and, it, and it could have been even if it was the name of this angel, if Jesus wanted to go around claiming that he was the incarnation of this angel, well, then he would call himself Jesus, right? So, uh, and even if he didn't teach that, if his followers came to believe after he died, like, oh, you know what? We think he was an incarnation of this angel. Then they could have assigned the name Jesus. And it even looks like you could interpret Philippians 2 as saying that that's what happened. Um, there's debate about that. But, uh, right. but the point being is- it's a weaker argument though because there's too many moving parts? Well, we don't know, right? So we don't we don't know any of this. Like, was Jesus actually his name? It is a weirdly convenient name. Um, I think it's funny but, in Matthew where the angel goes, for he will save his people from their sins, that pronoun to the Israel. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And, and you shall call him Jesus, for he shall save his people. He's right, right. His, his this is name means classic myth making. Yeah, right. cl classic. Well, just like Abram and all the other, and Adam and stuff. Their names are mythically constructed. The names are opposite to what function they play in the myth, right? Um, so oftentimes that'll be used as evidence for mythicism. But uh, the reason it can't be used that way is that there is an entirely the same reason for a historical Jesus to adopt this name. For whatever the same exact reason that he would adopt this name or that his followers would assign it to him. So you can't just assume that Jesus was born with the name, you know, he's christened, not christened, but whatever. Uh, I know what you mean. Uh, yeah, uh, that with the name Jesus. You don't have to believe that. Like, that's not necessarily true. There could still be a historical Jesus. He had some other name. And he picked up the name Jesus later, right? So so that 
and it, for the exact same reason that it would end up mythically constructed in Matthew, right? So, um, so that doesn't differentiate between historicity and mythicism, but it does differentiate a little bit between different theories of historicity. Okay. Thank you so much, Sages and Pages. Um, I appreciate that super chat, my friend. Aaron in the house. We don't have Jesus on tape or video. Just contradictory accounts. The question whether he existed is as, irre as relevant whether a guy called Joe existed. Do you want to? I mean, I, I don't know what I don't know what look, to respond, I, but um, I guess the point, and maybe I mean, Aaron's the, trying to defang the the animosity that goes on between those who are on the atheist side. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, what? Why? Why are we beating each other up? Over yeah. Why? Why become a like a vicious warrior for a historical Jesus? Like it's or vice it doesn't versa. really even matter, right? Yeah. Or, <clears> it, mean, it matters very little. It, yeah. It, it's uh, it's in, a historical in question. Sense. It's, yeah. It's it's interesting to historians. Um, Apparently, it's you know fanatically interesting to people on the internet as well. But ultimately, the Jesus that's in the Gospels didn't exist, and that's the mainstream consensus. So, like, right. we could just you know drop mic and walk right now, right on that. So, uh, so arguing about like the minutia of what is the case, even though we have no texts that represent that case, um, is really you're in the theoretical world no matter what you're doing. And and this I do I talked about in the in the course material we we filmed um, is that. The whole debate is a theoretical. Every historical Jesus is theoretical. Unlike Joseph Smith or Haile yeah. Selassie, where it's not theoretical. The fact that they existed is so superbly documented that it is a fact, not a theory. Um, but historical Jesus, that's why we have so many different historical Jesus right. models, is that this that's that shows you how theoretical this is. Uh, and so I think people should just be willing to just that's what it is. We're in the, we're in theoretical debate land. We're yeah. not an ab absolute. And when fact I land. say theoretical, to me, that's synonymous with. I'm going to speculate. Because yeah, it's uh, well, speculation theory, I, theories can be highly probable, I'm right? Just so saying, you like, have evidence for them, but it's still if you're going to create your model, yeah, you need you need a lot more evidence to turn a theory into a fact, right? A, a lot more evidence than we have here for either side of the debate. Uh, so Jesus is one of the worst evidence problems in history <laughs> that we can deal with. Uh, so it, the evidence is terrible. Like by every metric we have in, in the field of history, is, the evidence is terrible. So you're not going to have a, a definite conclusion um, of, the, of the kind of high probability that we would expect for claims like, well, if someone said Joseph Smith didn't exist, like, mm -hmm. like that would be easily refutable. Whereas right. for Jesus, like it's so, everything is so doubtable. Uh, that's what leaves it in theoretical land for, for debate, I think. Gotcha. Thank you, Aaron, for that super chat. I hope we can try to get along better. Um, Subislav, Subislav, thank you for the super chat. If Jesus is the incarnate word of God, creation coming into existence and being held together by, would Jesus be constantly holy from the start? Well, I'm having a hard time with that one. Uh, well, I, well, yeah, incarnate I have to interpret this one. Um, is the assumption then that uh, if Jesus was teaching this about himself, uh, so let's let's go back to Philippians two. So read Philippians two. It it kind of answers this question because it says yes. He starts as he's godlike. He's basically he could try to claim equality to God like Satan did, and you know, of course, that led to a war but in he heaven. Himself. Yeah, but instead, Jesus chooses to humble himself all the way to assuming a mortal body and and becoming a slave. And so it says. And you, you can't take that literally. It doesn't mean he like sold himself on the slave market, like I mentioned earlier. It's a reference to he becomes a slave to the, the lower world order, just like all other mortal humans. So the message is their gospel was that Jesus gave up all of that uh, in order to assume the mortal body. Now, it was the mortal body that had any kind of like corrupt nature. Uh, and then, of course, he kills it off, right? So like he's, he, sh he sheds that bodysuit off pretty quickly. In, in cosmic time uh, speaking. So it's it's not like, uh, it's so yeah, if he was holy, it's like the spark of his his core nature stays permanently holy, but but the outer body is still, that's the thing that's being crucified and thus uh, all flesh with it, right? So like, so that, you have to understand that's what they're, that's the way they're thinking. Um, they're, they're, so they're not thinking that Jesus himself became like sinful and corrupt or anything. Thank you, thank you for that super chat. Uh, Nikolai Dimov, thank you for the super chat. But why would someone advocate for a social change when they believe that the world is ending in a couple of years? Yeah, actually, so you can answer this by looking at Matthew. Um, note what Matthew is doing. Uh, if you often wonder, like, why? Why? So we know that Dale Allison. Dale Allison has proved that the Sermon on the Mount is a fabricated discourse. It was invented after the Jewish War. It's invented to respond to the Jewish War. Uh, because on three things, uh, you know, the, the the Jewish life depends is, you know, the Torah, temple service, and good works. 
So when the temple was destroyed, well, what are the three pillars now? Shit, we don't have the temple service. And so they come up with, well, alternative ways to pay cult to God, alternative ways to worship. And the Sermon on the Mount fits this model. It's, 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 there's no temple cult in it. It's about how to respond to the destruction of the temple cult. But it has a lot of really extremist things in it, like uh, don't defend yourself. Uh, even if, so if someone robs you or enslaves you or whatever, just let them do it. Just let them do it, right? Like there's no, there's no self radical absence of self-defense, right? Radical pacifism, give everything up, uh, you know, forgive everything, et cetera. Like if you look at this and you, know, you really analyze it and say, this is a totally socially unsustainable moral, moral system, right? Mm -hmm. There's no way you can run a society with a moral system like this. Uh, so what on earth is Matthew doing? Well, he's, what he's doing is he's saying, look, the end is coming anytime now. So let's stop getting petty about like, you know, defending ourselves, taking people to court, uh, you know, hiring guard dogs to protect our property. Like you're wasting your time. And in fact, you're risking sinning, like all of these acts that you're taking on to, um, to defend yourself from thieves and enslavers and, and abusers and, and violence, and all this stuff. Your mere action in defending yourself could implicate you in sin and thus get you excluded from the kingdom. And here, look, it's just a few years, guys. Like, so all you gotta do is just, just take it, just fucking take it, uh, become be be enslaved, be beaten, be killed, right. whatever. God's gonna because uh, because look, what's what is that to fucking eternity, right? Like you're gonna be in you're gonna be in paradise forever in like a matter of years. So really, Matthew is writing an apocalyptic moral system. This is an this is this moral system that only makes sense as lifeboat morality. Like it's just a few years, you just gotta get through the tribulation. They also might <clears> think, and I, I'm more on the deterministic side of this with the rest of with a lot of the Second Temple Judaism about apocalypticism. I had John J. Collins on not too long ago, mm -hmm. and he was describing not everything was deterministic. Some of it was conditional. But right. it, yeah. there might be this idea of like, the end is near. This, These are the conditions you should live as to be ready when he comes. That's right, yeah. Because at any moment, when exactly. he comes, you don't want to be caught with your pants down doing That's right. the wrong thing. You know <laughs> That's what I mean? absolutely like, it. No, you're, you're spot on. That's what I'm talking about. <clears throat> I'm trying to pull up this screenshot. Someone asked, oh, here it is. I think this is it. Someone asked, yeah, that's it. They want to see the question, so I'm going to pop it up as oh. best I can. While <laughs> yeah, because this would be easier normally, but but because of the, the dropout, we're, we're kind of in a weird text. Yeah, because it made me – I don't see it that way. So here's drop, yeah. what we have here just to show you. All right, the next one we are doing is Ped, uh, Podrej, Podrej Macalolane. Oh, Forgive uh, me. I'm, that's Gaelic. So uh... – <laughs> I don't know how to properly pronounce that, but uh, Dr. Carrier comments on Egyptian alcohol brewing, Judaism, cannabis, and dung resin, and the abundance of psilocybin mushroom links found to evolution. Um, so uh, I, I don't see any evidence that Christianity was a drug-using cult. There definitely were when Christianity arose. So like the use of psychedelics definitely was a thing at the time. But when you look at the Christian evidence, the early Christian evidence, that's not the kind of triggers they're talking about. They're, they're talking about like uh, uh, incubation, which is like um, sensory deprivation, sleep deprivation, uh, rhythmic chanting, and schizotypal, just schizotypal personality. So um, Paul is clearly just schizotypal. I, I think I don't, there's no evidence that he's dropping mushrooms. And you habit. talk about this extensively. Um, in I, I do. In, the in, in, I have element 15. And you don't even really entertain the whole drug thing. You show naturally why. This no, it's because we have so many religious models uh, in anthropology and sociology that don't, re you don't require psychedelics to hallucinate. Uh, I, I never used high school, uh, psychedelics when I hallucinated. I was able to do it through sleep deprivation and meditation through creating altered states of consciousness yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, there's a there's a great book called I think it's called In Quest of the Shaman, uh, which is about deep religious history, like like 20,000, 40,000 years ago. Uh, and it's about like all the evidence we have of hallucination in shamanic art uh, and, and and then comparing that to anthropological studies of uh, shamans in societies that still have shamans. Right. Uh, and showing that actually the human human mind is weirdly and peculiarly inherently built to hallucinate. So, so they actually build a theory of like, we think this is, this has a religious, like there's a benefit Connection. to having, right, there's a benefit to having a small number of hallucinators in your community. Uh, and it's just kind of like one of these weird peacock feather things, right? That like, it doesn't make sense except in this weird <laughs> specific context of differential reproductive success. Um, and, and so that's their theory. And I think like there's, there's some evidence to back this. Like it is strange that humans are so prone to hallucination Remember because you don't need psychedelics to do it. A psychedelic can make it easier right. and it can make more people access the experience. Um, and so there, so definitely it was used and, and in, in quest of the shaman, they do talk about the use of substances is probably a thing. 
Uh, and we have plenty of evidence that it was in many cases, but we also have plenty of evidence that in many cases of religious movements that are hallucinating, or visionary, you know, halakhic and so forth, uh, don't use drugs. They're, they're doing it, they're getting their other ways. So like sleep deprivation is a classic one, like one of the most powerful hallucinations I ever had or, was or sleep fasting. deprivation. You don't eat for a long period of time. Fasting is a really good point. Uh, and then like uh, marathon prayers, like you do these prayers and chanting for like Just hours keep and hours. Just repeating crap. Right, You'll right, yes. Seeing yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. I've done it, I've done it. Yeah, yeah. I was, I was I was nutty, man. I mean, you know, it reminds me of I was a Taoist. I was the I was the Eastern version of yeah, that. Yeah, you so. were the Eastern version. <laughs> um, the life of Brian. I'm reminded of the guy standing on the podium, nuts, just going, hey, yeah, Mr. right. Hey! Like, and everybody <laughs> runs to him and you're like, you're the Messiah. He goes, I'm not Messiah. Only the Messiah would say he's not Messiah. Like people <laughs> right. are just nutty, yeah, you know. Yeah. Um, but I'm with you. In True. fact, if you are uh, on the nuttier side and you can look at TV preachers and see this as a fact, you have a better chance of being successful. It, it, it running a cult. I mean, just you just gotta be. I mean, you gotta be kind of smart if you're gonna do it the way they're doing it, and getting all the That's money. A, but the, so there's the Joel Pearson one right on the screen right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and we're caught up, by the way, on all. Oh, we are. Okay, yeah, all right. Yeah, so good, 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 good. Yeah. Uh, which Jesus would win in a battle royale? I actually have an answer for that. Is is obviously the Archangel Jesus, because as soon as you kill Jesus, he would respawn as this invincible Archangel, and uh, that, he would defeat everybody. So. <laughs> But if they're only human and we're only dealing with human Jesuses and that's all theology, yeah, I'd go with right. the zealot Jesus. Well, He's yeah, a warrior, right? right. Like, yeah. In that case, probably. Uh, if he gets if he gets to play his army card, right? Uh, or if he, is he alone? Is he alone Dude, in a room or does he get his army? There should be about Jesus <laughs> with different Jesus. Right, right. Or Magic the Gathering, except it's all messianic figures battling each other. Right. right. Uh, I have the like, Shit, I don't have my army card. I'm caught alone. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. The Egyptian is on his way, <laughs> asshole. All right, Joel, thank you so much for that. <laughs> Subter Frugal says, if you could bring, what was it, Onimus? Oh, Onesimus. Onesimus. Uh, the reason being is uh, that's the, so when Paul wrote Philemon, He's writing, is he, I think he's writing about Onesimus or oh, to Onesimus. I right? forget. Yeah. Um, what What was the one question you would ask? Um, being that he would be able to answer questions about popular knowledge of Christianity or anything else uh, at or that Paul time. Even, find out uh, assuming that. Onesimus existed, there, there are some arguments that Philemon might be one of the uh, letters that wasn't authentic. It's usually put in the authentic letter collection, um, but it's so short, it's hard to stylistically establish that. So... And there are other weird things about it. So uh, so it could be a forgery, but let's assume that it's real. Uh, and I, I usually just assume that it's real myself. Um, then, then yeah, Onesimus would know stuff about Christianity and you could, at that time. Um, and yeah, obviously, like if I get one question uh, and you're talking about Onesimus, so he doesn't know a lot of other things that I would want to know. Like I would want to know things about ancient science and stuff. And like, he, yeah, he couldn't answer that question, but he could answer the question about, you know, uh, you'd ask the question about is, like just basically ask like explain to me uh where how your religion started like where basically tell me like about uh, jesus yeah what do you know about jesus what were you told about jesus uh and then find out if jesus was historical or not right so um that's the kind of thing uh you could ask i, I would have to come up with a way to formulate the question but i, I yeah that would be the, the classic question to ask is uh wh what do you know about jesus uh basically just tell me everything and then and see what he lays out um yeah, that, there's that another that. question I would have, and this is based on uh, Jennifer Bird has talked about a few scholars who are writing about this letter. This is like a runaway slave, and someone's made a case. Don't know who the scholar is. They made the case that this runaway slave may be being sexually abused, and mm. they're on the run. Yeah. And is it Paul that's sexually abusing the slave? This is something that oh, is man. a question. Yeah, that, yeah. So like if Paul is humping his slave— and here he is talking in Romans one, like bullshit to a church he's never met. We catch him right now, like, like right, Jimmy right. swaggered in a hotel yeah. with a transvestite doing. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I wouldn't put that. Like, I wouldn't put that high on my list of questions. I'm just but, saying. Uh, but yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, sexual abuse of slaves was the norm at the time, um, and happened quite a lot. In fact, like was even was even approved. Uh, it wasn't. It wasn't even like scandalous, really. Uh, it would have been, I think, maybe in a Christian ascetic community. I think it would just hurt so many fundamentalist <clears throat> feelings to find out, like, oh my gosh, my guy Paul might have been right, yeah, sexually yeah. frustrated, and you know. Anyway, the mythic life. Thank you so much, Kristen Whitakerhood. I appreciate the super chat. What's the most likely manner in which a historical Jesus died? Right. So, I mean, obviously, if we go with the majority of evidence, then it would be crucifixion. Um, but when you look at just the letters of Paul he seems to repeatedly think that Jesus died under some sort of Jewish scheme. 
because he says Jesus died under the Deuteronomy law, right? In, in Galatians, I think it's Galatians three. Um, uh, he says that you know, Jesus uh, became a curse for us. Mm -hmm. um, that's a reference to the law uh, of uh, that describes Jewish crucifixion, which is you would be stoned. Well, there are four methods of killing, stoning, burning, strangling, and beheading. But no matter what method it was, your body would be hung up on a plank or tree for public display until evening when you'd be brought down and buried. Uh, and so that was the humiliation, the kind of like final humiliation for um, to that. And it, it's an idea of just basically sort of like purge the evil, like the magic, somehow this magically purges the evil in some sense. Um, but anyway, it was what, what they did. And so the exact same terms are used in ancient language in Greek. Uh, the exact same terms are used for this form of execution as for the Romans. So there's nothing in Paul that distinguishes between Roman and Jewish execution. Uh, and he even implies that it was Jewish, if, if you're going to follow anything uh, in Paul. And then, of course, if you believe that First Corinthians or First Thessalonians 2 is not an interpolation, then he outright says the Jews killed Jesus, not, not the Romans, then it would be a stoning. Um, it would probably be a stoning, um, being that the other crimes that you that required the other killing methods uh, don't really track to the story of Jesus as, as probably as all the offenses that fall under stoning, um, blasphemy, for example, um, uh, blasphemy, I'm, sorcery, things like that. It's but, something to throw out there because Jews typically, um, they are very self, um, negative. Like, could this be interpreted as him seeing Jews guilty? Like ancient, like, why did Bobby not keep the Sabbath? That's why we're stuck yeah, the here blood, in Babylon. You're, you're talking about the blood liberal concept. Like, that, like that, Babylon that, conquers yeah. them. But notice like, you're, you're, to do that, you have to add a layer of theoretical assumptions beyond the text, right? So if he just says the Jews killed Jesus, like for, you know, First Thessalonians 2, if that's what Paul said, the most probable thing is that the Jews killed Jesus. If you're going to add that, you're going to add on an additional hypothesis that he's, this is an allusion to the Jews getting the Romans to kill Jesus. Mm -hmm. Um, well, you're, you're at the probability necessarily has to be lower. This is, um, what is it? Uh, the bank, the banker's fallacy basically is that the idea uh, is Linda, a banker and a feminist, or is Linda a banker or a feminist? You can look this up, uh, uh, on, uh online, examples? but the probability always has to be less. The more things you stack on, the lower the probability goes. So, um, so if, if Paul just says the Jews killed Jesus, the most probable thing is he means the Jews killed Jesus. Um, it's possible, like, let's say 5% less likely that he means the Jews, you know, instigated the Romans to kill Jesus, but you would need additional evidence for that, and that's where you get to like the Gospels and stuff. But even with that ev additional evidence, the probability can get close, but can't really get over unless you really have really, really good evidence of the kind we don't have, right? Uh, like for instance, somewhere else, Paul saying this that the Jews instigated the Romans to, you know, that would that would tip the scales in the other direction. But uh, anyway, that's that's whole digression. I think the yeah, well, how, just... how did. How would it? How would it be? If we if we follow the majority of evidence, which includes the Gospels, etc., uh, he would be crucified, which means that he would be uh, basically he would be tied to a post, the the lintel that would go across his shoulders. Normally, they would be tied, not nailed, and uh, be tied and run to run or beaten on his way to uh, the the station. And the station would have a pole, and then you'd be hoisted up, and there would be a, a knock in the in the lintel. And then the pole would be would sit on top, and it would be a T shape. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I to, just saw an right, and then and then we know they nailed uh, that ankles because we have an ankle bone with a nail through it. They would nail the ankle to the to the post. So the posts are just always there; they're just straight up and down posts. And the uh, the patibulum, the the thing that he would, you know, that they would attach to him. Well, he would carry. That's what he would carry. He wouldn't carry the whole cross. Um, that would be the most likely way because of all the descriptions we have of the usual procedure of crucifixion. Now. Romans didn't have a legally mandated procedure of crucifixion, so they used all kinds of creative ways to crucify people. So and there any isn't, wood they could find. Right. So, so we're really talking about the most frequent, the, so therefore the most likely. We're just talking about the most likely, right. not, not the guaranteed. Um, that would be the most likely sequence of events uh, for if, if Jesus was crucified by the Romans. And it's important to note that the equipment I just described with the pole, which was called the crux, that's the cross. Actually, the cross in Latin is not the cross. It's just the stick. Uh, and then the, the patibulum that goes on top that makes the T shape is what completes what we think of as the cross. Um, that would be the most common. It, that was actually a common agricultural instrument. It's a vine crop. Uh, so so that, that that's, that's the kind of thing that uh, is normal. And that's why you see some later art of Jesus is being crucified on scaffolding. 
Uh, and that's another form of, of vine propping. So this is an agricultural instrument that's everywhere. So you always have it on hand. You're helping Ataria uh, Estimates. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, He's an agricultural dying and right, right. right. No, no. But it's, this is just a practical reality that you, no, it, you it. right, you wouldn't necessarily need to have specialized crucifixion equipment. You just go grab a vine prop and use it, right? And then, and when it's, you know, I think probably once they start using it for executions, it's not doesn't get repurposed. Uh, it gets used until it can't be used anymore, and it gets thrown away. But um, but still, I think, you know, the supply, you go to the warehouse and grab a vine prop, basically, is the most frequent way to do this because it was the easiest and it was the, the simplest form of doing it. Before we leave her question, going back to Paul, because I didn't want to interrupt your train of thought here. Yeah. Are there other, are there any examples of Jews crucifying other Jews anywhere around the time of Paul? So or... by the way you're using the word. And I mean is... hung after they're dead for the whole day. Oh, so hung they're after gonna... they're dead. Yeah, do we have any yes. contemporary accounts of that? Uh, oh, where, contemporary Like where of. they hang them on a cross. and they, Well, So they... for instance, it's literally described in the Mishnah as legal procedure. So th there's no like a narrative of anyone. Right. It's just in the law, in the Mishnah law. I'm just speaking um, analogous. But it's, to... there, there are passages in the Old Testament where it's, it's, right. it's described. Um, so, and I, I cite all the passages in on the history of Jesus in the chapter four when I go into definitions and I go to definition of crucifixion. And I'm I'm relying on like the, a lot of the latest scholarship that's I, I'm using their scholarship on this. And um, there's there's some there's been some really good scholarship on crucifixion in the ancient world, including on the Jewish form of it. Okay. Um, so I don't think we have a narrative like like we have for Jesus. I don't think we have a narrative. We have hardly any narratives of anyone being crucified. Like we have, uh, you know, the, the Satyricon mentions, uh, it's part, there's a story in which there are crucified people in the story, but it doesn't go into detail about that. Josephus um, uh, mentions people. Josephus, were, right. Yeah. Josephus mentions that they were still alive. Like mm -hmm, they were, they were mm -hmm. still alive until they were taken down. And That's two, a way two of, of them didn't survive. Them. Right, right, exactly. The Roman system was to just like use it to let you just die on the cross. And normally it would take days, right? Like, so it would take days for you to die um, and that's why it's so there's a, the gospels write it as Pilate being surprised that Jesus is dead already. Like, mm -hmm. like what are you talking about? It's only been a few hours. Um, that, that, that actually tracks how crucifixion would work in the ancient world. It, it, that's plausible fiction about Jesus. Thank you. The mythic life. Appreciate the super chat. Blake in the house. Got any thoughts on John chapter 21? It seems like a redaction to depict, uh, Kephas more positively in relation to Jesus. What was the intent of the redaction? This is one of the vexed questions in the field. There's there's a lot of scholarship trying to debate this. Uh, I don't know that it's a resolvable uh, question. I, I know I know there are different things happening in there. So that's the other problem. And it's been redacted. So we don't know really. Like It's, it's not like someone took 21 and just slapped it in there as we have it. Um, it got slapped in there and then possibly was modified later. Like other things were added or taken away. John is a mess as a gospel. Um, so if, if you look at... Um, well, let's see, in, in chapter 10, section 7 of On the History of the City of Jesus, I cite some works on um, the redaction theory of John. All the leading scholars on the Gospel of John, uh, including N.T. Wright, I believe, uh, and, and others I cite there, they go into these analyses. Uh, while Whitechin's book, um, The Gospel in Two Editions, so it's called A Gospel in Two Editions. Um, we now think it's three editions, but um, uh, that book, The Gospel in Two Editions, goes into the analysis of this. And that's kind of one of the classic texts in this discussion of how do we answer this question. There's been more scholarship since then that has modified this and so on. Um, so it, it's a big field of trying to figure and answer that question. But definitely Gospel of John entirely has gone through multiple redactions where it's been mm -hmm. reordered, it's been um, things added, things taken away multiple times. So uh, so we do not have the original Gospel of John and, and it doesn't survive. And so um, so that that makes this answering this question vexing is because because multiple authors have been meddling with it with multiple different motives, right? Yeah. And so so it's hard to answer that the, question. The, uh, the pericope adultery, like there's a lot of obvious ones most people know, but in John chapter 21, what really makes me, um, my red flag, my ears go up, is this whole final uh, tradition where it's like uh, he would not die about this uh, disciple that would be alive. And I'm looking at earlier synoptics, which I think John knows all about. Of course, at least yeah. the final redaction. Oh, that's, your, that's the mainstream view right now. Right. So all the Johannine experts that you read about the Gospel of John now, they all agree that John is using the synoptics. And he's using it in the way that you normally train to do, which is to rewrite it in your own words. Right. So Matthew and Luke are redactions rather than independent works, right? So they're they're actually pretending to be the new gospel. Uh, and as we talk about like the lives of Aesop are an example of this, where we have multiple redactions, where it's just the same book with changes. 
So it's verbatim, a lot of verbatim similarities. We, we call those redactions rather than different lines. Um, and normally that's, that's how we should talk about the synoptics. These are really redactions. John is doing an original composition, but he's using sources. Right, right. So, so he's using the gospels as sources, as inspiration to write his own stories. Uh, and that was actually the more usual way to, to write literature in the ancient world. Uh, but but yeah, so I think definitely that is true. And you were you were saying I was getting at the whole uh, failed prediction uh, idea that he's like some of the, some of you standing here will not taste death. Now oh I see you're, you're seeing the connection with that. I right? see a connection to them trying to explain away that Jesus never really said that because everyone died <laughs> off. So like they're oh, trying to. That's an to, interesting point. I had yeah, because, of it that because way. they're making up the words, and he goes, "I did not say he wouldn't die." putting in the mouth of Jesus. <laughs> he said, what if it be my will? It's almost like, you know, if yeah, I, I want him to so remain until I come. There's then... actually there's actually a, a an explanation of that passage that I think is more probable than that. Okay. Which is that that because he, it's he, it's specifically said about the, the beloved disciple. Okay. And there's a lot of scholarship and there's tons of evidence. I think it's conclusive. And I talk about this in my treatment of John and on the history of Jesus. The beloved disciple is Lazarus. And the gospel says Lazarus is the disciple that Jesus loved. So the beloved disciple is Lazarus. Jesus resurrected Lazarus. This creates a theological problem because Paul taught, like, once you're resurrected, you have this immortal super body. Ah. Right. So like, is wait, does so that mean, a like, it, right, exactly. So, so he's not supposed to die. Right. Oh, this creates a big problem. It's like, well, where is he then? <laughs> that, this is the problem with Matthew. Matthew has all the saints resurrected. Right, right. So, so saying like, like, uh, like, how could he have died? He was resurrected. It's like, so they're creating this sort of apologetic to explain why people can't find Lazarus to talk to him. Like he should be immortal. He should have the super body. Are the Jehovah's be... Witnesses or something <clears throat> saying like he's out there somewhere or someone that believes uh, well, out there alive somewhere? I don't somewhere? know. Oh, okay, I can't speak on that. One of these uh, cults, but sorry, I didn't want to do that. Well, there's you. also a separate tradition about the wandering Jew, which is a different, completely different. There's a Jew who's cursed. There's a, there's a Jew who like uh, cursed Jesus on the cross or whatever, and then he's cursed to live forever until the end times. And of course, the the Jurgen Prochnow movie, I think it's the Seventh Seal, Seventh Sign, Seventh Sign, Seventh I Seal. Know. I can't remember. It's what it's there's. Don't confuse it with the Bergman movie, but yeah. anyway, the, uh, the, there's another one where it's all about that that theory that there was this this one Jew. Oh, and also the the TV show um, Forever. It, it went one season, but they had like the villain in it was it was turning out that he was this guy that was cursed mm. to live forever by Jesus or whatever. But um, anyway, uh, so that 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 is a separate tradition. That is separate from the Lazarus thing. It is interesting the cliffhanger trying to explain that. And, and uh, there's cults out there. I think it's Jehovah's Witnesses. It could be seven days. I'm not sure. But they think that he, the, the beloved, the beloved is, is still somewhere. Yeah. Till Jesus comes back. Right. Because they're right. still accepting this ridiculous claim. Yeah. 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 Anyway. Uh, Do a lot of interesting fiction out of that. I like your way of thinking about that because <laughs> I just interviewed Harold Attridge, who's writing the Hermeneia for John right now. And he's getting. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. 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 Shit. All right. Yeah, yeah, man. So there's some good stuff there. But I like what you're saying because it makes most within this book itself, it makes the most sense. Mm -hmm. And it still could be touching on this idea of like one of you is still going to be alive and remain. But I like yours. It makes a little yeah, more yeah, sense. Yeah. I, I, it's possible for both to be true, actually. Yeah, it could be because they were very apocalyptic, but they downplay apocalypticism in John. So they do. Yeah, yeah that's true. It's realized eschatology. Mm -hmm. Is Robert and Price busy making toys this time of year? Of course. <laughs> All year long. Oh, oh, oh. He knows when you're not here. Yeah. Nice. Thank you for that super chat. And I can't pronounce your name. I I really don't want to butcher it any more than I probably already have. <clears throat> Chris, did Paul ever say when the crucifixion happened? Oh, um, I mean, not to a date, right? Uh, but um, he does. Actually, could you get me some as well? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah that'd be great. Um, what, whiskey in it? I'm just no, not, not at this time of day. Uh, <laughs> no. Uh, so, um, <laughs> so what Paul does say in 1 Corinthians 15 he says, basically, Jesus is killed three days later, or on the third day later, uh, he is resurrected. And then in that same chapter later, he says, Jesus is the first fruits of the general resurrection, which means that Jesus began the end time clock, that he's the beginning of a, of a process that we're now living in. Um, when you combine those two pieces of information, it is very clear that Paul understands Jesus to have died recently. Uh, and this is true whether it was a cosmic death or an earthly death. He, he believes this is a recent thing. That has now unlocked the doomsday clock, uh, but how recent? Like he, it, like the most you could tell is like if we date the letters of Paul to the fifties, um, and he re references like in some of those letters, like 
20, 24 years ago, et cetera, the, as when I converted. This puts it in the 30s. So you can kind of triangulate to the 30s. There's other issues with dating the letters of Paul that are, it's a whole other problematic debate. But if you follow the mainstream uh, view of things, then, then that's what gets us to the 30s. Sometime in the 30s is what Paul was where Paul is putting the crucifixion of Jesus. You also take like the first Thessalonians account where you can tell that they're very anxious. They have loved ones who died. And, and like, right, why yeah. are they so anticipating? First Thessalonians 4 uh, is the, the apocalyptic idea. And then there are other places actually where he's talking about. First Corinthians 15 is another one of these where he's saying people are dying and that people are getting starting to say, like, well, what's where's this resurrection you're talking about? And yeah, so, if like, this is hundreds of years of right, life, then they wouldn't be so, like, yeah, what's exactly. The issue? No, no, this is something urgent that just happened, basically. That makes a good question, Chris. And Chris asks again, First Clement has no gospel info. Why dated 90 plus CE? Yeah, or even specifically 95. You'll see in the literature, 95 AD. Um, that is the legendary date assigned to it by Christians themselves. So when you get to like Eusebius, um, and Eusebius is quoting some earlier authors like Hegesippus and, and Clement of Alexandria and stuff, um, there was this belief that the First Clement letter was written by what they believed to be the Pope Clement who, who was the Pope in the nineties. And ju they, just because they believed that they had no evidence that that was the case whatsoever. Uh, it was just a belief that arose. It's a rumor, legend, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and so that's just what all Christian literature claimed of the letter. And so when you read even early 20th century stuff on first Clement, it just repeats the, the Christian legend. Um, I don't think that legend is in any sense plausible. Uh, and there's a lot of scholars who agree with me on that. I'm not alone. Um, the fir letter first Clement is written in a way that is based on the assumption, like it, the, the letter makes no sense whatsoever being written after the Jewish war. Uh, there, there's so many points that the letter makes that that war and the destruction of the temple cult would matter mm -hmm. to that, that they would be like, they would be like zingers. Like there'd be no way that you would, you would leave out the best argument you have for your case. Um, so first Clement seems to not know that the Jewish temple cult doesn't exist anymore. So that puts it in the sixties, but he doesn't know Paul is dead. So it puts him after Paul and we, we put Paul in the fifties. So then there's not much room between the 50s and the war, which starts in 66. So first Clement almost certainly is early 60s in my view and in the view of several other scholars. Thank you. Thank you. Chris, again, what now lost historic book would clear up the non or historicity uh, of Jesus? Well, we don't, unlike most other ancient history where we know the names of and contents of books that we don't have. Uh, I, this is a main frustration in ancient science where we have descriptions and titles of books on experimental studies in uh, uh, ballistics and gravity that come after Aristotle. Uh, he so desperately would want those books because it, it would teach us so much about how they, because they change a lot. A lot of Aristotle's mistakes were corrected by later scientists um, and his brain science was completely resolved within like a couple, like a hundred or two years after Aristotle. Um, we're here at the desk. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, and, oh yeah, vibrating the thing. Yeah, um, cool. Right. <laughs> uh, so there's so many books that we know about and we say, yes, I want that book. And we know like Kelsis did an encyclopedia of the arts and we only have the medicine section. We'd like all the others. Mm -hmm. We know for, for the subject we're talking today about ancient religion, um, uh, Varro wrote an encyclopedia of religion, an encyclopedia of religion where he talks about all religions, where we know he would be talking about mystery cults and stuff uh, from a pro-pagan side, like, right? So like, oh man, we would love to have that book. Um, we would love to have the histories of Pliny the Elder because he lived through the Nero reign and wrote about it in this book. And therefore, if there was a Neronian persecution of Christians and anybody was using that, as a, it would have been using him as a source. So if Nero persecuted the Christians, that story would be in there. We would have more Is information. Is this the other so, Jewish um, historian that we don't have? Because it was a uh, Jewish historian well, you're thinking with Josephus. You're thinking of Justi Justice of Tiberius. Yes. Yeah. I wish we had um, his works. Yeah, I don't think Justice will have mentioned anything to do with Christianity. So, so, I, so in answering this question... Yeah. I would say Pliny the Elder's history of Rome, because okay. uh, now I I strongly suspect there will be no mention of Christianity in it if we find it. We actually could find it, by the way. Um, there there is still a library sitting in Herculaneum, uh, buried in volcanic ash that that we stopped excavating because it was destructive. But there's probably hundreds of books sitting under there, and we now have the technology to uh, look inside the because they're charred, so we have we can't. Uh, see them, but you can you can use X-ray tomography and things now. But um, to look inside and see the text. But anyway, that library is there, and Pliny the Elder was a major naval commander just across the bay. Like literally, he's like he probably knew the family who lived in this villa. So the probability that they would have Pliny the Elder's history is is high. Like that book, there's a really good chance that that book is actually there. Mm -hmm. uh, and so if we went in and got That's it. The 
Yeah. Right. If we went in and got it, uh, just imagine, uh, and we would want to read that section of Nero, the, the whole, the, the fire of Rome and who he blamed for it and so on. He's getting the medicine just soon. Okay, and fine. yeah, and just so, uh, uh, you know, what would we base that on? Um, I suspect what will be there is a discussion of a completely different figure and a completely different Messianic Jewish movement and had nothing to do with Christianity. But if Tacitus is getting his data, like about the crucifixion of Jesus and stuff from this book, then there would be probably a more elaborate explanation of the belief and if and that this would date to the 60s this would be someone who was there so they would have the information from the 60s ad um which means that would be pretty strong evidence that jesus existed like that that could like could like answer the question and right? you would just rewrite your yeah i would say like we found this would, new demonstration that shows it i think you would yeah. still hold to the the, the mythos uh well yeah, that's mainstream yeah stuff, i would still be in the mainstream of scholarship you would just put the, the gospels are mostly yeah, the Gospels, right, mysticism would still be, well, no, I think it's probably it would drop pretty far. Like, it would drop off the list of plausibles, I think, if uh, if we, if if there was a, a believable discussion that looks like Pliny was informed about Christianity um, in, in the 60s AD, then I think that would nail it. Like, that, okay. would, that would be extremely good evidence for the historicity of Jesus. Thank you so much for that, Chris. Constellation Pegasus. Richard, what books uh, that you have written worth getting debunking Christianity and Judaism? <clears throat> Oh, I um I should have mentioned uh, not the impossible faith. There were some questions I answered today, uh, where I talk about these things. So, I, it's chapter ten of that, I talk about. I have to take this real quick. Sure, please continue. In chapter ten of not the impossible faith, I talk about um, uh, the role of rational argument in the philosophy tradition of Greece versus the role of God's talking to me. And these are the words of God, the prophetic model of trying to socially reform the world. Um, this is actually studied anthropologically because it's a model, it's a, it's a difference between two models that we see everywhere in world history, uh, and there are anthropologists who studied it, and so there's an anthropology of religion that goes into this, and so I go, I actually summarize some of the anthropology of religion about this, uh, and, and so if you're interested in why would rational philosophy not be a popular thing and not, not really play in Judea, but this whole prophetic, Jesus is talking to me stuff would, um, that, that's totally explicable in terms of how we understand most of societies before the invention of rational philosophy. Rational philosophy has never been popular, really. It's, it's, it's actually more popular today than ever, and it still doesn't really govern the way people make decisions. Um, whereas, you know, so we, we've at least gotten away from, uh, we've, through the scientific revolution and the, and the enlightenment, we've changed from this idea of let's listen to prophets to let's look at the evidence, right? Some, so they've won, have. right, won, <laughs> right, yeah, but, but the majority, yeah. the majority of first world society, right? So right. Um, anyway, th that's an example of one, uh, reading Not the Impossible Faith, there's a lot of material in there that debunks Christian apologetics, gives you interesting facts about the ancient world and context. So it's actually a good, it's just fun. Like it's a, it's a fun book uh, and it teaches you a lot of stuff. So that's one I often recommend. I'm actually quite happy with that one. And then of course my books in ancient science, um, uh, they- uh, that, I got it on Audible and I listened to it at like one and a half times speed to try. It's so long. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, so- There's so each, much there. I mean, yeah, each of the, you're talking about the one, the big one, which is uh, the scientist in the early Roman yes, empire. Yes, yes. I also have a short one, which is science education in the early Roman empire, which is really just a book about ancient education. Um, but it, it focuses on the science content. But each of those have one chapter on Christianity and how Christians differed from pagans and their attitudes towards education on the one hand and science on the other. So um, those are two that I would recommend right away. And of course, my book, Why I'm Not a Christian, is a tiny little four reasons not to be a Christian that, that is engineered to be kind of like a, a takedown apologetic that anticipates all the usual objections to the usual stuff so that it's really hard for a Christian to maneuver out of the, the arguments in that book. So um, that's another one that I would recommend people get. Thank you, Constellation. Appreciate the love. Fiction Mission, what do you think of a fictional story by Mark predating the church and giving rise to the gospel and rituals? Of a fictional story by Mark predating the church. Well, we don't even know. Giving rise to Mark's the Mark's a name. So I think what they're suggesting is that Mark is using some text that predates Christianity itself. Oh, kind of like a Q um, kind of thing or something? Or... Yeah, I, so I... I yeah, I, so there's two models of that. One is like, is he lifting a story that comes earlier? Um, I mean, he's picking. He obviously uh, to give you an using example, some tradition. Yeah, some if you look at Luke's nativity, and Luke uh, does a parallel nativity with the nativity of John and the nativity of Jesus, and they're they're paralleling each other. Um, there could well have been a nativity of John the Baptist. 
that was used just poured it over and turned into the nativity of Jesus. Like that, that's believable. Uh, we don't, we can't say that that happened because we don't have concrete evidence of it, but uh, it, it is something that would be plausible and possible. Um, but I think the other interesting question would be to ask, like, could Mark and story have been invented right out of the gate? Like, like Peter just invents this story and says, okay, it's not literally true. It's a story, but this is what we're going to use to teach the faith. Um, I think that's highly improbable because it requires, um, it conflicts too much with recent historical events for audiences to resonate with it. Uh, cause they would say like, well, none of this happened. Why should I listen to this story? Um, right. So like you, you, that, I don't think, um, I don't think it would work that way as a, as something that would come right out of the gate. It's possible, but it'd be, it'd be highly unlikely. It'd be unlikely enough that if we found an example of it, that I think it would be more likely that Jesus existed. Uh, than that the this story was completely made up. That that would be the way I would look at it. Okay, thank you so much, Fiction Mission. Again, Constellation Pegasus in the house. Is there any truth the math says the father Moses died before Moses was born? Saw this from a trusted source. Anything to this? I can't reference the dates correctly to check it. Yeah, it says the father Moses died before Moses was born. Okay, this is not a thing that I study, so I can't answer this. This is Old Testament... Um, uh, analysis stuff and so i don't know the answer to this question all right constellation oh but i'll i'll refer someone um the skeptics annotated bible is online there might be a section on this uh i don't know um, skeptics it, annotated yeah bible. it's a it's a scannable searchable digital list of all the skeptical things about the bible um including uh lists of contradictions and things so this this could be in there you can check it out yeah okay thank you so much for that Doc Paloroma not good to see you here, my friend. Qumranic influences on Jesus seems most paralleled in the Beatitudes on wealth. But where did Matthew learn these poor in spirit doctrines? Perhaps John the Baptist, Matthew eleven eighteen through 19, as Jesus shows few ascetic tendencies. Uh, I don't know. I do find it weird no that, that Matthew is the only one that wants to do poor in spirit. Luke wants to go the poor. Yeah, uh, Luke, Luke's, Luke Acts has a whole poverty, like, let's care about the poor narrative. Um, and Luke Acts purports to be writ written to a member of the upper class. So it is very much a uh, kind of like, um, how would a preacher sell Christianity to this rich guy? He's gonna, he wants to like put in a whole bunch of things like you should donate a lot of money. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. So it, this is very much a propaganda treat to the rich members of the church to give more money to the poor I members of the church. I thought that Matthew um, might also be because in a different way, because what if he's, uh, you know, trying to hit an audience that, hey, look, we know you don't want to give up all your riches. You know, Jesus says, sell everything you own to come follow me. What if he's like, look, you don't have to give all your money to the poor or try to give it to the poor. You yeah, can I just be poor in <laughs> I, don't I don't know that Matthew has that attitude. Um, I think Matthew's writing for a community that doesn't have a lot of rich members and it. it's mostly could be. It's it's more of a communal society. It's more like Paul is doing, he's creating these communal societies. Uh, there's more socialistic, like we see in Acts being depicted, although Acts is probably radicalizing the picture. Um no, I think if if you look at the context, Matthew's talking about like um the, the least shall be first, right? So like even people who who ha don't have the gifts of the spirit, uh, they also are going to be blessed, right? Like this. so they're actually, the people who purport to have like miraculous powers and gifts of the spirit might like get haughty and claim that therefore I'm I'm better than you. And like their idea is like, no, no, no. That like even the, even people who don't get gifts of the spirit, even people who have shitty luck and stuff, um, they're actually gonna be first. Like they're, they're, they're on the they're on the list. Trust me, you know, that kind of thing. Okay, I think I think it more has more to do with that. Um, but I can't say so for sure because this isn't a question I've done a deep dive in the literature or the scholarship on. Well, when uh, you look I at, could be persuaded to a different when conclusion. You look at the synoptic parallel, where it says poor, it yeah. literally changes. Yeah, it yeah Jesus alters. I mean, Luke so, yeah. alters it. Yeah, it totally. has a meaning. What that meaning is? Yeah, is, yeah, yeah. I, I like your idea though. That this yeah, is, I think Luke deliberately turns it into a. A statement about poverty because then he adds more stuff about poverty as well so i think luke is doing that on purpose thank you thank you doc really appreciate that did we answer the question perhaps john the baptist i i feel like we did but the ascetic tendencies right is, um is matthew no we did we kind of covered like what the possibilities are but uh no this is a thing that you'd have to do a deep dive into the scholarly literature and see okay. uh you could start with the latest hermenea commentary but i that's not out yet but uh the latest one is and I think it is kind of old the one that's out the, the, on the, John? the John one that's out that's now. Old. Yep. 
uh, needs an update. And so He's that would, that would it right, that would explain why we've got one going. Um, but, but nonetheless, like that would be an example. We'll go to the biblical commentaries and uh, start the, the thread of research there. Thank you. Chris is in the house again. So no pre-mark writings include detailed gospel information. For me, this is evidence against oral tradition fueling the gospels at all. Yeah, I don't. The oral tradition theory, many scholars have criticized it, especially lately. Um, the, it, right. It isn't it isn't plausible in a lot of ways, actually. Um, but um, yeah, so there let's say that there was a Christian pressure. Uh, let's put it that way. It's very clear because Paul quotes it a lot, like where he says, when, when, he, when he says Jesus was crucified according to the scriptures, he's talking about the pesher, right? And, and there's other things like when there's allusions in Romans 1 verse 3, it, he's alluding to the prophecy of Nathan in, in the Samuel literature. So, so there's, there's clearly, Paul has access to some sort of pesher, which is like a list of Bible verses and what they mean about Jesus. Um, and, uh, and we have copies of peshers like this at Qumran. They're not about Christianity, but they're, they're, they do this about the Messiah. So there was some sort of pressure and the pressure would include things that you would look like that would look like narrative details. So like Hebrews has Jesus, uh, the, the prayer, what looks like in the gospels to be the prayer in Gethsemane shows up. Uh, it's completely different. It has a completely different message, but it shows up in Hebrews. Hebrews does not place it in a garden or anything in particular. He just says when Jesus prayed, etc., And then he said these things. And then we have like first Clement has a bunch of when Jesus said, where he's literally just quoting scripture. Uh, right. So he thinks, that's how Jesus speaks is through the prophets and so forth. Um, and so uh, so there was clearly a pesher, a, a collection of stories and stuff that weren't about Jesus. They were originally written in scripture for some other reason that Christians were interpreting as stories about Jesus. And they're getting their gospel ideas from this. So, so that definitely existed uh, in Paul's day. Paul has access to it. Um, so that that's the, and it might not have been written. Um, but I think it probably was. Uh, this, this, these pressures are pretty complicated, so it's, it's unlikely to just have been an oral thing passed on. Um, so anyway, uh, so there would have been something like that, but it wouldn't look like the Gospels that we have. It wouldn't be a, a narrative story. It would just be a collection of scriptures and, interp and scholarly interpretations, notes on them, basically. Thank or even just that. a list of scriptures without the commentary. Appreciate that. Bradford Baldwin says, if you're going to believe anything the Bible says about Jesus, at what point do you stop? Did he preach to hundreds but not feed them fish? Was there some fish, then rumors? There's no way to know. It's all conjecture. So <laughs> true. Yeah. It's a vexing problem. Yeah. I mean, you got to come at it with a certain methodology to try and make sense of what we're dealing with. Well, it's like, and like I think the vanguard of scholars now, like most scholars you run into her, the, the new, the new generation, the, the consensus among them is that there's almost nothing we can know about the historical Jesus, that almost everything written about him is mythological or theological. Um, and these are historicists saying yeah, this. Yeah. Um, so they think the one thing, and I asked this of Paul Fredrickson, she says, if there's one thing, I said, what is there one thing you can be confident of? She goes, well, that he died. I mean, like <laughs> she said, it, died and not crucified. Well, yeah, crucified. Usually that's like, mean, right. Like, he got killed. Other Normal, than that, like, right. she's like, after that, She's like, we're dealing and with... And I would say, I, was, I would agree, like, because that's the one thing that's... And that he was... You would use the word staked, because the word star roster and, and, and the stories go and all of these things are... It, you're getting staked, whatever that means. Um, and so so, it, so some sort of stake was involved in, in the <clears throat> death. Whether it was Jewish execution or Roman execution, uh, it was some form of execution. That we know. That he, not that he would die, not that he was killed in battle, but that he was right. executed by some legal process. That she would be one of the, the most secure facts about jesus she took know. the approach of course that rome crucified because she right. said they, well, most people they had a, I, I think yeah most people that's the mainstream view right right so. she says they had a boner for crucifying jews like, yeah yeah like right it was just their it's definitely yeah so there's nothing implausible that's that. what she said she would put confidence in and then after that she was like mm. <laughs> after that she says she has to go and like right. make a case or try to build up right. she said in one of her yeah, methodologies yeah. she said and i think it's a good one even though you still have to be cautious is when you're looking in the Gospels, if it lines up with Paul, if you could see a line that draws like to Paul, it may, and she used the word even may, it may be something plausible that you can try and draw because Paul's earlier. But like she's like, you you, you need it to try and connect to Paul because if you do something outside of the connection to Paul, it is what we're doing. What it's we more speculate. ambiguous what the chain of causation is. Yeah, exactly. right. I, I understand that. And it's a, I think that's a good, that's better than, yeah, you know, it's... just what the Gospel said. And it's like, yeah, know, it's the like, idea we're going to assume there's or there's oral lore in the Gospels that somehow wasn't known to Paul or that Paul rejected. 
Um, that's a lot of scholars have taken that position. And I think there's more scholars now are starting to be skeptical of that position. Mm. Um, at least lower your confidence is the goal. Right. Uh, yeah. And certainly mathematically you have to, because, uh, stuff that connects through Paul automatically has a higher probability than stuff that connects through a hypothetical tread end. Right? right. So like, so like as soon as you're adding a hypothesis to your chain of causation, the probability drops. And even if it drops only a small amount, it mathematically necessarily has to be lower. That's that's the, the fact of it. I, I agree. Constellation Pegasus, were the Levites responsible for the Exodus story? Why were they given power in the first place? This is outside of your... Yeah, this is outside my area. Um, but it's been written on a lot. Um, I think Deaver writes, writes about it. Uh, I can't think of what the latest... There have been a few things discussing about um, why why was the why were certain texts invented to tell certain stories. Um, there's actually a lot. Like if you look at the last ten years, there's been some books on this um, from major scholars in Old Testament studies. Um, I would go look at that. Go find out what the literature is lately. Okay, I got to take the super chat thing off because we got to hurry up. <laughs> I don't want you to be here all afternoon. All right. I yeah. got to scroll up here. Sorry. We, we probably need, yeah, I probably need to wrap soon. Um, I am literally, yeah. So I just didn't want to keep you forever. And then you'd be like, dude, this guy. Um, scrolling up here, trying to catch up to where I was. Oh, I see. Gotcha. Yeah. So you see we have it's plenty finally of, populated. Plenty yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay. So just to make sure we're on the same page. Yeah. That was the Levi one. Now we are it. And if you're here, hit the like button, go in the description, help support us on the Patreon, check out ways of supporting by the books that Dr. Carey has, be on the lookout. We have courses that are coming in the future and uh, let's try and bring these out. Constellation Pickens says, any good books on debunking astrology? Uh, I don't know the answer to that question, but uh, look into the Center for Inquiry. They probably um, would know the answer to that question. P personnel at CFI Los Angeles, for instance, might be able to answer that. Thank you for that. Rainbow Kramp Krampus. Does historical Jesus make logistical sense, i.e. how do people who cast off worldly goods afford to eat and travel? Any sources on how itinerant craftsmen operated <clears throat> in the empire? Um, well, the model would be, uh, you know, people are still working, right? So um, it would be through charity, basically. Um, we, we have lots of evidence of people living on charity in the ancient world, both in the pagan world and the Jewish world. Um, and, and it would be like, you would have a group of people and everybody's doing jobs and yeah, itinerant craftsmen you have in every town, you have like a little place that's known where you just hang out and then people who need a, need someone, they would go and, Hey, I need laborer you dude. And then you'd go to that part and then you hire people. And so that would be one way that you would make money, uh, is, is, is by doing that basically just going to the, the sort of, uh, the, the labor you know, circle of town or whatever. And then people know laborers and craftsmen hang out there. Mm -hmm. And if you just need something like I'm moving, I need to move my furniture. You come, you know, that, that kind of thing. Jesus even gives a parable where he references this, this phenomenon. So, um, so yeah, that, that's how you would do it. And from town to town, it would, you would just quickly figure out like, where is the place you hang out? And then everybody in town knows to go there. If you want to hire someone to do something, um, that would be the main way. But if once you have established communities, like you have basically a church community of some kind, then you start having like basically slots you can plug people into. So like, mm -hmm. you know, they even mentioned uh, Axe mentions this, and whether this is true of Paul or not is a whole separate question, but it's at least realistic in the social context is right. the idea that when Paul is a tent maker, he plies his trade with, with the church and for the church, wherever he ends John up. Poppenburg and so, yeah. So the, the church community would already be prepped to organize that. Like they're, they're, they're already kind of like, if you know, there's a um, union in their own sense. Well, there's, there's Jewish family centers now today that do similar things like this, where they, they, they plug people in together. Like, Hey, someone's got a couch they want to get rid of. Do you want a couch? Right? Like, so they, yeah. so they, the, 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 the community itself already has a network for this. And then same with like getting hired and getting jobs and, and, working and stuff. So, um, so they, they would always have a place like here's a tent maker who will always have a slot for somebody, right? Like, and, and he's part of the community or we know we have good relations with this guy. Oh, and they, you know, we got a tent maker and can we plug him in and can you like put him in your, your factory or whatever. And right. so like that, that, that's how it would work basically. I think there is one scholar, I can't remember his name, just an interesting note that I read who actually thinks that the disciples stole the body of Jesus away in the gospel because the accusation is they stole yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. And there is actually more evidence for that than uh than him really but yeah. Rising. yeah like that's more plausible than the real resurrection yeah, but yeah. but it, it is funny because his explanation it hit like a worldly we all need to eat we all need to and he was like here these guys were possibly fishermen not doing very well the lake of tiberius has been ruled by tax collectors now and so what did they do they stole the body so they can pass this myth on and get 
funding yeah. from the churches. That so sounds like J.M. Duncan Derrett. It might be. Duncan Derrett did this article. In, uh, I don't did, know the name. He did a chapter in The Empty Tomb, which was a volume edited by Robert Price and uh, Jeff Lauder. I have several chapters in it as well. But uh, Duncan Derrett has a chapter in it called The Financial Incentives or The Financial Interest in the Resurrection or whatever, uh, where he talks about this, like, this, this, could, this looks like a religious racket. And there's passages in Paul that support this because Paul's <laughs> often having to defend himself <laughs> For like, what are you really doing with all this money you're getting? Yeah. Right? Like, said, no, no, I'm I'm taking it to this, the I holy people. First I'm taking it to the apostles in Jerusalem. Trust me, you know. Like, so there's oh, there's definite money involved, and it, it, Paul even references that he's taking the money back to the holy ones in Jerusalem. Which you know, some scholars think he means the poor. I think he means the apostles. So Paul is basically walking back to Jerusalem with bags of cash. Right. And so if you wonder like, why did they let Paul in, let, allow his mission to you know plug into theirs? Yeah, I'm, I'm I sure. Mean, he, could, yeah, I, I think it's highly likely that he had literally bought his way in. And it doesn't have to be either or. This is the interesting thing. Like, I did a video a long time ago. Did Joseph Smith be, believe his own BS? And yes, right. <laughs> he probably really believed in his own BS and yet was a con man who was making money right, to try and right, grow right. his empire and, yeah. and, and ran for president. There's all. No, absolutely. It can be both. And, uh, and even just like the, the whole conniving part of it could be believed by them to be in service of the spiritual mission. Right. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Send me your money because it's God, right? Like it's part of God's believe. plan. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Chris, again, plenty of the younger didn't know Christians equals plenty of the elder neither. Implications regarding Tacitus writing about torture of Christians in Nero's yeah. garden? This is one of the major arguments I wrote in an article. I can't remember what journal. Um, so I published an article on this in, in an ac academic journal, which is reproduced in my book, Hitler, Homer, Bible, Christ. So if you want... Um, uh, you want to read that, that's the easiest, uh, most affordable way to get access to that article. Uh, but uh, yeah, I go into that. Um, that's one of the problems is that there's no way Pliny the Younger, who absolutely revered his father and was even there on the day of his d death, because he actually writes to Tacitus a letter. Um, Tacitus asks him, like, could you tell me like what happened to your dad? And because it's, and, it's a heroic story. And so Pliny says yes, and he writes this letter back to his friend Tacitus. So Pliny and Tacitus are buds, and they write to each other all the time. Uh, and so when Pliny uh, writes this letter to Trajan, Emperor Trajan, about the Christians, and he says, like, I, I don't know anything about, I don't know anything about Christians, I don't know anything about what they're supposed to be guilty of, I don't know how to try them and all this stuff, um, that does make it highly unlikely that Christians are mentioned in Pliny the Elder's history of Rome. And I mentioned earlier that that's my position. I think he, he was writing about someone else. Uh, not the Christians. And that's why Pliny the Younger has never heard of them before. Like, well, he's heard of them before, but he doesn't know anything about them. Um, but if his, yeah, if his father had written extensively about them and they were implicated in, in, in arson, you know, Pliny would be writing like, uh, well, you know, my dad wrote about these guys who were guilty of arson, maybe. Like, should I be worried? You know, that like that kind yeah. of, you would have something more about that. Whereas Pliny's like, I don't even know what these guys are guilty of. I wonder of. if Candidamas probably takes that position too, because she's kind of suspect about some of this oh candida early. moss yeah uh yeah, yeah, i say yeah, candida because no. they said the pronunciation is actually not candida oh it is candida i think candida. i thought it was candida yeah, yeah that's okay. what i'm saying like it's a weird way to perceive I, I don't know I, how weird it also, is but I'm, I'm used to the the uh the act the, the afflicted version but no if she does uh, this candida. issue though makes me think and when i was thinking roman provenance for a while like that rome invented christianity this is a problem. Like, how does Pliny not know that Titus and Vespasian created the religion? Right. Something? How does he not know that it's like uh, it looks like a revolution cult to him? Like their leader was was executed for for pretend for attempting to be a king or whatever. Right. Like so. Uh, yeah. No. That, that it's so unlikely that this information wouldn't be available to Pliny the Younger because his own dad that he deeply revered and he read all this stuff. His own book uh, would have it in there. So so that argues that it probably wasn't there. And so I think if we do find plenty of the elders history, I predict uh, it will not mention Christians. Um, hmm. Thank you, Chris. Uh, liberal conspiracy. Richard, how many times do you think you'll need to explain varying degrees <laughs> of certainty to some people? Thank you for the 666. Uh, uh, for, forever, because, you know, um, yeah, there, there's always new people that you have to explain this to. And, and, and there's a tendency, people have a cognitive bias. Our brains are built to um to do this to, towards black and white thinking uh and and not being able uh, what it's called it's called uh, ambiguity intolerance it's actually you can google that ambiguity intolerance is an actual measurable personality trait uh and people who have ambiguity intolerance are literally physically uncomfortable by ambiguity so they need certainty so everything is either or degrees of certainty like shades of gray nuances these things physically hurt 
They, they literally are uncomfortable, made un physically uncomfortable by these things. And so they're, they're pushed by this discomfort into the black and white thinking. So it's like get rid of nuances, get rid of stages of, of probability. Everything is absolutely this or absolutely that. They're pushed in that direction. And this is an actual brain phenomenon that's studied by science. So this is why it's, it's a universal flaw of humans, basically. This is why I'm always right. You know what I mean? It's just the <laughs> and way the world also some, works. Also, some people are more prone to it than others. Like you're, you're, you're actually, it's a measurable metric of ambiguity and tolerance. And there is literature showing that the higher your ambiguity and tolerance the higher the probability that you're a political conservative. Um, but it's not one-to-one. -one. So it's not like if you have high intolerance, you are a conservative, or if you are a conservative, you have high intolerance. It's not one-to-one -one because that would be ambiguity intolerance. Uh, uh, so it's just, there is a statistical, measurable statistical relationship as well. So um, there's all that science you can find, just Google ambiguity intolerance and it'll lead you on a rabbit hole uh, on all of that. Thank you. Beta decay, good question. Is Jesus carrying the cross? He was ultimately sacrificed on a literary evolution of Isaac carrying the wood he was to be sacrificed on. I haven't looked into that, so I can't comment on that. Thank you so much, Beta. And there is an interesting thing in the Resurrection Book of Dale Allison Jr. that he recently did. He, I don't know the scholar's name, but he takes the death, the the uh, passion narrative, the passion narrative yeah. as a reversal of a Joshua story where there's five kings that get crucified and buried right. in a yeah. cave. That's one of the passages that uses the word crucifixion. But yeah, so it's like it's a reverse order, mm -hmm. and I gotta pull up the scholar because it's something to consider. You know. Anyway, thank you. Did you? You good? Yeah, okay. yeah, no, I, yeah. There's there's definitely a lot of good stuff out there that study the the myth making behind the gospels. Like in in my book on the historicity of Jesus, I just give examples. Like I don't go with I don't give a <laughs> thorough analysis of every myth. There's more than I've read, right? Like I'm yeah. always finding new stuff and like, oh my god, that's brilliant. Um, so yeah, there's tons of really cool stuff like that. Whiskey, yeah. thank you for the super chat. Does the plurality of Gnostic Christianities better fit with a historical model, mythicist, or a hybrid? Uh, I think not none of the above. Um, so uh, the plur the, Paul is already talking about a plurality of Christianities in his own day. So clearly there was a lot of stuff. But this happened to Socrates, right? So like as soon as Socrates dies, like all his disciples run off and go in completely different directions and spin his philosophy into different things, um, like immediately. Uh, and so this is, and, and the same you could say with mythicism, because as soon as you have someone start preaching an idea, well, other people are going to take that idea and riff on it and modify it like within years, right? right? So so the same phenomenon happens regardless of whether Jesus existed or not. And consequently, we can't differentiate the two theories by this fact. And, and especially since when you're talking about what scholars call Gnostic Christianities, uh, we're talking like 100 to 200 years later. Like we're not even talking about the origin of Christianity anymore. Well, just so you know, Onesimus is in the chat. Ah, there it is. Yeah. <sighs> you do exist. <laughs> Great question. Thank you so much for that. Nice. Dr. Romanat says, how was James, a.k.a. the indestructible Rasputin, likely killed? Stoning, taking a head, a head taking off, a the header off the temple. I was right there at the corner with yeah. the saves thrown. Or beaten with a fuller's club. Yep, or beaten with a fuller's club. Or maybe all um, <laughs> yeah, the, the ridiculous story in Hegesippus is that he's thrown off the temple. I think, is he is he thrown off the temple and then stoned? Like he survives the fall from the temple, which is impossible. And then he's stoned and survives that, which is impossible. And then the, this, uh, the fuller comes up with the club and beats him to death, which is, you know, that would work. But uh, yeah, that story is not even remotely believable. But then there's the passage in, uh, if people believe the passage in Josephus is referring to R. James, where he's just stoned in the ordinary fashion. Um, you, know, ex, you know, they make sure that the stoning works. Uh, the, the stoning method, all the execution methods in the Mishnah is, are horrific like so if you read like how the stoning actually operated and it is still done it's still practiced in communities today like the, the a lot of muslim communities still use the mishnah practice of stoning um which is horrible <clears throat> and, and it's guaranteed to kill you like there's no there's no surviving it i'd love to pull up the picture but i'm gonna tell you i'm just gonna emphasize i was there at the temple mount and that drop is so high. And right. the valley's right yeah. there. Yeah, yeah. And if he did get thrown off, I can't imagine him being alive. Right, right. No, it's, it's like impossible. They're kicking yeah, his yeah, ass yeah, right. and he's dead. Like, you, dude, he's dead. <laughs> yeah, like, right. Stop already. Yeah, they're beating a dead horse. They're the beating thing. a yeah, dead yeah, right. I don't know uh, how he would have survived. And I'm looking up going, Yeah, the body's still twitching. The body, he must still be alive. It you know, is I, I don't so know what's freaking high, yeah. dude. Oh, no, man. no, that's right. That's my point, is that that story's not believable. Um, no, I think we don't know. We don't really know. I don't think the James passage in Josephus refers to this James. 
Um, the Hegesippa story is totally unbelievable. We, we have no reliable sources about how, how, when, or where James died. Thank you, Doc. Of course, always coming in with really interesting questions and appreciate the support. Chris, did you, um, thank you, Chris, again, did you address Neil's attacks? Any new book ideas? Uh, well, if, if I, is, is this someone who missed the live stream? So I did a live stream with Neil on Neil's show. I guess that's the closest you would get to that. Um, also, there was a live stream with Aaron Adair between Neil and Aaron on um, on, on Neil's show. So I would say uh, so I'd say, say both of those together because there are things in Neil's show that got discussed that weren't discussed in my show and the one that I was on. Uh, but so when you put them together, it covers kind of everything, I think. So uh, I think that's almost in and of itself enough uh, of a response. Thank you for all the support today, Chris. Tim Okasa. Tim, did you super chat and then ask a question? That's the question today. Um, I don't see a question. Oh, see yeah, because yeah, sometimes people super chat and then they drop a comment. In there, yeah. They don't really know how to do both. Yeah. Or that happens. But maybe they're just showing some love. Tim, thank you so much. I don't see a question. I really appreciate that support. I'm still scrolling down to make sure I didn't miss you. And it uh, looks, I don't see it. Do you? I do not. No, not yet. And I'm kind of going fast, but that's because there's so many. Okay. Amir, last one here. Yeah. Richard, I'm not sure how to read Greek here. It's not used for sperm in ancient Greek literature. Um, is used Wait, for sperm. Wait, it's probability. So the probability Change my mind. that sperm is not used for sperm in ancient Greek literature is greater than the probability that it is change my mind. I, I've never made an argument like this, so I don't know why anyone would need this argued. Um, <clears throat> sperm means seed, and it refers to human sperm, uh, plant sperm, well, which would be seeds uh, in this case. So uh, it's a vague word. Um, the word sperm in Romans 1 and 3 comes from Nathan. So it's a quote, it's a lift from scripture. Um, and it refers directly there to uh, the, the semen of David. So um, it definitely means semen. Uh, I'm quite certain that's what uh, Paul means by it. And you grant this on the history. Yeah, it, it could be also, it could be metaphorical. So this is, Paul talks about like we being the seed, the sperm of Abraham, uh, the Gentiles being the sperm of Abraham. And obviously he does not mean that literally, uh, right? So, uh, so Paul can use this word in a metaphorical or allegorical way, um, but the allegory still plays off of the, the concept of sperm either way, yeah. right? So, the, so there's in no sense do you need to challenge the definition of the word sperm. I mean, it means seed, hence uh, uh, a sperm. And so. I take Paul like to be using the the Roman idea of adoption to a lot into his. Oh yeah, literature. absolutely. Uh, no, right. They've um, they're using that as their model for uh, how to be a son of God, right? And so and so you become this community, the sons of God, uh, basically is what the Christians are imagining themselves of. But it definitely does play off of the Roman concept of of adoption. Thank you so much, Amir. I really appreciate the super chat, and I'm. I think no, we're ready to wrap. That's it. Yeah, I don't understand it, so that's why I needed you to be able to. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously, um, go down in the description. You can check out uh, Dr. Carrier's blog. He's got a lot of ways to search items. Um, ultimately, with this live stream, I wanted to see let you see a historical uh, Jesus um, view because yeah. we all hear you of the mythicist model, and it was like, hey. You want to hear him flex yeah, his what, muscles? what I think is the most plausible model that comes up about the middle of this video. So Yeah, check it out. Mm -hmm. Check out his blog. Go join our Patreon. I've got a lot of content with other academics that we've done. Uh, Paula Fredrickson, John Dominic Crossan, Joel Baden, John J. Collins, Elaine Pagels. Like the list literally goes on and on and on. I've got stuff coming up that I'm going to be putting on the Patreon early. We've got courses coming up. The most recent ones will be the Quest for the Historical Jesus with Del C. Allison Jr. I've got the one that I did with James Tabor on the Gospel of Mark. Then we've got five that are going to be coming up with you, Dr. Carrier. And mm -hmm. we're going to be going into Gospel of Mark as mythology literature or right. myth mythography. The Gospels as mythography, yeah. all of the Gospels. Right. Um, we do naturalism as a worldview, mm -hmm. um, yeah. historical Jesus slash yeah. mythicism. Yeah. Studying um, the historical Jesus. And then, um, new, no, we didn't do, what else is that? Uh, introduction to new Testament, uh, yeah, right. studies. New so. Testament studies for everyone. So yeah, I do, I do a course on how to do that. And I appreciate that. I hope this dialogue helps people to get along more in the community because we really, we need it. We need more peace. So. 
Thank you so much. I guess my final words would just be the magical words. that When you die and traverse the afterlife, the underworld, remember to say this at each gate. We are Myth Vision. All right, we look like we're live here at Myth Vision Podcast, we're talking about the Book of Acts with a historian, scholar who's published extensively on the field of New Testament studies and other areas as well. I hope everybody's having a wonderful day. Is Acts fake history? What what is going on here? Uh, should we trust it um, to be historically reliable? And if it is reliable in some ways, why is that? Where did this information come from? Does this person have a propagandistic game to play to convince the reader, maybe Theophilus, of their particular belief system or their Christ movement? What are they doing? What's going on? And so I have a scholar, Dr. Richard Carrier, joining us today, who's actually wrote an article recently. I've been going through it again. Um, how we know Acts is a fake history. Welcome back to Myth Vision, Dr. Carrier. Yeah, glad to be back on. Just, uh, I guess, if you were to put, because I almost want to read your your bio, but you have several books. You have your website, which is where this article is for people who are interested. I mean, I've got, you know, Jesus from Outer Space, Proving History, and then Hitler, Homer, Bible, Christ right here. And I was trying to find your others, but I literally can't see yeah, there's so there's, many books. There's nine. I, I now have nine books. Um all but one are available in Audible as well, so people who want to hear them instead of read them. Um, the the ninth one, Audible, is coming, but it won't be read by me. It's going to be read by a special celebrity. So uh, mm. th that will be announced, I hope, by the end of this year, I think. Uh, so finally have the audio of Jesus from Outer Space available. Um, other than that, yeah, electronic edition and all that. But my website, richardcarry.info, people can go there, find my Twitter feed, my Facebook feed, um, uh, my, all my books, all my writings and uh, links to learn about my courses. Uh, so I yeah. have a variety mm -hmm. of text-based courses, but I'm also starting to roll out courses with MythVision, uh, which are right. video-based courses. Uh, and uh, they're great. Like I, I love the way we've organized those courses. The video is good. Uh, the syllabi are good. So <clears throat> uh, the one we've got is New Testament Studies for Everyone, which does touch on this issue of the Book of Acts. And then how would you approach scholarship about it? Like how would you approach this question that we're talking about today from an informed perspective without having to go get a college degree and all of that. Right. Uh, and that, that's what the New Testament studies for everyone is about. It's about giving people some of those basic skills, teaching you some of the resources that are available that you can use to leverage your ability and your knowledge uh, and just fill you in on what is the mainstream position where, where is the field on these things right now? And I think that generally the trend is on acts is with me on this. Uh, I was just reading, in fact, I, maybe I can read it out uh, again, but I, in my article, the one that you linked to, uh, I linked to the Western Institute's uh, summary of their study, because they came out with a study of acts, they published a book on it. Okay. Uh, and it lists all of their conclusions. And, and I think that came out, I can't remember when that came out. Oh, it was, uh, let's see, it concluded in 2011. I can't remember when they published the book, but um, but just looking back over their list of things that they found. And the Western Institute is, people recognize it as the Jesus Seminar. Um, that's a misnomer because the Jesus Seminar was just one project that they did and that they finished years and years ago. Uh, but the group that does these projects is the Westar Institute, uh, and of which I'm now a fellow uh, of the Institute. And and they they did a bunch of other studies. Once they finished the Jesus Project, they did uh, Book of Acts, they did Origins of Christianity and things like that. Uh, and they're doing a bunch of other stuff too. 
but anyway, they did this act seminar and I, I, I hadn't read like their report summary in like maybe 10 years. Right. This is because I used it. I used the report uh, and the reports uh, for my book on the history of city of Jesus. When I wrote a chapter about this, yeah. summarizing a lot of other scholars and, and you'll notice I cite tons of scholars, like some of the leading uh, writers of commentaries on acts are saying the same things that I am about the book of acts, that it is, essentially historical fiction. It, it's more on the fiction side than it is on the historical side. It's more of a religious adventure novel. And in fact, it has more in common with uh, religious adventure novels, with actual novels like fiction of the period than it does with histories of the period. It looks a lot more like a novel than it does a, a history. Uh, if, you've, if you've read the histories and you can really tell the difference between the way they're written and how they're composed and all of that. Um, this this is an interesting point. I hope we can get into some of those details yeah, yeah, yeah. We will. as we go in because your your article and I'm I've literally referenced it in the description of the video. So if you're watching this later and it's not live, you you can check it out. I'm going to go ahead and post this in the chat just so everybody can at least put the tab on your computer. You're going to want to read this later. I actually contacted Dr. Carrier because I'm actually a subscriber to what he has, what he publishes, and. And this came out, and I had just recently done some of this stuff on Richard Perbo's books. Scratch his reputation. I'm talking about his work, okay? Yeah, and probably. wow, what a heck of a book. I mean, he's written several books on Acts. Um, you know, he, he really knows a thing or two. And so I started yeah, reading yeah. that and then came across your article, and I went, this was really well written. One of my favorite parts right at the beginning – was how Christian apologists, and it's usually apologists doing this, because oh, yeah. I know Christian yeah. scholars who are Christian, whatever, how you want to define that. I tend to say if they claim to be Christian, they're Christian. I don't yeah. have this. Oh, yeah. like, right, right, right. Yeah, the, the, whole, the whole idea of if you don't believe in Nicene Christianity, you're not a real Christian. That, that's right. bogus. Yeah, that's definitely. Like Dominic Crossan, you yeah. reference him, the power of the uh, power of parables. So he, you know, will literally take jabs at Luke Acts as propagandistic yeah. and all of that, right? Yeah. And he, I consider him a form of a Christian. He claims to be a form yeah. of a Christian. Yeah. So I, I think he's a pastor as well, isn't he? Is, doesn't he have a some ordination? I can't remember. I know he was a monk. Oh, like had had been. Okay, yeah. Yes. Yeah. He right. was a monk, and in fact, he tells me to call him Dom because when he was. You know, a monk, his name was Dominique. So, or he went by the name Dominique. So ah. he just says, call me Dom. Yeah. He takes very clear factual approaches on trying to understand what the material is. What he draws ontologically is a whole different question at the end of the day. But yeah, I love what he yeah. says. Right. And he would be on the same page as you when it comes mm -hmm. to Acts. But other Christians who are apologists who, if this yeah. isn't history, I'm going to word it this way. If this book is what you're suggesting, they are in huge trouble. Their entire worldview is in huge trouble. The so, conservatives, yeah, the, the fundamentalists. Right. I, I think, you know, there's forms of liberal Christianity that can survive accepting right. uh, that the Bible is, an, uh, you know, all allegory and myth and has you know, wisdom messages in it and things like that. Uh, God's special way of communicating is, isn't through rational, objective uh, history, right? Uh, so, yeah, if you completely reinterpret the new testament you can you can rescue a semblance of christianity but you're right the fundamentalists need these things to be true because if it's not history if this stuff is being made up that contaminates the rest of the text right because like well that means then the gospels are making stuff up and then what have we got right you go into paul and then there's i don't know what everything's kind of wishy-washy in there and maybe paul's making up stuff we don't know uh yeah so it it has a cascade of problems and so yeah that's why the it's all man on deck right this is a they have to defend the bulwarks and acts is one of them. And, and of course the article we're talking about, I, that premise, the, the discussion on this one particular Christian apologist who has, a, who very explicitly says what their apologetic mission is, which is that they need the first, they need to believe that Jesus is God to do that. They need to prove that the first disciples, the first apostles believe Jesus was God. Mm. And to do that, they need the book of acts, right. To be a historically reliable text and not as most mainstream scholars now conclude a second century uh, piece of propaganda. Uh, right. So, um, so yeah, that's, and of course there's not even an internal logic to the thing I pointed out in the article, like actually acts never says Jesus is God. Uh, so <laughs> that's right. a, that's a mistake that often, uh, but you also but... point out like he he does a straw man and some fallacy because he assumes it's either he's completely mm. man and man only or he's all the way God Trinitarian. Yeah. And it's like, oh, my gosh, 
several scholars this, point out the boundaries, right? right? This is a common apologetic move, which is you say either one thing or the other, and then you refute one thing and therefore it's the other, right? Like this is right. a common, like Christian apologetics is practically built out of this methodology. Uh, and this is a good example where he says either Jesus, either Acts says Jesus is God or Acts says he was not divine at all. He's just an ordinary guy. And it's right. like, no, and that just most mainstream scholars come to the opposite conclusion that there is an excluded middle there, right. which actually is what the earliest documents, Paul and the book of Acts, and, and frankly, all of the gospels, even the gospel of John, we could do a whole thing on that. Uh, how, I don't think even the gospel of John is claiming that Jesus is God, um, but that's more debated. But anyway, the book of Acts isn't because the view was that Jesus was a divine being. Like he was supernatural. He was preexistent. He was, had, was God-like. He had God-like powers assigned to him. He had some of God's authority assigned to him by God and all of this stuff. But that's not the same thing as being identical to God, right? And so that's what the mainstream view is, is that was the earliest view. Acts is totally in alignment with that. But once you admit that that's the case, then, then his whole apologetic argument that it's either all God or no, no, nothing divine at all, that argument falls apart and you're stuck in the middle where he can't get to where he wants to go. And that's why he has to create that false dichotomy right. uh, to do that. I did. I don't want to get lost in that because yeah. there's some details about this article that I just want people to read because I, I'm really yeah. want to get into the data <laughs> of why is this book not yeah, let, history factual. Me, uh, it's not propagandistic to try and like force a path. And, and one of the things you yeah. said in the intro of this that I was getting to that was my favorite part is how oh, right. you, you literally say like they have to ignore the 20 other book of acts of various fictions and this is something that dr richard c miller said and by the way he loves mm -hmm. your work a uh, huge fan maybe sometime i can get you and him together yeah, on to talk he he pointed this out too it seems to be something that's happening in my thinking over time and i'm always learning is we have this overwhelming weight of of data from Christians, self-proclaimed Christians who are writing what we would clearly say fan fiction. They're yeah. creating narratives, having fun, having Jesus be a kid, killing another kid to turn yep. to birth. Like <laughs> crazy, cool, fun, interesting novels. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the disciple John commands bed bugs to march out of his bed. Yeah, that's like, <laughs> just... or the giant cross coming out of us. Yes. So <laughs> I, I say like, the gist is we want to create narrative around our guy. Whether he existed or not is not the question today. It's yeah. simply like, here's our person that we're going to create fiction about. But we get back to these supposed untouchable, sealed by some invisible power that says, these books, however, are the real deal. <laughs> <That's> right, <yeah. laughs> Everyone else is full of it. Yeah, yeah. It, it's it's the ignoring of context. This is another apologetic trap. Uh, and the, the true context is that if you step aside and forget Christian faith claims, like the, the whole idea of ca the canon and all of that, um, and you just look at it like books of Acts were normally fiction, like like 10 to 1, right? <laughs> like more than, no, it's more like 20 to 1. Uh, even if ours is true, then but th it's like the weirdest, rarest exception Right. of this genre of literature among Christians. And when you look at it that, in that context, you'll well, hold on. Christians are just making up acts willy-nilly left and right. Why Why should we believe this one right. uh, is somehow the only one that was a properly researched history? And uh, and that does mean you need to answer that question. And, and apologists like Boyd will attempt that, right? Uh, and then, you know, critics like me will come out and expose the fallacies of what they're attempting to do. When you look at the evidence... The evidence supports not only is the prior probability support acts being fiction, but the evidence within acts itself, our app book of acts itself confirms that it's fiction. Like all the evidence trends towards fiction, not, not towards history. And, and that's even apart from the fact that there's another version of our acts. I don't know if I, I sort of mention it briefly in that article, but people often don't realize that there is another version of acts, our acts, that's, that's like 10 to 20 percent longer and has right. a whole bunch of extra stuff in it. Uh, but it's otherwise identical apart from minor changes. Uh, and that one was just happened to be excluded from the canon for whatever reasons. Uh, but that means that like people were willing to even add fiction to X. Right? <laughs> so you can keep, like, keep fictionalizing it, like keep altering it to add more and more crazy stuff. I was reading the Hermeneia by, by, uh, by Pervo on X and he points out, I mean, there's so much in there. I, the, 
you can't just casually read that that Hermeneia. It's like it's oh, top. Yeah. I mean, all Hermeneia commentaries are heavy, uh, heavy, but they're all excellent. Uh, even when they're by people I don't agree with, they're still they're academically rigorous, and so they right. are the best commentaries to go to. You don't have to agree with them and everything, but they are invaluable to consult because they they've done their work. Yeah, on, on, and on he, every aspect of it. he brings this up. He says it's like there's different versions of that extended version where. It's yeah. from like seven, six to seven up to 10% like larger and wild stuff appears in that other model that we don't see in our yeah. version in our gospels or in our New Testaments today. And that, that centers our context because we step back and look at the context. We're looking at a different thing than the Christians want you to see, right? They don't want you to see the context. And when you do, they'll come up with a whole bunch of excuses why you should ignore the context, which is not what you should do as a historian. You should, you should pay attention to the context and take it seriously. So let's jab right in. Let's, let's get into these. We'll yeah, get let me, let me read the list. There's this 10. So at the West Star Institute, they have these 10 things and they spent 10 years on this. So this is a committee, you know, probably about a hundred scholars or more overall. Um, and not just anybody can join. You have to have a, you have to be fully credential credentialed and you have to be nominated and they have to like put you in uh accept you as for the fellowship so these are like serious vetted scholars over 10 years came to a pretty good consensus like there's not much dissent among them uh, of these 10 things about the book of acts and so let me read them <laughs> i'm just reading the verbatim yeah, make you full screen so everybody can see you okay yeah uh so uh the use of acts as a source for history has long needed critical assessment yes uh acts was written in the early decades of the second century this is you know, Christian apologists hate this, but this is the, the growing consensus now is that Acts is an early second century text. It was not written in the first century. Um, the author of Acts used the letters of Paul as sources. Uh, that's important because the author of Acts contradicts the letters of Paul a lot. And now we know it's on purpose. Um, except for, they say, the letters of Paul, no other historically reliable source can be identified for Acts for the Christian parts of Acts, that is. Acts can no longer be considered an independent source for the life and mission of Paul. Contrary to Acts 1 through 7, Jerusalem was not the birthplace of Christianity. Acts constructs its story on the model of epic and related literature. The author of Acts created names for characters as storytelling devices. Acts constructs its story to fit ideological goals. And Acts is a primary historical source for the second century Christianity, not for first century Christianity. So that, and I agree with all those things that those are all the things that I aim to prove in uh, chapter nine of On the History of the City of Jesus. I focus more on the fiction aspect. Like we can look at story after story after story and we can see the literary basis of them. And once you see the literary basis of them, it doesn't make any sense to believe that this is history. Right. Okay, a couple things before we dive into Q&A and, and to just want to throw it out there. Uh, come on. Dr. Carrier, I mean, look at the opening of Luke. I mean, it's clearly a history. You're just wanting to sin. Um, you just want to deny God and Christ. Um, Luke tells you in his preface, uh, this is a history, and he's giving you the actual facts, right? And Luke wrote this, right? I mean, you're, you're in total denial. Of course, I'm being silly here. Um Tackle that big question that even scholars tend to wrestle over about this issue, about the preface of Luke. Uh, yeah, so the, the usual apologetic line is, oh, this looks just like a preface to a history book, right? Uh, and it does. In fact, it deliberately does. But it conspicuously lacks all the actual things that you would find in history. So it's, it's mimicking history while not actually right and Can i'll give you an example some of, of those I mean. things as you as you go right. along yeah so uh to give you an example so uh we have lots of prefaces historians in their prefaces will usually say who they are not always but usually they'll say who they are uh what their sources were sometimes they'll mention uh they'll discuss they'll name the sources one of my favorite examples is arian uh christian apologists love to rag on arian because he wrote this history of Alexander the Great 500 years later. How could he write a history about Alexander the Great 500 years later? Why, why would you trust him, you silly historians? And it's like, because Arian says who he is. Uh, he says what his method was. He explains what his method was. Uh, he, he names his sources. And he says, I'm only using three eyewitness books written by people who marched with Alexander. Uh, I'm going to just say what they say where they agree. And where they disagree, I'll point out where they disagree. Uh, and we know he doesn't follow that method 
you know, consistently, but he does it. Like there's points where he'll say, oh, well, this author said that there was a magical snake and this other author said it was just a raven, right? Like, so there, there'll be things like that. Yeah. Um, but it'll be this methodological consciousness, but naming sources, naming who they are, explaining to the reader why you should even believe anything they're saying uh, in rational terms, not faith-based terms. When you look at Luke's preface, he never says who he is, never explains who he is, never explains how he knows anything he knows. He says he's faithfully reproducing a tradition handed down to him but we know that's not even true uh, because he contradicts all his prior sources, Matthew and Mark, for example. So he's not faithfully doing it, but he claims to be. But he doesn't name them either. He doesn't say, hey, Mark and Matthew wrote these books. I'm using them as sources and I'm going to do this is how I'm going to decide between them where they disagree or whatever. He doesn't do that. Right. He never names his sources. He never explains how, what method he used uh, to decide what to write. Uh, why did he contradict them? Why did he make more stuff up? Why did you know he doesn't tell you? So the preface looks like a history, but it doesn't do any of the actual things that a real history would do. So uh, this is very much kind of like a fictional history. Uh, the way it, it already from the beginning, the way it's constructed does not look like an actual history. You actually bring up Plutarch's kind of critique of Herodotus, and Herodotus for his time and age. You know, he does an okay job. I mean, he does not bad. Of course, the father of for history. His time, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But but even while Plutarch jabs at him for kind of the methodological, he crosses mm -hmm. over certain barriers and mixes up genres and stuff in the right. way that he does stuff. But even Herodotus is better than Acts. Uh, even Herodotus will sometimes name sources. He'll sometimes express skepticism when he's not sure about a story. Right. He'll talk Mike about it. Right. He'll tell alternative versions of the story. And that's a good example where he actually tells you oh, this version of the story I have from the Greeks who don't like them, and this version of the story I have from them, right? So uh, so he's telling you where the biases are. Like, he's doing a critical history here. It's very primitive. It's very simplistic in in, in his critical method because it's, it's he's practically the first one doing it. Uh, but he's doing more than we get in the Book of Acts. We don't get anything like that in the Book of Acts. So even Herodotus, whom historians like me deem to be eh, as far as reliability goes, uh, even he is like, you know, stars better than the book of Acts uh, by comparison. Um, we might get into some of the, the details of, I don't know if you want what you want to get into next, but there's one thing I know, the one thing that Christians always cite to try and contradict what I just said. Uh, and we can jump into that if you want. Go for it. Uh, which is that he gets trivia correct, right? Luke, the name of a magistrate. Uh, the the title, the word used in this particular region for magistracy, uh, mm -hmm. well, geography, his geography is decent. Um, uh, he gets like the correct people who were in charge in certain places at the right times and all of this stuff. So he get and he gets uh, like when he dates John the Baptist's ministry, he lists a bunch of facts, none of which have anything really to do with John the Baptist or Christians. But he lists a bunch of facts. And go, oh, look, all those facts. He's dating something. That's what historians did. He's dating something. Curiously, he's not dating anything to do with Jesus. He only dates the reign of John the Baptist. And he does it in a traditional way where he lists all of these things. But this is it. That's the only time he ever dates anything. Only time, other than the, the Quirinius census, which is mm -hmm. that's a dateable event. Um, but even what he does with that is ridiculous. Uh, and so, but all of this stuff has nothing to do with Christianity, right? This is all incidental color detail. Uh, and, and I cite, and I quote uh, an author and scholar, in the article we're talking about where he says like, well, I've read detective novels that were 100% accurate in all the trivial details, like the names of politicians and things like that. And yet we're total fiction, right? So like the, the it's curious that the only time we can confirm anything is accurate next is when it is basically stuff that you get from the ancient version of Wikipedia. And the only time he, in every time he talks about Christian history, nothing is corroborated. So what you're looking at is you've got a historian here who, who's making up Christian history and putting it into a skeleton of real history uh, where none of the Christian stuff is corroborated. But all of the incidental stuff is corroborated because he's getting it from reference works. And I, I talk about in the article about these were commonly available, like all the reference works that Luke would need to put these references in there without any reference to Christian history um, were widely available. It would have been in any library uh, and almost every major city in ancient Rome at that time. The Roman Empire at that time had a major library. Libraries were open to the public. Uh, you couldn't check out books, but you could use them. Uh, at, in, there are research libraries. You could use them in the library. Uh, and one of the most biggest ones we know about is Josephus. We know he used Josephus like mad uh, and used him poorly. That's the other thing is he's bad at even even cribbing from Josephus. He's bad at it. <laughs> Uh, and so, uh, but we, that, but that's how we know he used him because, because how he screws up 
can only be explained by having screwed up reading Josephus. There's no other plausible explanation for it. So, uh, so yeah, he, he's throwing that color detail in to give the veneer of historical reality. But it is conspicuous that all the real history that you actually want to know about, none of that is corroborated and all of it's implausible. And that's the stuff that's highly literary in its construction and so on. So, uh, so even the one attempt that apologists will try to make for, oh, Axe, Axe is a really reliable history. Actually, the evidence proves the opposite is that he's sort of good at doing research in encyclopedias. Uh, that, that's basically all you can show for that. It doesn't mean that he's telling you the truth about any of the other stuff. I enjoy the book, of course. It's fun. Uh, it's it's interesting. Certain spots of it are more fun to me than others. But <laughs> so we're talking about sources. We would say Acts has the Gospels, some form, probably all three for all we know. Um, I, I, we didn't dive into the Marcion slash debate of what's happening there yet. Maybe you can make a comment on this because mm. there seems to be a big, big issue between – what kind of acts do we have? Do we trust that Marcion actually had a primitive version and that they fluffed it out and padded it to try and reverse Marcion? Or is Marcion taking things out of what was already a thorough book of acts, you know, gospel of Luke or whatever, or really Luke, because I'm not sure about the acts part when it comes to Marcion, but it seems like there's a debate among scholars on what the deal is with there. Do you want to make a brief comment on that before I dive into any other material? Yeah, only to say that I don't have strong opinions uh, in that debate yet. Uh, I'm watching the debate. I see, I don't think any side of the debate has a strong case. I think the evidence is too poor, right. uh, but I'm persuadable on that. Uh, so I'm, I'm sitting around waiting for like people to rally around a position. Uh, I, I am not sure uh, whether Luke Acts is something that uh, Martian edited or whether he had the original and other people, the, the canonical, the creators of the edition that we have, if they're the ones who edited it. And this is complicated by the fact that we have that other version. Yep. And that other version, it's, it's of Luke Acts. So both Luke and Acts are longer. They have weirder things in them. Well, where did those come from? And I'll give you an example of the problem here, uh, how this is vexing. So we know Luke wrote, uh, Luke used Josephus, I just mentioned, the Antiquities particularly, uh, the Antiquities of Josephus, which was published in the early 90s AD, um, this is why we think early second century for Luke Acts. It's one of many reasons we think that. Uh, but that's one of the pieces of it. But So we know he used that, and we can point to specific examples of where he's lifting material uh, from Josephus. Um, now, in the longer version, the version of Luke Acts, it's not in our Bible. Uh, and we see this in Codex Bezdi, which is uh, one of the early medieval manuscripts, the complete Bibles that we have. And... Uh, it has in the, in the, this isn't Book of Acts, but it's uh, Gospel of Luke, so it illustrates my point. In the empty tomb narrative, uh, in that version of Luke, there is a verse added that says that the tomb of Jesus took 20 men to open. Now that's a historical nonsense. There's no way that any tomb of Jesus would, any tomb would require 20 men to open this tomb. That, that would be a dumb way to design a tomb. Uh, but also that's not the case. But it's almost, not exactly word for word, but nearly word for word, a lift from Josephus in describing the doors to the temple of God. He says the temple of God required 20 men to open, and he refers to a miracle in which they opened automatically, uh, uh, implying that God had left the temple, right? It was the idea that, oh, God is now abandoning the Jews, and it was this was a portent for the, the end of the destruction of Jerusalem, yada, yada, right? right. But here he, Josephus is saying, oh, metaphor for God leaving the temple, abandoning, you know, doing that and it's the doors with 20 men so someone adds a line from josephus to the tomb of jesus making the tomb of jesus the temple of god and jesus leaves the temple of god just as god left the temple of the jews and so they're creating this whole you know rather brilliant you know metaphor and analogy not history there's no witness to this, this is an eyewitness testimony this is just more literary expansion more fan right. fiction and all of that but why did they know to lift this material from josephus Right. So like this is the thing is like we don't have a version of Luke Acts that's missing all the stuff from Josephus. So if the first so could Codex Bezdi be the original and then those lines were cut because they were considered too embarrassing or, or they didn't like them or whatever. Uh, I don't know. And, and there's a lot of scholars who've, who've wrestled with this, have written whole books on this question. And they don't come to a conclusion either. They're not sure. Right. And so that complicates the whole narrative about what, what was Martian doing. Uh, and I think it's also complicated by the fact that we don't have Martian. Mm -hmm. um, we have his enemies talking about Martian, and I don't entirely trust them to be telling the truth all the time. 
So, uh, and there's a lot of arguments from omission that I think are weak. And so there's a lot of problems with that. So I don't think that question is resolvable now. Um, definitely there's, there's hinky stuff going on, uh, involving the Martianite edition leading into our edition, but I don't think we can answer the question, uh, like that. Uh, what all that we can come to is that the Luke acts that we have is, you know, basically all fiction, uh, in regards to the Christian elements of it. Sources, gospels, you just mentioned Josephus. I'm glad you did. Steve Mason, mm -hmm. I'm fully convinced I'm yeah. on board with. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you've made in common in a previous lecture you gave that there probably were other sources, historical sources that yeah. were helping with like the Aeolian islands and understanding the region. Yes. Yeah, so uh, the Aegean Sea. So um, Aegean Seas, yeah. the Aegean Sea was recognized as a region. And we know there were historians who wrote histories about it because we have we have mentions of there being histories of the Aegean region. Um, the mentions are usually of earlier histories, but there certainly would have been later histories. We, we don't have any of them. We don't have the names of them, but there had to have been. That wouldn't have been a neglected region. So in any library, they would have been the equivalent of Josephus, but for the Aegean, right? And that would cover all the other cities that are covered in Acts when, when Paul is going around uh, the Greek islands and, and things like that. So, and there are a lot of these uh, sea narratives. So there, um, they weren't just sea narratives. They were actual travel guides. They were more like travel like tourist books, right? Like, so like half true, half false. Like there's a lot of myths and legends in them, but also like the cities mentioned and the distances to travel to get them were all real, right? Uh, so they were actual travel guides like that you could get. And there are tons of these. They're super popular, these travel guides, there's lots of them. Um, we don't have hardly any of them. We have like pieces of a few, but we here have references to a ton of them. So uh, that's an example of something that you could use. Like he could find like a good periplus, which is what we call these, these travel narratives. And it would have all the like basic data that he would need to build a story about Antioch right. or Corinth uh, uh, or Malta, right? Like he, he'd do all of these things um, doing that kind of using these kinds of reference books. Um, so w just because we don't have the reference books, we can't confirm this. Yeah. Uh, but it's a plausible uh, like he, we know he's doing it with Josephus because we have Josephus. So it makes sense that he would do it for, for everything else. There's no reason why he would only crib Josephus for color detail and not crib any of the other reference books that he would have available for color detail everywhere else. Uh, so, so yeah, I think there's, there's more literary references uh, that we can't reconstruct that he had to have been relying on. Uh, and, but there's something I thought you were going to go in a different direction. There's something more substantial than that is that I even argue in on the history of city of Jesus, that there probably were Christian sources that he was using like real Christian sources. Um, he's completely altering them. Uh, in the same way he does the letters of Paul. So Paul is also one of his sources. I was just about to. Uh, and he, but he deliberately rewrites every, he completely contradicts Paul in numerous fundamental ways, uh, specifically because Luke has an agenda. He wants to sell a particular version of history. It's a false version of history, but he wants to sell it. So he rewrites everything, uh, pretends it didn't happen according to the way Paul said it happened. Uh, but he's using Paul's letters as details for how to rewrite things. And we can find this because there's so many instances where he directly contradicts Paul the probability of that without him knowing that he's contradicting Paul, like deliberately, is very low. So it, we know he's using the letters of Paul. There's more evidence that he's using the letters of Paul. Scholars have written on this. There's lots of literature on it. But um, so that's another source. But I think there probably had to be something else. Like I suggest that maybe like the narratives of Paul's trial speeches, because they're so weird. Uh, Paul's trial speeches are different from his public speeches and acts. And they're different in ways that are consistent across the trials, but not across anything else in the book of Acts, which suggests to me that there's some sort of source uh, that Luke is using uh, that's lost. Now, we don't know how much of what he's giving us comes from that source, uh, but the fact that it, it disagrees with Luke's own agendas, the things he puts in there, um, and di disagrees in other ways, uh, suggests that he's got a source that we don't have and that we can't reconstruct. Um, but... I can only say this as a suspicion, right? I can't say, oh, we know what that source said, you know, like I can't really do it. We can, you know, give some suspicions and some arguments, but uh, it's not that decisive. But I do think there's a lot of ways that Acts makes no sense in the context of the gospel that Luke had just written. Mm. Uh, and in a way that suggests that Luke is reworking a version of the story that lacked all that information. And occasionally he throws in his gospel material but he doesn't do it consistently. And he doesn't, he's because he's bad at it. He doesn't realize that he's 
making huge narrative mistakes. So one of the examples is like, he goes from the gospel directly into book of Acts where there is a missing body. Right. And, you know, even Matthew has the sense to think like, shit, they're going to think someone stole it. Right. Uh, Luke gets rid of that storyline, but still you've got a missing body. Right. Like that's a big deal. It, the legal authorities would be all over that. Right. They'd be hauling people in, interrogating them, trying to figure out what happened to the body. Did you guys steal it? Are you still did he escape his execution and you're still taking orders from him? Like this would be a huge scandal that the Romans forces and the Jews would be super interested in. But in the book of Acts, it's like nah, never happened. <laughs> There's no missing body. There's nothing to be worried about. And every time you have Paul interact with the authorities, it's like, I don't know, maybe he's just seeing a vision of an angel or something, right? Like there's no reference to what about the missing body? Like, did they steal it? Like, where, where is the body? Uh, the Christians never use it as an argument. And the Jews and Romans never use it as a reason to do an inquest. Like it just never comes up. So I think there's, there has to be some sort of underlying Christian story that the author of Acts borrowed in which there is no empty tomb. Uh, and it has the narrative structure, the skeleton that Luke is using. But Luke didn't like notice this glaring narrative disconnect between his two things. He just reworked the story the way he wanted it to sell the particular message he had. But it didn't occur to him, oh, shit, I better like have the Romans suddenly notice that there's an empty tomb. Oh, I better have the Christians constantly referring to the empty tomb as the best evidence for their position. Oh, I should be doing like it never occurs to him to do this. Right. And that's weird. Like, I think if if Luke was writing Luke Acts just himself, just from the table, uh, I think Acts would continue the narrative setup of the gospel. Like it would it would bleed into the second novel and there would be narrative consistency. The, the narrative inconsistency is weird. And I think the best way to explain it is that there was some underlying text. It's not an underlying text that said the things that modern Christian apologists want it to have said. Uh, but I think there has to have been something. Uh, and like I said, I can't prove this and I don't claim to have proved it. Uh, I just think there's there's telltale signs there. And there are other things missing that do this too. Like Jesus's family completely vanishes. Uh, Joseph of Arimathea completely vanishes. Uh, you know, all of these like these characters who are crucial at the end of one novel or one chapter just disappear in the next chapter. Like if this was a novel, you'd say like, this is a bad writer. Like why, why did he forget all these characters that he just introduced? And, and anyway, so um, that's the kind of thing that I, there's a lot of aspects to the acts that I think there might be some Christian source back there, but I don't think we can reconstruct it. Uh, we can make hypotheses about it based on the evidence we have, uh, but that's not a proof. Uh, and, and there might be other sources that we can't reconstruct at all because we don't know what books Luke was using to, to build his narrative. Okay. Uh, genre, right? So you, we, we've tackled several things so far as we've come along before we get to Q and a, mm and -hmm. that is what, what is this book? Uh, you've mentioned novels, can you give us any evidences we find in Acts or Luke and Acts that point to other genre type mm -hmm. qualities that make you say, we're not dealing with a factual historical thing. You yeah. might have a preface yeah. that makes a weak attempt at trying to do that. And I love what Dennis <laughs> McDonald said once he was speaking uh, at a conference and Dennis says you guys some like scholarly conference too because they'll like interrupt after yeah. a speech and, oh, like, mm -hmm. and and dennis I've was been like, to many here i know they're like <laughs> yeah dennis just like jabs in and goes so you're telling me this guy who's writing a historical preface 11 verses into the first chapter has angels flying around and, and appearing and and you're going to tell me you think that that like is a historical yeah. like that's how a historian would write something right. Um, and I thought, whoa, that's actually quite clever to, to point yeah. it out. But what are some tall tale signs? This is a novel in the fictional category of genre. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's all I'll set aside all the evidence, all that's relevant is all the evidence that Luke is inventing for propagandistic purposes. So all the ways he contradicts Paul and contradicts Paul in exactly the way that aligns with Luke's agenda is an example of fictionalization. Uh, now, you could say that that's historical revisionism. You know, it's it's still fiction in the sense that it's false, but it's not fiction in the sense of like adventure fiction, right? But that's still a big piece of it. Like we have a lot of evidence that Luke is pushing an agenda and rewrites history to push that agenda. But apart from all that, uh, it's just the way he writes and tells stories. Uh, and there's <clears throat> there's countless examples, and it's really that when you stack the examples, and it becomes clear, right? Uh, there, there's the overall picture, which is that Luke looks like these religious adventure novels. There were these romances written around the same time. They were very popular. 
Uh, there are many more than we have, right? We only have whole or pieces of some of them, <clears throat> but there are a lot more of them, uh, of these religious novels. And they have a lot of similar features. Uh, I wanted to pull it out. Uh, maybe I'll pull out. Go ahead. On the history of Jesus. Hit that like button, people. <laughs> hey, we got 518 people watching. Check out Dr. Carrier's course and check the links. We're diving deep today. Yeah, so in chapter nine of this, I go into an example. Which book is this? Uh, on the historicity of Jesus. Okay. And this isn't me. This is uh, other scholars have pointed this out. Pervo among them. Um, here we go. So. Uh, and this is a, a numbered list, and it's in the chapter, so for people who are interested. Uh, so this is what all these adventure novels of this time, uh, they have all of these features. And so listen to this list of features. They all promote a particular god or religion. Uh, they are all travel narratives. They all involve miraculous or amazing events. They all include encounters with fabulous or exotic peoples. Uh, Let's see, sorry, people. So, for example, the bull sacrificing pagans of Lycaonia in Acts 14, uh, the, um, the superstitious natives of Malta, the philosophical Athenian dilettantes, uh, fanatical pagan silversmiths of Ephesus. Like, Acts has all of these things, <laughs> just like the adventure novels, right? Um, uh, uh, they often incorporate a theme of chaste couples separated and then reunited. A token nod to this element exists in Paul's chaste interaction with Lydia uh, in Acts 16, and his many women followers, named and unnamed. Uh, they feature exciting narratives of captivities and escapes. There's several of those, weirdly several of those in the book of Acts. Um, they often include themes of persecution, uh, scenes involving excited crowds who become a character in the story, uh, which happens a lot in the book of Acts, uh, and divine rescues from danger, many times in the book of Acts, and divine revelations are always integral to the plot through oracles, dreams, and visions, all of which feature in Acts. Uh, and so that's one reason why Acts looks far more like a novel than any historical monograph, because there, you won't find any history that looks like that. Uh, and I, th I do know there's like pushback on some of these things. People say, well, you'll occasionally find something mythical and ridiculous in Josephus. And I think it's important to emphasize that, yeah, any author will throw the occasional thing in. Right. But what makes myth different from history is that this is the a pervasive fundamental feature of the story right like so it's not like occasionally there's some incidental weird thing it's not like arian where well there was this magical snake and well, this other guy didn't believe it right like, like, that yeah. doesn't happen like it's not just some one-off thing that happens you know occasionally no it's fundamental to the story every chapter every story is fundamentally these things Kind of like uh, if I were to use an example of, and I'm getting into the propagandistic mm -hmm. side of Acts. Yeah. Every time the Christians are SOL, you know what I mean? They're yeah. out of luck. Yeah. The Romans come in, you guilty. The Jews pointed it out. And wouldn't you know, every time in this entire series we call Acts, they're found innocent. Yeah. It's actually, it's not the Romans that do that. It's the Jews well, always, right? That's, that's, this is right, an important right. point is that, yeah, always, always the Romans are like, I don't understand. What's wrong with you Jews? The Christians seem fine, right? Like right. all the time. I mean, uh, but at so first they like almost think that, you know, Paul's guilty or, and then they find out, oh, hold on. What were we doing? Well, yeah, because they're yeah. listening. Right, the Jews will make an accusation and go, that's right. a serious accusation. And then they'll have Paul come in and he'll go, and he'll give this one speech. There'll be no like prosecution, uh, uh, you know, uh, redirect or anything. Or anything. Right. Paul just gets to make his speech and they're like, oh, wow. Yeah, I don't see anything wrong with this guy. I don't get it. Like, why should we, you know, uh, I, we would let him go if he hadn't appealed to Caesar. You know, that's that's the final, like the final trial line of the, of the thing. It's like, uh, yeah, I mean, that's wildly implausible. That's it's it's just one of many things that are wild implausibilities. But another example of implausibilities are the uh, parallels. So there'll be parallels set up between like Paul and Jesus. So their stories actually follow a lot of similar patterns, right. way beyond like historical coincidence could explain. Uh, and then Paul and Peter. So Acts has Peter and Paul as major characters. They both do a bunch of the same things. Like the, each one of them battles one sorcerer. Each one of them escapes from prison, right? So like they have, they have like, they, so they're each, each thing that Peter does, Paul does. And Paul does them all better. So he does better even than Jesus. Like he, whatever he, Paul does, it's bigger than Jesus. Like he covers more ground, preaches to more people or whatever, right? Um, uh, and where Jesus is killed, Paul, Jesus killed and then leaves, right? He 
resurrects and flies off. He doesn't appear to anyone. Paul, when he dies and comes back to life, he stomps right back into town and preaches to the public, right? He's still trying to, uh, you know, convert heretics and whatnot. Uh, so that's even better than what Jesus did, right? So it's that kind of thing. Uh, when you look at this, you're like, come on, like, why would you believe any of this? Yeah, it or, looks or look like it looks like novel, right? Uh, and and like there's, there's things down to like the minutest like language, um, uh, the Ananias. So you know, Paul has the vision and it blinds him. He has yes. to go to Ananias and get I back love this him. section. Yes. And people don't realize that Ananias is John, the, the same name, John, just spelled backwards. Like this, the two words are flipped. The two root words are flipped. Hmm. So so Jesus gets baptized by John, uh, which is, uh, I can't remember the, that's uh, Yahweh is gracious, I think. So one of one is Yahweh is gracious and the other is gracious is Yahweh. So you have John means one and, and Ananias means the other, but they mean the same thing, right? So, so Paul also gets baptized by a John, right? Except it's Ananias. It's hidden in the Aramaic. You'd have to know that the pun that is in there. Uh, and there's tons of other like parallels in that story where the, the, the version of Jesus is exactly reversed for Paul, like the sequence of events. And so uh, it's highly improbable. And then all of this, of course, contradicts Paul's account of all of this in Galatians 1, uh, so, so it's, when we add all these things up, we see historicizing, we see linguistic borrowing from Homer and Virgil, we see thematic borrowing from Homer and Virgil. There are some stories that are almost like right down, like down to like 10 different parallels in order where the same story in, in the Odyssey is being retold for Paul. Uh, so we have examples of that. They're, they're beyond the ability to deny is happening. Right. And history can't have happened that way. Uh, like you could, give a rationalizing plausible account of a historical sequence of events that would do that. But the probability that history actually turned out that way, as opposed to, you know, Luke just saying, Hey, I'm going to take the Elpenor story and turn mm -hmm. it into an Eutychus story and just makes it up. Right. He just makes it up. Uh, and anybody he's, he's just emulating uh, the Odyssey. And this is another thing that people often neglect when they're trying to debate or criticize Dennis McDonald is they'll say, oh, that's that's ridiculous. Why would someone do that? It's like, that's literally what everyone was taught to do in school. So, uh, and, and that's the thing is like, we have tons of examples, like literally explicitly, this is what they were taught to do. So you're then thinking like, well, of course they're going to do it. Like anybody who writes Greek is going to do it. Uh, and so that's why you, you shouldn't like react to this. It's like, that's crazy. Right. Why would they do that? It's like, no, this is, they're trained to do this. Like this is their, this is, they're good at this. This is the whole point. Uh, so, so yeah, when you, when you stack all the examples of the kinds of things I'm talking about and the article people can go to and find more, and there's more in, in chapter nine of my book, and there's more in the, the scholars I cite too, like Pervo's Hermenea commentary is full of them. Um, so, uh, yeah, when you, when you go through and you stack the examples, you see like, this is too pervasively fictional to be history. And then when you take that, you look at the book of Acts, like how, it, what, how much of it is an adventure novel. And then look at the annals of Tacitus or even Xenophon's uh, March Up Country, right? The Anabasis. You look at like, these are very different, right? Like the, the what they're doing is different. How they're talking about what's happening is different. Uh, how they're constructed is different. Histories look, and even then, histories look very different from novels. Uh, Acts looks exactly like a novel. It does not look like a history. Uh, and, and, and even when it's trying to pretend to look like a history, like when it throws a dateable event in or when it's, it's you know, sort of semi-bogus preface and all of that. Stuff. Right. A couple things that I think are important in highlighting to give you kind of a chuckle, but also you'll probably just <laughs> a minute. Um, Dennis came on. We were addressing Christian apologists who want to make the shipwreck narrative literally true because Paul talks about being shipwrecked three yeah. times yeah. and he spends like 12 words to do it. Yeah, and this shipwreck of one shipwreck is like ridiculously long yeah, yeah. narrative. But what I found interesting, and Dennis pointed this out, while they wouldn't agree with his mimetic reversal of certain things and whatever, Dennis said, "I dare you to go find in in any of the history we have of writings of shipwrecks where a <laughs> god or an angel or divine being intercedes to save them on the voyage." like you find in Homer, you also find here. You don't have it anywhere else. So he... Yeah, he, I, I'll correct that slightly. Okay. Um, you might get mentions of the story. So there, there are examples in Tacitus where he will mention people telling the story of a God's intervention, mm -hmm. but he will have authorial distance and he will be a rationalist about it. And so that sometimes Tacitus will say, well, and some people said this was the God's doing, 
but here's my rational explanation for what. Oh, okay. So, so that's that, but that's typical, right? That's how yeah. histories were written. Even if they're pushing a religious agenda, they were written that way. So the fact that Axe is 100% gullible never shows any doubt. Like it just tells these wild stories as if no one would doubt them. Uh, that's fiction. Only fiction is like that. Like an author who's writing serious history would know that what he's saying is ridiculous or sounds ridiculous to his audience. And he would apologize for it, right? He would say like, I know this sounds ridiculous, but here's here's why I believe this or why you should believe it or whatever. But the fact that the author like just assumes that everybody's going to just believe this wild, ridiculous stuff, um, that's a sign of fiction, right? That's a, that's an example. Of that, and that's what um, McDonald's getting at, right? Is, is right. this, that, that way of writing does not exist in history uh, of the time. So uh, and weird... I, it looks more like fan fiction you were mentioning earlier. Right. Uh, I would say the example of the Book of Enoch. Now, how many people know Christianity is founded on the Book of Enoch? Like a lot of fundamental Christian teachings from the very beginning derive from the Book of Enoch. A lot of basic assumptions, like the role of Satan and uh, and, and all of this stuff. Um, a lot of what's built out of the DNA of Christianity is based on the assumption that the Book of Enoch is scripture, but it never got into scripture except for the Ethiopian canon. Find its way uh, in Jude. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so, um, but the thing is, is what is the book of Enoch? Well, the book of Enoch is this ridiculous story about the war in heaven, how Satan rebelled on these angels and went down and gave sorcery and taught technology and science to everybody. And it, it, this is, this is horrible. And this is why everything went wrong in the world. Um, and then, you know, of course there's going to be a Messiah who will come and sort all this out and throw the, throw the demons into the hell pit or whatever. Uh, that, that's the book of Enoch, right? So Christianity is built on this. But what is the Book of Enoch? So the Book of Enoch is 100% fan fiction. I mean, none of it's believable, right? Like no one has, no one went up into space and talked to angels to get like reportage of the war. I, I Tell me about this war now. Who, who, which general did, you know? no, that never happened, right? It's total fiction. But it's based on one sentence in Genesis. Is one sentence in Genesis. I think it's uh, chapter six, where it says, just it just pauses in the middle of this narrative. It pauses and says, uh, and the watchers came down uh, from the heavens and had sex with women and then there were giants and and then it just moves on never never touches on that and it's really like you pause that wait what what was this about giants what, right. watchers? what are you talking about right like so there, there's this one sentence and they just keep going uh and so someone saw that sentence and they decided oh and they wrote a whole book yeah expanding that one verse into and the, the whole freaking bogus story right. and so that's what we get with acts and that shipwreck so paul mentions shipwrecks so it's so, well I can write a shipwreck. I mean, I was trained. And, for and there cool, may have right? been so. real shipwrecks. This is the, I don't, yeah. this is what I said. And I don't oh, yeah, know. Yeah. I don't know if I can trust Paul completely. <laughs> I'm not going to say he didn't get these three ship, these three, but he flexes in that passage. Yeah. And it's in a passage where he needs to like have his resume look good. Yes. So I don't know about and you. Suffering is an important piece of the resume. This is another thing that Christian right. all of this forget is that their epistemology is different from our epistemology. Right, right, right. We believe that evidence, right, and probabilities and things matter. That's how you prove something is with evidence. That is not the epistemology of the ancient thinkers. And certainly of Paul's audience, that is not their epistemology at all. For them, they care about, like, are you sent by God? And how would you prove that you're sent? If you're sent by God, you're telling the truth. That's it. Uh, so how do we know you're sent by God? Uh, one is I suffer for the faith. Why would I suffer the faith if it wasn't true? Wow, that's an amazing argument. You that's must be telling the truth about everything. Right? <laughs> yeah, no, right? Uh, right but right. I think people forget that this is a whole epistemology, that it is a bankrupt, ineffective, unreliable epistemology. But it is a super popular epistemology that a lot of people bought, especially then, even still today, but especially back then. Uh, and there's others like, can you do miracles? That was one. Of, and now they still have the thing like, well, even the devil can do miracles. Even the devil's guys can do miracles. And that's when you come to the whole like, well, are your teachings in line? with moral truth are you teaching moral things which is a circular argument right like it's like what's what's moral right uh, you know that kind of thing but none of this has anything to do with what your factual claims are true or not right like if you're saying it's like how you test the spirits are they saying moral things or immoral things and that's it and that's your only decide way of deciding what is a true spirit communication and what's not uh, and so this is their epistemology and i write for people interested in this i have a whole chapter on it in my book the scientist in the early roman empire where I go into the epistemology of ancient Christians and how it radically differed from the epistemology of natural philosophers of their own time. And that's the difference between religion and science then and now, ever since, right? And so if you want to understand the basis of this, that's it. But that's the whole thing, like you were saying, like he needs to build his resume. 
Right. But he doesn't build his resume by like getting, you know, sworn affidavits from witnesses or, uh, or, or saying like, Oh, I, I, you know, I studied under Peter for a year and memorized his story. And no, he doesn't do any of that. He says, I suffered for the faith. I I must be awesome. I must be telling the truth. Yeah. It's suffering. It's suffering, suffering, suffering. That's right. I, I, look, so our time is limited, and I gotta, I gotta get through some of this stuff yeah. before we get to Q and A. I That's absolutely good. love what you're doing here. I want to read you something that I um, kind of did at the beginning of a video once, and it's from our favorite website, ourdailybread.org. Hallelujah! And so, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what website, but go on, proceed. So I'm gonna share my screen for one second just to kind of tease people here so they can see what I'm doing in case you're curious. Um, the miracles of God in Acts, right? And I scrolled down and I just wanted to go through. And so I'm gonna read Holy Sound shit. of Rushing. This is so interesting. So when you read, if you read any other book, I'm asking for those who are, you know, evangelical fun, fundamentalists and such. If you were reading any other book that was saying this kind of material, I would hope, and I'm, I, would, I don't even think I would even need to make mention of this. I think you would be as cautious yeah. in approaching. It's funny that. that they clearly have, they clearly think that this is, this proves like the spiritual authority of Acts. Yeah. Like they, they think this is a positive thing, that the huge list of miracles. Whereas any like rational observer is like, actually, you're undermining the truth of this narrative. Like, why would it have this many wild things happening? And right. That, that's not a plausible. Uh, Sound of rushing wind, tongues of fire, miraculous speech, layman healed, building shaken, sudden death of Ananias and Sapphira, imprisoned apostles freed by angel philip transported from desert to azotus yeah. light and voice at paul uh, saul's conversion saul blinded and healed aeneas healed of paralysis paralysis dorcas uh dorcas restored alive herod's violent death elimus and the sorcerer blinded cripple at lystra healed demons cast out of slave girl paul freed from prison by earthquake eutychus raised from the dead paul unaffected by viper's bite father of pubilus healed clusters of yeah. miracles many wonders and signs many signs and wonders the shadow of peter apparently healed some and a multitude gathered and they yeah. were all healed stephen did great wonders and signs the multitudes heeded hearing and seeing the miracles which philip did the lord granted signs anyway here's yeah. where it gets interesting a wrong assumption about miracles. Now, look, the Christian website wanted you to know, yeah, hallelujah. <laughs> then, then they go on to go, all right, now, the fact that many miracles occur does not mean that every believer should always expect one whenever he faces a problem. <laughs> They're already trying to talk you off the ledge right. of a miracle right. happening yeah. in your yeah, own yeah. life. And that list omits all the visions, the visions and right. dreams, right? So that's another set of miracles. Um, yeah. So <laughs> you no, know, well, well put. I think that that is a good example of how they're living in a different epistemology than we are. Like for us, that's evidence against Acts being a history. And you know, if they read, they read about the the giant cross coming out of the tomb or the 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 bed bugs, you know, marching yeah. like military ants and stuff. I mean. They would read that and go, how ridiculous, because they've been trained, kind of told what is canon, what is the measure of what is the correct books that we can read. But if they didn't have that kind of boundary, the question is, would they look at that and go, yeah, bedbugs actually did you know, he had the powers and the magic to turn the <laughs> yeah. birds. If it was in the bird. canon, you bet. They would totally be defending bed bug marching orders. Yeah, I, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and, and, and more. The thing is that, that that's the Acts of John for people who are interested. But in the Acts of John, and I brought this up to a Christian apologist in a in a, an event recently. I wrote about it on my blog uh, briefly. But uh, so I asked him like, well, okay, look, here's the Acts of John. It not only relates this event, but it names the witnesses. Like it here's this huge list of people who were there and saw it. It gives their names, it says their families were there, you know, all of this stuff. And I'm like, like, so should we believe that? And if you mm -hmm. if you say that we should doubt a list of names, like they're actually trying to say that this we have witnesses to this. No, they made that up, right? Like it, he even said, like, yeah, okay, they probably made that up, but that document is late. Right. Is it's actually no not significantly later than the book of Acts of our book of Acts, right? So uh so that argument is bad unless what you do is Christian apologists, they need to front date these texts. 
they need acts to be before 60 AD or whatever, because or before 70, because once you accept that it's early second century, well, now it looks just like the acts of John and the acts of John claims to have better witness testimony and evidence of the sources than our book of acts does. Right. So, uh, you know, it's like, is it, is your epistemology just that what you need someone to do is lie more like, like the bigger lie will convince you uh and it's like does does lying more make your testimony more probable to be true no no it's the other mm -hmm. way right uh so it's it's the backwards epistemology our epistemology as we look at this and we go yeah that's that looks like a novel that doesn't look like history at all um their epistemology is well, hallelujah look at all the miracles it must be from god right and and but of course they have to like tack onto that oh but it's canonical oh it has to be early and all of this stuff so they can make that make that work essentially so we've tackled genre, we've tackled sources, we've tackled interesting, funny stuff. Um, one more thing I'd like to mention, and we, we won't have you know too much time. I think after this, we should get to Q&A. Mm -hmm. And that yeah. is literary imitation. Uh, fun stuff we find within acts that go, what? Like something sounds like Dionysus, you know, Euripides Bacchae, yeah. uh, yeah, the yeah. imprisoning, the being freed from prison, yeah. the earthquake. That's found in Euripides 500 years, maybe 600 if this is early second century. And this yeah. is, like, you know, 600 right. years yeah. earlier, we have Dionysus, a god who is a demigod who's birthed by Zeus and his mother Semele. Like, that already had a prison break. And so I'm looking at stuff like that. But the one that I wanted to highlight that I don't know if you have heard yet by Michael Kalshanosh, which was a student of Dennis McDonald, mm, we did mm -hmm. an episode called Better Call Paul Saul. Kind of oh, riffing off the yeah. show. Yeah, tell this story. Right. I, I know of it, but go. Yeah. I love this. Um, so the name of Paul in all of his letters is Paul. Yeah. And scholars for centuries have argued is Saul Paul. And what is this? Is this roman name and one's a jewish name and right. there's all this debate for centuries yeah he comes in cuts through the fluff and says listen all you have to do is recognize that after chapter nine this guy is now called paul he was called saul and the peak of saul's narrative with the transition where he converts or turns yeah is when <coughs> he is knocked down or he's on the road to damascus yeah. bright light and then all of a sudden this voice says Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? That exact phrase is in like 2 Samuel, 1 Samuel, one of the one of the Chronicles, Samuel, Kings books, I can't remember, but it's King David who literally could have killed King Saul, cut off a piece of his cloak, even felt guilty about that because it's the Lord's anointed. And he cries out to Saul from the hill and says, Saul, Saul, why do you pursue me? And so in the Greek, from what I understand in the LXX, is that it's the same Greek word for pursue and persecute. Right. Mm -hmm. yes. And so here you, right. it is. you have a literary imitation, like an invented narrative, where you have the apostle Paul, who was called Saul, literally Jesus is the King David, saying, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And... I won't get into yeah. the whole comparison to the mind. Uh, for that. the for the benefit of the audience, and also I want to I want to might do a blog on this. Uh, I have heard it before, but I want to go look into it again. Uh, author, uh, what is his name? How do you spell it? Michael Koshinosh. I think it's C A or K O C H E N A S H, something like this. Okay, I'll look for it. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm sure I've heard it somewhere. Uh, I didn't read the original study though, but I will look at it because. I want to add that to the list of things uh, that are relevant because then there's more like there's more in the literature than even you and I have talked about even more than I list in chapter nine. Like one, one can go through, I bet there's more even than Pervo mentions in right. uh, the Hermeneia commentary, especially since that's now what, 20 years out of date. Exactly. Right. Um, and, and you can't trust Christian apologists to include data like that. So, so their version of Acts commentaries are not as useful in that regard. Um, but yeah, no, that's 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 exactly right. There's there's lots of examples like that, and when it's when you stack the number of them, when you when you go to chapter nine of on the historicity of Jesus, and you just look through there, and you stack them all, and you're like, okay, look, like at some point, you have to admit that this is this is the fundamental nature of this literature. This is not like an occasional wonder they throw in. Uh, right. We're looking at fiction. We're not looking at history, <laughs> uh, and that's especially like in even in the important sense. 
where it is rewriting history. For, if you look at the letters of Paul, what Paul talks about was going on in the church and what his narrative was, and his chronology. Acts completely subverts all of that. So even in regards to the sources, the historical sources it did have for the origins of Christianity, we know the author of Acts has no interest in what actually happened. He has an opposite interest to conceal what happened, to make up completely different things, even opposite things is having happened. So Dr. Kerry, writing history. So that that's, I think is probably the most important takeaway. It's not on, just fiction. It's, on that it's, point, yeah. I, I have to ask you to ask, answer this question. Then we're going to do Q and a literally mm -hmm. you brought up something. I've heard Christian apologists say, okay, Dr. Carrier, here's the problem. <laughs> You're claiming that Acts is using Paul's letters, but he doesn't agree with Paul. There are some scholars who will say, since Acts doesn't agree with Paul, it's clear he isn't using Paul's letters. So you're suggesting, answering that question, that rather than using Paul's letters to accurately get Paul, he has an agenda. Really, yeah. this isn't really a companion who wants to be accurate and be in agreement no, exactly with Paul. Right. With Paul. Yeah. He has an overwhelming agenda that outweighs the evidence found in Paul's letters for his own purposes. Yeah, and I'd say there, there's two things to note to when Christians say that, that kind of argument. First is that we have a lot more evidence for the use than that. Uh, so there is linguistic evidence and things like that. So in my article on Paul's, I'm sorry, my article on Mark's use of Paul's epistles, mm -hmm. uh, which you can find on my blog at richardcarrier.info, uh, I list some of the scholarship on that argument, that Mark used Paul's epistles. Some of those sources are for all the gospels. So some of those, those scholars talk about Luke's use of uh, Paul's epistles as well. And those scholars will go into all the evidence and, and there's, there's a, a variety of converging evidence. It's not just this one thing that I mentioned. Uh, so, so the, the case is stronger than, than the Christian apologist is making out. The other, the other argument is that it's highly unlikely just as a matter of coincidence that Luke would exactly contradict Paul in so many specific ways that just happen to align with his agenda, and particularly when you compare with the Galatians narrative, the, the probability that Luke doesn't know the Galatians narrative and just somehow miraculously picked every detail he wants to change of the Galatians and changed it um, is highly unlikely unless he knows Galatians and is deliberately retelling the story. And I, I would make the same argument, by the way, for the nativities. I think that's one of the reasons why usually people say Luke can't have known Matthew's nativity because it's so different. And there have been several scholars who pointed out that the argument is the other way around that in fact luke reverses things in matthew that require him to know what that they were in matthew hmm. so he he deliberately rewrites the story in matthew and there's and, no and, and it's in line with luke's not agenda. aware right right and it's in line right exactly it's in line with luke's agenda and so if you were to predict say okay luke has this agenda he has matthew what would he do to the story you could predict every change luke makes not in the particulars but in the general aspects of it uh, and one of the big ones is the um how Luke converts the outlaw family. They, they break all the laws. They run away from the law, Herod, uh, run away to Egypt, can't do their the pil pilgrimages. They can't be good Jews and do the pilgrimages because they're hiding. They're outlaws, literally. Uh, Luke completely reverses that and weirdly conspicuously reverses it. He has them deliberately stick around to obey the law, like the law of Caesar, and has them go to Jerusalem every year like, to do the pilgrimages. So like he, he makes this, like it completely contradicts Matthew on purpose because he wants Jesus's family to be law abiding. He wants to prove how law abiding Christians are. And that's the, his theme throughout the gospel and the acts is that Christians right. are law abiding. It's those n dirty little Jews that are being mean and, and not, you know, not, not letting us do our thing. It's Christians are law abiding citizens, right? Is that that's the whole idea of Luke, and that's one of his agendas, and you can explain almost everything Luke does uh, using one, that among other aspects of his agenda, but that's one of his main agendas. But so even what he did with Matthew's nativity shows this, and I think when you look at the way he used Paul's epistles is another example showing this. He Luke wants a certain narrative, uh, and and he, he has to paint it a certain way. And one, one of the other aspects of Luke's agenda is that he wants to argue that the church was always unified. There was mm -hmm. never any disharmony. It's always the Jewish outsiders who are the enemy. It was never internal debates and combats. Uh, and so that's why he has Peter get a vision from God about right. the Gentile mission before Paul. Right. right? Like, like It's very clear from Paul's narrative that no one had ever heard of this idea until Paul did. And he was like really had to struggle to get it accepted uh, by Peter. But there's no mention in you know Galatians of Peter saying, oh, you know what? 
yeah, I had a vision of that before you even came along. <laughs> no, uh, no, there, there's a lot of tension. There's a lot of like the, the Torah observant Christians and the, 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 the sort of Christians under Paul that when he's converting Gentiles who aren't, he's converting them without converting them to Judaism. That created a lot of tension. There were Christians who did not agree with that. Uh, and Paul talks about that. There's a, pro there's a lot of pressure and, and issues and it was difficulty and wrangling. Luke papers that all over. He says, no, 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 no. We were always unified. This message was given to Peter, the founder of the church from the beginning, et cetera. Uh, and so it's just the outsiders that are a problem. Uh, and that whole narrative, that's an example. You can see the narrative of Axis pushing that storyline. And so that it creates a unity to all the ways he changes Paul's narrative. He, he changes it in all the ways that he wants to change it to serve his agenda. And there are other aspects of Luke's agenda I could go into, but that's just an example of what's going on. Wow. There's so much here. 670 people watching hit the like button, check out Dr. Carrier's uh, website. Uh, are you ready for yeah. Q and A? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's do this thing. Muhammad, thank you for becoming a YouTube member. I plan on having more content put up. Actually, I've got a several interviews too. We've got a lot. We've got a lot. All right, uh, Rochelle Goad, thank you so much, or Rachel Goad. A tangential question for Dr. Carrier. Feel free to come back to it. You describe yourself as something of a cinephile. What film have you watched most repeatedly? What makes it repetition worthy? Oh, most repeatedly? Oh, my God, a movie? Um, I don't know. I go on bouts. <laughs> okay, so uh, the answer is going to be not impressive. Um, so let, let's like, let me think like what is the movie I've seen the most times uh, rather than because I'll, I'll watch a movie over and over and again over time. And I have a whole list and I wouldn't say there's many that I do the most. Um, but there is one movie that I've watched way more than I ought to have done is National Treasure. <laughs> the okay. Nicolas Cage movie. It's a ridiculous movie in every right. conceivable way, but it is fun. Uh, right. it, is, it is a well-constructed film. Uh, it actually is, is good at what it's supposed to be doing, uh, which is a cheesy, you know, uh, hyper rah, rah adventure drama. Um, and it's good at it. Uh, and so, so I will, I will actually enjoy rewatching that movie, even though it's not great cinema in the, in the usual auteur sense. Um, Thank you. yeah, so, uh, and that's, I wouldn't say that like, I would probably other movies I've watched more, but, um, you know, the thing, for example, is probably the most watched of horror. That is the movie I've rewatched the most of any horror genres. John Carpenter's The Thing, for example. Um, so there are others I could answer, but, you know, there you go. <laughs> Thank you so much for that super chat. Q Source is in the house. I am unnecessary. Just what Luke kept from Matthew. What does that mean? Oh, Q. <laughs> yeah, Q Source is the name. <laughs> Yeah, you don't need you don't think uh q source is no. necessary not saying there aren't sources possibly yeah but. yeah no i i you know, i won't well, i don't think we can establish that uh i don't think we can establish there weren't either so that's the okay. point you were making i agree um but we can't establish that there were and we certainly can't reconstruct what they said uh and and that's you know i think is the, is the main thing i i suspect there aren't I, I i'm with robin faith walsh i think it's all uh de novo i think they're uh just making it up uh, I don't think they have sources, uh, except for Axe. Like I said, I, I think there's indications of source material there, um, but uh, but for the Gospels, I, I don't. I think I think Mark made it up. Uh, he just reified the teachings of Paul and by telling a story involving Jesus. He wrote his Harry Potter novel, and then everybody redacted that, like retold the story, to, changing it the ways they wanted, adding the things they wanted, subtracting the things they wanted. Hmm. I don't think there are sources for this stuff. Uh, I think it's all Mark. It all goes back to Mark. There, none of this stuff existed before Mark. Uh, and uh, and I think that's that's my take on it. Um, I don't rely on that. You know, in, in other arguments I make, I don't require that to be the case. It's right. just if you ask me what I think is the case, that's, that's what I think is the Got case. Got it. Um, Okay. Sages and Pages, thank you for the super chat. Do you agree with Steve Mason's dating of Luke Acts to the second century CE? If yes, why didn't the author include Paul's death in the narrative? Yeah, uh, I do. Uh, and Mason's not alone. There's like, uh, I think it's kind of the mainstream consensus now. Like, so we're talking Pervo, um, the Westar Institute scholars, like, there's a whole bunch of us now. Or it's kind of like we're. We're settled on this. It's it's early second century. There's not really a good case for anything earlier. Um, as to the, that particular thing, it actually does mention the death of Paul. Uh, it has Paul refer to his own death earlier on. He gives a speech 
where he shows that he's aware that he's going to die, which means the author knows that he dies. Uh, so that means the author excluded that story for some other reason. Uh, and there's a variety of possible explanations. I mean, the author himself doesn't tell us, so we don't know. Right. Uh, but there's a variety of explanations. I mean, the, the, the simplest one is that he just died. Uh, the author died before finishing the novel. That happens, right? Uh, but a, a more plausible explanation, or I think more probable explanation, uh, is uh, that that would have ruined his narrative. So remember all the things I just talked about, his agenda? His agenda requires the Romans are always good to us. We're always law-abiding. Uh, that destroys, he can't tell any narrative where the Romans kill Paul. Uh, he can't, right? So he has to just sort of like, push that under the rug and pretend it didn't yeah. happen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes, so, so he has a true. triumphal narrative where Paul was preaching the gospel. Um, and there's another possibility is that he didn't know. Uh, and, and I think there's a lot of evidence that the idea that Paul died in Rome is a late legend. Uh, the earliest author who actually knew Paul is the author of first Clement. Um, and he says that Paul died in Spain. Uh, which the furthest west, he says the the farthest point of the west, which was a phrase for Cadiz or, or refer referencing Spain. Um, so there was no notion of Paul dying in, in Rome until later. So when the author of Luke Acts wrote, which is early to early second century, um, he, those legends of Paul being killed in Rome or in Rome might not have existed yet. Hmm. Um, the author of Acts might not have known the circumstances. Uh, in fact, no one might have known the circumstances of Paul's death. They might have just gotten a report. Well, he's dead, uh, and and there are no surviving witnesses or whatever to like relate. Like we, we don't have any stories that tell us what really happened, and it's possible they didn't have any stories that tell them what happened. So I guess he possibly left it off because he didn't know the story. He, he knew Paul went off to Spain and never came back. Uh, you know, it's like that's all he knew. But it's also possible he knew how Paul was killed, and he he very specifically could not tell that story uh, because it would contradict his agenda. The real kicker is just that earlier you're saying he kind of points to his own death and that that's the kicker, I think. Yeah, it means that the author did know that he's not around. Um, now, that could be like if he's writing in the early second century, the author knows he's dead, right? Like there's no there's no way he's still alive. You know, he couldn't be a 140 year old man running around. Um, yeah. But uh, right. So um, so he knows he's dead. So he might just assume he's dead because, you know physics uh but uh it's also possible he did know that he had died and it's just a story that it was so contradict luke's agenda he can't tell it uh, hmm. and that's why he left it off thank you so much doc pleroma not in the house how does luke's egyptian notice the uh you point this out in your lectures as well mm -hmm. in your writings leading sakari into the desert make any sense when their narrative <laughs> is solely derived from concealing daggers in urban <laughs> settings is he just yeah. keeping and using josephus's latin vocabulary innovation um i mean yeah uh so yeah good 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 catch uh i do talk about this it's my favorite example and it's probably the most important example um, of how, uh, how Luke screws up the use of his source. Um, and this is one of the examples. There's a better one where he, he gets the date of Theodos wrong. Um, he has Gamaliel talking about Theodos, even though Gamal Theodos, uh, his, his story, his rebellion happened like a decade after Gamaliel. So like, like he, he's you know, somehow Gamaliel knows the future and all his audience knew the future. No, I didn't know. Um, Josephus tells the story of these guys in a particular order, but he tells one of them in flashback. <coughs> so the physical sequence in which Josephus tells them, uh, Luke mistakes for chronological sequence, and consequently he fucks up the order of these uh, rebels. And he mm -hmm. only names the rebels that Josephus does. So all of this combined, the probability of that is very, very low unless Luke is using Josephus and just didn't pay close attention to what Josephus was saying. Didn't realize it was flashback. Uh, and the same thing with the Egyptian. So uh, Josephus mentions the Egyptian and the Sicarii around the same place. But if you're reading closely, you'll notice that Josephus says they're different. They're completely different people. They're not related in any way whatsoever. Um, so for for the author of Acts to confuse them as related to each other is an example of how he's using sources, but he's not good at it. Like he's being very sloppy. Um, but the, the mistake makes no sense unless he's using Josephus. Like why else would he put Sicarii in, in the same place as the Egyptian. I mean, Josephus puts them in the same place in the story, but he doesn't, right, he doesn't link, link them causally. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, if you're just skimming Josephus for data, if you're just using, you know, going your reference works, you're just really quickly, you, you've 
looking through Wikipedia and not reading it carefully, uh, this is what happens, right? It's like you, you make a mistake like this, but the mistake can only be explained by your doing that. Uh, I, and so that I think this is one of those examples that shows that, that Luke is using uh, Josephus. Look at the Sakari, right? Like they, I love what's said here by Doc, and that is they were dagger wielding, mm -hmm. like they were up close terrorists. Yeah. They they only wanted to sneak up amongst the huge crowd of people, shank you and dip. Yeah, you're no, not going to go out in the wilderness, you know, like <laughs> in this open area. And no, yeah, no, absolutely not. And and the Egyptian wasn't doing that anyway. Like he has no connection to the Sakari. Right. But you're right. Yeah, the Sakari even in concept only makes sense in urban environments and the Egyptian as described only makes sense in a rural environment because that was his thing. Like, so, um, yeah, so yeah, exactly. It's, it's an error that, uh, is obviously a historical error. So acts is unreliable in that regard. Uh, but it's also just an error in the use of his own source. Thank you so much. Marabara. Thank you for the super chat. Could it be that Q source are sayings of another or several apocalyptic preachers? In my opinion, Matthew did it to make Jesus look more historical. Uh, possible. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, certainly we have proof of concept. So we know a lot of things that other people said get put into the mouth of Jesus um, canonically and non-canonically. So, uh, so that's a thing people did. Uh, we know that. Uh, and um it's also possible. So to give you an example, uh, in on the history of city of Jesus, I go into, um, uh, Oh, uh, I go into the argument that, um, the sermon on the Mount mm -hmm. and there's, there's scholarship and I, I cite scholars talking about it. Scholarship shows that the sermon on the Mount was written after the Jewish war. So it was, it, and it was written in Greek. So it does not go back to Jesus. And this is another West Art Institute agrees, uh, like little pieces of it might go back to Jesus, but the sermon itself is a fabrication after the war. Uh, and there's certain reasons we can show that, 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 that whoever wrote it is writing for a context in which the Jewish temple doesn't exist anymore. And, and there's ways you can show that. Uh, and I talk about that uh, in, in my book, but um, so someone wrote that it's a coherent, it's also a very coherent, so literally coherent speech. It's a very elegantly constructed speech, uh, which is exactly the kind of thing that can only be written. It can't be, this is, this is not like what you would see in oral transmission at all. Uh, it is definitely someone sat down, carefully composed this very careful speech and wrote it for a Greek milieu outside uh, after the Jewish war had already transpired. So you can show that. Now, does that mean Matthew did it? Uh, it, it doesn't mean someone wrote it after the Jewish war, but it could have been some Christian prophet, some Christian missionary. This might have been like a speech or a letter. Uh, that someone had. It, it could have been a letter of Peter's for all we know, right? Like, the, the, it, but um, like the real Peter, I mean, for all we know, like we don't know, uh, or Peter's son or who knows. Uh, and so it could have come from someone and then someone just said, I'm just going to lift this and put it in and give it to the, and put it in the mouth of Jesus. It's totally possible. It would make sense in the way things were done back then. Um, I'm inclined to suspect not. I think Matthew is constructing all this stuff himself. Um, but I can't prove that. And I think like the hypothesis being proposed here is plausible. Uh, so I can't, I can't rule it out. Uh, I, I just suspect it's, it's all Matthew. I think he's doing it all himself. Thank you. Doc Pluromanot's back again. Is Philip asking the Ethiopian if he understands Isaiah, a transposed inversion of Josephus's account of Eleazar asking Izatis if he understands Genesis and ritual circumcision, raw material for the Agabus prophecy aside. <laughs> so I'm going to uh, let you yeah. answer that and I'll be right back. Oh, well, no, that's terrible because I don't have an answer. <laughs> you don't have an answer. <laughs> no, I haven't looked into this enough to, to really say. I've, I've heard of this. I've heard people suggested. I've not like dived into the, I've not checked. Has this been covered in the peer reviewed literature, for example? Right. Has anybody talked about it? I haven't checked. Uh, I haven't checked. Uh, are there Greek? Are there parallels in the language? Uh, I haven't checked. So, so I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. It's possible, though. Uh, I, I think it's entirely plausible, uh, and it is the kind of thing he would do. Uh, but this particular example, I haven't looked into. Thank you, Doc. I'm sorry we couldn't answer it uh, better. Yeah. El yeah. Sar Sargento, Sargento, new to your channel. I'm enjoying everything, even the cringe. Stay <laughs> up. Well, thank you for tolerating the cringe and everything <laughs> else, my friend. I really appreciate you being here, and thank you for the support. Exit Music. Has Dr. Carrier read Bruce Lincoln's theorizing myth, large part of the basis for Robin Faith Walsh's book on the Gospels, and any opinions on his thesis? No, uh, I, I haven't read it. 
um, I, I only know it through Walsh's use of it. So, uh, and for people who want to know my opinion of Walsh's thesis, I have a whole article on that on my blog. I'm mostly positive. Uh, I, I think, she, I think she's right, uh, by and large. Um, but specifically Lincoln's uh, theory, I, I don't know. I can't, okay. I can't weigh in on that. Thank you so much, X Music. I thank you for that. John D., when you say Axe is a novel, would it have been read as such at the time? Wouldn't it need to be thought historical to be effective? I'm going to let yeah, you answer this. I, I don't know, um, but also it can do both. Uh, so uh, the origin, um, where do I talk about this? I... <clears throat> I think I just, I do discuss it in On the History of City of Jesus. It's in, I think, chapter four, uh, where I go into how Origen talks about how <clears throat> the Gospels were written for two audiences. And uh, for the elite audience, the educated audience, it was written in allegorical form. So you're supposed to understand the hidden truths behind the text. But for the masses who are illiterate, it was meant to be taken literally because they won't believe or understand the allegory. So they have to be converted on the literal meaning. And then when they die and go to heaven, then we can sort them out. Uh, but there's not enough time to teach them all the education they need to grasp the allegorical meaning. So we'll sell it on the literal uh, just to get them in the door. Uh, and then when they die and they're in heaven, we can, we can teach them everything. And he literally does talk about this, like how in, in heaven we'll sort them out. Uh, is, is the idea. Uh, and this is called the doctrine of double truth. There's, there's been scholarship on this. There's other authors who hint at it. <clears throat> um, so, so it could be both, right? So you could have the author knows that illiterate people who hear this story written or spoken, right? So you, people would read it out in congregations, will just believe it literally and it will have the effect on them that they want. But for the audience who are sophisticated, uh, the, they don't need to take it literally. They can understand it all as the messaging, right? Um, and that's fine, because uh, that's the class divide, the education divide. That's the way ancient literature could, could roll. Uh, so, so it's different from now. Like, we, we wouldn't normally try to do that. Well, one could say the neocons kind of do that. But, um, but that's the idea, right, is, is, is that. So, so it doesn't have to be an either or question. Um, I, what I do think though, is I do personally, I think Luke does want this primarily to be taken as history because he needs the propaganda effect of it being historical. So he mm. wants this to be the story. He wants this to be the narrative, um, that he chooses to use the novelistic format, I think is another example of how he's using, uh, it's kind of like if we look at a, a historian, uh, I don't know, David Irving or some like Holocaust denier or whatever, like the, these, these historians who want to rewrite history. Right. Then they write like this novel, like Dan Brown, right? Let's so take Dan Brown's novel. I'm not that I'm calling him a Nazi, <laughs> complete different uh, analogy. So Dan Brown wrote fiction, uh, but a lot of people took it as like fundamentally true, right? Like not that the story, not that the characters were real or the things happened, but the whole backstory, like this, the mystery that was revealed, et cetera, as true. Right. And a lot of Christian apologists had a problem with this. So they're like attacking Dan Brown's book. They're attacking fiction uh, for for being factually wrong. Right. Which sounds ridiculous. Right. Until right. you realize that they are taking it seriously as if it was a history book. Right. And I think uh, if you think of the mindset and the and the blurring of genres in the ancient world, that makes sense for Luke. Like he wants a popular, engaging narrative. He picks the narratives that are popular and engaging, which is the novelistic format. Um one thing to, that would make this make more sense is that they didn't have genre categories. Like they, there's no such thing as the word, the novel, uh, right? Like they, they, no one talked about genres back then the way they do now. Like now we have different book areas where fiction goes over here and science goes over here. Um, that isn't how books were organized back then. They didn't, they didn't talk about genre that way. Uh, so the idea of a novel and a history looking different makes sense to us in hindsight, looking at how these things get approached and constructed and built. Um, but it made less sense back then because books are books, right? A story is a story. Um, you, it would take a, like a, a concerted rationalist to say like, this story looks silly. Like your historians suck. Like the way they write history doesn't look anything like history. And they would be right, but that isn't what Luke is doing. Luke, Luke is trying to appeal to a popular audience to try and get people influenced in, into buying it, right? So he doesn't want to write um, like a fake history book with fake footnotes and stuff, right? Um, 
no, he wants to write an engaging novel that tells the stories he wants to tell. But he, I do think he wants it to be taken literally, uh, even though he knows it's all bullshit. Uh, and he probably knows that some other people know it's bullshit. But those people are the people who are on his side, right? Like who, who totally agree that that's the narrative we want to sell. Um, yeah. And so I think that's was cool. racking in the dough, right? Like uh, there's an aspect to that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Power influence money is a factor. Uh, that is true. Um, but I also think it has a lot to do with moral social agendas got attached to these narratives. Hmm. Uh, and it's much the same way that like the King Arthur narrative, if you were to say that that was a myth in, in early England, if you were to say that was a myth, people would take you as saying that you don't believe in a unified kingdom, that you don't believe in a United Kingdom. Right. Right. Like, so like, even that's not what you're saying, like that's what they would take you to say. And now like swords are being drawn, right? Like this is a big deal. Uh, and I think it's the same thing. It's like, it's uh, if, if you say that this is fiction, you're also saying that the narrative is like the message, the point of it, the social agenda attached to it is also wrong and you can't have that. And so I think there's a tendency towards people to historicize, to believe more and more in the myths being historical because they need the myths to be historical to build their morals on top of it. And, hmm. and I think that's, uh, I think that's a big factor of it. Uh, and I, and this is true throughout history. I think it still happens today, but it was especially true back then. People took their myths seriously. Uh, and like the elites would be skeptical and talk about allegory and all of this stuff, but the illiterate people, the masses hated them for this. Uh, and, and I talk about this in the scientists on the early Roman empire in the first chapter, I give examples of where scientists are telling each other, like, don't tell the common people this, right? Don't, don't tell them storms aren't caused by Poseidon. They'll, they'll not handle that well. Like, don't, don't say that. Just don't say that. Um, but in their books, they'll say it because they know one reads that they can't read. So they're not going to be reading our books. That's fine. But uh, they're not going to come to our dinner parties so we can talk all we want in our dinner parties. But don't go out in public and tell them that because they'll throw rocks at you. Like, this, not the thing, right? So, uh, so this is the environment that they're working in. And it's important to understand that cultural context. So they weren't mything around. Don't, <laughs> myth, don't myth around with the myth. All right. So Dr. Carrier, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, Sweet. eleven, twelve, thirteen questions. Sweet. I want to try and get well, through yeah. before um before we have a wrap up here. Almost seven hundred people watching live. Tech, check out Dr. Carrier's works. And if you haven't, like you're hard on trying to read the paperback, they're on Audible. Mm -hmm. You can check them out and listen to them as you're mowing the grass, going for a ride. It's highly critical. It's secular critical scholarship. My favorite kind of scholarship is that, uh, without that kind of uh, trying to sell you O Theophilus a package. Okay, Blake, when Ananias and Sapphira died, did God kill them <laughs> or did they die by overwhelming guilt? Did they blaspheme the spirit? Why did Luke include this story? You, you could ask, like, what would even be recognized as the difference between these two scenarios, right? Mm. Like, if they died from overwhelming guilt, isn't that God killing them? Uh, you know, like, it, that God designed the world for that to happen, and, and it's still God responsible, uh, right? Um, what, is, what does Luke want you to think? Uh, I, I think he, he doesn't care whether you think God did it. I don't think, like, these two hypotheses, he doesn't care. Pick, pick your one. It's just fine as long as you pick one of them, because his whole message is, is basically Stalinism is you better follow this program. Or you're going to die. Mm -hmm. uh, like whether God's doing it or not, well, let the theologians debate that, but you're going to die if you don't, if you don't like throw your money in. Um, sure. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a coercive fascist narrative. Basically. It is true. It's not just Marxism. It's Stalinism, right? Cause you have people being killed for not joining the commune, right? So like, that's why it's like one of the most shocking stories. Wow. Uh, but it, it is the message. And I don't think like Luke is saying we need to kill shirkers. No, it's I don't, their, I don't think, their, their, I don't think that's his you, right? I think his point is like that, you know, you know, instant karma is going to get you. I, I think that's his idea. It's, it's right. The idea is to scare you with the boogeyman right. rather than scare you with an actual, oh, we're, you know, faith militant is coming for your ass. Like, I don't think that's what he's advocating. I, I think he's just advocating for the moral of the story is uh, bad things might happen to you if you don't play along. Uh, and, and I don't think it matters to him what the theological causal mechanism is. It, it, it's irrelevant. It's almost like John, I always, when I wrote my only article, cause I've been so time, 
constraint with like making videos. The one article I did write where I say Jesus breaks the fourth wall in the gospel of John, where he looks at the reader and he's like, but blessed are you. who?" <laughs> <hopes> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> it's like, don't yeah. be Thomas, man. Just right. believe, you know, just that's a no, really good example. No, that's yeah. a perfect example of what I'm talking about. Yeah. Right. That's kind of what this author's doing. He's winking. He's looking at you, yeah. Theophilus. He's looking at the <laughs> yeah. guy he's trying to get to pay. Yeah. Which means, means means lover of God, which Theophilus just means any Christian or any any right. target of the book. So yeah. uh, anyone who's going to be a devotee of the Christ right. movement is my yeah. point. Whether it's an individual group, I yeah. don't know. It, no, yeah. And that's how these stories are told. Uh, I, yeah. I mean, I don't want to like drag us into digressions, but I, I, I no, often no, no. tell a story um, that uh, one of my girlfriends, she's ex-Jehovah's Witnesses. And she tells a story like like there was a story told in her congregation, and the story was basically that uh, oh this this young couple like this this girl is really interested in this boy, he's really interested in her, and they, so they go for a walk, and uh, and and they get to talking about things, and eventually like because they're they're alone and they're you know out in the forest, and and the boy says like you know they get to talking like we can tell each other anything right, we can tell each other anything yeah, and then he talks about well I have these doubts about the religion etc. And then they get back and then she rats him out. Uh, and, and, you know, that now there's discipline and all, you know, things, things happen. Right. And, and she's like, that story never happened, but they tell the story because now everyone's fucking afraid to admit that they're a doubter, even in private to someone they trust, because now they've been told the story that they might rat you out. Right. right. So it doesn't matter like whether the story is true. It doesn't matter like what the causal aspects of it are. It's just meant to instill fear that you think, oh my God, that might happen to me. And now you're shut down. Now you can't talk about your doubts with people, right? And so it's a control doctrine. Uh, and I think a lot of mythology operates that way. Thank you so much. Constellation Pegasus, I haven't seen you in a while. Hey, to hate to change the subject, but how do we know the census in Luke didn't happen according to the gospel account? Why would the writer pit put this in the, in the book? Evidently false history. <laughs> um, it's only false in the like sloppily description, the sloppy description of it, right? So like like Luke is just bad at describing it. Um, like if if you are charitable and say like, well, okay, he's being loose in the way he's describing it, it's not completely wrong, right? Like it's just wrong about some things, mm -hmm. uh, and and so um, I think that's and we've already seen examples where Luke is sloppy. Right. So we know that we know he like is when he especially reading Josephus, like he'll lift stuff from Josephus and he'll screw things up like he, he's quick. He's rushed. He's not really paying close attention. Uh, and so the errors in his account of the census can be totally accounted for by him just being lazy. Um, the, the, there is truth to it. Right. And, and it's not that there was a global census that happened in 6 AD. Um, there was just a standing census order that all the provinces be, be uh, counted, but when the, each province was counted, it varied because there are different traditions and the different the clock had started at different times. Um, and the only reason Judea was the census started in 6 AD is because that's when it was annexed to Syria. So, so as soon as they annexed it, they had to start a census, and so that would start the clock. And they were, I think, they were every 10 years. Uh, they had to do a census, and I think provincial censuses were every three or four years or something. Um, and so, so its clock was different than everybody else, but there was a decree of Augustus that all the world should be, you know, all the provinces should have a census. Um, it's just that, that decree was like decades ago and, and didn't apply to this specific case. It just was a general order for all the provinces. And then there's just a historical event just happened to make Judea subject to that decree finally. And so there was a census, et cetera. So there is a correct narrative you could write. It's just Luke is bad at telling the story, whether he knows the truth of it or not. I, I don't know, but um, he's just bad at explaining it. So, so there, there is truth to the story. It's just, it's complicated. Uh, and I do talk about this for people who are interested in this, the minute details of the census issue, uh, particularly with Christian apologetics about this. Uh, my book, Hitler, Homer, Bible, Christ, which you showed up, you showed earlier, uh, has a whole chapter on the, the the dating of the nativity, the discrepancies between Matthew and Luke, where I go through every possible Christian attempt to harmonize those two and explain with historical facts uh, why they're wrong. And, and mm -hmm. it answers your question, which is how do we know these things about the census? Uh, we know it from, well, hard detective work as historians. So we have tons of references in not just literature, but papyri, 
and inscriptions. And we have a lot of data that we can use to triangulate our knowledge of what was going on. Uh, and so we know a lot of things uh, about the census. And so we, that's how we can answer all of these questions about uh, what was really happening, how it really worked and stuff like that. Um, and, you know, one example people often point out is uh, the census never required you to move. Uh, you, you could you could register where you were like you, you didn't have to go anywhere. Um, but like you could come up with a story. So let's say like so um, when Judea was annexed to Syria, Galilee was not. Uh, and so there wouldn't have been any reason for a Nazarene to be registered in the census. Right. But if you said when they said uh, Luke says, well, he was a tribe of Benjamin and therefore had to go to Bethlehem and that's complete bullshit. There's no basis for that whatsoever. They would never do that. And there's no evidence that they did. But if he owned property in Bethlehem, then he might need to do it. Right. But then you have the story that he has to go to the, the manger or whatever. So does, I thought he owned property. Like, Just go so to like, your, like yeah. the story doesn't make a lot of sense, um, but you can invent narratives that would make it make sense. Uh, hmm. but it's just, Luke just needs a reason for people to move. And there, there have been historians that pointed out like nomads did have to go to a place. So if they weren't really Nazarenes, if they were just goat herders in the wilds, uh, and the nearest town was Bethlehem. And so they had to register, you know, there's like stories you could tell, but we yeah. know it's all made up, right? Like none of this happened. So what's the point in trying to work out what really happened? It, nothing did. Uh, so, um, but yeah, the, the way we know all of this stuff is, is from, tons and tons of data that we can piece together to build what was really happening, how censuses really worked and stuff. There's also stuff we don't know, right? So there's things that we can't see for sure. Thank you so much. Constellation again says, you two need to get away from Myth Vision and get to a Kingdom Hall quick. <laughs> I'm getting this right around the corner. Better get busy. Thank you so Always much. Always right around the corner. 2,000 years Amen. right around the corner. Thank you. Name Christian. In Armageddon, Bart implies that Revelation, I think they mean singular was partly inspired by tacitus's mention of nero's torture of christians wouldn't that constitute a source referring to the testimonium tacitum thoughts uh well it wouldn't necessarily like it if the event happened then it could just be independent corroboration right like tacitus writes about it decades later but it happened so other people are going to write about it um so th that wouldn't be the issue the, the issue would be <clears throat> if the fire didn't if the if the persecution in relation to the fire didn't happen, then you have a problem explaining how that would be in Revelation, right? And, and um, so, and this is the thing is that I don't think uh, the Christians had anything to do. I don't think there was any story involving Christians uh, and the burning of Rome. Uh, I think that was invented centuries later uh, and got inserted into Tacitus, uh, that it was originally Messianic Jews who got persecuted. It wasn't Christians uh, at all. So on that assumption, um, then you have to say, well, how would you say the revelation was written before Tacitus? Then you say, well, how would the author of Revelation know about it? Um, there, there's two two problems with this. Is One is it's very vague, so we don't really know that that's what the author of Revelation is talking about. Um, but more significantly is the author of Revelation is a Torah-observant Christian. Revelation is one of the texts that's uh, anti-Paul. So it is it, it the Revelation is written by a community of Christians who believe that you have to convert to Judaism. You have to be a Jew to be saved. You can't be a Christian uh, and not be Torah observant. You've got to get circumcised. You've got to follow the dietary laws and stuff. So uh, Revelation is still a pro-Jewish text. Um, it's countercultural, so it's anti-Jewish elite, but it's still pro-Jewish in that sense. So if it is the case, and I do think it is the case, that it was Messianic Jews that got persecuted uh, by Nero, um, that still becomes relevant to brought to bring in uh, into Revelation because this it's it's sort of an example of oh how these horrible things are happening to us, us uh, meaning devout Jews, um, and so so there's still an explanation that could that could get in there. But I I think ultimately the text is too vague to really be sure. Like what are they talking about exactly? Are they just talking about the general uh, general horrors of Nero? Are they talking about the general fact of the fire? And, and you know it's like there's no specific story in there where it says oh the Christians were specifically murdered in mass for you know blamed for arson for this particular fire revelation doesn't say that so um it's hard to to really reconstruct what it's referring to is per se uh, but there's still a narrative where that would make sense even if the christian element got added later because it, it they, they identify a lot with the punishment of the jews and and uh, the abuse of the jews uh, in book of revelation so that, that's important to the author uh, in a way that i guess could become unclear if you're not if you're thinking that this is an organized Bible of all 
you know, anti-Semitic Gentile Christian texts. No, the, the, the New Testament is a mixture of books that are in argument with each other. Like Matthew was written by Torah observant Christians to refute Mark. He's arguing with Mark. Uh, and Luke is arguing with Mark and Matthew where he's saying, can't we all get along? And John is saying, fuck you all. We're have a new religion now. Like, it's, <laughs> it's like they, they're all arguing with each other. Um, and, and they just get collected into this text because each of these texts brings a community with it. And it was political in terms of which communities do we want to be uh, on, on our side versus the ones we're going to try and oppose and kick out, right? And so I think there's a, that's why all these contradictory books got slammed together in the Bible. It's a political decision in the same way that the Nicene Creed is a political decision. It, it makes no logical sense, right. but it makes perfect sense politically. Uh, if, if you pick like, these are the sects we want to be insiders. Those are the sects we want to be outsiders. If that's your starting position, what is our creed? The answer is this gobbledygook, this contradictory gobbledygook called the Nicene Creed, right? So uh, the best description of that, by the way, is Bart Ehrman in How Jesus Became God. Uh, he has a chapter near the end that's just on the Nicene Creed, and it's the best, the best description of how the Nicene Creed was a product of political committees. Nothing has nothing to do with truth, fact, or, or theology, even really. Uh, and I think the same thing happened with how did our a, a canonical, what became our canonical edition of the Bible how it got assembled is the same thing. And so once you understand that these texts come from radically different groups who were at each other's throats originally, then you can understand what's going on in Revelation uh, in, in, in some of these odd respects. Thank you. We're going to have to blast through some of these here, Dr. Carrier. Gray is 174. Would you rather publicly fight or debate Frank Turek? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Wait a minute, Frank Frank Turek. Why would Christian why would Frank Turek? Why wouldn't I debate Frank Turek? Is there is there something I'm forgetting? They're just being funny. They're just yeah. Being... Okay. No. I uh, I mean there are people I would not debate, uh, but I don't think Frank Turek is on the list unless I've forgotten something. Um, but uh, but no, yeah, I would debate Frank Turek again. Um, I don't like debates, but if someone organizes a debate, I'll come. Uh, you know, I'm I'm expensive, but I'm not that expensive, but. Um, yeah. I think you're reasonable. Yeah, you're very I'm reasonable. actually reasonable. Uh, if you want to do a physical in person debate, it, the most, the biggest expense is travel, is right? Physically getting me there. Um, for and for people should know, I'm now in Georgia. Uh, I'm in the Atlanta area, so uh, no longer in California. Other side of the country now, so Got it. it affects people's decisions on that. But yeah, I would I would debate him. I, I don't see any reason to fight him. Someone uh, said. <laughs> They also say, have you ever interacted with Eastern Orthodoxy? I don't. Um, I mean, I have. I've engaged with Ether, Eastern Orthodoxists in person and um, I studied it a little. Um, so I'm not completely in the dark, but I, I've never um, I've never like in, I've never written anything about it. No. OK. They also asked, didn't catch the whole stream. But is Luke lying here or is there an internally noble thought process? Aren't those the same thing? <laughs> don't don't many liars have noble reasons for their That's lies? A good um, no, I, I think absolutely it's both, right? Yeah, yeah. Luke is totally lying. He knows it's bullshit, um, but he he does believe that he's rescuing the world. Like he he does think that that people need to come around to his way of thinking, uh, or else all hell will break loose or whatever. Like he, he he's he's sincere in his agenda but he's completely dishonest in the way he's going about achieving mm. it. We Are Alliance is off topic, but can you talk about the all-seeing eye of Jehovah some other time? The Tetragrammaton, check out some old Jehovah coins. I don't know a lot about numismatics, uh, or I'm you know Jewish-Israeli <laughs> numismatics. Uh, that's not my area. Yeah, If you were going to talk about like the Tetragrammaton on coins, you, you need to get someone who's an expert in ancient coins. <clears throat> mm, thank you gettysburg demoniac since the miracles in the gospels are fictional why did the original disciples think jesus was the messiah during his lifetime oh gosh uh, well i mean you're talking to someone who doesn't believe jesus existed so <laughs> right. uh the reason is is because he appeared in a dream and and told them uh and and you know and then gave them powers right they can they can faith heal and call out demons and things like that. And so th therefore it must be true, right? It must have actually been a real Jesus that appeared to them in their dreams. Uh, no, I think that's like in, in my own model of how Christianity began. It was that they had a God appear to them in their dreams or, their, you know, ecstatic states told them there were these hidden messages in scripture. They found them and they're like, Oh my God, this is brilliant. It has to be true. 
and then they went and did standard psychosomatic miracle tent shows and said, oh my god we can heal people etc uh and then believed it uh, i think that's what happened but um if you're on a model of a historical jesus there's lots of different there's like a hundred different models of a historical Jesus uh, as to how people would believe that they're real. Um, some of it's largely the same. Like how, how does anyone believe that Q of QAnon is some sort of like brilliant mystical inside leader that makes only good decisions, right? Uh, how, how does anyone, how did people come to believe that David Koresh uh, was the chosen one of God? Or, like you, you could just go through history and, and right. ask that same question. Um, it, it's easy to find followers Jim Jones, et cetera. Like they, there, there are storylines as to how, and they don't all do it the same way, but it's mostly charisma and it's mostly emotion. It's mostly this uh, bad epistemology. People aren't deciding who's the Messiah based on evidence-based rational reasoning. They're, they're doing it based on like emo how they feel. It's based on feelings. Uh, and so there's a lot of different ways to manipulate people to feel that you are the Messiah. And we know that throughout history and the Sabbatai Sevi, like, you know, uh, even, even um, Rastafari like denied to his his whole, all the whole time. I'm not the fucking Messiah. Don't worship me. And the Rastafarians are still a thing. Like they're still worshiping him. Uh, he himself told them to stop, and they're still doing it. So, <clears throat> so there's lots of ways this can happen. Uh, and um, because the evidence is so problematic and vague, uh, it's difficult to know which of these pathways happened for Jesus, if he existed mm -hmm. historically. Uh, we can talk about different models that would make sense in the context. And I think there's lots of plausible historical Jesuses that would answer that question. Thank you so much. What arguments of Paul were most persuasive, effective in converting Gentiles to Christianity or to believe Jesus was raised from the dead? Well, the, we talked about the last part earlier, uh, and I talk about this in more detail for people who are interested. Again, in the scientists in the early Roman Empire, I have a section on their epistemology and how uh, can you do miracles? Do you suffer? Or is your teaching moral? If you do those three things, uh, then you must be telling the truth. And Jesus must have risen from the dead. Why would you lie about it? Because you're clearly of God, right? That's their thinking. It's irrational thinking, but it is how they thought. Uh, and so that's the answer to that question. Um, as far as marketing goes, we already know, we have tons of evidence that there were tons of Gentiles who were already attracted to, to Judaism. And you could talk about like why, like what, what was it? It was appealing. But they didn't convert to Judaism because they didn't like cutting off a piece of their penis. They didn't like the dietary rules. Like the rules were too strict. But they did really admire the sort of intense piety uh, and some of the, you know, the brotherhood and the, and the sort of sincerity there were aspects of the Jewish life that really appealed to people, but they wouldn't get, wouldn't become Jewish. And so they became God-fearers, so they became supporters of synagogues, but they weren't themselves Jewish. That was a ready-made market. Like, Paul just had to walk up to them, hey, you want to be Jewish without cutting off a piece of your penis? And like, yeah, that's great, finally, I've been looking for this. Uh, and so he had a huge market to sell to, and a lot of those people had money. Uh, and so he's bringing in sacks of cash. He talks about it in his letters. There's a lot of suspicion thrown at him about what are you doing with all this sacks of cash, Paul? And he's like, no, I swear I'm taking it to the saints back in, in Jerusalem. I'm taking it to the problem, which means, you know, Peter, James and stuff. So here's this guy is coming back with sacks of cash. And it's like, hey, look, I got this new gospel sacks of cash. And they're like, well, okay, maybe we can be a little flexible money. on the conversion thing. Right. So <laughs> I, I sincerely think that is literally what happened. Uh, and I think they, that, wow, we could, we have all this money that we can use for our mission. Let Paul convert the Gentiles with this stuff. You know, we, we'll use the money we get to like push it onto the Jews. And so like get more Jews on board and then we can finally bring paradise on earth. Like that's probably how they thought, right? I think that's probably what's going on. Thank you. Gray 74, 174. What's the relationship with Torah, Christianity and Islam? Was Jesus a prophet or of a law this whole time? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I have an article on uh, the historicity of Muhammad. Um, don't get excited. I don't have come to a conclusion on that. Uh, the article is mostly about how we can't know the answer to that question. But in the article, I talk about the fact that there is some serious scholarship uh, and I think there's a good basis for it, suggesting that Islam is actually um, a remnant, an evolved remnant of one of the early original sects of Christianity, that it's evolved from a Torah observant sect into a halal observant sect. Because halal and kosher are very similar. You might wonder, like, why are they so similar? Uh, and there's a lot of aspects of the Quran that look similar to um, Peshitta and Syrian Christianity. 
Uh, and so you can see like, well, maybe there was some sort of like little sect of still hanging around of the original Christian sect of Torah observant Christians hundreds of years later and just like their beliefs sort of evolved and changed. And then boom, they've got an army and they're, you know, going all over the world with like gangbusters spreading this thing. Uh, and so it looks like Islam popped out of nowhere, but that's only because it might've just been this remnant, this little remnant that just, you know, game of Thrones its way into having military power. And then suddenly sh shoots onto the literary scene where we, now we can see them. The evidence is uh, survives for us to see their presence, but they might've been there all along. So Islam mm -hmm. might actually just be a sect of Christianity in much of the way that Mormonism is. Um, and so I, I think it's entirely possible and plausible. And there are other scholars who've argued this. Thank you so much. There's so much we don't have time for, but uh, seven minutes here. How confident are you that Acts was written by a single author? Books usually were. Um, so I give it more than 80% chance. Like it would be very weird for multiple authors to be involved. Not so weird as to be like, that would never happen. Uh, we have, we have things, we have examples, I think, where we have, we believe in multiple authorship. Um, and then there's redaction, of course, which is a different question. Um, like our version of Acts might have been redacted by multiple authors after the original. Right. Right. So uh, that's a different, well, that's the gospel of John is that it's our gospel of John is not what the original author wrote. It's been redacted by two different authors since, but they're separate authors coming, getting the text and changing it and then moving it. And the next guy comes along and changes it. Um, as far as like a committee of authors, uh, that's uncommon. So I, I, I would need evidence for it before I would believe that that happened. It's not impossible. It's just, it's just not uh, what we statistically expect. Thank you, Mark Benson. Uh, Maribara, a fist fight between Richard and Bart Ehrman. Who wins? <laughs> I, I don't fight people unless my life is threatened. So if <laughs> Bart Ehrman is trying to physically kill me, um, I, I think I'd do pretty well. But <laughs> I've got some moves. But uh, but otherwise, I'm, I'm not going to have a fist fight with people. I, I don't believe in the use of violence in that way. So. I guess I should start. So <laughs> before we move to the next question, just for the sake of the poll, I'm going to go ahead and stop the poll where it's at. Do you think the book of Acts is a historical fiction? Yes. So the numbers are 56% said yes, 21% said no, and 21% uh, said not sure. Exactly those numbers, 816 votes. We're starting oh, a new poll nice. based on this super chat. Who <laughs> would win in a, a fight? Bart, yeah. uh, people maybe. might, as if they're good gamblers, they might want to have background information. As a, I am ex military, but <laughs> yeah, um, I'm gonna put uh, <laughs> Richard or Bart. Also, I'm willing to bet I drink a lot more. Okay, so I asked the question. I can take a hit. <laughs> we only have a few minutes to answer this question. Thank you so much for the fun question, Christy. Do you see anything with the stories of the New Testament revolutionaries being? Protestants to Judaism mm. and the founders of America, Capitol Hill in DC was named after the Temple of Jupiter, Optimus Maximus on Capitoline Hill. Okay. Looking for an analogy here. I think um, so. Well, the word revolutionary is a bit mis misleading. So, um, uh, cultural revolutionaries. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Right. I, I would say, I mean, I, I don't know. The analogy is weak because it's not like Paul walked up to the temple and put 99 theses or whatever on the, <laughs> you know, on the, on the thing. Um, but in a sense, uh, it is a revolution cult. Uh, and I talk about there, it's an anthropology of this. Uh, there's a lot of studies of revolution cults throughout the ethnographic record across history. Uh, and I have a second uh, element 29 in chapter five of on the historicity of Jesus. I talk about the anthropological literature on revolution cults. Uh, and why Christianity fits it to a T. Absolutely. Uh, I don't know that, Pro I think Protestantism doesn't because Protestantism was weirdly a much more rational political movement. It wasn't a visionary revelatory movement. Like There weren't people claiming new visions and it, it wasn't from the bottom up. Uh, it was a top-down movement. It got aligned with po politics very quickly. Uh, so it was elite power players were involved. So, and it was more like a, a rational political objection to the way the Catholic Church had become corrupted. Uh, so I think that Protestantism is not considered a revolution called it. It's a very different process. Uh, so so it would be hard to like build out the analogy. Or maybe not fruitful to build out the analogy, other than the fact that they are 
uh, religious reform movements that they definitely have that in common. Thank you. Warren says Richard eternally looks like he's in his twenties. Yeah. It's weird, right? <laughs> You're going to be like getting old, looking, looking young. <laughs> Dan Johnson says as a janitor with four kids, I can't give as often as someone should, but glad to support when I can. Thank you for always awesome. great content. Yeah. L B U Y. What's that mean? L -B -Y. Oh gosh. Text. I would Google it normally. Someone will throw it in there. Yeah, someone tell me in the chat what <laughs> LB you want. But Dan, thank you so much. You didn't have to. I really do appreciate the support. And yeah. um, I'm going to keep bringing the fire. So thank well, it's you. support like that that allows him to bring me on on shows. So yeah, if you want to see more than more of me, throw some more money at him. So <laughs> that's literally what yeah. I called no, Richard. Right. I said, hey, man, and I've got the economy time. works. Yeah. Yep. I really do appreciate the support, everybody, for making this possible. And then Ann Scott says, what does Dr. Carrier think about Paul's pressure being the original or actual Q? Well, it wouldn't be because – so a pressure would be a collection of verses, uh, and it might have an interpretation attached. Um, so it might – this verse is connected to this verse, and this is why, et cetera. Um, so what, that is – if we build out Q, which is just – literally Q just means – everything that Luke copied from Matthew that isn't in Mark. Uh, so if you build that out, it doesn't look like a pesher. Um, it looks like a gospel, actually. It looks like the gospel of Matthew, honestly. <laughs> that's why I think that's all it is. Uh, no, it looks like a gospel. It doesn't look like a pesher. Um, it could be a collection. It could be something like, let's take uh, Dennis McDonald's model, where it's Q+. Plus. He has a much more elaborate version of Q that he argues for. Um, where he argues that this was a story that predates uh, Mark, we're told. Um, that totally could predate Christianity. It could be a document, a story about some hero in, of yore. It could have been originally like someone set in the time of Daniel or whatever. And then someone just used that to write a modern story about Jesus. Uh, and we have examples of that being done. So, uh, so I think that is a plausible model. I don't think that's what happened, but it, it, it could have. It could be something like that where you have, it was a story about, someone else some other religious hero hundreds of years ago uh that they just adapted and we just don't know that because we don't have that story mm -hmm. uh, to build out from richard i really appreciate your time dr richard carrier yeah, thanks for having me on. great questions from everybody uh thank you and there's much more we could have gotten into but i had tried to get through my first hour i kind of try to take the first hour and then give the rest for i audience. think i think we did a really excellent use of time it's fantastic i think so too hitler homer bible christ Proving history, um, you have several more, of course. Jesus from Outer Space is kind of a condensed version of On the Historicity, if you're interested in more exhaustive. You can get these on Audible. Um, you can listen to them. Check it. Go, go literally subscribe to his. Um, it doesn't cost anything. Go subscribe to his email list. You can support him more in ways like taking his online courses that he does through his own website. We have one through MVP courses that's all in 4K, high quality, and we have more to come as time goes by. We're going to be putting out four more courses with you. Um, we also have uh, your Patreon. You have a way of personal support. Is there anything else I'm missing here? Uh, no, I think you've, you've got all of that. There's lots of different ways of support my work. Um, and even if you want to list more on my website, one of the top menu is how to help. And it lists them all. So including like where to get my books, uh, that's one way to help, um, uh, how to give donations, oh. how to support me on Patreon and all of that stuff. Literally so. tells you right here how to yeah. help. I'll put the info support link in the comment section in case someone wants to go over there, show you some love, yeah. or they want to be emailed. Like I get emailed every time you launch. How common is it that you, how often are you publishing? Because I do four blogs, four, four blogs a month. Occasionally I do more more than that, but only four substantive blogs. Um, I'll do wow. sometimes if I do a physical appearance, I'll announce it on my blog. But um, all other appearances are only on my social media, so they're announced on Twitter and Facebook. Uh, there is actually on my website there is a guide to my social media, so if you want to know where to follow me based on what your interests are, you've got that. I also have a, a guide to my books. Uh, you can search for guide to my books, and it lists all my books and why you might be interested in which ones. Uh, so that's that's there as well. Uh, but the thing that I think that matters the most, the thing that I, I've really is keeping me in biscuits and doing this as a living is Patreon supporters. Yeah. Uh, and Patreon supporters get a lot of perks, especially if you like communicate with me and remind me that you're a Patreon supporter. Um, you get more access to me than the average Joe, basically. So um, Patreon, yeah, support me on Patreon. 
Uh, you, if you, can you can also it. comment and instantly be approved to comment. Yeah, so that's one of the perks. And, and on Patreon, it'll tell you what the perks okay. are. One, one of which is that, that on my blog, your comments go straight through. Uh, they get whitelisted and they don't go through the queue. Um, once you become a Patreon member, it might take me like a month to get you on that whitelist. But um, but every month I go in and I update the whitelist. And so once you're on the whitelist, you can post comments to my blogs and, and it posts immediately. So uh, and that means that you could even start engaging with other Patreon members on my blog in the comments because you, your comments post immediately. Whereas uh, everyone else, it goes to moderation. And it could take days, days before I get in and, and approve everything. So yeah, one of the big, one of the big, that's one of the big perks. The other is if you want to be a Facebook friend, I only allow people to comment on my Facebook posts who are Facebook friends and Patreon members are automatically, you can request to be a Facebook friend. Just say I'm a Patreon member and you're in. Awesome. Well, I can tell you this much. I know for a fact, if it weren't for those who've helped support us through Patreon, we wouldn't be here. And that goes for Dr. Carrier as well. So support the scholars you appreciate. It's really about just putting money where you want to see more of that kind of content from that kind of scholar. I've noticed that with Myth Fishing. And so I say the same for you. Imnac came in, dropped heavy supporting yeah. at the end here. Yeah, yeah. Hey, Derek, I've been- I already saw it, so I, I'm ready to answer. Uh, yeah. And I can answer quick. Um, well, I've been busy and just catching up. So doctor, what do you think about today's Christian nationals? And would you consider them revolutionary or dangerous? Dangerous as fuck. Uh, Google brown shirts. I think they're basically our era's version. Wow. Okay. Imnac, thank you so much for that big drop of uh, money there. You helped us out here. And Dr. Carrier, help support Dr. Carrier. If you love what you heard, never forget to uh, check us out in the description as well. We do have a course. You can purchase that as well with him. So any final words from you before we let you go? Uh, no, this has been great. Uh, good discussion. Covered all the topics, I think, uh, pretty well. Um, yeah, no, just yeah. check out my website. Uh, check out how to help. Uh, there might be ideas in there. Um, for how to have me on. And if any of you are content creators, uh, get in touch. Um, I'm, I'm affordable. So <laughs> yeah, very affordable. Uh, yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. And you really, uh, just go above and beyond. You understand that we are trying to do super chats. We're trying to yeah. keep yeah, doing yeah. what we're doing here. And I, I just, you know, my whole goal with this was initially just let me cover what it costs to have you on because I love educating and I know time is money and we all have to eat. And so I wanted to just yeah. make sure that we could somehow cover that by the super chats. And th and we did. So I want to cool. thank everybody for helping yeah. us today, make that possible. And uh, yeah, I guess have a wonderful day. Take care of yourself. I've been exercising. I've been bragging about it to Dr. Carrier. <laughs> like I've been trying to get back in shape before COVID, you know, that kind of thing. And um, I hope that everybody else takes care of their bodies and sticks around keep uh, sharing this content, drop a comment and support those you want to see more of. So thank you so much. All righty. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Son, do you want to know what the truth is? After this, there's no turning back. You take the blue pill and you wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to. You take the red pill and you stay in Wonderland. And I show you just how deep the rabbit hole goes. Remember, all I'm offering is the truth, nothing more. out the door so please forgive me they're uh, finishing their meal we've been on a rush today I've uh, been recording I can't tell you how many videos I've had recorded over the past three days
with uh, both Dr. Richard Carrier and Dennis McDonald. We've been having a blast. I, I mean, literally probably have 50 videos already, maybe a little more, maybe a little less, right around that area. And uh, they're about to come out right now with their glass of wine. We had a nice steak and uh, some pasta. And I'm going to be recording this live. Last night, uh, just so you guys know who are tuning in, um, as soon as I got done, I used my phone to do a live. I usually do my computer, never through StreamYard. I'm using StreamYard right now. But somehow when I exited the live at the very end, it deleted the whole live from yesterday. So we're not repeating the live, but we are doing another live. Like wh whatever you guys have questions about, whatever you want to ask, feel free. If you super chat your questions, they go to the top, all that kind of stuff. We're going to be addressing that. I'm going to be recording with my cameras while I'm recording them with the phone. So it'll be recorded live. It won't get deleted this time, I promise. But it'll also be in high definition. So I'll end up putting it on Patreon in the future. And um, you guys can see that there. Um, the gentlemen are finishing up and they'll be out here. I'm going to get these cameras set up and get ready, so please bear with me just a moment as we get these things started. And I'm going to check out your comments. So <clears throat> this one's not as easy to turn the camera around. Okay, no audio. Hold on. No video. Speakerphone? Hear me now. Let me know if you can hear me now. Is this better? Ladies and gentlemen, let me know if this is better. Can't hear. Better but but loud. It's loud? Hmm, much better. Hearing now. Better. Yes. Much better. All right. Can you guys see? Is everything good? <clears throat> well, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping I'm not too loud. Empty chairs will be filled in just a moment. So please bear with me. I'm going to be recording this, ladies and gentlemen. So that way we don't have this problem. So, all right, testing out for you guys. How loud am I from speaking? Imagine Dr. Carrier or Dennis are here talking. Can you hear me? My phone's about three to four feet away, so hopefully you guys can hear me really good. Let me see what your comments look like. This is live. Perfect. I can hear you. Great. Volume is good. Awesome. You guys are great. Cool. The master is coming. Sounds good. We are going to still do a test when they sit in the chair. Um, I'm using my phone, big boy, so there's no 4K on this. This is the best I have with my phone. I am in the mountains of California, so I wish I could do better, <laughs> but it's all good. There's, there's one of the guys, one of the mans with the plans. All right, Dennis, try talking to us just for a second to see if uh, if they're picking up the audio from you. And, and, and I'm going to hook that up in just a second. I'm just seeing if they can hear you from the phone. Hey, public. Mid vision people. <laughs> We're still finishing dinner. And you have your cup of blood. Yep. Or better yet, grape. Let's see. They say Doc's like the Hawaiian prince, eh? Greetings. We are PTO. All good. SoCal. Sounds great. Hey, public. All right, guys. Cool. Awesome. 100, 100 you are watching. Hit that like button while we get set up here. I do not want this one to go missing. So if something happens, we at least have it on. Okay. Clip it. Okay. You got it? Okay. <clears throat> Carrier, I'm going to go ahead and um, test your audio real quick. Go ahead and test yours, Dennis. Two Hittites walked into a bar. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I have to use the restroom and I'll be Go right. ahead. Go ahead. 
let me see how this one's sounding. Ladies and gentlemen, all right, looks good, sounds good. <clears throat> so, Carrie is going to go ahead and he'll be out in just a second. Dennis, I'm a little disappointed last night when I said I deleted that video. So, this one will be set up. Someone said that's dark wine there. <laughs> LOL. Look, look, this is the cool thing about what I like about StreamYard is you guys can like if you if you end up commenting, I can post it up and all. Yeah, there you go. What you how look while we wait on uh, carrier, what do you think about what we've been doing so far? How do you feel about it? Derek, I feel so honored to have my uh, work um, just made more public. And I know people may not agree with it. I know that it might be really quite foreign. Uh, certainly, I have taken my um, my lumps along the way in the last 30 years when I've been working on this. Actually, it's more like 40 years. Uh -huh. And um, you have made it possible for me to meet to reach 20 times more people than I could ever reach in a classroom or with the cost of expensive books. Right. And I've published a dozen or more books on these topics, but none of them has had been able to have a, a far reach. And I am so grateful to you and to Richard for sharing this uh, platform. And by the way, if my brother is watching Peter McDonald, I want to greet him. He's uh, been not only a lifelong friend of mine, but he's a scholar in his own right and is helping me write the synopsis that I'll talk about somewhat later. Awesome. Um, so, hey, Pete. Um, Pete, call, what's I, up, Pete? I call him little bro and I'm big bro. So, <laughs> that's awesome, you know, man. You know, but, but that's now um, we disagree with each other and I'm not always as articulate as I'd like. But I, I think just having the kind of public exposure is such a privilege, and I'm eternally grateful to you, Derek. Thank you. Well, thank you. I really appreciate it. And I, I look, this is a win-win. I get to hear some of the deepest stuff you hear, you won't hear out there from two of the sharpest minds on the block when it comes to this material, and I, I'm honored to be able to be part of it. So <clears throat> we're making history. This is not that's not a joke. This is a fact. What we're doing is making actual history, and I'm glad to be part of it. So thank you. I really do. Okay. <clears throat> Just so you know, your audio is good. I've already tested it. You want to clip that on your shirt, and then uh, we'll get started, and everyone else can join us. If you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you're not an alcoholic like uh, me, uh, get you a glass of wine and enjoy the show with us. Uh, or whatever you like to, uh, I guess you'd say, get in the groove and uh, settle down and enjoy your evening. Uh, if you're on the other side of the world and you got to work, I get it. You can vicariously get uh, a nice Dionysian buzz through our guest here tonight <laughs> on Myth Vision. <laughs> All right. All right. So we are recording on here. Recording on here now. And uh, you guys are seriously awesome. Thank you. Please forgive me, audience. Last night, the video, for those who are just tuning in, was accidentally deleted. I don't want to go into the exact details of what happened, but there's no way to bring it back. But I have filming, <coughs> high definition, really, really good stuff. Uh, we're going to have this on the Patreon. So real quick, um, my friend, Al uh, my friend, sorry, <laughs> Anthony Guthrie, he has a, a thing on slavery. Honestly, might be better to just do it as its own session tomorrow where we can talk about this. So remember, <laughs> yeah, I will. I will. He's, a, he's, a so. he's huge. Okay. So guys, welcome. What is up? We are myth vision, myth vision, ladies and gentlemen, Daniel's getting that Russian vodka. All right. We already got some super chats, baby. That's what I like to see. And look, I can pop it on the screen. So I'm using a cool setup. If you guys saw it, it's so much cooler than last night when I just went just <laughs> through, you, through YouTube. Secular Rarity, thanks for the super chat. He says, you make some absolutely awesome stuff, Derek. Thank you so much. You rock on, man. Thank you. I really appreciate the love. If you have any questions, I'll try and keep an eye out on your name and uh, ask away. But uh, thanks a lot, man. We're going to jump right into the deep end and uh, get these people's questions. So uh, I will have to let our you know you guys know in this, I can't just like 
after about three to five minutes, when the chat gets pretty heavy, super chats can disappear. And so we <laughs> might have to cut things short to make sure we can get them. Yeah, and I'll try good. not to cut things short. It's a good discipline. Yeah, I'll just, I, I'd rather you get the content out. So, all right. Unclean Hero, what is up, man? Thank you so much. Aside from religion, do you have any critiques of Christ himself? Oh, we just wrapped a video about that, really. We did. I don't know if you guys want to um, talk I mean, about the, the gist of it, the overarching gist is it depends on what you mean by Christ. <clears throat> okay. Whose depiction and whose interpretation. So Okay, let's get out. We let's... compared the fundamentalist, literalist reading of the Bible versus the intention of the author's version. And then even that is their version of Jesus, isn't necessarily the, the Jesus. So... It's it's a vexed question, really. The, let's look at the like the human uh, ideas within the Gospels, right? Like, forget about walking on the water, so to speak. But like, is there any teachings you would look at and go, "Nah, dude"? Like, uh, I'll, I'll answer that question, but I'm going to answer it in two ways, Derek, but very briefly. Okay. One is I'm convinced that the mythologizing of Jesus in the Gospels is something to uh, Greek poetry. <laughs> But in almost every case, Jesus is portrayed as either more compassionate or more powerful than the heroes of Homer. But I'm also uh, a scholar of Q. And I know there's a huge controversy about whether there was a lost gospel Q. But if there was a Q, or even if not, if traditions known, say, to Matthew uh, have anything to do with early Christian tradition, Jesus is portrayed as more compassionate in the use of Jewish law and has um, arguments against the rich, blessings for the poor, um, oracles against Jerusalem that kills the prophets. And the Jesus of the Q document comes not to call the righteous, but sinners. And even prostitutes will enter the kingdom of God before Torah enforcers were called Pharisees in the text. And this sits very well with what I understand the shortcomings of religion, that religion has made expectations of fidelity to, um, and actually fleece the public in order to fund its organizations and has not taken care of the poor and the needy and has not been able to challenge the rich in an appropriate way. And I must say that I am a hopeless socialist, and that kind of rhetoric in trying to make the re religion more responsible for the less fortunate than I is very attractive to me. So real quick, <clears throat> the super chat is Christ of the gospel. He, unclean hero, thank you for the super chat. So he, he super chatted the super chat, right? And he's like, all right, look, uh, the red letters. So do you find any problems with the red letters? If we can go with that, could you, since you've already given your, your position here, can you give a... I mean, yeah, I'll just throw out some examples. I think the, the extreme uh, hostility to human sexuality that you get from Jesus of the red letter, <clears throat> uh, I think is uh, contrary to humanist, contrary to human welfare and contrary to humanist principles. Um, and also his extreme pacifism. Um, uh, the, the total non-resistance, like don't don't even sue anyone, don't even oppose a thief who steals, steals your stuff, uh, do nothing to resist uh, anyone who even enslaves you, actually. Um, now, in context, of course, that's written by people who think the world's going to end anytime soon, mm -hmm. so that any resistance that you oppose uh, risks sinning and thus shutting you out of the kingdom. Whereas if you just, like, do nothing and let anybody enslave you, beat you, kill you, whatever, for 10 years, let's say, or even 20 but then you get eternal life for it. But that's a pittance, right? That's easy. Suffer through it. Like that's that's the attitude. So it's based on apocalypticism, which I think is, uh, there's a lot of negative outcomes of, of apocalypticism, including uh, failing to act like custodians of the earth, for example, um, failing to plan for the future, uh, that, that kind of stuff. And, and then this sort of extreme uh, morality that comes out of it. Uh, <clears throat> so I don't, I don't, uh, truck with the apocalypticism and you know that's different from again the, the literal reading of of jesus is, is even worse than the, than the intended reading of jesus mm. but that's just two examples i threw out there thank you appreciate the super chat uh unclean hero daniel i don't want to butcher your russian last name bro <clears throat> it's uh 
K I Z I L O V. Kilosov. Kilosov. Dude, is that close, bro? Yeah. He says, "Keep up the good work, sexy boy." <laughs> <laughs> Love you, man. Thanks, dude. I appreciate you for real, man. Tell me if I got your name right too. Is it? Is it? Uh, Kazilov? Kazilov? I don't know if I'm saying that right because it probably has Kazilov. Yes, I mean, it, that's what it sounds like you're trying to spell. I can't see the whole words, so I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, I spelled it, but if you saw it, you're the kind of person who needs to identify yeah, looking. Okay. If I see the letters, I know the, yeah, the etymology or, okay. or the phonics. But... <laughs> Interesting. All right. Well, thanks for that super chat, bro. Um, it also well, depends if it's like, for example, Polish versus Russian pronunciation. Is I think it's – that's a good question. I think yeah. it's Russian. I think <laughs> – um, I know he knows Russian, so thank you, man. Appreciate the love. Dudist Priest is back. Back, Dudist. Dudist. <laughs> so the story of the four kings that visited baby Jesus. I mean, three kings. It, some people say three kings, actually. So, act, it's not even, there's a no number. In the box, right. So. <laughs> right. So we'll just go with his number. Who cares? Because <laughs> right. the number is not actually there. It says, um, the four kings that visited baby Jesus, one was turned away for bringing fruitcake. What was the religious meaning? <laughs> Baby shower? <laughs> uh, no one likes fruit cake. That's the mean. That's it's it's really you just gotta be literal with the text on that one. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know this is a good time to. I love how his humor it is. There was actually a king, and he actually brought fruit cake. It's just an allegory for the fact that no one wants fruit cake. So you're supposed to take away the lesson. Is the moral of the story is don't bring fruit cake when your friends are bringing frankincense and myrrh and gold. <laughs> So um, to, to educate everyone, what is the purpose, the actual purpose? And when I say actual, I mean like the secrets. What's the allegory? What's really going on here? The teaching of this. And I know literalists. Oh, yes. Yeah. Well, what's the point of that narrative? What do you think? There's a wonderful uh, study that has been done by one of my students on the similarities between Matthew's account of the infancy of Jesus and um, speculations about the uh, birth of Alexander the Great. And it includes astrological signs, and it includes magi, of all things. Mm -hmm. And um, so there is in the uh, air a, a, a fictional trope that includes a lot of these elements that you find in, um, in the uh, Alexander myth. But we also know from rhetorical handbooks how one is supposed to greet the, um, to give an encomium or a panegyric to an emperor. And what you do is you talk about how magnificent and unexpected his birth was and how he comes out of such a good genos, that a good family, and that in fact the, the gods shone on his birth with astrological phenomena. And that certain sages were able to to, to see uh, in the birth of the the uh, youngster uh, a future dynast, and you actually have this also in um, the mythologies of the birth of Augustus, and you see this in Suetonius, and he's somewhat skeptical about them, but nonetheless, these tropes are there. The next thing is that he was wise and there was an opposition to his birth and he shown himself to be uh, above his peers and he grew up smarter than anybody except for Richard Perry. Yeah, that means <laughs> you can't be smarter than Richard, yeah. yeah so, but you, <clears throat> we actually have rhetorical handbooks that talk about when you are praising an emperor, what tropes do you use? <laughs> And one is the irony that the person comes out of a noble heritage but does not receive proper recognition by the authorities. And the um, so ancient readers would see here the advent of a baby who's going to change the world, much like Augustus or much like Alexander the Great. And I can show you how these uh, retors were taught how to tell an infancy story. That's awesome. Yeah. Would you want to comment on that? No, just, I, that's um, uh, it just reminds me of something we I can't even remember. We said something, either it was today or yesterday, but it's in the vein of everything we've done. I mean, I'm telling you, my mind is messed up. Like, from this. 
<laughs> it's cooked from the sun yeah, too earlier. You saw knots and, and cooked by the sun. Oh it's my gosh. I'm sorry. I, I, something relevant, but thanks do this priest, man. You rock. Thanks for coming back, man. Gnostic informant, my good buddy, everyone go subscribe to him. He, he interviewed me not too long ago oh, yeah. and uh, he's a good friend of mine. Right. And uh, he says, tell Dr. Carrier, I missed the email for the class. Laugh out loud. Oh, well. Dummy. He says, can I jump in still or wait till next month? He could jump he, in. right? If he wants to. Yeah, he can jump in. You could jump in, man. Jump in, because when I get back, I'm still going to continue the class. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's you're a week behind, but we're not doing anything scheduled, so you can catch up however you want. Awesome, thank you, man. I appreciate that seriously. Uh, the only thing I would say is if if the so the email will have the link. Okay. If that link is expired, uh, he should email me uh, so that I know to send a new link. For him. Email him again if you need to. If you need to, the link might still work. I, I don't know how google decides when to expire these links so yeah honestly i don't i'd prefer them not to at all but <laughs> right uh, but if it has happened then you'll have to get in touch with me. but otherwise the link should still work in the email that you got the invite uh, from the class of google groups thank you brother appreciate it all right we got some super chats guys lined up here so <clears throat> okay um i'm gonna ask it out loud will you be able to hear me i think you hear me you're good oh okay yeah um this is all just the phone yeah um Okay, um, so Michael Bottoms asks, and I'm kind of loud, guys, so that he can hear me too. Dr. Carrier, is it your belief that one cannot hold on or hold to an historicist position without ignoring evidence or engaging in fallacious reasoning? Sorry, let me pop that up for you, Michael. Thank you for the super chat, bro. I think I'm going to bring gifts to my children. Frankincense, myrrh, and I don't know what else for all these super chats. By the way, if I may, this pattern of, um, of rhetoric for the emperor is even clearer in the infancy narrative in Luke. Okay. And there we have again, and a, well, uh, go ahead and ask your question. Okay. Uh, Dr. Kerry, is everyone an idiot who doesn't agree with you? I'm just kidding. That's not the question. <laughs> uh, is it? Is it your belief that one cannot hold to a historicist position without ignoring evidence or engaging in fallacious reasoning? Well, you notice I already allow historicism uh, at least a one in three odds. So uh, for me, it's a question of... I, he has a follow-up, so maybe I can okay. make this one. I apologize, yeah. Michael. I'm on a phone, guys. I am so fallible right now. Please bear with me. Like most historicists, the answer is yes. Uh, they have blatantly fallacious or inaccurate premises. Um, but there are a number of historicists who have reasonable positions. The, the ones that have reasonable positions are the ones who actually acknowledge that mythicism is, is at least plausible. Yeah, right? they see the, the so, issue. So we're, t we're really hedging by like maybe a 30 or 40 percentile difference, which is if you understand how evidence works, that that is an extremely small change. Like normally probabilities would be like 10, 100,000 times out of range. But when you're like within 30, 40, 50 percentiles, you are so close that even just the slightest change in the, the probability of evidence can actually swing you over either 50%. way. So, um, so that's why, like, if, if you're, if you're already at 80%, then you're roughly in the same range of where I am already. Right. So it's like, you're just like leaning in one particular direction, whereas I'm leaning in one particular other. And it's difficult then to like, it would be, it would be very difficult to get into the minutia of where are we assigning the, why are we ending up on pro different probabilities? And it often involves a, a large different database of background knowledge that we're operating on. He follows up, given that position, on what errors in reasoning or evidentiary analysis do you believe your present compa uh, companions base that, their positions? My present companions? But who do they mean? That's a good question. Let me read it again. <laughs> Michael, I'm sorry. Given that position, on what errors in reasoning or evidentiary analysis do you believe your present companions base their positions? Um, I think, and I might be wrong, is he saying like, what do you think, why do you think the hist why do you think historicists, for well, example? Let's, let's, for example, for, the, for Dennis McDonald and I, I think the, the main difference is uh, his um, dedication to Q as a hypothesis. Uh, and actually being able to show that that's, I think, is is the problem. He's assigning too high a probability to it would be very difficult because it gets deeply into the weeds of how we interpret a wide range of different particular pieces of evidence. So um, so that that to me is a much more, uh, you know, it's a much more ambiguous difference. Uh, it's much, much harder to, like, get behind why we're ending up in different places. 
but I understand the difference though, because he once he's constructed that particular cue, you can see how he's constructing the particular historical Jesus that he wants uh, right. he ends up with. Um, but if you look at others, uh, I, I mean, my, my book, Proving History, is all about this. In chapter five, I give example after example after example of historicists making arguments that are completely fallacious and obviously fallacious, sometimes on blatantly false premises. And most of um, those I'd agree with. Right. right. Yeah. So so if you want to see like blatant, <laughs> if you want to see like blatant examples, uh, which, which, you know, it's one of those cases where if you if you were to get all these historians to uh, suddenly stop, like if you could magically wave a wand, and like if yeah. you, you suddenly they forget all false premises, they only have true premises, <laughs> and uh, and they can't reason non fallaciously, like somehow it's blocked. Uh, there would still be some historicists left because of the ambiguities in the evidence, because it's so ambiguous. The evidence is so difficult to like uh, parse, and but they would be closer together, right? All the the mythicists and the historicists would only be like fifty percentiles apart, uh, right? So which is if you think about it, like a single piece of evidence that is five times more likely on one theory than another is going to end up at, if, if you're starting at 50, 50, you're going to end up five times at, and concluding probably it's five times more, not, not 50% more, right? Not 0. 0.5 yeah. difference. We're talking five difference, not a 0. 0.5. That's a huge difference. So that that's how ambiguous and weak the evidence is for the historicity of Jesus that you end up in this uncertain zone. Right. Uh, it's the historicists who say it's, oh, no, it's a hundred to one. There's a Jesus or there's a thousand to one. There's Jesus. Right. Those are the ones that are making fallacious arguments. OK. Well, but of course, that that issue works in both directions. Mm -hmm. If there's new evidence that doesn't work as well for myth. Correct. Yeah. And then then it moves the other direction. I, by the way, that's why I want <laughs> I want this. Uh, I want someone to produce a book defending historicity that's that's like and uh, answers all of the objections and problems that I wrote point out in on the historicity of jesus so that we can have two books on a shelf here's the best case for historicity here's the best case against and then you can like compare them yeah that's I a lot of work scholar to do that no i do want i do want everyone to know i mean i can't read your mind but after knowing you and meeting you and talking for hours and hours and hours yeah. i know that you would it wouldn't matter if there was a guy in yeah, your head not, and right, that's, that's the thing, thing is, have, that's another one of the common fallacious arguments is right like, I need Jesus to not exist. No, 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 no. No, I went for years in grad school and through most of my life completely comfortable with the historical Jesus. In fact, I would love to be able to reconstruct a plausible historical Jesus. Like that, um, there's a there's a hundred different ones that are totally plausible and they don't vindicate Christianity, yeah. right? Uh, so so it has nothing to do with Christianity. It's not an anti-Christian thing. Um, so I, I have no problem with historical, and I find many historical Jesus theories to be entirely plausible. Right. Uh, that's why I end up with such a high odds on the margin thank you thank you ben bassett thank you for the super chat hi uh i think he means richard uh how should academic historians best counter popular writers like tom holland on topics <laughs> like christian influence on western morals and then of course you'd like to comment that's a good question because i don't see enough pushback that as there should be there's this most historians just ignore it ah that's just pop pap and then they just, <laughs> they don't write about it they don't they're not seeing themselves as a public intellectual who needs to push back in, for the public's benefit, right? So that the public isn't snowed by this kind of triumphalist narrative of Christianity, how it saved Western civilization. And if it wasn't for Christianity, we'd all be doomed. Uh, no, right? <laughs> and also I would think like ancient historians really should get in this fist fighting, right? Because they know all about philanthropy originating in ancient Greece. And they, they can talk about like the origin of charitable organizations, the origin of human rights, the idea of natural rights is like comes out of it, Stoic philosophy. They should, I mean, they, these historians love ancient culture. They should come up to their defense, basically. But no one wants to be perceived as the the evil bad guy who's bashing Christianity, I think. Is, whereas I don't mind being seen that way because, you know, that's what I do. <laughs> right. Let me get the next one. Okay, Alan, Alan Bird, man, thank you so much once again for the super chat. Being a hopeless socialist like me, what does Dennis think of libertarian theology? With that in mind. Libertarian theology right okay all right, all right. with Curious. that in mind what is his favorite text mine is the magnificent you mean the magnificat the, yep the magnificat okay. sorry i could it's small letters on the my, my apologies <laughs> the magnificat appears only in the gospel of luke and so it doesn't occur in the earliest uh strata of traditions about jesus in fact it comes at the end of the synoptic tradition no. But the Magnificat and the Benedictus both are amazing texts. 
and they um, had set up Luke Acts as an epic of sorts. If you think of it, all epics need crises in order to sustain the narratives to the end. And epics are long um, and complex texts, and so is Luke Acts. So in the case of the Iliad, um, Troy can't be taken. They're in the ninth year of the war, and um, Apollo has punished the, the um, Achaean troops because of the uh, arrogance of Agamemnon. And you have to have then some kind of intervention. The intervention includes a guy named Calchas who tells the Achaeans that they have to uh, give, uh, Agamemnon uh, has to give up the, uh, the daughter of, uh, I don't want to get too deep in the woods. In the Odyssey, the problem is Odysseus is trapped at Circe at Calypso's island. Suitors are at um, the home of uh, Odysseus. Telemachus has come of age, but he's not strong enough to get rid of things, and you need divine intervention. So Athena goes and talks to uh, her father Zeus and decides she's going to go and give courage to Telemachus, which is very similar to the Holy Spirit coming to Jesus, telling him he's God, God's son and empowering to claim his kingdom. Uh, the Aeneid starts out with the problem that Troy is destroyed, and Aeneas and his people need to have, find a kingdom. And in order to do that, they need the help of the deities. Mm -hmm. Luke Acts begins with the oppression of Greeks and Romans over the Jewish people, and the longing of Jewish people to have a redeemer, a savior, who can come to their rescue. And so the Magnificat is a political document it is not a, a praise of motherhood, as it's often taken mm -hmm. uh, at Christmas. The <clears> same <throat> is true of the Benedictus. Um, uh, I've waited my whole lifetime for salvation, and now I see it in this infant, and so on. So uh, these texts set up the epic proportions that Luke wants in order to have a triumphal Jesus that is proclaiming a kingdom that ultimately is going to reach to Rome. And um, it, it, it really is a magnificent fictional narrative of the growth of the Christian movement. And it's a fictional move, uh, document for which I have great admiration. So these, I agree with the, your loving the Magnificat and the Benedictus, because these are stories of liberation against oppression and hope that, um, and I'm, a, I'm an atheist, but they had a hope that God would finally rescue Israel from its, uh, its enemies and establish a kingdom of peace. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, Digital Komsky? 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 Apologize if I butchered your name. Chomsky. Do you know that? <laughs> well, it's not our Chomsky. No, yeah, not do you, no, digital Chomsky. Digital Chomsky. Chomsky. You don't know who Chomsky is. No, never mind. Okay. okay. So he's a contemporary philosopher. So he says, Dr. Carrier, peer review weeds out crankery. Your blogs, many bold, your blogs, many bold philosophy claims mm -hmm. are not peer reviewed. Mm -hmm. So how do I know it's not crankery? Yeah, uh, the same way you know anything is not crankery. Uh, you don't necessarily need peer review. You can you can wait until peer review has occurred if that's what you want to do. But you can also just go look at someone's argument and, and weigh it yourself. I mean, crankery is self-identifiable. Right? Once you figure out the skill of identifying crank, do it. So you just go and engage with the argument and figure it out. Um, I actually my intention with philosophy is to make it available to the public for the public to make their own judgment. Uh, there is some philosophy that I have gotten through peer review, but Generally, the process is too much work for, for too little gain, really. Um, so you don't get paid for that, right, to get it through peer review. And the peer review standards are, there are a lot of them that are kind of, uh, I find, onerously stupid. Uh, so, for instance, they, they want you to do history of philosophy rather than the philosophy you want to do. So they want, like, tons of citation of every other philosopher who's spoken about the subject and the huge apparatus and stuff. And I was like, I, I don't need to do that to make my argument. Um, so I, what I do is I, as a public philosopher, I just do philosophy and then people who want to do philosophy can 
interact with my arguments as they are and then evaluate them on their own. So philosophy for me is a public enterprise. It isn't necessarily an academic enterprise. Hmm. Um, but I do also do academic philosophy. I'll do some published stuff. And, and I have things that I want. I have a list of things that are half finished papers that I want to get through peer review. Um, I just don't have the time to do it since that's, uh, you know, I got to make money, got to make a living. I hope that answers your question. I appreciate that. Thank you for the answer. Thanks for the super chat. Digital Chomsky. Mm-hmm. Cade Welly. I am not shy to ask this question. I hope they're not shy to answer it. <clears throat> and thank you for the super chat. If this is too vulgar, then feel free to ignore it. But is there any truth that the Bible says anal sex isn't real sex and anal is fine to do before marriage? <laughs> I knew this Catholic girl who was wild. <laughs> no, there's nothing in the Bible about that. Nothing at all. Anywhere. Um, there's Paul has a a criticism of unnatural sex in which he's very clearly categorizes it as wrong. So, but he's talking about same gender, I think is what he's trying to say. Well, it, he's actually brought about it. It's unnatural sex. And he's, he's ta- he actually mentions women in the context. So, um, so it is possible he's referring to anal sex, but I think he's referring to all unnatural sex of any kind anal yeah. would be included uh, oral as well. Right. So any sex that is used for an unnatural purpose. And he's definitely a, sexist for procreation guy he's yeah, not he's not a sexist for pleasure a, guy yeah right. uh okay. so so th- so there, there's nowhere in the bible that i think sex is for pleasure is actually a, a problem mm-hmm. even the song of solomon uh which is very erotic uh even it does not have an ideological declaration that sex for pleasure is great uh right so <laughs> <laughs> interesting i'm not going to ask about the greek world i already know it, it, it goes down like King of what is Actually, it? A... You would be surprised. There is a lot of prudery uh, amongst the Greco-Roman elite, but it is not nearly to the scale of Christianity. But they were not as um, sexually libertine as you think. I mean, they, they were in practice. You know how everybody, like even you know the the most <laughs> righteous, supposedly righteous evangelical, is secretly know, checking child porn or something, snorting meth and having sex with guys in, in st- bathroom stalls. Yeah. Right? So, so, so there's, there's difference between practice and preaching. Right? Yeah. Um, so the, the actual preaching of, of even pagan philosophers is, is very restrictive, but not restrictive, but very, uh, they're not very pro sexual libertinism. Uh, that is not, that is not the environment. Uh, what an interesting but, question. Thank you for the answer. And thank you for the super chat, Cade. Pony No More says, how can we tell when the Gospels got their traditional authors assigned to them? Thank you for the super chat. Oh, that is a wonderful question, and I'd like to, <laughs> to address it. Awesome. Nice. I think the Gospels at a relatively early time did have attestations or attributions to Jesus' followers. And I would say that Luke is was somehow in the title. Um, uh, but it's a late a synoptic gospel. And certainly the gospel of John was identified with the beloved disciple at some point. I don't think it was in the earliest version, but I think it might have been in the second version. Mm-hmm. But Mark and Matthew are a different story. And our earliest witness to this is Papius, who's writing around the year 110. And he already knows that there's a gospel that's attributed to Mark but it and an I and a, a alleged eyewitness testimony from Peter. Peter preached in Aramaic. Mark translated into Greek, and um, but Peter preached in random order, and that's why Mark has a different sequence. That's what Papius says. Right? Papius says. But Papius also knows of two Gospels of Matthew, potentially more than that. Only one Gospel of Matthew survives. Because those two Gospels of Matthew disagreed in sequence and were apparently longer than Mark, um, Papias and his informant, apparently, John the Elder, attributed both of them to flaw, a, as flaw, viewed them as flawed Greek translations of Matthew's Aramaic original. Now, if we look at the Gospels, they do not carry originally the names of those apostles. Right. So why is it that we have those names attached to them? I think Mark, by the way, is a Latin name. It's not even a Greek name. Mm-hmm. And it is a very common standard Roman first name, Marcus. And um, it is secondary because it is simply transcribing the preaching of Peter. 
Matthew, on the other hand, was one of the 12 already in um, Matthew and Mark, um, in, in, in the Matthews we have. And so he's an authentic eyewitness. And then you have these two translators, both of whom botched it up. And Papias says he's going to want to put it correctly. So Matthew's name gets added to these Gospels because he's one of the 12. And so his witness is more direct than it is in Mark, who's simply recording tradition. And he's doing the best he could. If he says he did a damn fine job, but it's not as good as what would have been in the original Matthew. Like while you're saying this, there's so many like funny things in my head about how this literature was written. Fine, like he's keeping the tradition. Yeah. What do you mean? He's writing a, a literary fiction here, but I, I love how they paint it though. And well, so the Matthew becomes more important than Mark because he's one of the twelve. Right. And so then you have this attributed to the two then. Now, the Q document probably, in my view, is the other Matthew, and it may have been attributed to Matthew as well. Um, and at least Papias thought that they were coming from uh, the same transition tradition. But I want to go quickly to the beginning of Luke. Luke ignores, he knows Matthew, but the name Matthew only appears in lists of disciples. He is not a bearer of tradition. There's no recognition of use of, of Matthew. Matthew has a very has very little influence on the Acts of the Apostles, for example. He's he's really vanished. Um, there is a John Mark who's an informant, not only to the Jerusalem Church but also to Paul. So he's a more authentic bearer of tradition, and he's called a huperates, that is an assistant. At the beginning mm -hmm. of the Gospel, the God. Luke says he knows lots of people have created the agesis, that is, expositions of the things that have happened, and he's consulted them all, and they are they involve eyewitness testimony, think Matthew and Peter, but also who paratai, those who are assistants of the Logos. So you're the saying Lord. Luke knows Papias' traditional idea about Correct. Mark, yeah, that's and yes. that's very interesting. And that Mark is a Huperites. That is, he's a transmitter of the Petrine tradition. And he, if Peter goes to Mark, John Mark's house in the uh, Acts of the right. Apostles, yeah. and then becomes <laughs> a Huperites also to Paul. He's the more authentic transmitter of tradition. And what do we find in the synoptics? Luke is much more dependent on Mark than he is on Matthew. Yeah. So th there is this really clever use of names. Now, by the time Luke writes, he knows that Gospels have attrib been attributed to people in the Jesus circle. Mm -hmm. Luke also, by the way, is a Latin name, um, Lucas. Um, and and um, what was I going to say? And he's a part of the Pauline tradition. So now you have a Pauline gospel, but it has, he's done his research with earlier books, and he has John Mark as an informant, as a verite of the word. It's really quite fun. Wow. Gospel. Thank you so much. Uh, Nowhere Man, what's up? Thanks for the super chat. He says, I'm back with another dumb question. What is the mimesis origin of Jesus bringing Lazarus back to life in John 11? Oh, in John. Okay. Uh, <laughs> you want to start yeah, us out? I have a section on that in, uh, on the history of Jesus. And, and I, I had come to a realization about it on my own and then found a few other scholars had actually come to it. Actually, several have. Uh, when I did my research for it, I discovered others had figured it out too. Um, I think, well, I mean, what's going on there, I think, is, is John is reifying the parable in Luke. And he's doing it to criticize Luke. So Luke, Luke is, of course, it, that's the first time we ever hear of a Lazarus, which is interesting because La Lazarus, Eliezer, is actually a really common Jewish name. And we have no examples of it appearing anywhere in the Gospels or Acts, except for this one particular instance where we have the parable in Luke. And then we have the suddenly it becomes history in John. <clears throat> in Luke, of course, he says, uh, you know, Lazarus is the beggar who's at the It's a parable. It's not even true. Right. So it's not even a historical fact that Jesus is telling this as a tale to illustrate the gospel. And he says, you know, there was this Lazarus, he was this beggar. This rich guy kept ignoring him and kept ignoring him and didn't help him, didn't do anything for him. And then the rich guy dies, of course. And then the first Lazarus dies, you know, and then the rich guy dies. 
and then the rich guy's down in hell burning horribly and he, he's desperate for any like even a drop of water and uh La he sees lazarus up in heaven this is very convenient for a story that you could do this uh so he sees lazarus up in heaven in the bosom of abraham you know resting in the bosom of abraham uh in paradise and so he, he reaches out to lazarus and he says please you know put in a good word for me give me just a drop of water and the the response is like you had the you had the you or no he also says he says that but he also says <clears throat> when he's rejected he says okay well in that case would you send uh send lazarus back to go tell my brothers <clears throat> so that you know what's really going to happen so that they know and this they don't end up where i am yeah and they the response is like they have the they have the prophets they have the scriptures they should know and if they don't know John yeah. did not like that. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, John doesn't like this. And you know, John, if you read throughout John, or at least uh, the final redaction of John, so there's many recensions of John and it's been edited over time. So I'm speaking of the final version. Like when this got into John is a whole other separate question. But by the version that we have now, uh, there's John is repeatedly talking about signs and evidence. And this is what proves this. And so he's very concerned with uh, evidence can convince you. Uh, and in fact, even when it comes to Lazarus, at the end of the story of Lazarus, he says the resurrection of Lazarus was the thing that was convincing people to come to Jesus. And that was the thing that initiated the Sanhedrin to decide, the, you know, the elite to decide we got to get rid of this guy. We got to kill him. Um, so, so it's, that's uh, evidence is that important. So in yeah. John, in John, that's that he's using this to do the opposite of what Luke says. Luke says, Lazarus isn't going to come back. So it's almost a parable for saying, why doesn't God send people to like explain this to us? Because yeah. He already has the prophets. So it's a, it's an argument for why, why someone isn't being risen from the dead to like prove this. Whereas John says, no, Jesus freaking rose Lazarus from the dead and Lazarus convinced everybody to come to Jesus. And so you should come to Jesus too. It's the exact opposite message, right? So John is reversing it. The, the entire point of the parable by creating a real historical story that will convince you. Okay, so before we get your mimesis, I really want to know mimesis. So we'll strictly go to the what your mimesis is. Ladies and gentlemen who are watching, if you super chat and for whatever reason I miss it, help me out. Bear with me because I have a limitation on this and these guys can't just, oh, a two minute answer. Uh, some of this awesome. shit takes a little longer than two minutes because it's a lot more complex. So forgive me. I am absolutely trying to maintain and get everyone super chats. Please. Okay, uh, I agree with much of what Richard said about this text, and I think the author does know the story of Lazarus from the synoptic, from Luke. But I think that there's another fascinating tradition, uh, literary tradition, that lies behind it. Ultimately, that I he's think building on, right? I, that, this is compatible. With but yeah, I think it is, and uh, but I think it comes out of Euripides' Bacchae. Uh, Dionysus mm -hmm. is put in a prison. There are women in the chorus who are outside weeping. He is freed from the um, from the prison, and uh, <laughs> he's freed from the prison. And then uh, the women rejoice, and so on. This story in the Bacchae had already been imitated in the Acts of the Apostles with Paul's prison break right, yeah. at um, uh, Philippi. And what happens there? There's a woman named Lydia from Lydia. The chorus in the Bacchae are the Lydian women. Um, then Paul and Silas are put in prison. There's a convenient earthquake, as there is in the Bacchae. The women then rejoice, and, and there's hospitality. Now, in my uh, synopsis of the mimetic synopsis of the Gospels, I lay this out in more detail. But it, this, is, in my view, is an example of eclectic mimesis. On the one hand, there's a, a, a engagement with the story of Lazarus in the book in, in Luke. And in fact, it's not exactly in my reading what Richard says, because the Jews still don't believe in Jesus when, even though they see that Lazarus has come back. The from Jewish the dead, elite do, but the Jewish the elite. public do. It says they're that's they're worried about the fact that, that many are coming no, to believe. That, that's right. Yeah. So there's a, but the elite uh, still don't believe. Yeah. But then you have also these possible echoes to the Bacchae. Now these parallels by themselves may not be convincing, but when you see the evidence of the the Bacchae on the Gospel of John generally, generally that yeah. he's the the heavenly stranger who 
turns water into wine and tells people to eat his flesh and drink his blood. These are all Dionysian and they were recognized to be such in antiquity. In that case, this story appears in the earliest stratum of the Gospel of John, apparently, and isn't a later insertion. So maybe that's two minutes. No, that, that's more than two minutes, but wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> uh, antithetical, antithetical rants. Thank you for the super chat. What do you make of the research by Brian? It's actually Brian C. Marescu or Marescu, uh, and the spiked wine with psychedelics of the uh, Illusian cult and early church. So he, he wrote a book. It's really an interesting book. Yep. You've yeah. heard of it? Um, I mean, I think it's largely crank. Uh, <laughs> so you don't buy it? Um, yeah, it's no, it's not. It's not peer reviewed scholarship. So it's not really a, a usable work of scholarship uh, on the subject. There is a ton of usable scholarship on this. It's proper peer reviewed science and uh, stuff. I have a in, in on the history of Jesus. I have element 15 where I, I actually cite a lot of the scholarship on this. There's a huge variety of uh, ways that people can experience altered states of consciousness and full-on hallucination that don't involve psychedelics. In fact, the human, the human brain is actually naturally designed to do uh, to get into hallucinatory states. There's a lot of literature on this. It's in the anthropological field and sociology and so on, uh, and psychology and cognitive science. Mm -hmm. uh, so <clears throat> so you, don't, you don't actually need recourse to psychedelics. Um, psychedelics did exist, and people did use them, uh, but there's no evidence of that as a channel for hallucination in early Christianity. There's none. There's evidence for sleep deprivation. There's evidence for ritual chanting to create altered states of consciousness. Uh, there's evidence for schizotypal personalities, but there's no evidence of anyone using substances as an, en an enhancer for this. And they didn't need to. It, it culturally throughout the world, it's not necessary. Do you have a take on this? Uh, I haven't read the book, but I uh, emailed uh, back and forth with him. Um, I thought the argument had more to do with the use of hallucinogens in religious ritual, not right. necessarily Christianity. Mm -hmm. No, but oh, you I have see. it in the Lucis as right. well. Mm -hmm. You have the Dionysian cults otherwise. So The Delphic uh, Oracle would be a, a known example of this. So we do know that hallucinogens were used in uh, rituals in ancient in the ancient world, including in Judaism, by the way. So um, the fact that you have um, wine in the, uh, the Christian Eucharist, it's not that it's a hallucinogen but it may be uh, an altered spiritual state that uh, is evolved. It, yeah, it's an enhancer for being able to reach altered states of consciousness, same as, you know, all the other methods that you can do. So to that extent, I think it's useful. That's all. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, appreciate the super chat. Yaga Yo, thank you for the super chat. Why is Matthew put first in the Synoptic Gospels? So I think he's saying, out of all the Gospels, why do Not they put Matthew happened. first? Yeah. I'm going I'm gonna, I'm gonna to answer that. In Greek... The first words in Matthew are the book of Genesis of Jesus Christ. It's sometimes uh, <laughs> translated as the genealogy and so on. It evokes the beginning of the Pentateuch. And then what do you find immediately in Matthew is a uh, genealogy that goes back to Abraham. Mm. And so if you're looking at the beginning of the Gospels for something that hooks it up into the biblical, um, the, the, the canons already developing related to the Septuagint, say, um, having a gospel that says in the beginning and then begins with a genealogy is a dead ringer. <laughs> <laughs> would, that, would you just be echoing him? Awesome. Thank you for that super chat. Black Belt Monkey Song, thank you for the super chat. Is it um, is it possible, I think you mean to say, at all, to come up with a recreation of the passion of Romulus? Ooh, interesting question. Well, a recreation of it. A recreation of the passion well, of Romulus. Kitchen, obviously, right? So, but we have a lot of pieces that we could put together. I, I, mean, I think that probably Richard Miller's book probably has and all the pieces in it. Uh, so, um, uh, Dennis's student, Richard Miller, put, put out a book that uh, is it resurrection and tradition or yeah so it's resurrection and tradition richard miller you can find it it's a proper peer-reviewed academic book um he goes into all sorts of like uh, ascension narrative traditions and empty tomb traditions and so on and throughout uh pagan culture but he it, his main central focus is romulus so he does 
So you'll find everything, every possible reference to the Passion of Romulus, you'll find cited in Richard. And Gray's the most important sure. one is Livy, because then Livy informs some of the later stories. Yeah, of course. Uh, I mean, it's more important that Plutarch references the fact that there were p public passion plays. Uh, and the, the one thing that we really wish we had is Ovid's Fausti in that section, because mm -hmm. Ovid's Fausti is missing the, the six months that has the Romulus passion play. Mm. We would love to have that, because it means you would have a whole section poetically describing the passion play of Romulus. So we would love to have that. I mean, I often, and I mentioned in my book, I, I suspect the reason we don't have those six months of Ovid's Fausti is it was too offensive, that that was too similar to the passion of Jesus. Can't prove that, but it is suspicious. Interesting. In a pile of other suspicious <laughs> of ancient literature. Thank you. Alan Bird. Now we're, I'm trying to catch up. I don't know if I missed some of the super chat. I hope I did not. I swear on everything. You guys are coming in quick on me. So um, I might do like this. And that just means like time. Yeah. Just yeah. because I want to make sure everybody gets. Can. Alan Bird says, Richard, Paul's infamous 500 eyewitness texts refer to the apostles and also to the 12. What do you think he meant by these terms? Yeah. I mean, there's what I think. And then there's what we can prove. Right. So it's the two different things. Uh, uh, I mean, if you were to take a text as written and assume that's what Paul wrote, uh, and I have a blog on this uh, and, and the 500, you know, I have a, I have a blog on the 500. Uh, I, I think it's more like, I think that's a reference to what Luke mythologizes in the Pentecost uh, ecstasy. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's, I think Luke is creating that environment uh, for that. But I, I think originally, if you were to ask what I, what I suspect actually happened, I don't think Paul wrote uh, to more than 500 brethren. I think he wrote to the brethren at Pentecost. Uh, because he, Paul later in that same chapter refers to Jesus as the first fruits of the general resurrection. And Luke puts the first public announcement of the gospel on Pentecost. So I suspect that there was the the religion, the religion actually began that way at Pentecost. They had this great uh, experience that they decided was convincing them uh, that the religion was true. And that's when they began preaching the gospel. Publicly. So I think he just said, brethren, I don't think he said 500 brethren. And if you look at it, you know Luke is using the epistles of Paul. If, if Paul had said at the time that Luke was reading it, 500 brethren, Luke would have put that in there. Mm -hmm. Instead, he says 120, which is a symbolic number. It says 10 times the 12 tribes, right? Uh, so Luke just puts 120, sort of an arbitrary number that he just comes up with. Um, so I suspect that it originally said, and, and by the way, 500 and Pentecost in Greek look very similar. So right. it's an easy scribal mistake to screw one up together. Thank uh, you. So I suspect that's what happened and that would tie into Paul's later reference to the resurrection as the first fruits. Um, but I can't prove that, right? It's just, a, a, it's one of those things that, boy, it looks suspicious. Um, but either way, it was some sort of mass ecstasy. It wasn't a, it wasn't Jesus showing up and having dinner with them. It was some, some sort of magnificent experience like feeling Christ inside you or seeing a light in the sky or something ambiguous that they interpreted as a confirmation that this is Jesus appearing to us, verifying the, the gospel. I, I don't think, I think it was a more generic experience that they took as very meaningful and not, not what the gospels portray. Thank you. Skip Bosco says, if contemporaneous evidence for the existence of Jesus was discovered in what form or forms would it likely appear? And thank you for the super chat, Skip. I have a good answer to that. Um, all right. I've mentioned this many times. The Library of Herculaneum is still there. Uh, it's sitting, it's all the scrolls are charred. They're sitting under, you know, 500 feet of ash. Uh, we started excavating it in the late 19th century and, and gave up because we didn't have the technology to recover the scrolls from that state. We now have that technology and there are people talking about it. Uh, we could go back in and recover it. And they reburied it, by the way. So the library is still there. We know the owners got away with some of the scrolls because when the ash fall was coming down on Herculaneum, they started evacuating the library. Uh, and this is a private rich man's library. They started evacuating it and there was a staging area uh, in the courtyard. Uh, and so the library is deeper in. So they had a staging area and probably got away in the wagon with some scrolls. We don't know. But the staging area, they eventually they gave up and just skedaddled. And we've ex excavated to the staging area where they were starting to pile scrolls in the middle of the uh, courtyard. So there's a, not only are those scrolls still there, but there's uh, a whole library inside there somewhere. Uh, and this is 79 AD, Herculaneum. It's across the bay from where Pliny the, Young, uh, Pliny the Elder uh, commanded the naval fleet. And he died actually trying to rescue people from Vesuvius during this event, mm. uh, famously. Uh, and Pliny the Elder is also famous for writing histories. And we don't, and Tacitus, for example, relied on the history of Pliny the Elder. 
Uh, and Pliny the Elder wrote a history as an eyewitness of several imperial dynasties, including or imperial reigns, including Nero. Pliny was there during the 64 fire and burning of Rome. So there would be a detailed eyewitness account of what happened after the fire of Rome. So there's two possibilities. Now, I've argued that I think uh, some cer cer other sect of Messianic Jews were punished for the fire. And I think the, the line about Tiberius and stuff is an interpolation in Tacitus. But I could be wrong about that. And if I'm wrong about that, that would suggest the most likely source that Tacitus is using for Jesus is Pliny the Elder's history. And this would be someone in 64 detailing who these Christians were. And therefore, would, would, he would have access to eyewitnesses and to more. This would be one of the most reliable testimonies you would have to a, from a third party. Right. Outside of. To, right. To, to the origins of Christianity. So you could have. Pliny the Elder, like, giving you much more verifying evidence that, oh, yeah, there was this Jesus guy, and he was a big problem. We hated this guy, and then <laughs> Pilate got rid of him. So you, you could theoretically have a very a solid confirmation of the history of Jesus. And theoretically, I, I, I suspect that's not what you're going to find in the book. But the book very likely is there, because this is Herculaneum, a rich guy. Pliny the Elder is famous. He's right across the bay. Like, the odds that this is in there are high. So, Dennis, I want you to answer, but also we're getting a lot of people saying that your volume is low, and it's not your volume. You're super soft-spoken, and they don't uh, know that. No, no, yeah. no, no, no. They can't hear through that. No, no, no. That's not it. I'm recording. So, ladies and gentlemen, they have clip-on mics, but let me show everybody. So, all right, you guys, this is what I'm doing. I am recording high definition. You're only getting 720 pixels through the internet. So, everything you see here will come up on my Patreon later in super high quality. Including the audio, but here's the thing: I do want to try and get closer because I don't expect you to get your soft-spoken period, and so I don't need you. <laughs> yeah. So let me do this. Turn this. Try to get closer. Um, I can barely get you close to the screen. And you don't, you don't have game control. No, this is purely through yeah. the internet, and uh, fingers crossed this works. So please forgive me. It. All right. So okay, I'll try to talk that <laughs> Why are you yelling? My, my answer is entirely different. <laughs> I don't think we have to wait to find the recipe of the magic sauce so um, we can imitate uh, burgers. Uh, I think we have all the evidence we need. The problem is that we don't have sufficient methodologies that are fine-tuned and disciplined in order to mine the Gospels for the materials we already have. And my work for the last 10 years has been in large measure to refine that methodology so that we can excavate the Gospels behind the mythological levels which certainly are there and find not what I would call uh, bedrock, but we can find early, earlier constructions of the tell or of, of the site because we ah. have better excavation uh, tools. And um, this is not the place to talk about the esoteric tools, <laughs> the historical tools that are necessary. I think we have all the materials we need, but I don't think we have all the methodologies we need for proper excavation. So that would be a um, if, if pressed, I could tell you what I think some of those criteria are, <laughs> and they are not the ones that Richard Courier has uh, criticized. criticized in the past, which which have flaws, I actually with which them. I would agree. Your, your methods actually have a section of proving history where I actually validate the methodology. Uh, I, I'm not as confident that the methodology will get us the information that we want. Uh, so that's that's where that's I am on this. All right. So we, we adjusted the audio. Your long lost pal. Thanks for the super chat just to get my attention, literally to let me know the audio was low. All right. Indo, yeah. my friend says, is it true that the Bible has been preserved so well? Only one person of the original verses can't be that. known with no theological changes at all. Love you, bro. Or love you both. Yeah. Already 1% is still a really shitty signal, uh, by the way. Uh, so if you have... You know, we were talking about 80 to 100 verses. Let me restart this real quick here yeah. so I can actually get this on video, right? <laughs> I'm restarting it because you guys on the Patreon are going to see this later. 
You're going to go, thank you, Derek. This, this, continues, high quality. this continues uh, the same file. Is that what yep. All right, that's it. Uh, yeah, so the question is, uh, is it true that one per- only 1%, there's is only 1% error in the transmission of the New Testament? Um, uh, the, the 1% is kind of speciously derived because there's, one percent of what verses, books, words, letters. <laughs> so, so what your metric is is going to change that percentage, and also what you count as an error is going to change that. So, um, th- there's some books on this. Like the Ar- Airman did a debate on this that was actually pretty good. Uh, that, that he actually represented the statistics pretty well in it. Um, uh, that uh, that correct that. I mean, it, it's it's a questionable statistic, but let's assume that it's true. One one percent is only lost, uh, or is is signal uh, distorted, right? That's still a lot. That's too much to use the Bible as a reliable uh, source. And I, 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 it'll come up in a video that we recorded earlier. But uh, if that was instructions for a rocket, I wouldn't get on that rocket like that. If one percent, <laughs> a one percent error rate in in all of our instructions for building it, no, that's terrible. Um, and also, like you can have. If 80 verses, if that's about 80 verses, 1%, if 80 verses say something that are false compared to what the original said, um, that's a catastrophic loss in terms of trying to accurately reconstruct things. So it, it is a problem. But this is a common problem in history. We fully accept that this is the case. So we're, we're, we're used to poor signals on manuscript transmission. We, we don't go around claiming that this stuff is completely infallible and, and are, are, we're absolutely certain that everything in it is true. Right. Um, so, uh, so that that's one side of that debate, but uh, it, again, it depends on like what what do you care about? Which what what are you counting? What what do you need to be true in it? And even then, that one percent figure, in, even as smart as you can calculate it, only gets us back to the second century edition. That's exactly uh, right. That's so <laughs> that's really the most important thing is that David Trobus shows us this in the first edition of the, of the New Testament that all the manuscripts we have come from this one common edition that was edited together in and published together as a sort of anti-Martianite response. Any editing that that editor did to the original, We don't know behind. We have no manuscript evidence to check. None. There's no manuscript that goes back to anything prior to that. So, so we have nothing that goes back to the originals, really. We only have this edition. That's a big problem. I mean, that, that, that really limits your... If your intention is to do what the religious people want to do. It, for historians, it's annoying, but it, it doesn't completely destroy our craft because we can deal with probabilities and, and accept ambiguities. Um, but but yeah, the, trying to use that as a Christian apologetic is is catastrophic. Wow, I mean, very briefly, you have the same thing with the Homeric epics. The Homeric yeah. epics are written in the seventh century BCE. They become standardized in the third century BCE, and we know that those uh, philologians had multiple copies that differed from each other that have not endured. Yeah. So then you have what's a kind of Vulgate uh, of, yes. uh, of the Homeric epics, after which time the text becomes incredibly stable. So the same thing likely happened in, with the New Testament, that you had variants that no longer are able to be identified because you had a kind of a Greek Vulgate, that I know that sounds crazy, of say the Pauline letters and the four gospel collection. And after that time where you had that philological precision in putting these things together and making them authoritative, then the tradition becomes somewhat more stable. We have some survivals of uh, readings from an earlier time, but they really are relatively modest. So that the stability of the text is really a second century phenomenon and not probably a first century. Thank yeah. you. Wow. There's a lot. I love that. that. Yeah. That's <laughs> worse, worse. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Jay Crone says, what's your take on Paul? Was he real? If so, what was his goal? Wow. That's a broad question. I, I know people ask this of me a lot because I know there are some mythicists who tried to deny the historicity of Paul. I have an article on it. You can check my blog. The, uh, why do we think Paul exists? The historicity of Paul. You can check that out as to why. I think it's 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 an improbable it's not an impossible hypothesis it's just a very improbable hypothesis that paul did exist and his goal was as he states uh he wants to spread the gospel i think he agrees with the moral social message of christianity or he came to agree with the moral social message of christianity and realized to sell it he has to sell the gospel right mm-hmm. well if somebody wanted to create a paul they did a pretty bad job <laughs> this is actually that's a summary of some arguments i make yeah yeah yeah, yeah. some of that 
a real inventor of Paul would have done different things, uh, is to put it in a more charitable way. Yeah. Uh, they would have different things than, than has been done. So uh, thank you so much for the answer. Thanks, Jay, for the super chat. I appreciate you, bro. Digital Chom uh, Chomsky is back, and he says, I have no idea if PH is crank. Uh, how uh, actually, Proving History. I assume it's okay. Uh, so proving I History is peer-reviewed. Uh, actually, my contract with Prometheus Books, I insisted that they not publish it unless they get it peer-reviewed by a professor of mathematics and a professor of biblical studies. So this is what so he said. had two peer reviewers, and so it's actually peer-reviewed work. Okay. He says, I have no idea if, if uh, Proving History is crank. How many top Bayesian scholars in philosophy, logic, math, probability theory say that uh, Proving History is serious? At least five big names? Uh, I, they have to read it first, right? So they can't have an opinion on it. They can't have a valid opinion on it. They haven't read it. Uh, I think there's an insistence on avoiding it, uh, largely because Bayesian epistemologists aren't engaging with history as a field. Uh, there's some exceptions, like uh, Tucker, for example. And these are Tucker actually agrees with the fundamental theory of proving history that uh, history is Bayesian. Uh, and uh, he's a philosopher of history, it's, it's field. Uh, and uh, there's Wallach uh, did a um, uh, did a peer reviewed uh, study of the transition from uh, old, in Old Testament studies from uh, kind of kind of like believing the Exodus story versus Canaanite origins theory, which is now the mainstream view that the whole Exodus is made up. Uh, that was a huge shift in biblical studies. Where now the main the mainstream is the Moses story, the Exodus story is all myth, and the Jews were actually just Canaanites that were native to the region and just conquered the locally. Um, and he did a Bayesian analysis and showed how Bayes' theorem explains why the the actual field of biblical studies shifted. Uh, and that's a peer-reviewed study. And I actually have an article on it on my blog. Uh, so people who are paying attention uh, are actually doing this and actually involved in this. And in Proving History itself, I cite archaeologists uh, in peer-reviewed literature using Bayes' theorem and, and proving it for the study of history uh, through archaeology. I think the problem is it's mostly being ignored. Because historians are afraid of math, they, they don't. They they're terrified of the idea that, that anything they're doing might be mathematical, and that they have to learn math. Uh, they shouldn't be, but this is an American disease, largely. Uh, the, the way our schools teach math make people hate math and fear it, rather than be excited about it and, and find how valuable and useful it is. Uh, so that's a problem. Uh, so I think there needs to be more attention to uh, Bayesian, especially because history is all about probability. So if your entire field is based on probability arguments, you really need to understand the logic of probability. Uh, and if it's not Bayes' theorem, you need something else. So that's that's one of the mm -hmm. points I make. It's like, if you're going to reject this, you've got to replace it with something. So what's your replacement, right? Uh, so uh, so that that's my response on that. But but it's important to note that proving history is actually a peer-reviewed work. So it's, it's not just some random self-published thing. Real quick, um, guys, and audience, forgive me. Um, it re because we don't go quick enough and stuff. I, I, I lost, I think, three, maybe four of your guys' Super Chats. It's the, the so next... throw the question back in, not Super yeah, Chats. They can at me, at MythVision. I'll keep an eye out on the there specific one. But someone needs to let me know that these are actual Super Chats, because if not, so you'll just throw... Super Chat any question, and it hasn't been answered yet, do it at Derek. I don't so know this is the next one I see, right? So if your Super Chat was before your long-lost pal here on the Super Chat, Try to get it to me, and I'll keep going down, hitting the super chats because it updates on. Those actually show to anyone, right? Streamyard's ridiculous, right? huh? Let's just go in there. Go in there and see if it pops up, and and we'll look before your long lost pal, and um and and go on YouTube. But while you do that, um, I'm gonna ask some questions. What do you make of the apologetic against uh, adoption of pagan motifs like dying and rising gods? <laughs> we did a video on this, by the way. For example, Jews didn't adopt pagan traditions is what they'll say. So I'll let you, I'd love to have you start with this dying and rising God. And like the Jews wouldn't use pagan uh, tradition. Um, that is really, unfortunately, an ignorant question. And I don't want to insult. <laughs> no, no, no. So great. He's actually, or she's asking, because some other Christians are saying that, I suspect, is what they probably. We have so much evidence of uh, cultural assimilation of Jews into the Greco-Roman world that in fact, um, almost all forms of Judaism have some form of Hellenism um, in the first in the first century, um, and I can give examples. In Third Maccabees, you have uh, imitations of the Bacchae. In Fourth Maccabees, you have imitations of Greek poetry. 
in Tropic, you have uh, imitations of um, uh, the uh, of the Odyssey. You have it also in the Testament of Abraham. Philo cites uh, Plato over and over again for insights into his exegesis of um, of the Bible. Josephus interrupts his narrative of the, of the Jewish tradition in the Antiquities and embellishes it with imitations of the Iliad and the Odyssey. To think that we have a Judaism in the first century BCE to the second century CE that is insulated from Greek uh, influence is really unfortunately an un uneducated judgment. Mm. Wow, and that goes for dying and rising God motifs, I suspect. Oh, uh, it goes... Um, <laughs> It goes in everything. To know, uh, <laughs> exempt. Wow. Well said. Thank you, your long lost pal. I'm going to continue as if nothing happened and uh, see if we can't pull up like a YouTube link or something and see what I missed. Okay. So, I'm in. I can see it now. Okay. Before your long lost pal, can you see the chat and go up? Or okay. All right. What's before that, if you don't mind? Uh, I, well, that's a good question. So let's see. Um, you see Cade Welly. So we have. We're gonna get Cades here in just not, a second. There might be others up up, up further, uh, okay. but the one that I caught up to now is: What do you make of the apologetic against adoption of pagan motifs That's like exactly dying and rising? Did. Did. Okay, so you just did that one. Yep. So scroll. Oh, up. I see. You want yeah, further? Yeah, it cut you off, huh? But you so, do, go back there and don't miss any. <laughs> well, well, you I'm don't want to miss any. I'm, that not, yeah, I'm just trying to make. Just sure. Let me go further. All right, so. Kate Wellies next, and she's the one super chat. I do have one other question. When we have time. Okay. So, Cade, thank you so much. I love asking this question to experts. So, let me ask Are there any literal jokes in the Bible? Or is there anything that looks like it could have been a joke, but the nuance has been lost in translation or lost due to time? I don't think we have jokes as a genre in the New Testament. But that doesn't mean we don't have comedy in the New Testament. And there's a difference. And it's there. We also certainly have witticisms that uh, a reader um, can enjoy while reading. One of my favorites is the story of uh, Eutychus and the Acts of the Apostles, who is listening to the Apostle preach, and the preaching is so boring, he falls out of a window and dies. Oh, yeah. And his soul stays in him. Paul says, Oh, don't worry, if the soul's still in him. I'm going to go back and preach, and at breakfast I'll leave. They leave, and they take him up, and his name is Lucky. Well, El Eutychus, well, come on. This is uh, the El Painor of the Odyssey, and that itself is kind of a funny story. So <laughs> I think we need to be alert. By the way, the difference between tragedy and in the tragedy, things end badly, and in the comedy, they end positively. And when Mark calls his gospel good news, he's announcing from the outset that it's a comedy and not a tragedy. Thank you. Appreciate that. I think you guys will both agree on that one. Cade, you rock. Thank you so much for the super chat. Antonia Miranda, thank you for the super chat, says, Could Christianity have been manufactured in the second century since all texts come from Egypt? Is there an attestation of Jesus in the first century? We don't know all texts come from Egypt. That's not the evidence of that. Um, and the could have is a possibility question. So anything's possible. Uh, it's not probable. Uh, the evidence seems pretty strong that these texts originate. Many of these texts originate in the first century. Awesome, awesome. All right, all right. Thank you, Antonio. I hope that answered your question there. Not sure if it's satisfied your, you know, <laughs> well, that's you know, the thing about you scholars. Probable text that attests to the Christian movement in that earlier period. I would include the Jewish epistles and Papias, which is an extra biblical text, and um, the um, the social identification of things uh, of a movement that comes right after the Jewish war. So I think one could make a catalog of evidence that really is quite long. In Judas Priest, um, I'm noticing I missed yours. Um, he says, uh, 
so why did Luke miss the boat on the story of Jesus walking on water? Um, because it's so outrageous and it's um, it's so obviously dependent on uh, epic. He already has Jesus calming the storm um, in the earlier period. And this uh, happens in a what's called the larger omission in Luke, where there's a large section of Mark that is missing in Luke because he wants to avoid duplication. This story is largely a duplication of the stilling of the storm. The, feel, the feeding of the 4,000 also is missing in Luke, and it's largely a duplication of the feeding of the 5,000. We have other examples <laughs> of duplications. So Luke has a big project. He's got the Acts of the Apostles to go for. And by the way, the limitations on how big a papyrus can be for a consumption in antiquity is a kind of a physical limitation on how some long some text can be. Now, people can uh, put together uh, other uh, choirs in a codex where they can add papyri to a scroll, but even so, there are some physical limitations. And also, it becomes boring if you think he had imitations of Mark in that section, again, duplicating this, this work. It really is a d diversion from his literary task. Right. Mm. And, and we talked about that, how they would do their own creativity. Uh, thanks for that super chat. Indo, I missed yours as well. So I'm, I'm, I'm catching up and I'm going to get to the current ones. Uh, question was, why don't other Jesus texts like Gnostic texts, like the Gospel of Judas, uh, uh, taken seriously historically? Judas was written only 40 to 50 years after John was written. Well, I think we all have a uh, historical probability criteria. And when we run it by the, uh, the, the Gospel of Judas, it doesn't uh, meet the criteria very comfortably. As to why we don't need it earlier. Or, or take it more seriously. Well, take it yeah, more why seriously. Aren't, it's only 40 to 50 years after John was written. So why aren't we taking the Gnostic text <laughs> yeah, well, of the that, Gospel that's, of Judas? That's the Sorites paradox, right? Uh, is, is you keep adding a grain. It's a hill. It's a hill. You keep adding a grain. At some point, it becomes a mountain. But but every time, it's still a hill. When does it become a mountain? Why does one grain make a difference between a mountain and a hill? So if you keep pushing it up, well, it's only fifty years after this. Well, it's only fifty years after that. Well, it's only fifty. It's only fifty years. But yeah, but it's like <laughs> now we're like one hundred fifty years after the beginning. It's still <laughs> half a century. <laughs> right. Interesting. It's good. also still half a century. It's a good question yeah, yeah. though to kind of get the point. Yeah. 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 But is it also it's kind of, of is some of the stuff in it? Outrageous. I'm going to back up so I can make sure I can get both of you in the screen because you guys are hanging barely in the screen over here. Like, oh my gosh. Okay. What? Do we have a super chat? Can, can I interrupt or do we need something? Do we have to do now? Did you want to say something? No, no. I, I Okay. I, I No, I just, I want to jump in when there's room. Um, so I, I'm communicating with a friend of mine uh, who's also in watching and, and, okay. and you, you had misread a question from someone else earlier that, uh -oh. that, that didn't make any sense. And so uh, it was about libertarian theology, is okay. what you said, right? And so I, was, I don't know what that's a reference to. Um, no, it was, so this is a paraphrase, this isn't the exact, but this is a paraphrase of what the question was supposed to be, I think. Um, since you're a dirty socialist like me, what do you think of liberation theology? Liberation. And what is your favorite liberation text? And then mine is, but he I said remember, he remember what the one that he said. But uh, oh, so that was yeah. It. yeah, so liberation theology, and you did kind of touch on that a little bit. Yeah, 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 so. yeah. Okay, Gnostic informant super chat. Thank you, Alexander. Romance, miracle birth, son of God, knows his death, fulfills prophecies, dies in the month of April at Paschal Moon, at almost exactly thirty-three years, and he's got the little holding his chin like. What do you guys think? Sorry, I was... Alexander Romance, Miracle Birth, Son oh. of God, Knows His Death, Fulfills sure. Prophecy, Dies in the Month of April at Paschal Moon, almost exactly 33 years. Oh, well, I mentioned before the similarities between the birth of Alexander and the birth of Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew. And uh, the importance of the Alexander Romance has less to do with um, direct mimesis one way or another, but it shows that people were perfectly willing to mythologize historical characters yeah. and to do so according to certain rhetorical tropes that are going to appear also in some of the lives of the emperors. So this is a very interesting um, 
um, alternative text. The other thing is that people say that Luke uh, Mark couldn't be sophisticated because his uh, Greek is mundane. Well, take a look at the Alexander Romance. Um, it is not a sophisticated Greek. It really is rather pedestrian. And yet it's a very sophisticated and fascinating uh, mythologizing narrative. So it shows that this kind of composition in the ancient world to venerate heroes uh, was common. But attempts have been made to make uh, uh, more literary connections between the Alexander Romans. And by the way, the Alexander Romans appears in several versions. So it's not just one thing. Uh, that is, it, it, it has several recensions, and they sometimes differ from each other. But quite apart from that, it's hard to draw a direct literary line between them. But you can draw a rhetorical, mimetic line. Interesting. Thank you. Did you want? Did you have anything to add on that? Yeah. Good. All right. So this was the earlier question Alan Bird asked. Thanks, Alan, for the super chat, man. I'm catching up, everybody. I'm catching up. My earlier question to Richard was, why does Paul refer to the twelve and also to the apostles? In the right. 500 witness text, are they not the same? Okay, so that that is that is a whole different question, right? Yeah. So because this gets to the question of is verse seven even original? Because it seems like a tack on. Yeah. Why are you saying uh, both? Yeah. yeah. Especially since you're throwing James in there, that that seems like so random. Uh, like, what is the purpose of that? Uh, so I I mean I personally suspect that that's an interpolation. I don't think James. I don't think Paul wrote the and James and all the other apostles and last of all to me. I think he just said and last of all to me, but. Um, but it's possible that Paul wrote that. Uh, and, and if he did, it clearly indicates that there were more apostles, as obviously Paul is an example, Apollos would be another example, than the 12. The 12 are just the original quorum, the, the original council of 12 who represent the 12 tribes, who, who, who Peter convinces to endorse him in his, his new mission. Uh, and then there are others who have the vision, and these are the more, there are more apostles than 12. Even the Gospels say there are more apostles than the 12. Um, I mean, they claim 70. And I'm sure that's just an arbitrary, sort of theologically significant number, and I doubt there was actually 70. Um, but I, obviously, you can tell from Paul that there are more apostles than the 12. Um, but we can't really get back at the actual, what was going on at the beginning, as to how many apostles there were, how were they becoming apostles, who was endorsing them, could any of them have been excommunicated, was that possible? Uh, you know, Paul's talking about Christians being made anathema for preaching the wrong kind of Jesus. Uh, so we, there's so much that we have tantalizing hints of that we don't have actual good on the ground intel about what's hmm. actually going on. Going on the time. I think you have a friend who really wants to get your attention. Digital Chomsky. Thanks Chomsky, for the super yes. chat. He says, what number? All caps. Philosopher, math, math, um, I think mathematician, probability, theory scholars. So he's talking about oh, I see. on your work proving <laughs> history. What number? Uh, well, I, I mentioned some. So you can go to my blog and look for uh, the Wallach article. Uh, that's an example of it. Uh, you can look for the Tucker's book uh, on uh, historical knowledge. Uh, is make the same point. Um, what? I'm counting. Oh yeah, two. Uh, so th <laughs> those are the two, and then of course the peer reviewer, the mathematician. Well, both peer reviewers. The my both peer reviewers for that. Uh, so. Um, who obviously by, you know, double blind methods have to be uh, anonymous, but still. Um, so those are the ones that I know. Uh, the rest all comes to like, who's going to read it? Get get one of these guys to read it and then comment. Let them on. critique you. Yeah. 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 Hey, you're, you're open. You want it to happen. Mark Smith, thank you. Yeah, how important was ending infant circumcision as a motivation in writing the New Testament? Also, if you don't mind controversy, I'd like to hear your personal view on whether it should be legal. What should be legal? Um, so infant should, circumcision. Yeah, should, yeah, oh, I see, I see, I see. Right. That's so how important was ending infant circumcision as a motivation in writing the New Testament? Yeah, I, I actually, I wouldn't object to outlawing it. Um Without, unless you have a specific religious objection, like make make people actually declare it as a religious thing, rather than just do it as an automatic uh, custom. Um, the, there's a there's an important distinction to make here. So if you look at female genital mutilation, for example, there's actually three levels of it. Uh, there's the the hardcore like removal of the clitoris, which is like horrific mutilation, and that would be the equivalent of cutting the top of the penis off altogether. Uh, and then there's uh, trimming of the labia, like hardcore trimming of the labia, which is closer to male circumcision. 
And then there's ritual just pricking, like a, like a slight removal of something just to claim that you remove something uh, that's very trivial. Um, and all of that's pointless. There should, we shouldn't be doing any of that stuff. But uh, with regard to male circumcision, removing the foreskin is unnecessary and excessive, but it is not as severe as the, the worst form of female uh, genital mutilation, which is literally, that would be removing the glands of the penis, which is basically just completely removing the sexually uh, sensitive part of the penis altogether. Wow. That would be horrific mutilation by comparison to, or so, so it's not, it's, it's more uh, ambiguous, right? So male circumcision is more ambiguous than uh, the thing that people talk about as the most horrific version of it. That said, I still don't think we should be doing it. Uh, and, and I think there should be more, we should be forcing people to make a religious objection positively. So technically, and I don't know if you'd agree with this, a Jew who's proclaiming this is their ritual and their practice and their religion and they're born that way, you're not objecting to that. What that you're saying is, is uh, right, I know you don't me. agree with that. I, I don't think morally they should. Uh, right. But in terms of maintaining a civil society, I think that is a that is a, a place where we don't really have to force that issue uh, in order to maintain civil society. But you're saying I would everyone, argue, Joe Schmidt. I would argue persuasively to try and get rid of that tradition over time. Uh, but using force to stop it, I think, would cause more problems than uh, uh, than money. I think it's a superb answer, but I would say that from the perspective of social identity theory, what happens with male circumcision is that uh, identity in the community is determined by a male right and not a right that's for women as well. And I'm not endorsing female circumcision. So it, it by itself it is a gender discriminating uh, uh, you know uh, operation and what do we do with a non-binary understanding of gender sexuality right <laughs> and so we've got to factor that in but there's something else male circumcision is a way of having a high boundary maintenance between the Jewish community and its neighbors which is imposed on children before they have a decision about whether they want to be in that community voluntarily. Right, yeah. And then they are marked for themselves as members of this community and not to another. And I think that there are, I agree with Richard that we should not be imposing abolition at this point of male circumcision. But I would hope that the Jewish community would rethink its way of understanding its social identity in a in a in a world that has non-binary gender thinking and more fluid social boundaries. Interesting. Yeah. Thank you for that. Christianity considered. Thank you for the super chat. I missed your earlier one. You said and you said thoughts on Herman Dettering's arguments for thinking that all of Paul's letters were written in the second century. I apologize. I really couldn't control what happened. So. Anyway, gentlemen. Oh, uh, well, I have a blog article on that. That's the historicity of Paul. Uh, it, it addresses that, uh, not to the satisfaction of Dietering fans, but otherwise. Um, I, I think his theory depends on an extremely elaborate system of epicycles, uh, this, this extremely elaborate theory of interpolations in the letters of Paul, uh, and a bunch of other hypotheses that, that don't have evidence on top. I think it's too elaborate a hypothesis for, with too little evidence for it. Not necessary. Uh, yeah, so that that's my conclusion. Uh, not not to the point. I mean, to point out his work is very interesting, and I like a lot of his commentary. But uh, the theory doesn't hold up. It, it, in terms of probability analysis, there's just not enough there to make it. Up. All right, thank you for answering that. So you have an article pertaining to it. Unclean hero, super chatty said Jesus was a historical figure was and a real that. person based on all standards for determining historicity. <laughs> How do you feel about that, Richard? I know he's talking to you. Um, and then we'll all standards. That's the, that's the primary question. What standards are we talking about? And what premises are we plugging into this? So that, that's what my book is about uh, on the history of Jesus. Uh, proving history, that book is about the standards. Are the standards being applied in Jesus studies? Even standards that historians use. There's a lot of standards that are used in Jesus studies that are not. They're kind of made up just for the Jesus studies field. And some that are legitimate that are actually are used outside the field, but they're misapplied. They're misused in the Jesus studies field. And that's what chapter five of Proving History shows, uh, is that they're using the methodology wrong and some other methods are kind of made up. Uh, and uh, in On the History of Jesus, I try to come up with as most objectively vettable method possible. 
uh, that bypasses all of those questions so that you can just go right at it. Uh, and so you can actually evaluate, does it hold up or not? And if not, like, what, how do you change the probabilities? What would you, what probabilities would you make different in my uh, assignments of probability and why? And I think that breaks it down much more simply so that you can actually get at what is the actual question we're trying to answer here. Uh, so that that's actually what the book is for. So on the historicity of Jesus is the one to go to and take it seriously. Like when you get to the ends of each chapter and I assess probabilities, like ask yourself, should I, should a different probability be there? And if so, why? Uh, that's the way to go about it. That's the way we would react to this and maybe come out, come out with a book that would actually come up with better probabilities and convince me that they're right. I would love to see that. So, And then Dennis, you are a histor historicist and they say, and just to repeat it again, Jesus was a historical figure and a real person based on all standards for determining historicity. How do you feel about that? Well, it depends on what you mean by all standards. Yeah. How you manage it. You don't have to have all standards satisfied. You need to have a few that create enough probability that you would say there's a historical character as opposed to a mythological one. I think in that in that case, Richard and I differ a great deal because I think there is ample evidence for a historical figure, but it doesn't satisfy all the criteria that people have tried to apply to the historical Jesus. Nor does it satisfy all the historicists who want a particular Jesus yes. to come out of the analysis. Yeah. What kind of Jesus are we <laughs> dealing right. with? Yeah. 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 The Jesus that I think is most reliable is the one that can be demonstrated by what's called reverse priority in the synoptic gospels, where later gospels have preserved earlier tradition that creates a corpus that's really very interesting. It is not Christian. It is Jewish for Jews who think Jesus is pretty cool. And it gets used by Christians because with this mythology of the, um, the suffering savior and the so on the risen Christ and so on, Jesus would be shocked to have read the Gospel of Mark okay. if I'm right. Yeah. But that does, and so I'm a historicist who is skeptical of the, the Jesus of the synoptics, but with the proper tools again, I think one can excavate beyond the mythologies and find enough um, evidence for historical Jesus. That said, I don't think we have can have confidence of any one saying that comes from Jesus. Mm. But we have a posture and a presence and a uh, memory, to some extent, uh, of a character who is really so different from the, the gospel Jesus that it probably comes from this story. Thank you. Two different people, two different positions. Mm -hmm. um, the Mythic Life, thank you for the super chat. Hi, it's Kristen Hood. Again. Hi, Hi uh, Kristen. Welcome, Kristen. Thank you for the super chat. Where do you think Christianity would be without the Jewish war? Oh, God. Or Jewish wars. Sorry, plural. I mean, true. That that actually also is true. Uh, so there's multiple Jewish wars. Um, wow, that is a, that's if, a challenging contrafactual, actually. <laughs> And uh, contrary to a lot of historians who hate contrafactual history, I think contrafactual history is an important way of trying to understand actual history. Uh, you can't really understand your causal theories if you don't understand how if causes were different, outcomes would be different. Uh, I think historians sometimes fail at that understanding. Um, but that one's a tough one to actually think about. Uh, Let me take a swipe back. Yeah. Mark is the first person to have a full-blown narrative of the life of Jesus and his writing in the aftermath of the Jewish war. And he's identifying the cause of the Jewish war with the inability of Israel to accept the teachings of Jesus. In order to create a narrative of Jesus' death, the author appeals to the death of Hector at the end of the Iliad whose death anticipates the fall of a great city. And he's a, a young person who dies uh, un, uh, unceremoniously. Uh, Achilles gloats over his corpse when he kills it. Three women lead in the laments, uh, watching from afar. A father named uh, Priam has to rescue Hector from Achilles and bring him back for burial. Uh, Jesus is uh, mourned by three women who watch from afar, a man named Joseph, 
maybe the same name as his father rescues the corpse, but the difference is that Jesus rises from the dead with hope, whereas Hector is buried, and the, the reader knows that uh, Jesus would, uh, that Troy would fall. Now, if that's the case, without the Jewish war, you may not have a narrative of the death of Jesus. And that is pretty fundamental to the Christian understanding. And so I actually think the, uh, the Jewish war was the social political uh, catalyst that uh, made Mark pursue the Iliad as a model for the death of the hero before the fall of the city. Hmm. Yeah, that's, that, that's a good example of how it could have had an impact. I, I'm undecided. I'm not really sure. I think it's more. It would be more important to have taken Paul away in the Jewish War. Like if Paul didn't do his thing, I think Christianity would have faded away and it would have been gone. It would probably wouldn't even show up in our extant sources. I would suspect uh, by now. Um, Can I play a scenario and see what you guys think of it? While in the vein of this question, because she's part of some of my Facebook groups and really a brilliant mind on so many things. Mm -hmm. She's trying to think, you know, and yeah, yeah. and uh, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, Let's suppose the Jerusalem war did not happen in 70. The temple did not fall. Therefore, the Jerusalem church is still That's in right. power. Yeah. Do you think Paul was just so persuasive and so uh, aggressive that he would have? I don't think that's the way to put it. It's not that Paul was so aggressive. It's that he had a, a wider selling product. Right. So like if, if your market is Jews, you've got a cap on how many people you can convert. And most of them aren't going to convert. Right. Most Jews are going to stick with traditional Judaism. So mm -hmm. your 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 market saturation is extremely low. It's a tiny percentage of the population. And then you're done. That's it. That's as far as you're going to go. Uh, you would just be like the 13th sect of Judaism in order of, of, of interest. Right. Um and so yeah, there's all these like lists of Jewish sects and there's like a ton of them, but uh, Christianity would just be a really minor one way, way, way down there. Um, but Paul made it easy for Gentiles to convert mm -hmm. and made it attract. And it was already, there were attractions Judaism already had to, to Gentiles. So his church could grow much more quickly just because of the idea that he allowed it to happen. And he got the Jerusalem church on board with letting it happen. So that uh, so it would just grow of its own, right? So it wasn't really dependent on Paul's charisma necessarily. Uh, it was dependent on Paul, like convincing the Jerusalem church to endorse it and thus allow it to uh, foster and grow. Uh, but it was just the popularity of the religion became just like any other religion that was becoming popular. It would grow at the same rate as Mormonism and other religions that we know throughout history. Um, so, so I wouldn't see the Jewish war necessarily accelerating or stopping that. So I, I can't see it necessarily as having an effect, but Dennis makes a good point. Like if the war hadn't happened, there's certain transformations in the religion into the sort of visceral historicist narrative. It's like King Arthur. It's the difference between would there have been a movement for the unification of England without a King Arthur legend? Uh, I don't know, actually. Right. Because that was very central to like getting people on board with fighting wars to unify England and create a quote unquote united kingdom. Right. Yeah. I want to take a um, swipe at this again. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and I definitely do. Um, I'm going to jump to some super chats here in a second. Go ahead and take a swipe. And then I want to mention, I want to ask one more question in the vein of this, if you don't mind. Well, the Jewish war also caused the diaspora. Of, right. Uh, Christians who were not a part of the Pauline circle. One thinks yeah. of the Johannine tradition, for example, That's a good point, the too. author of the, of the Apocalypse, the growth of the Syrian church uh, probably is uh, you, you have uh, refugees from the Jewish war. You also have an enduring uh, paranoia about the Roman power. So yeah, that, that's, I that's think the impact, the impact of the, the, truth, the, uh, the Jewish war is really quite profound. Yeah, okay, real, good points. Yeah. Yes or no? This is my, my personal question. I, I'm undecided. I really no, don't know. Okay. I, I, here's the question, though. It's a different one. Is do you think there was a split from the uh, the? Uh, well, do you okay. think Paul finally said, "Screw these well, guys"? There's another big important difference is the rise of anti-Semitism in the Christian Church. The Jewish War did have a lot to do with that. Uh, so, so, so you could think of the whole future course all the way up to the Holocaust. You could tie that back to the Jewish War, mm. really. I mean, not through a deliberate, like not intentionally, but I mean, just through the the, the pool extreme. balls, right? The pool balls bouncing. Uh, that's what happened, basically, uh, tragic as it is. 
Well, thank you for that super chat, Kristen. I appreciate it. Mark Smith says, thank you for the, uh, for the answer to my question about circumcision. But I was also wondering about the New Testament authors. Did they seem to care very much about circumcision? That's the question. Yeah. Okay. The answer is no, not for Jews. The issue is whether the Gentiles needed to be circumcised to be eaten with. And so it has to do with social identity merging. And it's quite clear that Paul is okay. I am circumcised among the circumcised. I'm uncircumcised among the uncircumcised. It's this right that divides the potential community from its growth and the cohesiveness. So there's no objection to circumcision if Jews wish to do it. And Paul himself is circumcised and is not apologetic about it. Mm. But to make it a requirement for Gentiles is hardly something that you want as a as a banner for evangelists. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if, if people aren't aware, like the, the universal practice of circumcision that happens now is actually a very, very recent phenomenon in human history. It's not... Like the default, we're going to circumcise all babies. That that I don't remember when that started, but it's not much older than 100 or 150 years. So interesting. Turn the light. Just trying to make sure we got you guys clearly, because the phone light it picks up makes you brighter. This thing's auto, so it don't matter. All right. Well, I'm going to screw you up because I'm going to go to the restroom, but I'll be right back. All right. All right. <laughs> so um, I'll ask the question out loud. Thanks, Mark, for that super chat. Read between the lines. Um. He says, what would it look like if the Maccabees had lost? Um, I think they're still... <laughs> That's a, 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 <laughs> another trick question. I think the processes of Hellenization would um, continue one way or the other. The victory of the Maccabees um, would have slowed that, but I don't think it would have um, slowed it very much. In fact, the books of the Maccabees also have imitations of Greek literature. So um, even when you uh, are happy about the Maccabean uh, successes, uh, it didn't halt a Hellenization. Well, okay. It makes me wonder, too. I mean, do you think if they would have lost, what do you think the Jews would have thought uh, apocalyptic wise? I think it played a huge role, didn't it? In the way that they were viewing things apocalyptic, like we're going to get the national God's going to come and the end is going to happen. All of this stuff. No, I don't think I'm qualified to. Okay. Now waiting on carrier. No, no biggie. I'll uh, ask his here in just a second. What would happen if Maccabees had lost? <laughs> Yeah, what do you think? Another, what do you think? Kind of kind of yeah. Well, that's, a, that's a tough one, actually. Um, the Maccabees have lost? Good Lord. Because uh, that, that affects a lot of history, um, including including the progress of the Roman Empire, right? Because they would be fighting different people and they'd have different allies in the region uh, come the time when they start taking over the East. Uh so that, that's one where I'd have to sit down and start looking at the, I would have to go reading the military historians, uh, the modern contemporary historians about the Roman conquest of the East and how, how much uh, Jewish alliance with the Romans actually, which actually happened, uh, would have affected that. Or versus the Seleucids being totally in control uh, and uh, being stronger, therefore, and therefore more able to resist Rome. Uh, I can't off the fly uh, answer the question. So wow, <laughs> that was my answer. Yeah, he's like, I'm not qualified. <laughs> um, Digital Chomsky, your best friend, has a question. A giant scholar panel to say if crank carrier is crank. What that means? What is a giant scholar panel? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, obviously, he's not a fan of mythicism. I, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> so. I get it. Uh, it was interesting. Uh, I think that's the same person who said establishes you're not a crank, right? <laughs> My book on the historicity of Jesus is a peer-reviewed book by a respectable uh, academic publisher in biblical studies. So, um, so by his own standards, I'm not a crank. And, uh, he should change his question uh, direction, I guess. Interesting. 
read between the lines super chatted i you didn't have any um any question or any comment i appreciate the super chat my friend i really do um yeah i don't see any follow-ups on that and i hope i haven't missed anybody i really really did not mean to since last i got on yeah and i think i missed only two but it might have been three that i had we had already answered those particular yeah, questions I'm, I'm looking for the colored ones and making sure you don't miss any it's that's like you've done all right so far so good i'm trying i mean it's tough on the phone you guys sorry yeah, i can see um so I, I mean as a as a guest usually i turn this off the chat because i can't keep up and i'm not i'm not i can't keep up with the chat as is yeah yeah super yeah. chat at least makes it possible but uh yeah, <laughs> because usually it's too distracting. I can't pay attention to what I'm doing. It's, it's hard work. Uh, you're doing the job, man. The hey, job I'm, of work. Well, I'm not only doing that. I'm having to make sure after 30 minutes, I restart these. I'm making sure the lighting's halfway decent. Oh, my God, every 30 minutes, right? Every 30 minutes, I'm restarting both of these. The light's right. Making sure you guys' the super chats are getting in your questions. Making sure you're both in the shot. He's dropping the audio. I've got a baby screaming in the background. <laughs> it's, it's a work. Yeah, make it happen yeah i'm trying man i'm trying yeah, i appreciate it um no nobody else let me see anyone else you guys are more than welcome to ask uh, it, it seems like look uh, every time i do a live i i don't want to block people but it's like if you're gonna come into the chat and you're just gonna troll like I've seen this happen with uh, Otangelo. He comes in. He's like a, an apologist who's on repeat. It doesn't matter that the topic. He comes in and he's like, "There's a first mover," and you're like, "I'm talking about ancient Rome and like orgies in the in the pagan temples or something." And you're talking about there's a first mover, and you know it. And it's like, bro, That's why so are weird, you wanting yeah. to hijack the chat with nonsense? So there's another guy who comes in and it's all Islam and it's Muslim and Muhammad and Allah is the truth. And it's like, look, oh, it, it, yeah, you see what I'm saying? So I don't want to block people, but like engage in the conversation or go to another channel this and talk to about Israel. No, we just got a couple of yeah. I'm just saying like, I'm trying to look and I'm thinking to myself, like, it's like you have to be heard because you have to defend what you think so true. So, so much that you. I don't it care. Doesn't, it doesn't look like they're super chatting you though, so they did not. There's their two mic. I have. No, oh. they aren't. They're not contributing. Why would they want to give to a guy like me? Um, that's that's the always thing that I would say. Like, if, if it's not even worth five dollars to you, why is it worth even five seconds to me? That's <laughs> what I'm saying. And you know what? When we get done with this live, another live somewhere else that has nothing to do with Islam or Muhammad, he's probably yeah, going to go like, jump in there and do the same thing. The five dollars. And it's like the joke you told earlier about put put call him a saint in your. Oh, do you want me to tell that? <laughs> hey, I'll tell that if you want after I uh, get these super chats. Do this pretty super chatted, man. Thanks. I would do it the same way. I would. You'll get an answer. It won't be the answer you want, but yeah. uh, for the five dollars, I'll do it. Hey, you want you want us to talk about Islam or Muhammad? Hey, super chat question. So we have a shoot here. Yeah. So the name Israel. Does it have anything to do with the gods Ra and El, i.e. is Ra El? And I've actually heard this before. Okay. <laughs> no. Um, I, it, it, the El is correct, right? Because it's, it's he who struggles with God, right? Is that the, yeah. So it's El, El like Allah. It's just a word for God. Right. It's not a name necessarily. It just means God. Uh, so Israel is one who struggles with God. Okay, well, I, I would really... There's no raw in there. There's no Egyptian. <laughs> yeah, that's the stuff that... Okay. I can even begin. I know Min, Minhotep. I I, hope, I think that's right. Min, Min to Hotep. Uh, what? I can't even begin. I'm so sorry. I don't even oh, want to right. wait, wait, Come look see. at this name. Is it Kwame Mat? Yeah. Kwame Mat Ra. Oh, Mayat. Uh, so Kwame Mayat Ra Nayami. Mentohotep <laughs> is uh, the Therapeutes Jews in Alexandria praying in, to Serapis, and the Serapis cult influenced Christianity. And did the Jews support the Romans over Greek? Yeah, this this actually conflates two different sources. Um, the work we have on the Therapeutes doesn't mention them worshiping Serapis. That's not in there. Uh, there is there is a book that way way later. It's part of the uh, uh, Augusta. Um, Historia Augusta, which is this bizarre late fourth century collection of biographies of Roman emperors, and it's the later Roman emperors, like the third century and fourth century, 
And half of them are semi-authentic. They're like hack jobs, but they're semi-authentic. And then the other half, someone just like phoned it in and they literally just started making shit up. Uh, and so the other half, they're just t- completely fabricated with makeup names and all kinds of stuff. It's one of the weird mysteries of history. Is that, like, why did someone finish out this collection with this complete, like, like it's as if someone hired them to do this and then they got tired of researching it and just, I'm just going to make shit up. I'm just going to make shit up for the rest of them. Uh, and in one of them, they do, there is a reference that somehow connects Christianity with Serapis and stuff. But this source is so late and so bogus and so unreliable that, uh, and, and probably anti-Christian, uh, it's probably not written by a Christian uh, to begin with, uh, that you can't use it as history, unfortunately. So the, the connection with Serapis and the Christians is just not a usable source. Um, but the therapeuti that they influence Christianity is a more interesting question because the therapeuti do appear to predate, predate the Christians. They look similar to Christians in the way they're described in Philo. Philo is the one who describes them admirably, uh, admiringly, I should say. Um, and Eusebius himself mis- tries to represent them as Christians. He's like, oh, Philo just got confused. These are actually Christians and, and he's actually describing Christians. Um, that's not the case either. Um, my answer to that is that they're way out in Egypt. Uh, it's unlikely there's influence. Uh, they're more likely cousins in the same way you have like the early fringe sects and you have the Dead Sea sect comes out of that. And you have Christianity come out of that. Therapeutai maybe come out of that. So they, they may have connections, ancestry and in, in ideas, in, you know, descendants and ideas. But uh, I don't think the Therapeutai became the Christians or anything. But I think there's another possible connection. And yes, Jews did support the Romans against the Greeks. And, ultimately. and you know, Therapeutai in Greek means the healers. Um, and right. it's, there's a literary genre in antiquity called uh, politeia that is idealizations of uh, social groups that are used to uh, support certain kinds of virtues. The best known ones appear in uh, the in Plato's Republic um, at the end, where you find uh, the, the guardians are the ones in, in Athens who. Uh, can have they don't have it they have everything in common including wives um they they are wise uh, governors of the city if the city had such guardians uh, Athens would be in much better place and so we have these communal ideals and idealizations that then get historicized so we have Josephus doing the same thing with the Essenes in saying that the, the Qumranites have a, a kind of a communist community. The Therapeutai is another example. We have also Stoic examples of uh, Therapeutai. And uh, one of my students did actually a dissertation on this topic to show that the Republic of Plato generated mimetic imitations in um, Hellenistic uh, literature among Jews and Christians. And that's what's going on in the Acts of the Apostles when the church is identified as having no need. And in fact, um, my student has shown that in fact there are literary echoes directly from the Republic mm. in what Luke is doing in so. The genre of Philo about the therapeutic and the genre of what Josephus is doing with the Essenes is a part of a literary project spun out of Plato's Republic that also, for which Luke also is a contributor. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't even know how to pronounce your name, my friend, but Satan has moved your mic too low, Carrier. So the mic in his solar plexus region is set there specifically. <laughs> That's why he's in here. I mean, you could go up. Yeah. You don't have to go too far because I don't want distortion. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, I, I can always edit and bump it up. The high quality camera later when you guys see this, you'll you'll, you'll appreciate. I could, I could like make it into a nipple ring. And put it you up could there. do the nipple ring thing. I think that... <laughs> That might get some people that we don't want in the chat out of there. Who knows? <laughs> oh, Lord have mercy. Oh, my gosh. I guess I should say nipple plant. Dude, and look, the crazy thing. 
things and things like this. But okay. Yeah, I'm gonna have to uh, look. This is the thing. If I I block him, right? He says blocking me because I say the truth. Smiley face. Of course, yeah. The truth sucks. Nope, that's what they always say. LOL to those who refuse it. It's like, of this course. This proves I'm right. This proves that the truth of Islam is true. Because I want to block a troll who can't let it go. I don't know. Anyway, not happening. Anyway, Tyler, thank you so much. Why did Christians get so involved in proselytizing? This is a good question. I read, um, I read, uh, what is her name? Leading Paul in Judaism thinker, um, Paul, the pagan's apostle. She recently wrote. Um, nope. Um, I can't believe I can't think of her Paul name. Paul, the pagan apostle, you said? Paul, the pagan's apostle. Gosh. I, um, oh, I, right. Of course. Nope. Nope. Gosh, there's a lot of really Paul great the women pagan's uh, experts. It's Fredrickson. Yep. Paula Fredrickson. So I read that. Another great scholar in the field. Yeah. She goes into the history of like proselytizing. I haven't read that book, so I don't know. It's about. worth checking out. Um, but she talks about how like proselytizing was like a, almost a new thing on the scene. You don't really see that in history where like there's com- competition going on now. Christians are showing up and they're doing things and Jews are having to compete now. And their hints. Yeah, sure. I mean, you have to remember like Christianity began as just a Jewish movement. Right, they're not. They're proselytizing Jews. They're not, and as all the sects did, all the sects were like trying to get people on their side to build political power and influence and, and numbers. Right? They and that's if you look at like uh, when prophecy fails, the whole cognitive dissonance uh, theory. The idea of people evangelize. The psychology of this is that the way you can convince yourself that you're right, that's right is to convince other people to agree with you. So people are psychologically motivated to evangelize. Everybody is. A flat earthers are psychologically motivated. The dude that you had to kick out is a perfect example. I He's just psychologically kicked him out. motivated to convert other people. Like this is humans are like, this is how if you have, especially the crazier the belief, the more motivated you are. This guy. Right. The more motivated you are to convert people. Right. And so there's that you get this sort of equilibrium between craziness of belief and motivation. So if it's too crazy, you don't succeed in converting people, but it has to be crazy enough to motivate you to keep trying to convert people, but not so crazy that people don't convert. And so you end up with this, 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 you draw the graph and you have the nexus and that's where almost all religions are. (laughs) You know, right. So, I mean, obviously, I mean, I I laugh at it, but that's, that's actually, that's actually what's going on. Um, But what happens is there's originally a Jewish sect when Paul, so as, in context, you have to understand they're already Gentiles who are fascinated by Judaism. There are things that they found very appealing about Judaism, but it was too onerous, right? All the requirements were too onerous. So they would just hover around, the, they would orbit around it, right, basically. And But Paul came up with a way to get all those customers in, right? He made the, the entry fee lower, and so they're all ra- racing in. And so now, of course, it's popular and you think this has two motivations. One is you could say money, you know, the old motivation of churches in general. But I think also, I think Paul genuinely believes in the social moral program. I think he genuinely yeah. believes that this this religion, he thinks this religion will solve all the world's problems. This tension, this battle that, that results in actual violence between Gentiles and Jews can be solved if we can all come together on this one thing. So if he can unite the two sides he can fix all the world's problems. I think he genuinely thinks that that's the case. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of evangelists, that's also one of their motivations that they think that they're actually helping. They think this is going to solve the world and won't people just listen. Well, before I kicked this guy from being able to comment, he can watch, right? I just, it gets Mm -hmm. annoying when you do that. And literally you do it. Every third comment is him saying, yeah, he's, this happens. I got to start getting some people that I've seen for a while. I actually start to be able to guard the comment section on my videos because if you're talking in the vein of the topic and it's not relevant, you're literally distracting from people watching your content. That's annoying. Uh, but what he did right before I ended up kicking him, and I don't even know, he might have commented a lot of stuff below that I didn't sure. see. Yeah. But he said, um, it's a hard pill to swallow. He said, but once you swallow it, you're set free. Now, notice something here. Unless you come to his conclusion, if not, Screw you, you're wrong. And it's like, yeah. nah, 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 and they're not going to stop till you get it. But you have to swallow their pill. And that's he literally said it's a tough pill to swallow. The one he's forcing he on to, you. That's, he has to test it psychologically. Yeah. So the this. More people you can convince, 
the more certain confident he'll be that he's right, which relates to what we were talking about in another video about uh, insecurity, right? So insecurity drives a lot of what we complain about in religion, uh, dogmatism and, and trying to force other people to adhere to certain ways. We need more people to join and us. Evangelism also is, is born of insecurity. That's, that is literally a cognitive distance model of evangelism that you get in When Prophecy Fails, that particular book. Wow. Uh, it, it is this insecurity, and you solve the insecurity by reassuring yourself, and the way you can reassure yourself is getting other people to agree with you. That, that's one effect of insecurity. Another is trying to force people to behave certain ways. That, uh, yeah, I think that those uh, uh, sociological impulses are there. But I wouldn't want to um, put all of the texts that encourage missionizing right. into a single pattern. Correct, yeah. Because their <laughs> message is different from time to time. Yeah, and their and reasons, their motives are different. Their motives are different. Yeah. And so, for example, if I, again, go back to the Q document. Just because I think it's so enlightening is, I think it's there. But it, people can just consider the possibility. Yeah. In the Q document, Jesus is a prophet and above all a teacher. He's called the Didaskalos. And his followers are not called believers. They're called Pathiti. That is, they are disciples. They are his students. Literally. And in fact, there is no evidence that Jesus' followers were called Pathiti prior to the Q document. Paul never uses the term. It doesn't appear in the Johannine tradition. Uh, until you have some influence from the synoptics. Right. Okay. Now, in this case, these uh, people are to imitate the Didaskalos and his message in proclamation of the kingdom of God in going in groups of two to teach and to heal and so on. Now, I think the impulse of the sociological impulse is there. You want people to agree with you, which reconfirms your vision. But yeah. in this case, the vision has to do with an alternative understanding of Judaism. It's not just that we want you to be like us. It's that we want Judaism to change so that it's more bearable to people who can't right. observe Torah. Yeah. So sometimes evangelism can be, and this sounds crazy for an atheist to say, maybe sometimes evangelism has legitimate social positive function. Yeah, I mean, the analogy is environmentalism or feminism or any of these yeah, movements that are the social justice movement. It is a social justice movement in its own sense. And that motivates people. We want to fix society. We think this is what I was talking about with Paul. He thinks this will fix all kinds of social problems. So. You Thank you. Uh, Mr. Monster says, are there any correlations between Caesar, Bo Caesar, I think he means Caesar, Bo Caesar, Bo Caesar Borgia? Caesar Borgia. Borgia. That's a and famous Jesus Christ. Pope from a famous Italian family. From I think it's Italian. Anyway, I don't know enough about it. That's not my field. I'm okay. assuming this has something to do with maybe some sort of Jesus dynasty reason. I'm not really. Uh, uh, did, did someone claim that he was a descendant of Jesus at some point? I, I don't know. Interesting. I don't know the context of this. I mean, Mr. Monster, text uh, like 15th century stuff. So email me. I'd be interested just to hear what the whole claim is, and uh, if there's people out there who think that. Thank you, man. Thanks for that super chat. Travis Adams says, oh, I'm already in the chat. Do you, yeah, know, who, see do you know who that is? Oh. Travis, you are in the chat. Look, you are in the chat, Travis man. You, you are in the chat. Thank you. <laughs> You're in here, man. You're in the chat. <laughs> Okay, guys, I'm trying to find you. I, uh, Darren Wright, let me pop you up on the screen. Derek, love the work you are doing. Thank you so much. Keep on rolling and rolling and rolling and rolling. Yeah. Thank you, Darren. Appreciate it, man. Look, um, I'm lucky these guys even want me around them. See, I did a little proselytizing myself, but I had things to offer, and, the, and it wasn't a, a hard pill to swallow. You see, I had good friendship. I had things in common. I wasn't too aggressive. What was I? Was I too aggressive? I don't know. I, I, pros I, I pressured. I what you would think would be aggressive. I know, right? Thanks, Darren. Appreciate the love, man, and the positive, uh, you know, encouragement. Um, the name that I cannot uh, even 
represent properly here. Uh, thank you for the super chat. Kwame Mott. Ra Naomi. It is a long name. Yes, it's an it's an amazing name. I just wish I knew how to say it. Um, majority of Alexandria was Jews, and the cult of Alexandria was Serapis. We have evidence of Jews praying to Serapis at De Delos and the Hadrian reference. That's a weird segue. Seeing it on my screen. Okay, it's uh, towards the bottom. Above J. Crone is it, the next uh, one's J. Crone. I'm it's not in my view. Uh, I don't know what to do. Majority of Alexandria was Jews, and the cult of the majority that's not true. Uh, the majority of the population of Alexandria was not Jews. Okay, there was a large Jewish quarter there, probably right. the largest of all the diaspora communities. Uh, and it was very influential and in, and in, uh involved in a lot of political tensions that the emperors had to deal with. But um, not, it wasn't the majority of the population. I, that's not their question, though, so that's not a right. helpful answer. The next comment is, the, the cult of Alexandria was Serapis. We have evidence of Jews praying to Serapis. Serapis was a cult in Alexandria. There were tons of cults. Um, Serapis did arise, as, it was invented as a deity in Alexandria centuries Absolutely. before. That was centuries before, though, but, um, but it was remained popular. It was essentially the Egyptian, I should say, the Hellenistic Roman Egyptian version of Asclepius uh, in Alexandria. But and he says they, they Jews, Jews praying prayed. Serapis at Delos at the Hadrian Reference. Yeah, that that's all stuff that comes from the uh, Historia Augusta. I'm pretty sure that comes from the Historia Augusta. It's not a reliable source. It's very late. It's not a reliable source. Interesting. Okay, okay. So we're going to Jay Crone Super Chat. says, biggest fan. Myth Vision is home for me. <laughs> Keep up the good work. Jay swallowed the big pill already. See, I love it. I love it, Jay. It wasn't a big pill to swallow at all. As, Bu as Buzz says right above you, it was the blue pill. The red pill or the blue pill? I'm going to say it's the blue pill, man. Jay, seriously, <laughs> thanks for the Super Chat and the love. Hey, um, um, everyone should take the both. Cheers, my friends. Oh, yeah. All right. Cheers all right. to the pills that we swallow. All right. Oh, that was lovely. Mm. <laughs> that was uh, music to my ears. Thank you for the friendship, my friends. I really appreciate it. Now I'm scrolling down. So, Coffee Zealot is in the house and super chatted. Right. Says, hey, Derek, coffee. when are you going to jab at Hinduism? <laughs> I have discussed with you Hindu. Uh, I actually have a blog on that. <laughs> really? So there's an interesting story. Uh, Mira Nanda is a, a major critic of Hindu nationalism, uh, the Indian author. Uh, I don't remember how, like, she was just kind of like, like a fan or a reader of mine, and she asked it, like, "Would you do a review of my book? Are you interested?" And I'm like, "Yeah, super interested." This is a book about Hindu nationalism because I don't know anything about that and i would love to read a book by an expert by someone who actually knows that so i have some insider knowledge i would love to do that that'd be amazing please send me your book and she did and i wrote a whole blog about uh, about her book mira nanda's book uh, i want to say like it's the god market or the god industry or something like that but you'll find it on my blog if you go mira nanda uh or just hindu nationalism that'll be easier to remember Search that on my blog, richardcarrier.info. Look for Hindu nationalism. I have a whole article on it. It was very fascinating and very informative, and it has really uh, altered and improved my understanding of uh, events that are going on in India because I keep my eye on world events. I read news around the world. Uh, and so my, my understanding of the politics and the situation in India is much more informed uh, by having read her book. Wow. So I would say that would if you want to hear about Hindu nationalism, the problems with Hinduism, uh, that's that is a book to read. So this is what he said. I have discussed with few Hindus and their level of stupidity is just mind blowing. You would be surprised. Now, I want to go to vouch for people who think he's bullying or whatever. That's no, I, I, I well, I'm not going to name a guy's name, but I had a, a, a different spin on that. Let's, let's say um, Hinduism is very much rooted in its cultural support in a way that this kind of unfathomable to us today because we're so used to being able to rebel and uh, leave family traditions or come out with our own religious traditions. So Hinduism doesn't have the buildup of history of experience with apologetics, right? So if you look, run into any run-of-the-mill Christian, 
you're going to say, oh, my God, they're so stupid. But really, it's just they, they have no skills or experience in trying to defend their faith once it's challenged. Uh, and, and But then you can find sophisticated Christians who are super used to this and have built on a whole tradition of getting used to this. Uh, and that looks so much more sophisticated, but because it's so much more informed and it's based on experience with trying to defend their faith against uh, opposition. Hinduism doesn't evangelize outside of Hinduism, so it doesn't it has never built this tradition of Hindu apologetics. Right. right? So, uh, and and honestly, the same thing can be said largely for Islam, because Islam has become so dependent on political for compulsion into a belief that it has, and it, it, it's uh, like a hundred years behind Christianity in its apologetic technology. If you think of it. Terms. So, like to give you an example, if you were to read creationist apologetics from the 1920s, like from the Scopes trial era, and you read creationist apologetics in the Islamic world today, it looks very similar. It's very unsophisticated compared to creationist apologetics today, right? Because they've had to fight against people debunking them and arguing against them for decades and decades, and so they've refined their methods. Whereas that, that kind of pushback is either illegal or oppressed or not available in the Islamic world. So the Islamic world has is kind of stunted in their apologetics because they don't they've not had that kind of back pressure. And even when they get back pressure, it's not intellectual back pressure, it's just cultural opposition and bigotry, right? So the, so even when they get opposition, it's just hatred of Muslims not constructive like actual criticism of their religion that they have to respond to huh. much less decades and decades of building up with this so they've built up an industry to respond to it the way the christians have done uh so i think like hinduism hinduism is further back than that so that, that's why if you it's wow. not stupidity that you're running into it's just that they're not used to pushback against their religion and i think also uh, hindu religion has not gone through cultural you know uh, revolutions in the same way as Western religions or even Islam in China. Right, so, yeah. for example, there's no real equivalent to the Enlightenment in um, Hindu tradition. There's They've been affected by the Industrial Revolution, but secondhand. Right, uh, and because it's, of there are external forces to this external, Western culture. That's right. right, colonialism and so on. So actually, Hinduism is, has continuities with ancient religion probably more than any other major religion. Because it hasn't had the major it is the most shifts. thriving contemporary paganism. That's world, exactly right. So, and if, if you can imagine if, if Italy it. had stayed Romano paganic, right, it would be it would be the same situation, right? But no, no other culture, and Christianity, Christianity and Islam has crushed paganism everywhere else. So, so it's Hinduism not that they're stupid, but they're committed to a culture that hasn't had the challenges um, of other cultures. And so it really tends to be a very conservative, mm -hmm. preservative um, social phenomenon. That's why you get a lot of these political tensions in India now between Islam, Muslims, and Hindus within, and Sikhs, by the way, too, mm -hmm. uh, and others as giants and other, there's many other religions and they're more minority than that. But the, the hostility is not intellectual. It's it's violent and political bigotry based between Hindus and Muslims. They're not really having, they're not, building an experience of critique of, of, between their religions, because that's not where they're going culturally, unfortunately. And assimilation is very difficult. It's a social identity. Mm, yeah, right. Yeah. Yaga Yo, thanks for the super chat, man. So no one knows how Christianity got to Africa then, huh? Wait, what? <laughs> Wait, is this the same person? No, not the guy who... Oh, is this someone else? Yeah. No one knows. I don't even know what that's a reference to. Uh, no, it's right next to Israel, literally. Just <laughs> it's well, literally on the trade route. I, I, I wouldn't be surprised that this is a Copt or someone who understands Coptic tradition asking the question. And Copts are very insistent that the Holy Family got to Egypt and that there were cults related to Jesus in Egypt at a very early time. And then there is the Acts of Mark. It claims that Mark was a uh, evangelist who uh, went and right. faced opposition and martyred in Alexandria. Mm. So you have uh, churches to Mark and Mary all over Egypt. And um, it's so important to it, point out this is the, these traditions are talking, the written traditions are late. So this is not early evidence of later evidence. Right. But it's likely 
that um, early Christianity came as an import into the Jewish community first in Alexandria, and then was able to uh, find some footing. But we know at a relatively early time it became a center of Christian learning, the same way as it had become a center of Jewish learning uh, with a Hellenistic spin. So um, the 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 origins lie in a penumbra um, that we can see we can see somewhat through the the cloud, but we can't see everything that we'd like. But yeah. we know that by the time that we get to Clement, and apparently he had a, a great teacher who was also a, a Christian Platonist. Right. Before that, um, we would have to date it. Yeah, yeah, by the time we would have to date it probably around 160, 170. Hmm. It, that's the furthest, that's the earliest evidence that survives of us being able to see something concrete. But certainly there was Christianity before that, but all the documentation is lost. So we don't, we don't even Eusebius didn't have access to it. I have a blog on this where Eusebius does what we just did, traces it back to Pantinus and then makes the fudges and makes up a bunch of stuff about the Therapeutae and things like that. So even Eusebius didn't had lost the documentation for what was going on in Alexandria Christianity before that. But certainly there was some, and not just Alexandria, there's North African Christianity. You can sure talk about Tertullian, for example. There's, by the end of the second century, there's Christianities all across North Africa. Hmm. Thank you. Mark Smith, thank you for the super chat, bro. Any thoughts on the difference between the rod of Asclepius and the Caduceus? which are often confused and their connection to John three fourteen, where oh Jesus God. compares himself to Moses lifting up a serpent. serpent. Interesting. I, I don't I haven't researched this stuff. So that's iconography. The, the Conquest and um, actually probably the earliest manifestation of it is in traditions about Hermes and Hermes right. has the wand that can put people to sleep or raise them, and it actually has other magical qualities. So the idea of a magician's wand is very ancient. It's pre-Homeric. And uh, Hermes uh, is seen with winged feet and carrying a caduceus. And then uh, we have Circe in Odyssey, who also has a wand, who uses the wand to... Um, have with Odysseus's uh, picks become soldiers become pigs right. and to reverse it. But you have Moses with the wand who strikes the rock and he can produce water. So you have the same thing in the Bacchae. The women, the Minads in the wilderness <clears throat> can hit a rock and it can produce wine or water. So the idea of a magical wand is a lot earlier than Harry Potter. And um, but Harry Potter is pretty badass, though. So I'm not, I'm not denigrate, denigrating. <laughs> but then the wand also becomes a symbol of healing because it's it's got magical properties. And so Asclepius uh, and the goddess Hygiene, meaning health, are often depicted in our building comics. Um, and you have the double uh, entwined serpents at the top of the Caducaeus. And um, it's, it, it actually is a very ancient, interesting trope. And it identifies the carrier of it as a magician. We have evidence that during Europa of Jesus in the miracle story having a wand to show that it's magic, mm -hmm. it has magical properties. So you even have it in the Christian tradition. It's, it's, uh, this magical one. I, I can't vouch for it, but I'm looking at the Wikipedia article on Caducaeus, and it looks pretty well sourced. So uh, I'm not reading it, so I can't vet it for you as to whether they're doing the sources justice. Um, but it, it looks unusually well resourced. So whoever's put this and, in here. And probably what it's saying is pretty close to what I would say. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're exploring other hypotheses, but it's largely what you said. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. There's a lot of data and symbols and uh, evidence. So uh, I'll just say, like, uh, go check out Wikipedia. I can't say for sure that it's 100%. Learn your internet skills. Learn how to vet a Wikipedia article. That's exactly. Uh, in general, because that's a skill everybody should have anyway. 
Um, but uh, it's iconography is not one of my specialties, so that's the kind of question that I would have to go to the library to do. Yeah, my PhD has taught me how to do that kind of research, but it's not something I have on tap. Okay, right here's right. a little little piece in the Q document when Jesus sends the disciples out, he tells them not to take a stick. Now, it often is thought that that's a walking stick. No, it isn't. It's a magical wand. And the reason I can say that is when Elijah sends Elisha out to heal somebody, um, he can't go himself, but he can give Elisha the stick of magic that can be used then to heal the young lad. And he says, when you go, don't greet anybody on the road. That's right out that that's in the story of the seventy and seventy, yeah. um, and you you can't you can't say goodbye to your family, and so on. So this business about not taking a stick is not a walking stick, in my it's actually a magical wand. You don't need a stick when you go out and heal people. Mm. You do so. Uh, you don't need magic to do. That. That's a very it's, it's trying to say something better, so to speak. Uh, it's kind of topping the magic of the Old Testament, right. saying, "Don't worry." It's yeah, you don't need a stick, stick in order to do this. This is not derivative magic. Interesting, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, so, one thing I do want to let everyone know: we got like almost three hundred people, but the two cameras are rolling there. <clears throat> I want everyone to know. As we continue, join the Patron, okay? He's got a Patron. He's got books. He's a dinosaur like Bob. He doesn't have all the internet things we do, okay? <laughs> but I'm a member of Patreon. Patron. You are? Oh, yeah. You joined my Patreon? I did indeed. I, well, I gave you money. <laughs> wow, I don't know how you did it. So you know how to do that much. I mean, all my stuff. stuff. You can yeah. find it at richardcarrier.info.info. You can find my Patreon there, my Facebook page, my Twitter feed, my online courses I teach, my blog, books, everything. Yeah. You can find it at richardcarrier.info. How many videos do you think, if you were to guess, with the sun scorching our brain? Have we done? Yeah. How many do you think? Oh, I've done? lost track. We've done like 30-minute uh, videos, a lot of those, too. By the way. I, I want to say somewhere between 50 and 100. Mm -hmm. We've done a dozen, maybe. A dozen? <laughs> more more than that. You and me did more than a dozen the first day. <laughs> Just you and me. <laughs> oh, anyway, all that will be on Patreon. Just you know, go join. Awesome. I had to do a plug. Why not? And I had to pop it. I had to plug. I had to plug. Oh, yeah. Ooh. You want That's not wine, though. Yeah, now that we, now that we can oh, you guys went from, woo, looky, looky. All right, so, okay. Anyway, appreciate you guys. Just want to give a shout out. Oh, myth, the mythic life. It's Kristen. She's back. She says, getting late on the East Coast and have to head to bed. Derek, do not delete this so I can finish watching tomorrow. Yeah, oh, trust me. I'm recording. It'll be up tomorrow, but it'll be back. Oh my god, I can't believe I accidentally deleted it. And you know, when I deleted it was as soon as I exited it. So there were people in the middle watching and that were like 15 minutes behind us at the end and it shut off. Um, so they didn't even get to watch the last 15 yeah, minutes. Yeah. If you weren't watching That's it live, you missed out. I've got two legends. The legends and the apostle. That's me behind the screen. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> you like my plug for your book? <laughs> Seriously, though, I can't tell you. You know what? Pull the books out real quick. I, I really want What do you want? I mean, there's so much. Um, all of them. Why not? Let's let's show your books. Let's show them. Give them a rundown of some of the material. Stack here. If you don't like the material, you can throw them at people. And it'll hurt. All right. So show them your books. It's underneath, of course, the Novum Testamentum. Right. <laughs> And they've been using that in some of the videos. So, we, like, there's a couple times we're doing like That's true. Greek word searches yeah. and like. I said about mine. I, I didn't even think of it. Silly. But, yeah. It's awesome. So, what do you have, Dennis? Um, from the earliest gospel, Q plus, to the gospel of Mark, it argues not only for the Q document, but how Mark has used the Q document. It's, it's probably based... the best introduction to that 
argument, right? Because Easy. this one is too complex. It's the two shipwreck gospel, <laughs> um, the uh, logo of Jesus and Papias' exposition. Uh, the arguments are made in Greek. Um, it's really deep in the woods, and so I think you can think is... of it like this. So, so this is the book you should read. And when you're not convinced, and you need to see the appendix of all the evidence, that's this. And they're right? in Greek in order to read. Right. Oh <laughs> my gosh. This is a book on the Acts of Andrew that was its own imitations of Homer, which is developed. What's by the way, it's one of your earliest works, right? So, well, uh, Christianizing Homer was on the Acts of Andrew as uh, an imitation. And I'm very proud of this one. Uh, what is it? <laughs> Luke and the Politics of Homeric Imitation. It shows that Luke's imitations of Homer are very similar to the imitations of Homer in Virgil's Aeneid. Mm -hmm. And this is an alternative mimetic project to show that Jesus is superior to Roman um, yeah. deities and Aeneid. But I'm working on a, have been working for years. Alternative English Gospel Synopsis, which I call a mimetic synopsis. Where's that at? It's right here. Yep. Oh, snap. Hand. Okay, so right I now... Tell people, so if you go yeah. to Amazon, right, search for Dennis McDonald and find any book. If you go to the author page, because Amazon has already done this for you, right? So Amazon has created an author page. So you have this whole corpus there, and you can actually go through book by book and read the synopsis of each one. And decide like which one you want to like start with first, or which one you want to dig into. It's that's the way to go. Just very briefly, though, this is a unique reference work that has English translations of all every word in the Gospels, with my reconstruction of Q, and with the parallels laid out from Q to Mark to Matthew to Luke, but with major introductions of the possible. Uh, model literary models mm -hmm. that were in Greek poetry poetry Homeric epics Athenian uh, uh, tragedies especially and it has its own um, synopsis for the Gospel of John in his three layers of it composition also Septuagintal stuff right so Septuagint material um, yes I do that I had that I have my own translation of a number of passages in the Septuagint that imitate that are informing um, the, the Gospels, but I, I am thinner on that simply because it's these are available in existing uh, synopses for the most part. If I may, and I want to get into your works. I mean, you're way more known, right, to like the YouTube world, sure, but yeah. I want you in your own words, and let me restart this camera. Okay? Oh, right. I got to do it because we're filming, right? All right, let me restart this camera over here. Okay, guys. So, in your own words, I like I don't care where you take this. That way, anyone watching knows, like, there's no blowing smoke up anyone's ass or blowing each other's heads up. Honestly, heads up. And, and I don't mean that in like the literals. I mean, like, just the idea that making you're trying to kiss Dennis' ass. I'm just picturing. Okay? Uh, right. I'm asking simply. The movie when people blow up. But anyway, <laughs> how important <laughs> would you say Dennis's work is? I and think it's it's really it's important in two respects, not just well. This is super handy. I mean, I'm gonna, when that comes out, I'm going to actually have a lot of use for it in the future because uh, this is the kind of thing you need to go reference. This right, if you're going to talk about a passage, you need to go see what are the references here. What what are the illusions that are going on here? And this is going to have material in it that you're not going to get anywhere else. That's that's what I think is the important. Thing. But also the methodology, uh, the methodology that Dennis uses to find these analogies and then demonstrate that they're actually real and not just coincidences. They're not just phantoms. Uh, that methodology is crucial and applicable much more broadly. And I think if people understand this fact, once you're convinced of the reality of this phenomenon, it really, it's a paradigm shift in the way you understand this lit all ancient literature. Uh, honestly, classicists are already Would you doing like this. some more scotch? <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyway, yeah. No, I, I, well, yeah, we're we're both killing this bottle that we that we bought of <laughs> a few cannons. No, but it's true. Uh, so I, I think it is. That's it is important, and that's the one of the effects of it. And I want everyone life. knowing this answer that you're saying. Mm -hmm. I have listened to you guys disagree at least over a dozen times today because we've recorded more, not today, but over the past more few days, yeah, yeah. more than a dozen recordings. Uh, yeah. days. But you guys, when you disagree, you say it. I mean, yes, you're you're kind, you're polite, you respect one another, but you disagree on many things, and, and people will see that. Why? 
Yes. That's the you respect his what you don't think is true. He respects what he doesn't think is valid or whatever, vice versa. But I say that to say you value his work. And most scholars yeah, will try valuable. to mock Dennis or try to downplay. Which frustrates the hell out of me for a number of reasons. But yeah. <laughs> okay. Let me um, say something good about the book. The purpose of having a reference work instead of a hammy, a, a ham-fisted um, interpretation of the data is that people need to make their own judgments and they about see it. the parallels. You see it side by side. So yeah. there are lots of ways of explaining possible parallels or explaining them away. But you can't have that discussion until you have a good translation and the presentation of the parallels in a reference work. So I really am trying yeah. to dial back my own interpretation of the parallels right, yeah. and to put them in front of people so they can make their own judgments. Now, uh, Richard and I have talked about this. some of my parallels are stronger than others. And some of them I actually would be willing to backpedal on um, because the data isn't as strong as others. Yeah. But the, what I find is that readers don't agree on what's a strong parallel and what is <laughs> And I also know they can be augmented with other parallels. And that's one reason I want to put it out in electronic version so that people actually could add to it if they want to. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's a good point. All right. So your works. I, I want to get into yeah. yours. Oh, okay. well, and you I, don't have all of them, of course. I don't. I actually, I only have three right now um, on me. Uh, so, well, Hitler, Homer, Bible, Christ. Uh, that's all of my peer-reviewed and magazine work uh, up to 2014 in history. So there's a lot of interesting stuff in here on a diverse number of subjects, hence the weird title, including, I wonder, maybe we'll get a video talking about the work that I've done on Hitler studies. Uh, I'm actually now a major cited person in Hitler studies because of one peer reviewed work I did wow. uh, on the subject, which has actually led to another professor producing an entire book that was inspired by my article in German studies review uh, on Hitler's table talk. And it's an amazing book. It's fantastic. And, and I've worked with him over the many years that he's produced it. It's amazing. Um, anyway, Hitler, Homer, Bible Christ is fun because it's a variety of different topics. There's short chapters uh, on weird different topics. And so it can be entertaining, but also it's the cheapest way to get a hold of all my peer reviewed work. So if you go to, um, if you try to go to the, the journals, they're going to charge you 20 to $35 for an article. And I don't get a dime of that. And this, you get all the articles plus a bunch of other stuff for 20 bucks. And I do get a dime off of that. Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, obviously on the historicity of Jesus is probably the, the most known and best selling of my works. Uh, peer reviewed academic press book. That is the full formal academic case, including 90 pages of apparatus at the end of, you know, bibliographies and various <laughs> indexes. Uh, so that's one thing. And then uh, proving history, which, I want to get more books in casement bindings. I really, all, most of uh, Dennis's books are casement bindings. It's the new thing, and I really like it. It's a nice, feels good. Yeah, yeah in your hands. I want more books like this. Uh, I insisted that Jesus from Outer Space be casement bound. That is its nice. First release. Yeah. I have the casement bound um, one too. So, yeah. Proving History is also a peer reviewed book. Uh, it's uh, by Prometheus, but I, in contract, required it be peer reviewed before you publish. And this is the methodology. So, this is Bayesian history. And it starts basic and gets more complicated as you go on. So you can stop whenever you get tired of the weirdness of it. But <laughs> so anyway, oh, that's, that's that. And that talks about how to talk about history. And chapter five is all about the methodology of Jesus studies and how you can analyze it with that. And I have several others. I've got uh, two books on ancient science, um, science education in the early Roman Empire, which has actually come up several times that we're talking about. But understanding the education system in the ancient world is crucial to understanding a lot of even biblical studies. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, uh, in that book, I cover the whole, the whole education system. And I just put a special focus on science content, including pop culture. And there was a, such a thing as ancient pop culture, uh, up to and including juries. There's actually there's examples of a jury. It would be an a, opportunity for average people to get exposed to science. But anyway, um, so that's one thing. And then the scientist in the early Roman Empire is my, uh, basically the bulk of my dissertation at Columbia University uh, produced uh, with an extra chapter on the Christian side of things. But um, that's on ancient science. So if you're interested in, in ancient science and what people thought about it, who these guys and women, some of them women were, uh, that's the book for you. And then what am I forgetting? Well, Jesus from Outer Space is the latest the one. The newest, yeah. Yeah, and that's that's that comes in binding like this, which I find is really nice. Uh, and it's it's also comparably short. It's like the same length. 
and it is the colloquial summary of why I think it is reasonable to doubt the historicity of Jesus. With a little material that isn't in on the Correct. historicity. There's a lot of uh, material that I, I take for granted, and I think most historians do or should take for granted, but a lot of people don't know about it. And as I'm finding now, a lot of historians don't know about it. But anyway, it's in there. So I have like a whole chapter, for example, in Jesus from Outer Space on comparing Jesus, the evidence for, with a whole bunch of other historical figures like Pontius Pilate. Herod, Antipas, uh, all the Caesars, Alexander the Great. You're doing one on that? Spartacus, uh, 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 Hannibal. No, it's a whole chapter in Jesus. Oh, okay. Space. I think so I have like it. whole sections on why do we, why are we certain Hannibal existed? And I go through the list of all the evidence we have, and, and, and it's evidence we don't have in the case of Jesus. So Jesus is weakly attested com at best compared to these other ones. So right. that's an important point that, that I and other historians take for granted, but I think needs to be shown to re if you don't know this already, like it's an important context. So that's Jesus from outer space. I'm sure I forget oh, why I'm not a Christian. And of course, uh, sense and goodness without God. So if that's you want right. my fundamental philosophical treatise, that is actually, and that's also still a bestseller. It's a bestseller. Uh, and that is a complete worldview. Of, if you don't believe in God, what should you replace it with? It's not just a negative. It's not just why not. They don't believe in God. It's also like most of the content is what should you believe in? Ethics, aesthetics, political theory. How do you build your political theory? Science-based, non-God-based uh, principle. Uh, semantics, epistemology, all of that stuff's in there. So, And that's really informed a lot of my whole life and a lot of my work. So sense wow. of without God is important. I'm sure I'm forgetting something, but that's just a – and I've done chapters in anthologies and various things as well. Dude, that, that's – I mean, it's really awesome. And we didn't even begin to scratch the surface. You only showed some of your books. You've got a bunch of Yeah, no, right. <laughs> well, yeah. You mentioned another one. Mythologizing Jesus is the easiest one and mm -hmm. the cheapest one. That's actually the one I recommend people we'll start with if they want to get any I actually – I have to say, and we've got – and I want to tell my little funny story about the two – two brothers uh oh, yeah. but, but we got a super chat and i want to say about mythologizing jesus at the end of the day, there was a certain album that i like to listen to while i read your work and it's become a, a dennis mcdonald album i'm not kidding you literally uh, i go into the homeric and the odyssey and the iliad and like i get into this weird epic world when i listen to this uh the muse. this certain muse yeah and um at the end of your book you asked your grandson you know which one do you like more the, the Jesus epic or the Greek epic here with Odysseus? And he said, I like the Greek one better, but which one would you rather be like, you know, like the, which one shows better morals and stuff? Well, the Jesus one. And I mean, I actually teared at the end of that. I was like, this is so good. It was so amazing. Uh, so it showed appreciation at the same time. I was like, yeah. Yaga, yo, appreciate the super chat. I really do. So thank you so much for the support it says. Yeah. So Christianity got to Egypt first. What about the Book of Enoch found in Ethiopia or uh, Eritrea? Eritrea. Eritrea? Um, Enoch. Uh, we have pieces of that from the Dead Sea. Uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it predates. So it is a part of the uh, Ethiopian Church's canon. Uh, the, the Ethiopian canon is one of the largest canons of the surviving Christian churches today. They have a bunch of books that aren't in. Uh, any other Bibles, but the uh, Book of Enoch is one, and uh, I think I'm uh, surprised it didn't survive in canon anywhere else because it's so foundational for Christianity. Um, there's actually a lot of texts that we rely on the Ethiopian preservation of that we don't have many other examples of in other places, but we have pieces of Enoch from the Dead Sea Scrolls, which is before the Jewish War in Judea, so we know for sure it originated. It's, a, it's an incomplete. Correct, yeah, but we can attest that it would, did not originate in Egypt. It, it appears to originate outside Egypt and if emigrated there, basically. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And they think they date that for most people are wondering in the second to third, potentially third century, but mostly second or first century BC. No, no later than first yeah, century no, BC, but yeah, no later than what? First century BC. Oh, really? No, oh, you mean no, yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. I'm yeah. thinking earlier, can't be any later, yeah, yeah. 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 Most of the people yeah. who are watching um, this show will know something about the Gospel of Thomas, maybe the Gospel of Mary, the Gospel of Judas. Those, in my view, are among the least interested in Christian yeah. apocryphal. We also have apocryphal acts of apostles for at least five of the apostles, and then a later one for another. Um, and these, uh, we also have apocryphal 
apocalypses. We have apocryphal letters of Paul and other correspondence. Uh, but these apocrypha are survive in probably six or seven different languages that no one on the globe can fully uh, uh, deal with. And so there's a group called La Asociación de Pour the Tour de la Literature de Craft Chrétien in France that <laughs> divides uh, various, uh, the various apocryphal texts into language, language groups. So you have an Ethiopian group, you have an Armenian group, you have a Syriac group, you have um, a Latin group, you have uh, several Greek groups. Slavonic uh, and Georgian. Nice. Slavonic. Uh, and the wealth of this information is remarkable. Now, these texts, uh, uh, some of them exist in multiple languages, so they have to be collated and translated and evaluated. And to think that the Christian tradition was devoted to the New Testament and to no other literature, and that the mythologizing process stopped somewhere in the early second century is a, another myth that needs to be broken. Mm. These Christians were very good at expressing their faith with mythology and creativity, and we shouldn't discredit it. We should try to understand it, as uh, because people use myth often to express their deepest and most profound uh, truths. And um, so there are groups, and, and by the way, many of these texts are still not published, even in the primary languages, and uh, to let, let alone in English. And there are some, especially uh, Canadians now, that are working on uh, the project to get these texts out in English. Wow. And they are, some of them are absolutely remarkable. I've written on the Acts of Andrew, I've written on the, uh, the Gospel of Nicodemus, I have some coming out on that soon. And by the way, this writing of uh, Apocrypha is not all the kooks in the world. It's not heretics only. Um, it, the great church continues to write these things. And in Greek Orthodox monasteries uh, in Greece, even now, they read these texts as though they were scripture. So um, the Protestant notion of sola scriptura Right. And then putting a fence around the <laughs> Bible and thinking this is the that only is kind of thing, Christian, yeah. Christian revelation is so historically anachronistic and limiting that um, it's it's one of the, the reasons that we have the problem with fundamentalism. Mm. All right, I'm going to tell that story. We're getting close to that. Right. <laughs> so, um, I was giving a testimony. Uh, in a preterist church in New York, and I figure I'd let you guys see me when I tell the story. Yeah, yeah, no, that's the best way to do it. I'm standing being, there, and rather than being a ghost behind the camera, exactly. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and I usually am a ghost behind all the cameras, like the vision. But when I'm doing my lives and stuff, they get to see me. Um, but I love to like put you guys on the pedestal and see the work you guys do. Like I said, a fox chasing, you know, the rabbit. <laughs> but I find the groundhogs, and that's you guys finding all the deep stuff in the yeah, earth. That's right. And I would never Good know stuff. how to find. Yeah, so, I'd never know how to look for it. Um, so there's two brothers, totally horrible, wicked, debauched individuals. I mean, they're like mobsters running the entire town. Everyone hates them. One of the brothers dies. And I, I'm telling this in front of a church, by the way. Yeah, right. And, and if I cuss, it's, I, I didn't cuss at the, you know, in the church, but yeah, yeah. I'm, like, <laughs> I'm emphasizing. Yeah. These are assholes, like total jerk douchebags. And one of the brother dies. The other brother, who's alive, goes to the local priest and he says, "Listen, uh, my brother just died." And the guy, the priest, is thinking, "Thank God," you know. And it, but he's like, uh, "What can I do for you?" And he says, "Well, listen." I've got a check right here. I'll put as many zeros on it as you want. You could just, at the eulogy for my brother, <laughs> make sure you let everyone know he's a saint. And so the priest is thinking in his head, oh, hell no. And he starts to add some zeros on the check and sees these numbers start to build up. And he's thinking, okay, okay, I can do that. 
So the eulogy comes, the day comes, and the entire town has appeared to this funeral. Everyone, everyone had been lied to, robbed, stole from, everything you can imagine wrong these brothers did. And they're there to praise the death of this man. And the brother's there in the front. And here comes the priest. And he says, this man you see today, he was a debauched, wicked, evil, horrible just the worst kind of human being. He's probably done everyone in this crowd wrong, but compared to his brother, he was a saint. <laughs> I'm telling you, I love that. And the good. church laughed so hard. <laughs> the church laughed so hard. Well, you told the story of what was it, the charioteer? Uh, it was uh, the guy who, who says, are you looking for so-and-so? Is he in your in your wagon? And he had back and is, is it in the right can you tell that story oh it's a trickster story and it comes out of the amish uh, mennonite tradition <laughs> um G- german soldiers who were um, uh, protestants uh in the uh the lutheran uh, tradition right. were looking for menno simons who was one of the leaders of the mennonite community and the the, the uh Mennonites were trying to escape a village that was going to get targeted by the soldiers. And they stopped a uh, wagon that was being uh, driven by Menno Simons. And there were a number of Mennonite Amish ancestors uh, in the uh, carriage. And the soldiers came up and said to Menno Simons, is Menno Simons back there? And he turns around and says, hey, is Menno Simons back there? And they said, no, Menno Simons isn't back here. So he tries to show you, oh, man, Simons isn't back there. And that's how these people escaped. <laughs> that's a fantastic story. Oh, that's man. Beautiful. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> you have one or no? You don't really no, have one. No, I'm, I'm borrowing these. I'm going to steal these. Yeah. I used to tell, like, more. I used to have, like, I can't remember them. I always I, I hear a great joke, and it's hard to hold on to it. Yeah. Okay, I'm a banjo player, and I've got a lot of banjo jokes. Oh my God! Uh, I'll only tell you one or two, of okay. us, uh, especially if you get somebody to chat us up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll do it otherwise. Okay, okay. You know what? A banjo player and a blindfolded javelin thrower have in common. In both cases, you don't have to be very good to attract attention. Oh, thank you. <laughs> oh ouch! Okay, yeah. Damn. <laughs> Okay, okay. You want another one? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, what is the difference between a South American macaw and a banjo player? One is loud and obnoxious, and the other is a bird. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> right? Right. These are like mime jokes. Uh, yeah. I was making fun of mimes. Right. You know how a good musician can tell that a banjo player is at the door? First of all, that person can't find the right key. <laughs> Second of all, the knocking gets faster and faster and faster. <laughs> and third of all, the person is never sure it's quite right to come in. Oh, man. Oh, <laughs> man. You know what they call Jim Banjo? Huh. Total mistake. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, <laughs> ladies oh, and gentlemen, huh? I said, "Oh dear." <laughs> yeah, look, we're coming on three hours. Um, this has been a hangout, like real fun. I wish yesterday's didn't get deleted, but it's all good. I mean, it, it happens. You got back up today, so it's going to be preserved. Not only back up, but this one won't get deleted. So uh, this was fun. I really enjoyed it. I hope everybody who's watching this live um, had fun with us and the questions. I appreciate the super chatters. You guys keep this thing alive Um, compared to, you know, your brother. You're a saint. Okay. That's all I could say. (laughs) That's all I could say, you know, Uh, but seriously, you guys, you guys are awesome and go check out their works. Um, I can't tell you how much fun it is to, let me just give you a little spoiler. If you didn't know this about me, when I first started myth vision, I read here and there. But I did all these shows by winging them because I just had the charismatic character and I'd let scholars come and like educate me on the spot about a theory I had no damn clue what I was doing. 
and this is a fact. I was an ignoramus, and I don't mean it like I don't know things or I'm not a dumb. I'm a dummy. I didn't know what I was doing. I learned, and I found out that when I enter your mind by reading your works, holy shit, does a show come out? And when it comes out, it's deep, and you really get to mine for the nuggets that the groundhogs find in the earth. And I can see into the hole as a Fox. Now I'm like, Holy, when I look in the hole, I'm like, (laughs) what the hell? How did you do that? I don't know. It's okay. Just tell me what you found down there. All right. I'm going to get a rabbit now. (laughs) Um, This is, this is what reading your work has done for me. It, It allows me to enter a world. I know I'll never live in, but I get to see it. And it's like, Whoa. And other people see it too. Yeah, that's right the on. goal. Yeah. To be the bridge, to be a mediator, yeah, cool. to be a son of God. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, but seriously, this is great. And the 246 people, 50 something people, whatever, uh, that are watching, hit the like button on the way out. Go down in the description. I literally set up the description. The first link you can go into is the Amazon link to Dennis's works. The second area is a section of links that Richard Carrier has for Patreon and the blog and go support him, get his works, Amazon, the whole nine. They're all down there. And then the last of all, because I'm the Apostle Paul uh, on this thing, uh, you can check out Myth Vision material and you guys get early access to everything. It's only $3 a month. You don't have to go for more if you want to. You go to heaven, like in a better level of heaven. There's different levels, you know. But seriously, um, you guys make this thing possible. And then you allowing me here. Dennis opened up his doors to me and Carrier. Um, took us to dinner the first night. Like this has been. I'll never forget this. Yeah, it's know? quite cool. Quite awesome. Yeah. yeah. I think done it. Thank you, dear. thank you, and thank you, everyone. We love you, and never forget. We. Fish. Yeah, yeah. See, that's what I do. I try to get Bob. Bob does it too. He's a car. <laughs> so, he, see, this is, this is how a groundhog would respond. It's not cinematic in the same way. You tried. You did try. You. you no, I, I get all into it. My face. And I'm like, we are myth vision. Live, it is Saturday here in North Carolina, and uh, welcome to Myth Vision. Let's get our intro started, and let's have some fun. Myth Vision. Welcome back to Myth Vision. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're new to the channel, make sure you subscribe and hit the bell so you're notified every time I commit heresy and you can watch me burn at the stake. Ladies and gentlemen, our guest is Dr. Richard Carrier. Welcome back to Myth Vision, my friend. Good to be here. I'm always excited when you come back. Uh, You know, you're just a great thinker and you're all over the place. If I have a philosophy question, I can ask you. If I need to know how to bake my, my... my potatoes. I can ask you. You, you, you pretty much know a thing or two about everything. Um, but I really wanted to have you on today to uh, put you on the spot and allow everyone to be able to bring their questions, be critical, super chat your questions, ask away. Yeah. Um, you know, obviously be polite, uh, be respectful, but you know, he's a critical scholar and he's debated many uh, Christian and uh, you even had a debate with uh, Dan um, Barker 
with a Muslim crowd. Uh, that that was an interesting story you were telling me in California how that yeah, went. Yeah, I just also did uh, debated James Charlesworth on whether Josephus mentioned Jesus on uh, Jacob Berman's show. So uh, that will post uh, in a few days or so, I expect. Um, did, did he get? Yeah. Were you guys screaming at each other? Or? Uh, it got weird, but not like that. No. Uh, yeah, there's there's a lot of really fallacious argumentation coming from him, and a lot of patronizing. Uh, but uh, but other than that, it was actually it was all right. Like we we each had got to say our piece, and it was relatively short, like only about an, less than an hour. Um, and you know we'd exhausted all points worth saying at that point. So it was uh, so it's worth seeing at the very least, even if you'll be totally frustrated with his, the way he defends. Uh, his position. Interesting. Well, I want everybody to know they can go to the blog. Please do. It is in the description. You have, uh, I've hired you to do an article on Israel only before. Uh, there's various articles. You can also be hired to do research for people. Yeah. So if you're like me and you're a lay person, you're interested in having a research project done. Dr. Carrier does that. I don't know if any other channel promotes that or even mentions that. I just do that because you have done one for me. If it's worth investigating, if you're asking, yeah. you know, uh, I, and I'm expensive for that kind yeah. of job, but, uh, but uh, yeah, I've done, I've done a variety of projects like that actually. Uh, and so, yeah, I do that, <clears throat> do consults, uh, you know, I, I charge by the hour for video consults. Um, and so various other things, uh, you know, I cobble together an income helping people in various ways. Mm -hmm. uh, it's so, yeah, I mean, it's expensive, but that's, that's the only downside for it. But other than that, I do it. Uh, yeah, for sure. And I also teach the online courses. So those yes. are the more affordable ways to engage with me for a month on Take a particular class. topic. So for $49, you can basically have a month to plague me with all the questions you have about the subject of the class that you're taking. And right. then there'll be a bunch of, uh, you know, re readings and challenge questions and things like that. And so that, that that's the whole point of these online courses. Uh, and so I recommend them if people want to hone their philosophies, their knowledge and skills and philosophy or ancient history or Jesus studies, New Testament studies, things like that. So awesome. Yeah, definitely do that. Also, he's got the books on Amazon. The latest, greatest. Are you working on a book real quick before we get started? Not not yet. Right now, I still haven't done the audio to this book that you're showing right now. Uh, and that's that's all my other books I've read. So they're all available and audible. This one I'm way behind. I just can't find the time. To do it, so I have to knock that out first before I actually start working on another book. I think my, my next books are good; would be more like anthologies, um, but I haven't decided yet. So I've, got, awesome. I've got a lot of like life things to resolve that are close to being tied up, uh, and then I'll have time again to actually. You're do the things. only person on planet Earth that has that. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> We're all busy. I totally get it. I really do. Consider joining the Patreon, of course, Myth Vision. I have to give a shout out, shameless plug for my own work. I work very hard to edit videos. This is the latest and greatest, The Epic of Jesus. It's like a documentary style using kind of Dennis McDonald's models and uh, the ideas of Greek liter literary uh, imitation and how that may have played into, and I say, I'm, I'm, I'm convinced that this is an absolute thing that is playing. The imitation is there. How much of it's mimetic, if we want to get technical on that term, that's a whole different question, but it's kind of a cool documentary that's like 29 minutes long and Everyone really enjoyed it so far. All in the Nations, this woman right here, her book, Patel Bartholo's book, amazing interview going into the historical background on pagan Rome's influence on Jewish minds and thought, even though they called them Esau. How much influence did they really have? I, I swear, reading this literature by everyone, including Dr. Carrier, even if you disagree at the end of the day, because me and Carrier, <laughs> yeah. things, like I can appreciate, I can value, I can respect, and it will... I don't know. It'll hone in your skills to be a better thinker. And you give good interviews. I have to say, like, I recommend people watch the interviews you do. And you, you interview a wider range of scholars than most people do uh, and and let them, like, explain their theories and, and their work and stuff. And it's really valuable. Um, so I, I praise you for that. Thank you so much, Dr. Carrier. All right. Now, now it's time to harass Dr. Carrier. Uh, I'm kidding. Uh, thank you, everybody in the chat. Let me go ahead and give our first people who showed up. I'm giving out myth points. I am mimetically copying Pine Creek, except myth points. And uh, you can catch them out at the gates of heaven. So right here, we have a thousand myth points for a wonderfuler. Thank you, my friend. 500 for the Stevening. Make sure you're writing this stuff down because it's in my uh, the Eternal Book of Life. 
if you guys ever like anger me, I might blot you out. But anyway, uh, there's 500 for the Stevening. Uh, you you have myth points, and Mr. Willis, I hope I'm saying that wireless. Hope I'm pronouncing that right. You have 250 pine points, my friend. So first three people, I'm copying, mimetically copying. I'm telling you <laughs> that I'm plagiarizing Pine Creek's channel here right now. And uh, you three, thank you for showing up early. Welcome everybody in the chat. Dharma Defender said, Jesus never existed. Thank God. <laughs> oh, you guys are funny. Uh, Dennis, let's see. I'm just going to jump right into our first question and let's have some fun. Yeah, Thank you it. to everyone. I just wanted to say to everyone, Man, Bear, Pig, Byron, uh, Canelo, Median, uh, and on and on. I'll keep seeing people. Thank you, everybody who's showing up. Hit that like button so Satan can't win against us today. And uh, Chris, thanks for the super chat. When will we get on the historicity of Moses? <laughs> That's already been done, right? Uh, so um, uh, Thomas Thompson's books uh, are the the real are the the equivalent of my on the historicity of Jesus. It's now become mainstream, so you can get uh, like Finkelstein and Silberman's book, uh, The Bible Unearthed, which will go into the the reasons why uh, the mainstream scholars don't think Moses existed. So that that's already been mainstreamed. So, um, and it's outside my, actually my direct field. So I wouldn't do Hebrew studies. I do Gre Greco-Roman studies. So that's why Christianity is my, my orbit and Hellenistic Judaism is my orbit, but, uh, we're talking way before that. So of course, a different set of skills. Uh, and so other historians have knocked that out already. Um, so I, I won't be doing, I won't be doing a book on that subject myself. Just a question. I don't know if you read DM Murdoch's, uh, Moses book, but, I know that you disagree with her at the end of the I, day. I haven't anything. read her book. Never read Moses, it? Okay. No. <laughs> no comment then. No comment. Uh, Constellation Pegasus, thank you so much for the super chat, my friend. Always good to see you here. Are there verses missing at the end of the book of Jonah? Even the Jehovah's Witness comment on how the book abruptly ends. Uh, interesting question. I don't know. I haven't looked into this. Uh, so this is another example. of Jonah is an intertestamental, uh, or not intertestamental, it's one of the exile books. So it's a book that was composed under Persian influence. Um, but it, so it's like just on the cusp of where my expertise starts, but it's it's just before that. So uh, I don't really do Jonah studies and I haven't looked into this question in particular. If, if I were, I, I know what resources and what scholars to consult. Uh, so I would recommend looking at uh, the New Interpreter's Bible Old Testament survey. And you can get this as a single volume. If you can't afford it, go to your local library and interlibrary loan it uh because they they'll do that they'll actually get the book from anywhere in the world uh and and it might take some weeks but they'll get it for you and then you can read the chapter on jonah and see what they what the scholars say because that that particular volume is fairly up to date i mean it could probably be even more up to date there's new stuff since but uh fairly up to date and mainstream so it gives you like what is the scholarly perspective on this uh and um and so if you want that answer that's that's a good place to start and another place to start would be the hermenea commentary on jonah uh, the Hermeneia commentary series is the most scholarly and most mainstream. It has some apologetics in it, but it's it's most it's more mainstream than any other Bible, Bible commentary you'll find. Uh, has footnotes, you know that kind of thing, <laughs> actually, yeah. and is concerned about the scholarly questions more than the exegetical questions, right? So it's more interested in the history about these books than how you preach them, right? So so the Hermeneia commentary is the best series to get on this. So if you can find a copy of the Hermeneia commentary and Jonah. It's, ideally the most recent version because they do update them uh that would be a place that would another place to look uh, or both wow yeah i must admit the historicals i used to be the ex exegetical you know read all these commentaries on ephesians and that when i was in bible college yeah 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 most, I, most bible commentaries you go into the library and go oh a bible commentary and you pull it out and you're like what the hell is this it's a preaching and, and type of right exactly they're teaching well this is what we think it means for us now and here's how you would, and like no that's not what i want to know yeah <laughs> and, and know that, that's the actual stuff some, right i want the history because that that'll right, tell me right. origins or why maybe more than anything Thank you so much for that. Jason Anderson, thank you for the super sticker, my friend. Really appreciate that. Good to see everybody. Apes, snake, uh, apes kill, ape kill snake, and Gnostic informant, my buddy Neil. We are. Oh. <laughs> little, uh, little, little impeller. Thank you for the super chat. Why do some think Jesus was modeled after Caesar? Um, why do some? Uh, there's a variety of reasons. Some of it's crankery, uh, tea leaves, right? Finding patterns in tea leaves. Uh, but there is the, so, so some of the examples, so I'll give you an example of a good uh, attempt at this, uh, which was um, 
I have it right here? No, I don't. Um, I can't remember the exact title, but it's something uh, et tu Caesar. So, um, but, uh, or et tu Judas or something like that. But there, there's, a, there's a scholar who's not an expert. He's an amateur, but he wrote an interesting analysis of how the gospel story kind of rewrites the Caesar story in play format, right? And so he has, and he's wrong. I don't think he's correct. Uh, but he at least had a balanced kind of view. And the idea, the general idea that you see with these kinds of things, um, there's another price, not not Robert Price, but there's a you know, RG Price does yeah, some books yeah. on this, this same topic too, that I think are fairly good. Uh, I don't always agree with him, but uh, at least he's being more measured in this idea. And the idea is that the Gospels were written in reaction to the destruction of uh, Rome or destruction of Jerusalem by Rome uh, and are also reacting to the Roman Empire as a thing. So, so if, and a lot of, one of the values that you see definitely being represented, the techniques represented in the gospels is called transvaluation. This is something that Thomas Brody has talked about. Um, and then Dennis McDonald also borrowed it and, and uses it in his work too. But transvaluation is where you take a story and then you reverse aspects of it uh, because you want to sell the opposite message. And an example is um, the Emmaus narrative in Luke uh, is a story. If I don't know if you know this story, but it's like Jesus shows up after the, he's, he's dead and he shows up meets the disciples, but they don't recognize him. He's like, mm -hmm. they think he's just some old man hanging out with them or whatever. So he's in disguise, right? <clears throat> and and there's this whole revelation that leads to their realizing that, oh, Jesus is risen in the gospel, et cetera. And you'll have eternal life, yada, yada. So it's like, it is a gospel story, but it totally copies the Romulus story. So Romulus is the founder of Rome, right? So the Romulus story, the same thing happens, except it's a glorious appearance. Romulus appears on the road to the, to the disciple, in in glorious visage and says you will have a great empire if you keep my commandments etc so it's, it's the same kind of thing however that's the roman story is about imperial powers a secular power worldly power that you will have worldly power if you follow my gospel and it's associated with the the uh, aggrandizement gloriousness right whereas the the emmaus narrative is is, is a humble narrative jesus shows up in disguise he's not in glorious raiment and and the message is a spiritual kingdom, not it's, it's anti-worldly, right? So it's, it's the message. So they're borrowing the same story and they're changing these things specifically to sell to tell you that they're selling a different message. That they're not promoting worldly empire. They're promoting the opposite of the worldly empire, and they're not promoting gloriousness than glorification. They're promoting humility, right? So uh, and so this is how the message of the gospel is different from the message of Rome. And, and they use this story so that you recognize that they are changing the story and the changes are what their point is. That's, that's why they're, mm. they have different values. And so it makes sense to do the same thing with Julius Caesar, the founder, the purported founder of the Roman Empire, or to do it with Titus, who uh, is the general who is primarily responsible for the destruction of Jerusalem. Uh, and so, and, and became a later Caesar, right? So it was probably, might have been a Caesar when uh, Mark wrote or uh, certainly when Matthew did, right? So um, so it, it would make sense. Like it's plausible to think that they would transvalue the story of these guys into the story of Jesus to say that we are selling a different message and these guys are selling. So that makes mm -hmm. sense. Uh, and I've seen some scholars do decent work attempting to extract that. I don't think it holds up in the long, in the long run, but I've also seen some serious crankery on this too. So you gotta be really cautious about, about who you're reading uh, and there were a serious tea leaf reading where they're just seeing things in the text that aren't there. Um, so, so, so it's plausible. It's just, and that's the reason why it's plausible. Uh, but you need to use caution when you're, when you're looking at anyone trying to argue it. Well put, thank you. I was thinking of Adele Collins or, you know, she has an interesting, uh, model yes. there too, but not to that's, get lost that's, in that. And, uh, you're right. And that's, that's <clears throat> a real, she's a real scholar, right? Like yeah. actual degrees in the CV and publications. So, uh, under peer review. So, uh, that, that's a good example of, uh, Adela Collins is a good example of, um, work to look at where, where this kind of thing is being done and done well. Thank you. Constellation Pegasus, as a reference here, is the ending of Mark 16, 9 through 20 completely made up and not original? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for people who are interested. There's like um, nine or ten endings, aren't there? Right. Like <laughs> uh this is the book in which i have the whole the complete chapter on this subject like the most thorough treatment of this subject that exists uh where i actually survey all the scholarship on this and all the arguments pro and con uh and show uh even the pentecostals agree that it's not original i i, I often joke and i probably on this show have, have joked about there's a, there's an article that i used for this which was published in the pent there's a peer-reviewed 
uh, Pentecostal uh, uh, sectarian journal where they, where they do biblical studies. And some, some of the articles are decent. Uh, and, and there's one on this where it is actually a really good scholarly article. And it is so good, in fact, that they have to admit by the end, you know, we've looked through everything. We've tried really hard to establish that this is authentic, but we have to admit that it is a forgery. Uh, we have to, it, it was added. It was Mark didn't write it. Uh, but then they tack on a paragraph that says, but the forgery was inspired by God. So it is still acceptable <laughs> scripture. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so I was like, well, at least that's honest, right? I like that style of scholarship where they're, they're doing real scholarship and they support their dogma with a faith statement, not with like trying to jank the evidence, right? That so that's cool. Uh, so I have more respect for that kind of apologetics than because at least yeah. it's honest about like, like, oh yeah, we're, we're doing the scholarship for real, but we're going to come up with a side reason to accept it anyway. Um, all right. <laughs> Keep playing with snakes, everybody. Right, Keep right. But people who want to know the whole backstory on that, uh, my my book uh, has that whole chapter in it. And and my conclusion, I mean, apart from it being forgery, is that I suspect that it got moved over from a commentary. I, I think that this was someone we know. So we know there were some early commentaries on the Gospels, like Ariston supposedly wrote this commentary that we don't we hear about, but we don't have any examples of. Um, but if he were writing the commentary on the other gospels and were writing a commentary on Mark, he might have added like, well, and you notice Mark doesn't have the endings that the others do, but here's what, here's a summary, like a combined harmonization of those other endings. And so I think there was probably a commentary on Mark where that was done. And then someone said, oh, this looks like it would make a great ending to Mark. And they just took it from the commentary and plopped it into Mark and it just became the end, the new ending to Mark. Uh, I suspect that's what's happened because whoever wrote that long ending is actually harmonizing all the other three gospels, uh, Luke, Matthew, and John. They, they clearly know those other gospels and they are concerned about those gospels and no others. So we're already talking about the specific sect that selected these four gospels. So, so it, there's, there's definite consciousness here uh, that the gospels, those four gospels have already been assembled uh, and then someone's commenting on Mark. And so, so it wasn't even in the original edition of the fourfold gospel. Uh, it, it got added later, and it, the evidence suggests third century or fourth century. Thank you so much. Dharma Defender says, Dr. Carrier, and thank you, Dharma. I'm interested in more uh, in more in-depth thoughts about Taoism. What are your thoughts about the philosophy of Tao Te Ching? Uh, Zhang, Zhangzi? Zhangzi. 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 Yeah, Zhangzi. Uh, um, so, um, so you might know him as Chuang Tzu. Uh, or, um, so there's, there's Lao Tzu and Chuang Tzu are the two, you know, in, in Pinyin, not Pinyin, Wade Giles, uh, system, but anyway, different ways of, of spelling and pronouncing. But, um, so there, there's, uh, those are the two leading famous philosophers who are at least attributed as the authors of some of the most prominent, like the core scriptures of Taoism. Uh, I used to be a Taoist. So people who, who don't know that I was, uh, I was, that was my only genuine faith belief. It was the only religion I genuinely had faith in. Um, and I was converted by religious experience and the whole thing. So it's a lot of like, uh, and, and, and eventually came to realize that the religious experiences had scientific explanations, uh, and, uh, and moved on. But, uh, I tell that story in sense and goodness without God. So people want to know that, uh, my background in Taoism and things like that. But I also have an article on my old blog, which is still up. You can find it on blogspot. Uh, it's Richard Carrier. I don't remember blogspot dot com or something but uh, you, you can find it but if you go looking there you can find i have an article on i have a couple actually on taoism because someone asked me like about my favorite translations uh of the Tao Te Ching, uh and someone asked me like about how does it affect me for philosophically and I, I think i wrote an article about that too so people who want to get into that stuff there's more stuff there uh in my old blog about it i don't write about it very much anymore because it's just not in my interest area um but uh I have a lot of thoughts, so you'd have to be more specific in your question. So about what what I would say about Taoism, um, I think it's a much like so. There's two different forms of Taoism. There's philosophical Taoism, and then there's traditional Taoism. Traditional Taoism is wackadoo. It is all about magic and sorcery and superstitions and things, and it's ridiculous. Uh, and that is the most practiced form of Taoism, unfortunately. Uh, philosophical Taoism just takes the philosophy without all the sorcery and the supernatural, because there isn't really any of that in the scriptures. So there isn't any reason to have all of that add on garbage, that weird stuff. Um, and uh, so uh, so the same way that people treat Confucianism, right? Confucianism is the same way. You can just go to the Analects 
or uh, the Lunheng or all these other you know, famous Confucian texts and just read them as philosophy. And it, Lunheng in particular by Wang Chung is very skeptical. It's, it is like, it is an example of secular naturalism as a worldview in ancient China, right? So as a Han dynasty author, totally just believes in the supernatural and so on and, and gives like naturalistic explanations for things. So you could just read Confucianism like that, but of course Confucius himself, or at least according to the, the five great classics, um, Confucius himself promoted the superstitions, not because they're true, but because they were necessary for the well-ordering of society. So for his ideas, like you should worship the spirits of your ancestors. Eh, there might not be any spirits of ancestors. D don't, don't go into that, but <laughs> it's important for the well-ordering of society that you do that. Like the rituals and the respect, uh, the, the conceptual results of this are good for society. So Confucianism is uh, pro-religion, but only as a fun for as a functionalist, not as a, not as a supernaturalist. But the result is that Confucianism, in practice, has a ton of superstitions piled on top of it that aren't mm -hmm. in the Confucian classics, right? So you got to be aware of what are you talking about when you're talking about uh, Taoism or Confucianism. Thank you so much, Doc Pleroma. Good to see you here, my friend. Thank you for the super chat, my friend. You grew wings right before my eyes. By the way, Pine Creek was in the chat. It's a shame, shame, shame. What? Dude, I came up with the points first. <laughs> Satan is tricking people here right now. I came up with the points and then you took them, Doug. Why are you trying to act like I'm the one taking from you? You took from me. That's the shame here. Anyway, I like Doc, I like Doc Pleroma not. That's a great name. <laughs> it is. Hey, he, he always comes up with some wild questions. Let me tell you, I enjoy him. Luke, 24. do you, you want to see a movie about a, a Pleroma not that turns it into horror? It becomes a horror narrative. Uh, it's called the Black Mirror. Black Mirror? I think it's called Black Black Rainbow. Sorry, Black Rainbow, not Black Mirror. Black Mirror is the TV show. No, Black Rainbow is this obscure, uh, pulpy uh, sci-fi horror movie that that is a emulation of an '80s movie. It's designed to look like it was a movie made in the '80s uh, and uh, a horror movie. Uh, and so uh, it involves people kind of essentially going to the mystic realm and coming back wrong. And so if you uh, want to see like Pleroma not as a, as a horror story, that's uh, black rainbow. It's, it's a bizarre film, but interesting in that respect. Um, Luke, question. You can go ahead. Yeah. Luke 13 to 53 seems to parallel episodes from the Odyssey. How much do you see the cor correction of Cleopas misunderstanding of Jesus teachings as resembling Nestor and the theox theoxony of Athena? I haven't looked into this. So um, obviously the place to look into it would be Dennis, um, Dennis <laughs> McDonald's book. I think he's got specifically a commentary on Luke. Uh, well, this he, it's not titled a commentary, but it's basically where he looks at Luke looking for parallels like this. Um, and if it's, if it's anywhere, if anyone's noticed it and has made an argument for it, uh, it would be there. Uh, so I would, I would recommend checking that out. Uh, I don't remember which of his books would be the best one uh to check on that but he has he has one i think it's on luke acts that's specifically in the title um or the subtitle uh, and that would be the one to check uh, where he goes into these kinds of questions <laughs> he's coming out with a parallel i don't know if it, well i guess the parallels is going to be more about the deuteronomy parallels rather than the the odyssey parallels but he's coming out with one that'll be free eventually it'll be online it's a big pdf where he's going to try and collate everything into one place uh and most of the focus is going to be on the deuteronomy material uh, but I do think it does mention um, uh, Homeric and similar material. So, so that would this might be in that as well. But it's not out yet. So, his book on uh, parallels between Homer and Luke that is out, and you can find that mm -hmm. uh, online uh, or just, uh, on Amazon or wherever. Just so Doc knows, I did email him just now, literally as we were talking. So Dennis will get this, and I know him. He might end up calling me. That's just how he is. <laughs> He's just, that's this kind of guy. Dennis, like, hey, my friend, how are you? And then he's like, hey. And then he starts to answer. So thank you for yeah. that, Doc. I did email him. Let's see what he has to say. Caleb Jackson, my favorite Christian, maybe my second favorite. Jonathan Sheffield and you are like my two, like, go-to Christian guys I really love talking to. How would you respond to criticisms that parallel a mania, such as between the Gospels and the Torah, Homer, etc., is unfalsifiable and poor methodology? It's a good question uh, because it comes up a lot, right? And you can find countless examples of ridiculous parallelomania. Uh, and so the question is, is there a valid way to do this? Or is it all just the same tea leaf reading? 
Uh, the, the answer is yes, because <laughs> we've done it for ages and ages. It's called literary theory. We, we're doing it all the time and have been for decades and decades in every other field. People only freak out when it's suddenly Jesus we're talking about. Uh, but if, but in every other field, uh, religion, myth studies, literary studies, um, finding what's called mimesis, which is the emulation and transvaluation of prior texts, uh, is so common and is actually a, a standard uh, a study field uh, within history and literature and so on. Uh, we do it all the time, um, and so there and there are techniques for doing it correctly and for finding. And what I would say by correctly is a method by which you can show that the parallel is more probable than not, uh, and, and therefore not just something you're seeing. Uh, and there are techniques for this, uh, and I discuss it in Proving History, uh, my book on historical method. I have a whole section on how to do proper mimesis criticism and how to do it using a, a probability metric, right? So uh, you, need, you need certain things that will increase the probability that the parallels you're saying are there are really there. Uh, and one of, the, one of them is, is purpose, right? There has to be... Uh, something, a demonstrable reason to have done this. Like it has to fit the context. Uh, and, you know, a, a, let's t pick a trivial example that I, that I mentioned in On the Historicity of Jesus, which is West Side Story, right? So uh, no one would say, oh, parallelomania, that's not Romeo and Juliet. That's just parallelomania. And it's like, you know, it's obviously a riff. Uh, it is a rewrite of Romeo and Juliet. And they've changed some things. You know, it's gangs in New York. It's uh, Puerto Ricans now. It's knives and guns instead of swords. It's, you know, there's a lot of things that have been changed. It's it's in song. It's a musical and not, uh, and not a straight play. Uh, so, and so if you, you could go argue against it, well, it can't be Romeo and Juliet because it's a musical and Romeo and Juliet wasn't a musical. It can't be Romeo and Juliet because they have guns and, and not swords. And it's, there's no Puerto Ricans in New Orleans and Juliet, et cetera. So you go and you could act like that. But everybody would recognize that that's a dumb argument, right? It's like, it's obvious that they're borrowing all the core elements of Romeo and Juliet and rewriting it in a new way for a new message for a new audience, right? So um, so that's an example of mimesis criticism that's valid. And, ob and you, it's obvious that there is a valid way to do that. Um, and But th then you can see someone that would say like, you know, uh, someone would try to find a movie and find, try to find a parallel. And it's like, I don't think the parallels you're seeing there are really there. Like, I don't think the author of the, of the movie really knew what you're talking about. Um, so you can find bad examples of it, but there are legitimate ones. And so if you want to see like a criteria based uh, probabilistic logic uh, behind this, how you would do it formally and correctly. Uh, I have a whole section on that in proving history uh, where I go up into that, how we do that. And, and the way we do that is to go look at how it's been done before outside the context of where people freak out. Like instead of looking at Jesus studies, <laughs> <laughs> Go look at, uh, for instance, the example that I've given on the history of the city of Jesus is how scholars have thoroughly demonstrated that the Aeneid of Virgil yeah. is a huge copy and rewrite of the Homeric epics, the Odyssey in particular, right? So, uh, so, uh, but it's not just the Odyssey; he borrows from the Iliad and the Odyssey, and he's rewriting scenes and how you do that and how you how you show that that's being done. Um, that's all plain and that that's mainstream studies of Virgil and Homeric studies That's mainstream, right? There's nothing, no one freaks out about it being parallel mania. Uh, so, but there's a legitimate way to do it. And so you have to go look and see what, what techniques are being used in those other fields where it's really being done. Uh, and then you have to port those methods over and you can't just go looking for anything that you can make with any leap of retrofitting. Uh, that's not valid. You, you do need to use some sort of discipline. Awesome. Yeah, there's so much here. We got so many super chat questions. It's ridiculous. And so I want to thank you all, of course, for the support. Um, I really appreciate that. Let me turn off my AC real quick because it makes noise. Oh, and yeah, then, I was going to say. <laughs> and then and then let me uh, continue here. Here's our next one. If you want to start on it, you can. Uh, you, thank you, you Marcus. You turned off your AC. I just turned off my heater. That tells you how different. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we're, we're going to have snow up here coming in a few days. Okay. Sorry. M Hello, Mr. Carrier. <laughs> we are all just wondering if you could tell us why you are so awesome and how did that occur? Derek, always love your stuff. <laughs> Thank you for the super chat. Uh, what, what, what is it? Uh, oh, nuts and berries. Uh, no. <laughs> uh, proper diet. No. Uh, I, honestly, just um, being uh what i want to say healthily self-critical right like rather than being like toxically self-critical which people can be um rather than doing that um 
engaging in healthy self-criticism to try and improve my knowledge and not get stuck in ruts that other people get stuck in, in terms of assuming certain things are true. I always like to figure out like, how can I test my beliefs and improve them over time? And I've been doing this for a long time, right? So decades now. Uh, so, you know, it's like, I'm, I'm very different kind of person now than I was, you know, 20 years ago. Um, so it's taken a lot of work, but focusing on that. And, I, and that's true in philosophy. It's true in history, like in all, and even in my knowledge of science and other things is like, I'm really aiming at making sure that my information and my knowledge and understanding is correct and always looking for opportunities to test it and fix it uh, if it's wrong. Right. So uh, uh, if, 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 you know, insofar as the question's even meant to be sincere. Yeah. You literally uh, that, interpreted that's, that. In some <laughs> that's, what would, that's what I would say. That's I what I would recommend like, to people. Is, he just is that. found this message to mean something and he just <laughs> went, well, I'm critical of myself. Now you, you, yeah. I really enjoy uh, hanging out with you. Of course uh, we, we did that in California and it was really mm -hmm. cool. Um, you hung out with, with Dennis. It was really, really cool watching you guys get jump, drunk every night, you know? I'm just that was fun. <laughs> yeah, I loved it. Yeah. No, but seriously, it was really fun learning so much from you guys. Festering Boils, thank you for the super chat, my friend. You do know everybody who super chats gets like direct access into heaven. Uh, 72 of whatever you want other than virgins. Um, so just keep that in mind. Were Jews still being stoned as punishment for adultery in Jesus' time? And was Jesus upholding stone? Sorry, upholding stoning laws in Matthew 5.18. Could the pericope adultery, adultery story have been added to oppose stoning? Well, okay, it's two questions. Um, the short answer is yes. Uh, in, um, so we still have that in the mission and the Talmud are quite plain on this. Uh, so um, now to what extent, like to what extent people got let off? Right. Uh, that, that is a different question that you would have to ask someone like Jody Magnus or someone who's an expert in uh, Second Temple Judaism. Right. So they like there are experts who studied this stuff more who could talk about how much people how, how often it really happened. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, it was on the books. And and by all accounts, it was a thing that could happen to you um, to be stoned for this. And <clears throat> so so that's true. Uh, and yes, the Jesus in Matthew is totally like, even if it were the case that stoning weren't happening, the Jesus of Matthew wants it back. Uh, that, that is definitely what's going on in Matthew. Matthew is like, Matthew's Jesus is saying, essentially, you guys are slackers. Like, you, you, you're not following the law by the letter like the way God intended. Like, you need to go back and follow it even more strictly than, than Mo Moses was being nice to you guys. Like you need to be even stricter. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that's the thing there are some aspects in Matthew where Jesus goes lighter than the conservatives, but most of Matthew's Jesus is very much like a Shammai, uh, which is the conservative sect of Pharisees uh, is very similar in many respects. Like I said, there's some aspects where he's more liberal than them, but not a lot. Uh, whereas when you get to Mark and, and Luke, Jesus is much more like a Hillelite. Uh, so which is the liberal wing of the Pharisees. Uh, in fact, it's almost verbatim, like the almost the exact same, like a, a Hillelite Pharisee would be citing with Jesus on almost every point made in, in the Gospels. So um, in the Mark and Luke especially. So and John even. So the, so that's the but that's the basic background. Now, uh, is is the uh, pericope adulteri, which is a story that got added to John. We don't know where it came from. Um, there's, it, it's actually in Luke in some manuscripts. So it floats around. Uh, so it's this story where a woman is taken in adultery. She's going to be stoned for the crime. And, and, uh, and then the, the Pharisees, I think, or the, the Sanhedrin asks him like something like, I'm, do, should we do this? And he's like, well, let the first among you throw the first, let the, let the uh, one with you, uh, one among you without sin, throw the first stone. I'm like, oh, Okay. Then maybe we should let her go. But the, the ending of it is that Jesus says, uh, you know, you are forgiven, but go and sin no more. Right. So it, Jesus is not saying, oh, go be an adulteress. That's great. Uh, so he's still saying go and sin no more. So there's there's still an ominous threat of something there. Right. Like, so there's going to be some punishment for you. Hmm. Um, so is the story specifically against stoning? I, that could be. Um, but I think by the time that story gets written, because it appears after it's uh, we don't know when it's like early second century, probably, because it doesn't appear earlier in the Gospels. Um, so uh, by the time that's a thing, I, 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 it might not even be in a Jewish context anymore. So like stoning might not even be on the mind as a thing, right? Because uh, there's there's a lot more law and order. Uh, so mind you, this is after the Jewish war. So after the Jewish war, the treaty with Judea was nullified. 
So the Jews lost the power to actually enforce their own laws. Right. Um, unless they had it specifically worked out municipality by municipality, right? So um, so whether after the Jewish war, whether people were being stoned for adultery is a, is a more open question. That I haven't looked into. Um, there would be reasons to suspect not, but you'd have to check to find out because uh, the, the basis for allowing you to just murder people based on your own arbitrary laws within the Roman Empire was the treaty. But the treaty is gone after 70. So so that's a whole different story. And or by is this get, trying to fix that problem by showing forgiveness? Yeah, I, I don't know. So it, it, know. it could be. Uh, I think the, the main gist of the story is forgiveness and waiting for the apocalypse should replace um, enforcement of the law. And this is actually in Matthew as well. So Matthew says the same thing. Um, uh, and, and for the individual, it doesn't necessarily say the courts should do this, but the way the pericope of adultery is going a little bit beyond Matthew and saying, well, even the courts should just let people go because God's going to burn them to hell in a couple of days. You know, that kind of, that's the, that's the thinking. But in Matthew, he's saying individuals shouldn't even take people to court. Don't punish anyone. Like no matter how big a sinner they are, no matter how much they abuse you, even if they enslave you, rob you, kill you, kill your family, doesn't matter. Do nothing. Because if you do something, you might slip up and sin. Whereas if you do nothing, God's going to come and melt everybody in a you know couple of years anyway, and you're going to live forever in heaven. So who cares if you're a slave between now and then? Right. Uh, who cares if your family gets killed? doesn't matter. They're all going to get raised and live in paradise. So it doesn't matter, right? So that's the Matthew's version. It's very apocalyptic. This idea that you should just, this is the whole turn the other cheek. It's not some like wise ethic. It's literally just, just don't risk sinning because it's almost over. Just, just got to hang on for a little bit. Suffer as much as possible. Let criminals kill and eat you even. It doesn't matter. Because God's going to sort it out very soon. And so this is a very dark apocalyptic worldview. It's not a very uplifting one. Mm. Uh, by the time the Pericope Adulteri gets written, though, uh, we're in a, a different context and things have changed. So it's harder to know what its original intent was, especially because it's out of context. Like, did it did it get taken out of another gospel that we don't have and got moved over? Don't know. Uh, was it a part of one of the redactions of John? We know our version of John is a third redaction. So two other authors or groups of authors have gone over it moved it around, taken things out, added things. So it's been edited multiple times. And this is a mainstream view. This isn't just some weird thing I'm saying. Uh, the, the, all the leading uh, Johannine scholars agree that our John is a multiply redacted text. So, and we have like the Egerton gospel, which has other weird stuff that overlaps with John, but has other weird stories in it. Is the Egerton gospel one of the earlier redactions and stuff got pulled out? Uh, so the Percopi Adulteri could have been in one of these earlier redactions and, and got pulled out of some copies and not others. Who knows? Like, it's too complicated to answer this question. And because we don't have the original context, it's harder to think in terms of what its original point was. But it is definitely selling Matthew's idea that forgiveness should replace punishment on Earth because celestial punishment is coming. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think that's that's the main gist of it. Now, is there a subtext of also like stoning is stupid? That that's possible, uh, but it's hard to hard to know for sure. Thank you so much. Doc Pleromonauts back again. Thank you, my friend, for the super chat. Jesus' pre-existence is neither articulated in the synoptics nor in Acts. But wouldn't the I have come sayings be analogous to saying made by heavenly visitors to earth? That's a good point. Uh, and the fact, right? So uh, <clears throat> it, it can be interpreted both ways. I I think it, it might even be deliberately vague. Uh, and here's here's the reason. So we know that Mark is composing his gospel based on the epistles of Paul and the theology of Paul. So Mark is very much reifying Paul's teachings into the gospel uh, and into a gospel narrative. And for people who want to see the scholarship on this and the examples, I have a blog article on how Mark uses the epistles of Paul. You can go to my website, richardcarrier.info, search for Mark and epistles of Paul and read. And I have a bibliography of this is mainstream scholarship. I have a bibliography on it. And then I give many examples uh, from the literature on this. So Mark is definitely using Paul and Paul is definitely a preexistent. His theology is definitely a preexistent Jesus deaf. I mean, a full on angelic Jesus model, right? So the fact that that's not in Mark means that Mark is deliberately avoiding it. Uh, right. So it's not that he disagrees with it because he doesn't argue against it. He just hides it completely. And so I think this is part of what Mark is doing when he says in Mark chapter four, that uh, to everyone outside, everything we told them in parables, but the truth will only be told to you in secret. And so Mark is doing the same thing. He's giving this straightforward historical narrative about this, you know, abused prophet. 
Um, but the underlying subtext that you're supposed to be taught in secret is this is all allegory for the celestial mission of God, right? So, so I think that I think it's deliberately removed because he doesn't want it overt, and I think it creeps back in over time. By the time you get to John, it's all the all the way back into the preface, or at least our final redaction of John. Let's make it that uh, put it that way. Um, so over time, it actually Jesus the original secret teachings start to leak out into the text. Uh, and, you know, by the time you get to Matthew, you've already got the nativity where you're kind of, you're getting close to uh, hinting at the same, same model. Right. And so um, it, it's over. And by the time you get to John, it's outright pre-existence doctrine is right there in the preface. So I think the, the, that as a secret doctrine just starts to leak out into public doctrine over time. Um, but it obviously was already doctrine, like uh, and except would have been accepted by Marx, even though he's not including it in his version of it. Uh, so, so I think that's how you got to look at the text in context. Thank you so much, uh, Oh Flamio. Thank you for the super chat. In Egypt, pharaohs are worshipped as gods. We have historical confirmation that pharaohs existed. How do atheists separate the divinity from pharaohs? Well. Uh, Rulers in general are regarded as divine in some sense, right? So not just in Egypt. Egypt isn't the only place. Um, the you Roman emperors... argue in the Bible, sons of God technically can be a divine title, even if it is a king yeah. figure in a way. In, in right. Typically. It's it's less so in the, in the Old Testament than you'd find like the, the Roman emperors where they actually right. were deified. Um, they tended to be deified after death, however. Uh, so they would be <laughs> quasi-worshipped in life, but they would be properly gods after they died uh and there's a famous joke that vespasian who's the the emperor who uh, defeated judea in the jewish war uh, and his son titus is the one who actually was the main general but but vespasian was was busy conquering rome uh, at the same time uh defeating uh, uh nero's forces and so on but um but Vespasian has a famous line where, uh, according to Suetonius, where he's dying, he's on his deathbed, and someone asks him, how do you feel? And he says, I feel like I'm becoming a god. And he's joking, because he's like, he means I'm going to die, and you're going to deify me. I know what's coming, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of mocking the idea of deifying. Um, wow. Emperors. But but it was common to do, right? So, uh, so, so the question is, how do you separate divinity from that? And it depends. There's two different ways to ask that question. One is politically. What is what does deifying a, a you know a leader mean politically? Like it, ha, it, it apart from supernaturally, like what does it mean politically? That's one analysis. Another is how do you separate like the supernatural component from the natural? And that's what we do with everything, right? So um, we don't have a difficulty just discerning that you know when Vespasian, when the story is that Vespasian healed someone with a touch, that that wasn't real supernatural healing. That was like a a faith healing act that we know like you know psychosomatic or um, tall tale uh so there's various ways that that can uh, come to be so that's just the same way we analyze history in general where we know the supernatural doesn't exist so when it appears there has to be some other explanation for how that story got told and so that's what we we look for um a different question altogether to ask is that we have the pharaoh osiris um who is a pre-existent deity who descends to earth becomes incarnate does all of these amazing things gets killed uh by his own people and then uh, ascends uh, to heaven in in, in glorious uh, power and then controls the the fates of the dead and so on. Um, there is no Osiris. We we have a very Egypt is one of the few uh, empires uh, of of antiquity for which we have a re, a continuous record, a reliable epigraphic continuous record of who was ruling when. And there's no Osiris. So there, so we know Osiris didn't exist. We can confirm there is no historical Osiris. Even though by the time of the Roman Empire. Everybody is trying to place him in history as a specific mm -hmm. pharaoh who actually existed, but he didn't. Uh, and so that's an example of how we can show that Osiris didn't exist because we actually have a continuous record and can show it. Also, the all the context of the stories told about him are ridiculous. So they, like they, they can't even have a historical source. We do the same thing with Romulus. Romulus is a very suspicious name. It means, you know, essentially little Rome. Uh, so baby Rome. And so like the guy who founds Rome just happens to be called baby Rome like the we, we doubt these things. Uh, but the, the stories of Romulus only appear hundreds of years later. They, and they hugely emulate Greek myths. Um, so, uh, so that, so we, we have lots of reasons to doubt that Romulus ever existed as a person, but we don't have the continuous epigraphic record to verify it, uh, the way we do for Osiris. Mm, thank you. Appreciate that. Wayne Rossi. Thank you for the super chat. If the crucifixion was derived from the Hebrew Bible, why do the Christian prophetic claims for it seem like eisegesis? 
Uh, so there's different ways to answer this, depending on what it is, what assumptions are being made here. Um, so the word crucifixion, first of all, in an, in ancient, in Greek and Latin, doesn't mean what it means today. Uh, when we say crucifixion, we're thinking of cross post execution. Um, but the word back then was way more broad. It meant any hanging of the dead on a stick. That, it, impalement was crucifixion. Um, uh, killing someone, stoning them, and hanging them up on a tree is crucifixion. The word is the same for all of these different methods of execution and publicly publicly humiliating the corpse. So, um, so, so in antiquity, there there is no such distinction being made here. It's a much broader concept. And so, when we get into the the Mishnah, uh, for example, where we talk about uh, execution, there's four modes of execution in the Mishnah. Uh, you're set on fire, you're strangled, um, uh, you're stoned to death, or you're beheaded. Regardless of which one uh, is the thing, yeah, and they're 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 graphically described in the specific procedure you should follow, and it's horrific. Yeah, burn I mean, that guy. You, yeah, he he needs to be burned. Yeah, oh you, and if you read like the description of how you strangle, how you legally publicly strangle someone to death, it, it is horrifying. But anyway, it's a this what? is a brutal brutal religion, right? So anyway, um, brutal teachings. But um, regardless, the corpse would always be nailed up uh, on a wooden plank. Uh, and, and you could use any wooden, and they, there's a description of a particular way to do it in the Mishnah, but it's clear that you could do it wherever. So you can nail it on a tree, you can nail it on a stick, a vine prop, which is probably the way the Romans did it most commonly, because vine props were very common and you could easily get them. Uh, and so and so the, the nailing up of the corpse for public display is called a crucifixion, and that's just inherent in, uh, by the time we get to the Roman Empire, it's inherent in Jewish execution law. So it's in the Mishnah, like plain up. So, uh, and th there's other basis for this too. I, I cite the scholarship on this in on the historicity of Jesus in chapter four. There's an early section on definitions. I talk about crucifixion, and I cite the scholars who actually point out what I just pointed out to you is that the words are ambiguous. Um, so when you get to Christian prophetic claims, now there's a difference between ancient Christians and modern Christians. Now, when you're talking about modern Christians, they just don't know what the fuck they're talking about. Uh, right. So modern Christians are just repeating things that they've been told by modern scholars of their own ilk, meaning apologists and preachers and stuff. Um, they, they don't know this. Everything I just explained to you, they don't know that because they don't actually check these things. So so modern Christian apologists and uh, exegetes and so on are often deeply ignorant of what actually the reality was in the ancient world because they don't check. They, they, they check their own people's what they've said, uh, their own, you know, they'll, they'll read, you know, 19th century theologians. And not realize that maybe those theologians don't know what they're talking about either. Uh, maybe you should go check the original context, right? So that's why you get mainstream scholarship corrects all this stuff. So if you're actually paying attention to mainstream peer-reviewed scholarship, you will be corrected on these things. So modern Christian eisegesis and exegesis is often deeply uninformed. So it's not usable for understanding the ancient world. Ancient Christians, what we're looking at is Pesher. Uh, so, and Pesher, we see this in the Qumran, the Dead Sea sect. Pesher is where you look at the Bible and you find these disparate passages in different books, different periods, originally by the intention of the authors, never connected to each other. And you see tea leaf patterns and you go, oh, and then you come up with the story. You take them and you piece them together and you create a new story and you say, this is a hidden story that God hid there and the Holy Spirit is telling me that this is true. Now, this is completely bogus, but it's what they did, <laughs> right? So, and then they come up with these like ridiculous prophecies based on doing this, right? Like, like cherry picking passages, creating a new story that's a list of these passages and saying that God told me that this is a secret prophecy that he hid in the Bible. And then, you know, that, that this is, but this is normal. This is what Jewish, uh, especially fringe sects and apocalyptic sects and the sects most like Christianity were doing. So when we see the Christians doing it, already from Paul, you see Paul's doing it or, or referring to Christians doing it. Um, by the time you see that, it's the same thing. This is a pesher. So someone has assembled the theology of Christianity by grabbing disparate verses and creating a new story that's the secret story that God meant and this Holy Spirit told you it's true. And that is Christianity. That's how Christianity got originated. So what you're seeing there is a lot of that stuff, um, they're deliberately trying to support the crucifixion because they need that for their particular narrative. And, and, and sometimes they pick passages that actually do refer to crucifixion, and sometimes they take passages that don't, uh, and, and, to, and then claim that it refers to crucifixion because they want this particular gospel narrative, which is like 1 Corinthians 15. They want that narrative, so they look for every possible connection. And I discuss some of the examples of how they do this 
and how the connections are made in uh, chapter four, again, of On the History of Jesus. I have some elements in there uh, where I go into this element 18, for example, I go into that. But um, so, so it's both things happening at the same time, but it's, it's all crazy religious Holy Spirit stuff. It's, it's uh, a tea leaf reading that they're doing. Um, in, even in antiquity, but it, it is a was at the time a respected method that, that even other sects of Jews were doing. So, I, I'm I'm fascinated with uh, some of the really interesting uh, cultural background stuff. As we move into this next uh, super chat, real quick, I just want to mention why I mentioned this book that that I thought was so good by Cattell Bertolo and why uh, pagan Rome had influence on Jews. Th there was this problem. If a non-Jew is trying to convert and say this prayer, our the God of our fathers from Deuteronomy, and rabbis were saying, no, they are not descendants of Abraham. They cannot say the God of our fathers. Mm -hmm. The New Testament sprinkles this whole thing like the God of our fathers, right? These ideas. And I'm like, what, what's going on? Then another rabbi comes on and goes, that rabbi doesn't know what he's talking about. And he said, has he not read the scripture? And in the scripture, mm -hmm. this is how he interpreted it. You can see what, what's going on here. His name is Abraham, the father of many Goyim. You see, now they're like, <laughs> don't you see the scriptures predicted that these yeah. non-Israelite, non-descendants mm -hmm. would join? It's just fascinating what they would do. So yeah, yeah, yeah no, this this is like everything. Like the way Daniel gets reinterpreted and the way every everything gets reinterpreted. And Isaiah 52 and 53 got reinterpreted. It's in the Talmud where the they interpret it, the Jews themselves, the Talmudic Jews, like the most uh, you know, traditionalist Orthodox Jews you could think of, they themselves saw that as a future prediction mm -hmm. of a dying Messiah. Like they, they're explicit about this. And so uh, even though originally it was a metaphor for Israel itself, right? So, or, or it, it's Cyrus. So it's either Cyrus or Israel, they get conflated in later interpretations. But yeah, when these prophecies need to be relevant again, they reinterpret them in crazy weird ways. Uh, and it, even when they don't need to, uh, they will mm -hmm. do it. Thank you so much for that super chat, Chris. I read The Scientist in the Early Roman Empire. I did too. That was such amazing. Such a long book too. And now I'm interested in Christianity's role during the Dark Ages. Any book recommendations? Ah, well, so I keep getting asked about like Nixie's book and Freeman's book. I haven't read them. Um, I've read the, the freak out reviews, the criticisms uh, of uh, pro-Christian authors about them. The, the critical reviews don't sound like they're being fair to the text, but I can't tell you for sure if they are or not. So I don't know if Nixie and Freeman have written good books on this or not. Uh, maybe they have. I don't know. Um, the criticisms of them are often misinformed, and they're based on apologetics rather than um, sound analysis of the Dark Ages. So I have a chapter on this in uh, Christianity is Not Great, um, which is... a volume edited by John Loftus, um, has a lot of, actually all of these Loftus anthologies have amazing articles, uh, chapters by many experts on many subjects. I have, in the first three anthologies, that one included, I have two or three chapters in each. So in this one, I have a chapter on the Dark Ages where I specifically engage with the apologetics trying to deny the Dark Ages existed um, or that they were dark. Uh, and I, I counter it all. And I counter it all and cite actual scholars in the mainstream literature who agree and, and who are aware of this. This apologetic is a bit extreme and needs to be counteracted. Uh, and so I, I quote some of these scholars saying, like, it's kind of silly to say that they didn't exist and they weren't terrible. They existed and they're really terrible. Um, and so there's a lot of apologetic devices that will be used to try and deny it. So they will like, uh, redefine what the word dark ages means into something it was never meant to and indicate and then prove that the, it, the ages weren't like that. And then say, oh, then there weren't any dark ages. It's like, well, you've just engaged in equivocation fallacy, right? So that's a straw man argument. Um, so, uh, so there's a lot, of, and then there's e denying evidence or exaggerating evidence. Um, and so there's a lot of ways that this apologetic happens. So if you want to see that concentrated into one place, my chapter in that book is the place to start. And then there are scholars I cite in there and quote in there those would be the guys that you would go, uh, or, or women in some case, you would go and check for for more. Uh, and those are real peer-reviewed scholarly works, um, not pop market works like Nixie and Freeman's books. Not to knock Nixie and Freeman, I just haven't read them, so I can't I can't say whether they're good or bad. Thank you so much, Cade Welly. Good to see you here. It's been a minute. I recently watched your debate with James Valiant. Did you know he was going to flip out like that? Is that the way he normally debates? I've never seen him debate, so I, no, I didn't know that. Um, He's debated on my channel before, and um, 
No, I mean he gets he gets excited, but he's never yeah, like, freaks so, out like right. He's he's I think he's I think he's a bit of a crank. Uh, needless to say, uh, and cranks tend to do that when the pushback is intolerable, right? So if they if the if if their cognitive dissonance is being triggered too hard, flipping out is what they do. Like that's every crank does that. Uh, so, so, you know, globally speaking, I should not have been surprised because if you start actually pushing back against a crank's uh, illogical claims or f factless claims as the case may be, um, and, and, and you don't relent, uh, and you don't like, it, you know, agree with them, uh, in the end, uh, and, and this conversation doesn't end early, uh, they have only one recourse left, which is to leave or to flip out. Uh, and so James flipped out. So that's, that's what happened. Yeah, I wouldn't call him a crank. But then again, um, you know, I've known him for a while personally and stuff. And uh, I think he got over way overexcited in that one. And um, it, it it didn't look good. I'll put it that way. It didn't yeah. look good. But, uh, he, you know, I'm friends with everybody. I Look, I've been interviewed by oh, Tim O'Neill. Yeah, right. Tim O'Neill recently interviewed with me. Right. And uh, I'm good friends with him. He's like enemies with you guys. And yeah. I'm like, well, I'm really good friends with these guys. That's fine. And yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't I'm have friends with, with everybody, man. Don't put me against anyone. Don't you dare. <laughs> I will rip your wings off. All right. So Farsight, thank you for the super chat. In Historicity of Jesus, IIRC, you talk about Inanna still being worshipped in a town tire Jesus visited. Could you talk a little bit about that? Thank you for the super chat, by the way. Yeah, so um, Inanna is the Sumerian goddess, uh, becomes Ishtar uh, in in later cultures, uh, but her myth, which was tied to Tammuz, uh, which was who's sometimes called Adonis. The word Adonis refers to many different religions, uh, unfortunately, um, so it can be confusing as to which Adonis someone is talking about. Uh, but one of the Adonises is Tammuz, who is Inanna's consort, and so they both have resurrection stories about them that predate Christianity. Uh, and we know that religion, that particular religion that worshipped Inanna and, Tum and Tammuz, um, Dumuzi, it's, it's Inanna and Dumuzi, it then becomes Ishtar and Tammuz, etc. Anyway, um, the same gods, this slightly different cultural names as, as time goes on. They become f fundamental Phoenician uh, deities. Uh, so they end up being worshipped, they have temples to them and societies worshipping them it, wherever the Phoenicians had colonies, which is all over the Mediterranean. And most prominently, Tyre. Tyre is like one of the was one of the Phoenician strongholds, and so by the time it gets to Rome, though that that religion is still there. The temples and and the the cults and the sects and things are still happening at Tyre. Now we don't have uh, actual congregants writing about those things that we get to read. So if there was literature about what was going on at Tyre, what the beliefs were at Tyre at that time it doesn't survive for us to know. So we can only kind of guess and reconstruct based on hints and things around. So we can't be specific, uh, but we do know that that Inanna cult was prominent at Tyre, still in the Roman Empire uh, in that period. In the same way that um, Hercules Melkart was the god Melkart, which is related to the Marduk, and it goes way, way, way back. So you get Hercules, wow. Hercules Melkart is also at Tyre uh, as a prominent sect. And that's another dying and rising god who got translated into like, Greco-Roman terms. And so he's basically Hercules, who is of this particular variety of Hercules. And th this this is what, how Romans and Greeks did this all the time. They, they would go like to, to Egypt and say, um, you know, so that they, they say like, oh, this god looks, sounds like Hermes. So Thoth, this is Thoth Hermes, right? So, or Hermes Thoth, right? So it's, it's, it's the Thoth version of Hermes. And that's how they would interpret it. And so Melkart and Marduk and stuff were their stories were most similar to Hercules' stories. So people say, "Oh, you're talking about Hercules. You have some new stories about Hercules, I hear." Okay, so we're going to call you Hercules of the Melkart variety or Hercules of the Marduk variety, and so on. So, um, so that was still happening. So you have the syncretism going on all the time. To what extent that had transformed the non occult uh, in the Roman Empire, we don't know because we don't have uh, good sources on that specifically. But we hear more about Tammuz. We hear more about Adonis. O o um, Origen talks about the three-day resurrection ceremonies that were still going on in Syria, for example, um, for Adonis, which in his case, he, he specifically identifies it as the Tammuz Adonis. Uh, so, so we know that was still going on all the way into the third century. Um, so it, it survived thousands of years. Well, that's only by the hand of God. I'm just kidding. <laughs> People act like if a religion lasts that long, I had a philosopher or his name was something Dixie philosophy, something in my chat yesterday, trying to argue that like what happened with Christianity, there's just no explanation. And I'm like, 
What do you mean? What? What, are you, what are you trying to say? Like, I didn't. I don't want to get lost in there. Deborah Grace, thank you so much for the super chat. Awesome, six sixty six. Excellent. <laughs> Just a gift for thoughtful skepticism. Grateful for it all. Thank you, cool. sweetie. I'm grateful for her. She has a book called Crucifying the Messiah, or Crucifying the Bible. Oh. I apologize. Crucifying the Bible. Oh, I didn't and know this. It's Tell a this. really good book. Uh, really, really good book. You should check it out. She's not like a scholar, like you know, but she's really um an autodidact and like delved into things and she had this controversial chapter people were trying to hang her on a cross i'm not kidding you for the chapter <laughs> ironically and she made a claim uh, that david may have been a bisexual king now according to the text that's and actually not non-mainstream that's I actually know. been a mainstream argument uh, i didn't so, know that yeah. at first i had never heard of this so then i mm -hmm. do the right thing i messaged joel Baden because i started catch catching hell for this as well Joel uh -huh. Baden responded, the guy who wrote a whole book on King David, okay, uh -huh. the yeah. JEDP documentary hypothesis scholar. Yeah. This guy's a Hebrew Bible scholar. He said, you know, the language is quite ambiguous, and I think there's definitely yeah. something going on there. It's, yeah, it's in the mainstream literature. There's a lot of scholars who've thought about this. It's like, and, and yeah, it is controversial. Like, how dare you suggest? And it's like, well, <laughs> uh, honestly, this is before. I mean, so this is the other thing. It's like the timeline of the Bible is not the timeline of the Bible. Right. right. So like the Bible is written as if Moses came down from the mountain with the, the Levitical laws against homosexuality before Actually, when Moses yeah, right, yeah. Bef right before David, but it's the other way around. Yeah. So, so if you notice, like it's, it's one of the later royalties, one of the later Kings where they discover these new, these lost books of Moses. And that's where Deuteronomy and stuff suddenly appears. Uh, right. So, so these books get written after the reign of David. So the stories of David are written before they start, basically harping on the gays right so right. By, by the time they get to like being anti-gay that, that's long after the stories about david have already started circulating whether david existed or not it doesn't even yeah. matter right so like like uh because the stories existed long before this so, so even the actual gilgamesh chronology may have been gilgamesh may have been yeah. like you know goes back i'm not sure about that but i've heard that oh that's yeah right yes no that's also a mainstream discussion too about uh and keto Gil is gilgamesh and keto uh uh Homosexual, homosexual narrative and it, it sounds like it yeah it's entirely possible um and because it, it the, the ignominy didn't exist back then right that that is a later perversion of of human thinking uh, is to be against homosexualities and so violently against it uh but yeah that came later not so so it actually it's entirely possible that david uh could have been bisexual and no one cared right because that yeah. this was before people started giving a shit about that. Um, anyway, so so yeah, yeah. There, there's nothing there's nothing non-mainstream about that. That's, that's actually in Clip the field. This, the Clip this, Clip this. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, Joseph, Joseph, pardon, thank you for the super chat. What do you think of Catholic Eucharist miracles? I haven't looked into this that much. Uh, I've read some of the literature. Um, for example, Joe Nickel has some good literature on this. Uh, so the... the there was the heyday of the 70s and 80s, which was the heyday of miracle debunking. Um, some of the best books, so you have James Randi, Joe Nickel, uh, a lot of these authors, they kept writing books too, but um, but back then was the heyday of it. And you can find a lot of literature about this from them. And and Joe Nickel and James Randi were magicians, so they actually know how to trick and con people, so they can see through tricks and cons really well. Uh, and this is why it's, it's often been recommended that if you're going to investigate the paranormal, you either need to be or have on your team a, a, a skilled magician because you need a con artist to spot the cons, right? <laughs> uh, so, um, and so these guys are good at it, uh, really good at it. Joe Nickel was also a private investigator. So he was like a legit actual investigator. So he, wow. he can apply those skills as well. Um, anyway, so there's there's stuff on, so if you wanna find the authors who've probably written the best stuff on this, it would be either Joe Nickel or James Randi or both. You can find uh, their books, uh, literature on this. Um, and, and I've read them and I've read like, like just, it's been a while since I've looked back at them, but I remember looking at them and like, the historical evidence for them is weak, uh, yeah. uh, right? For them being genuine, right? Um, and so, uh, and so, I just, I just don't go further into exploring them because they, they're not useful for me for any of the work that I do. Uh, but if you're interested in that subject, um, there, there are those guys who do that. Wow! Thank you for that, everybody watching the 560 people. Hit that like button if you don't mind. Share this with someone. Who's a con artist? Anyway, thank you so much for that. <laughs> Smoke, I appreciate the super chat. Do we have actual autographs, originals of any ancient documents? If not, mm. do we have any documents that are even close? Wow, that's a uh, pretty generic question. Ancient I mean, the, the, the lame answer is yes, we have thousands. 
but uh, that means documents as in like uh, court records, tax receipts, and things like that. Uh, letters. We have hundreds and hundreds of uh, autograph letters. Um, we might even have one signed by Cleopatra herself. Um, this was recently reported in the news that we have. There's a there's a, a letter that a scribe wrote, and then the signature for Cleopatra is written in a different hand uh, wow. than the rest of it. Which which the only reason that would be is that she signed it herself. So that that would be like actual the handwriting of Cleopatra herself. Um, so 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 yes, we have those kinds of things. But I, I think the question I think what they want to know is literary texts. So that's different. So like Sophocles or Herodotus or whatever. Um, do we have any autograph copies of this? <coughs> we don't have any way to know. So for instance, we have a fragment of the Kestoi by Julius Africanus, this little torn piece of papyrus, and it dates roughly to the time that he would have written it. Now, is that a copy or is that the autograph? <laughs> we have no way of knowing, right? Um, and also, uh, there's a bigger problem, which is what do you even mean by an autograph? Because these guys usually didn't actually do the writing, right? So they, they would have a scribe do the actual physical writing while they speak out the text. Uh, and they might have, they might usually, like the usual method of composition is you would compose on wax, right? Because it's erasable and correctable. And you would compose on wax, you would dictate from your wax tablet, your scribe would write it down, and then you would erase the wax and start over, right? And you might have tons of wax tablets for different sections or a thing. So, so autograph in terms of the author himself actually inscribing a draft would normally have been done in wax and we don't have any of those. Um, we do have notes in wax. We actually have, so there's like, there's peat moss in England, uh, whereas a Roman camp where we've recovered like, uh, like military field notes on, on the wax tablet where like they, before they were able to erase it, it got lost in the bog or whatever. Um, so we have some of that, but like literary texts, I don't think we have any wax tablet versions of literary texts. Uh, mm. So like, so it depends on what you mean by autograph, right? Um, and it, it's different also, you could say like approved edition, right? So you, if, if the author is dictating and a scribe is writing and that version goes out and at sight, the author looks at it and says, yes, I approve of that. That would be an approved edition. Um, but we don't know that either. So like the, that little fragment of the Kestoi of Africanus, is that an approved edition or is it a copy? We, we don't know, right? There's no way to tell. Uh, there's no, no indication of this. Uh, so it, it's impossible to know. Um, but do we have manuscript fragments at least that are close to things? Well, the Africanus is a good example of this. We do. Um, and we have, uh, so for instance, Sands of Egypt, we've got, um, what is the earliest? We've got Homeric texts, I think they don't go, obviously don't go back to Homer, but um, that I think they go back close to classical Athens, uh, manuscripts, I mean. Um, but again, they're like fragmentor fragmentary and things like that. And and Homer, the text itself goes back even further and I had multiple authors over multiple centuries. So it's that never had an autograph copy because there was never such a thing uh, for Homer. It's an evolved, probably was for centuries oral only um, and then got written down later. But um Anyway, so yeah, so the, answering the question is, is difficult to do. Usually, um, for a literary text, we don't have a manuscript f until about a thousand years after authorship, right? So in most cases, so if you're reading Suetonius or Tacitus or Josephus, the, the span of time between when the text would have been written and our earliest man physical representation of the text is going to be roughly a thousand years. That's pretty typical. Um, but then we'll have references to it in other texts, which then have their own manuscript representations. And so it can, you can get complicated in terms of your detective story. Uh, but the, you can show that it's highly probable that Josephus wrote when he claims to have written, because you can show that the propagation of evidence throughout the, the world is such a way that to have forged all of that would be virtually impossible, uh, unless you're literally running a computer matrix and all of this is an illusion. But uh, apart from that, it would be very nearly impossible to have forged all of ancient literature and every reference to Josephus in every one uh, and every manuscript everywhere. It's, it's uh, so, so, so th that's why we don't really doubt these things, but sometimes the evidence is sketchy as to when someone wrote and we don't have manuscripts near to it. So we, we can't reconstruct it. That does happen sometimes. Thank you so much. Lou core. Thank you for the super chat. I didn't see a question. I really appreciate the support. Thank you so much. Uh, Grays 174, thank you for the super chat. Why do we know from Mark 410 that the whole gospel is a parable? It makes a clear delineation when Jesus is speaking in parables and when he's not. Now, before you answer this, I just want to say we got like 50 minutes. 
uh, before you have to go. And you've got a ton of super chats. Just keep that in mind. Okay. Uh, so. I could probably stick around until one. I think okay. I have. Yeah. Um, just, just, just letting you know. I mean, it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. So the, this, this, it actually doesn't uh, distinguish parables. He only mentions parables. That's different from saying, well, when I'm not talking in parables, I mean what I mean. I mean what I say. Like he doesn't say that, right? He, he's only talking about parables. Um, but the thing is, is that the parables are functionally and structurally identical to the gospel. So, so the entire gospel is an extended parable. So when, when Jesus is telling these stories and then suddenly you notice that that's what Mark is doing uh, and, and he throws in this and usually authors don't throw these things in. Like, why would they do this otherwise? Right. Why, why have this story even here? Um, uh, well, it's, it's a clue, the author's cluing you in. And so that, that's the kind of the literary clue that we look for. The author is trying to tell you when parables are being told, the literal version of it is not what you should be paying attention to. You need to know the secret real meaning of it, which is a clue, right? So it would be a clue to, to indicate that the rest of the gospel is that way. And we can show that just the way Mark has constructed his stories too. Like they're obvious uh, parables uh, and, and the, the parable, the story of the withering of the fig tree is a really good example of this. It's like this story makes literally no sense. Even in its own context, it makes no sense. Uh, even if you assume Jesus is supernaturally powerful, it makes no sense. The story is nonsensical. Uh, but when you look at the allegory, the actual secret meaning, which lines up exactly how Jesus interprets parables, it makes perfect sense. And it makes perfect sense in context. It explains the entire sandwiching of uh, this fig tree story around the temple clearing story. It, it like, opens up the entire text. So it's obvious that Mark is writing parables about Jesus. And so when he throws in this thing about Jesus telling you, when you, when you see parables, um, this is a clue to the audience, I think. Um, and uh, other scholars have made this point too. Um, uh, Power of Parable by John Dominic Crossan. It's a really good book. I highly recommend it, where he says, like, that's what the gospels are. They're just extended parables about Jesus. And then he extensively shows why and how that is. Uh, and so, um, so I, I recommend that book. And I, I'm not even particularly a fan of John Dominic Crossan, but that book is actually pretty good. Uh, so that's how we know it. That's, that's how we infer this conclusion. Thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Mark, thank you for the super sticker. I really appreciate that, the support and the love. I really do. I appreciate it. Um, I don't know how to pronounce your first name, and I'm just going to say Kumar because I don't want to mispronounce it. Thank you for the super chat. At least once in my lifetime, I want to see a proper debate between Dr. Richard Carrier and Dr. Bart Ehrman on the subject, <laughs> Did Jesus Exist? Let me answer this one. Can I please answer this one? Sure. I think it's only fair that I answer this one. We know what you'll say. You're definitely down to do it, okay? But I don't think that Dr. Ehrman will ever debate you. And the reason, if I could say, from hearing it from the horse's mouth is mm -hmm. that you have been rude or obnoxious in a way. Yeah. So your reputation yeah. has followed you that he's like, uh-uh, I don't, he doesn't deserve. Yeah, he thinks I'm too mean. Him. Yeah, uh, which is why I think the suggestion should be that we should do a moderated written debate. So the moderator can make sure nothing offensive gets published, that Ehrman never has to deal with what he's afraid of, uh, where it's only straightforward uh, debate material. And then we do it with written debate. So he has plenty of time to like research it and think about and the firming, framing of his words. It's not going to get gamed by rhetoric. It's not going to be, there's no trickery involved. Um, I think a written, and I prefer written debates incidentally, because I think because of that, that it eliminates gaming eliminates rhetoric it eliminates uh the kinds of mistakes you can make simply because you're trying to think on the fly mm -hmm. and that's what much more difficult it's not indicative of of the truth of anything right it's it's more to do with rhetoric and game playing than a written debate where you can actually carefully do it scholarly in scholarly fashion uh and you have time to think about it and 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 research and fact check and, and cite sources and so on uh so i actually strongly support a written debate so i would love to see a written debate and if it was moderated, where we submit our submissions to a moderator who makes sure it meets whatever conditions uh, Dr. Ehrman wants them to meet, so that he so he can't use that as an excuse, right? So he can't we'll say this down, right? <laughs> so yeah, so you can't. I say will that be I'm talking be, to him, and maybe I can. Right, right. Yeah, yeah so you can't but... say that I'm going to be mean to him. Therefore, he shouldn't debate me because the moderator will prevent that. Uh, I mean, I'm not going to do it anyway, but uh, but the moderator would give him assurance that it wouldn't wouldn't happen, uh, and then we'd have a proper scholarly debate. Uh, I would love to do that in, in written format, and it would be extremely useful. 
uh, and would make a great book, incidentally, uh, if, uh, if it's profit that motivates him. So <laughs> it could be beneficial for both of you guys. Yeah, I, agree. I, I think to an extent he doesn't even, he doesn't, he wants to avoid talking about me. Uh, and, uh, he, I think he, uh, he's, he's worried about the reputation, like his reputation being hit by daring to even, uh, acknowledge me. Uh, and so there's more of a saving face kind of attitude from him that might prevent him from doing that. Uh, it's more about honor and prestige rather than truth and scholarship. Uh, I, I get that vibe off him a lot, but, but nonetheless, I, I would love to see if we, we would do this, this written debate yeah, format with, with a moderator who moderates and, and, uh, moderates the text so that there's something in between going on. Uh, let's do it. Sounds good to me. Thank you for that. Interesting question. Really good. Super chat. David, uh, Kalkara. Hope I'm saying that correctly. Love your work, guys. Keep it up. Dr. Carrier, are you planning to further explore your values cascade concept? Would love to see it debated sometime. Yeah. Um, so this is obscure uh, for people who might not know <laughs> about this. So now we're in philosophy. So uh, I have two tracks of research that I publish in, which one is contemporary philosophy and the other is ancient history. Um, and with a weird side project in Hitler studies, that's a whole other uh, thing that I got involved in by accident. But anyway, um, the uh, uh, so with regard to philosophy, so the values cascade is a blog I did recently about how you, so the question would be, let, let's say you were to build an AI, like a sentient AI, a computer, and you were to ask it, uh, rather than tell it what it's supposed to value, you were to ask it, what should you value? Um, and so you tell it, well, find the answer to this. Like, is there something that's worth valuing? Uh, and if so, you can adopt that as your values. Like, what would it come up with? Would it be able to come up with anything? Um, is everything just subjective and arbitrary? Uh, and I find that the answer is no, it is not subjective. Well, it's not arbitrary. It ultimately has to be subjective because it has to come from you one way or another. But it's all about ways to objectively evaluate different possible worlds where you value different things and what is the overall outcome to you and, and, and so on. Uh, and so it's possible to get to from, you do have to give one, uh, desire. You, the computer has to start with the desire to know the answer to this question. That's it. Uh, and with that desire, you can construct uh, an entire objective value system from there. Hmm. Now, it's still a subjective value system in the sense that it depends on subjective interests and subjective feelings and so on, but it is objectively reconstructable. Uh, so the computer could actually say, yeah, that, it would be better for me to be that person than to be this other person. Uh, and so, uh, and so that, that's the argument that I made. And, and obviously this is a kind of a controversial thing to say. Um, it's not completely unique. There are atheists who've, who've taken similar positions throughout the history of philosophy, but have never framed it the way that I did. Uh, and, uh, and so, and so the question is, uh, is, am I going to write more on this subject? I don't have any plans to, uh, I've, I'm way behind on comments because I've been dealing with a bunch of other things right now, including migrating my site to a new host which was a nightmare uh, as it always is. Um, so, uh, so I've not been able to get at it. Uh, so there might be a bunch of comments in there that I'll, I'll post recently. I'll clear through the queue and reply to and so on. So there's probably going to be more in the comments there coming up um, in the coming weeks. So, so there will be, if you're saying like, am I going to further explore it? I will in the comments there uh, almost certainly. Um, and, and already have a little bit. There's there's some in the comment section there already. But I'm going to do it more because i got to clear the queue. There's a bunch of comments waiting uh, to get through moderation. Um, what, whether that will result in any further books or articles about it, I can't say right now. It's possible. Uh, I'm interested in exploring it further because I think it's, it's fundamental and important uh, for anyone's philosophy and worldview to have worked out things like this. Um, so that's, I think it's important even though it is highly obscure to most folks who aren't familiar with this kind of argument in philosophy. Thank you so much. Constellation Pegasus. I love you, man. Thank you. Dr. Carrier, what book is it that you showed about the ending of Mark? I couldn't see it clearly too fuzzy on the screen. I need to buy that book. Yeah. Hitler, Homer, Bible, Christ. And, and the, that, the title. Cause there's chapters on every one of those subjects in this book. Um, that's on audible too, right? It is available on audible. Uh, you, you might, depending on what kind of what you want to do with the chapter, you might want the print because then you have the footnotes in the scholarship and things like that. And the Greek and things like that uh, are spelled out in there. But, um, but yeah, that book contains all of my peer reviewed journal articles and magazine articles um, published in history 
up to 2014. So, so it's a good cheap way to get like all of that stuff where to buy those individually from different journals is super expensive and ridiculous. Uh, but you can get it all in there. And then I have a bunch of other big research project stuff that I put in it, including the ending of Mark, which was a big project I did for Errancy Wiki. Um, it, that was another example of a funded project. Someone, someone mm. paid me thousands of dollars to do that. Um, and, and so I was, because I'm being paid handsomely, I took very good, good care in producing uh, the content. So it was worth putting in a book. And so that's that's where you can find it. Thank you so much. Grays174, you're back. Thank you for the super chat. Approximately how many times have you read the Bible books? In what way do you read them, i.e. like a genuine sponge or as part of your job to go through facts? <laughs> like, yeah. like um, ah, this is boring. I'm just drudging through this yeah. one. The, the entire Old Testament I have not read very many times. I think I've only done it once. I've only done it complete once and only in English. Um, the New Testament, however, I've read many different times in both languages. So uh, now I haven't like necessarily read the entire Greek New Testament cover to cover in Greek. I haven't, I haven't sat down and done that. Um, but I will read sections when they're relevant to what I'm doing. Um, and so, so that's most of how I've read the Bible and, and in English, I've read it, the New Testament multiple times from cover to cover. But, um, but when I get into the original language, then it's section by section. And then I, I reanalyze. So I've read sections of the New Testament, even in English, many, many, many more. Like I've lost count hundreds of times more than I've read the entire New Testament in English. But, um, but yeah, I'm usually, I'm usually focusing on specific projects uh, rather than just sitting down and rereading the text, which I find largely a waste of time. <laughs> The Mythic Life. This is Chris. This is Kristen Whitaker Hood. Uh, this is her uh, YouTube name. Thank you, Kristen, for the super chat. How did the crisis of the Third Temple play into the eventual rise of Christianity? Yeah, I think it was very crucial. Um, probably essential. Uh, had it not had that not happened, Christianity might not have become a dominant world religion. Maybe. Uh, so, uh, so people who don't know what we're talking about, uh, the crisis of the third century is. To put it bluntly, it was there was a 50-year-long civil war that ended in a, in a fiduciary depression. So the, the fiduciary economy collapsed. So imagine the United States Civil War, which was five years long. Imagine it lasted 50 years. And then right at the end of it, you had the Great Depression. Um, the U.S. would be fucked, right? Basically, <laughs> uh, it, it would have been catastrophic in, in ways we can barely imagine. And the Rome was kind of rebuilt ish uh but on a foundation of stern fascism so it became incredibly more superstitious incredibly more fascistic um because people became ridiculously desperate and so there's an abandonment abandonment of empiricism and rationalism uh across the board and then there was a definite quest to use religion to keep maintain order uh basically to, to sort of establish the empire rather than on a basis of rational philosophy but to establish it on a basis of imperial controlled religion. Uh, and there were attempts at this already during the civil war, the 50 year civil war. There were many uh, uh, Aurelius Victor and various other, uh, even Elagabalus right at the beginning of it, tried to do this. Uh, they tried to create a religion that would be the foundation of the entire, that they would run the whole empire out of. But these guys kept getting assassinated before they could implement their plans significantly. So their missions died. Um, Constantine did it. He And they each picked their own religion to do this with. Constantine picked Christianity and uh, he didn't get assassinated. So, so the, the kind of the, the fact that Constantine got to stay in power for thirty years, and his sons got to take over power after him, that solidified the role of Christianity. Had he, like like Victor and these others, been assassinated really quickly after they'd come up with the plan, Christianity might not have seeded itself. It might not have become an imperial religion, and then thus would have just remained a religion among many. It would not have become an imperial world religion. So, uh, so. Constantine not getting assassinated uh, is also crucial to the history of Christianity. But the, the age of crisis, too, I think, is it, if, that, if the third century had been an age of continued progress, had it been just like the second century, only more, um, then we would not have had Christianity on the other side of it. Uh, like Christianity would still be around. It would just be a sect, another religion among many floating around. Uh, and so it would not have become a dominant world religion. So I think the, the age of crisis set up two things. One is it set up the whole empire's populations move away from rationalism and towards supernaturalism. So Christianity now became a hot item. It was more, more attractive than it was before. Um, and then the idea, the move, the 
third century's push towards fascism. The, the fascism is a solution to hold the empire together, which requires an imperial religion. And so, uh, and it just by happenstance, Christianity was chosen. And I think there's some reasons you can argue as to why it was attractive at the time. Like Mithraism had been more attractive, but in the 50 year civil war, all those guys got killed off, right? So like Mithraism and also, you know, if Mithraism is the religion of your armies and your armies are getting wiped out all constantly, you're generally not going to think that this religion is too such an hot item. Your God's doing really poorly at helping you out, right? So you're going to look elsewhere. So I think Mithraism got killed off, essentially. It was still around. It was still a major thing in the fourth century, but its influence and attractiveness died out in the third century for obvious practical reasons. And so Christianity was one of the most organized religions that had already a network of control spanning both halves of the empire, which was crucial at this point because Constantine needed to, the, the empire had split. He needed to reunify the empire. And so he picked the religion that his enemies had been persecuting in order to basically subvert uh, his support in, in the other side of the empire. So he actually did that on purpose. It was a good, smart political move to do this. So, so the, these kinds of these things, the sort of the contingencies led to Christianity, but it could have been any other religion had the contingencies been different. Um, but yeah, if the third century had not played out the way it did, I don't think Christianity would have become a, a world religion the way it is. Wow. Well put. Kristen, thank you for the super chat, sweetie. I really appreciate it. And uh, thank you so much. The mythic life. Neophyte one, Dr. Carrier. Thank you for the super chat. If Jesus was a myth, what was the utility in placing him in Capernaum versus a place like Sephoris and making him an exorcist? Thank you, doctor. Yeah, um, there's actually a scriptural basis for Capernaum. Um, so uh, there, there's scriptural reasoning here. Um, that's That would be my, and for Galilee as well, uh, having the whole scene set in Galilee. It's also useful for the Homeric parallels because you need a C to draw a lot of the Homeric C parallels. So you need a big C and there's a big C in Galilee, but there's scriptural basis for Galilee as well. Uh, and so that was the, and even Nazareth, uh, Matthew says that Nazareth comes from scripture. We don't know what scripture he's talking about, but uh, there was one evidently um, that they're drawing this from. <clears throat> uh, whereas Sepphoris is a recent city that couldn't have any scriptural basis. Like it didn't exist in the Bible, the Old Testament. So uh, so it wouldn't have scriptural relevance to have that. Um, so I think that's, that's sort of the short answer. Um, there could be other reasons. We, we don't really know uh, like what, what, what associations, if you pick Capernaum, what associations did people make about that when, when you're selling the text? And that has a lot more to do with local knowledge back then that we might not have access to. So we can't always answer these questions. Thank you so much for that. David Cham uh, Chamberlain, thank you so much for the super chat, my friend. I really appreciate the support. And Dalai Lama in the house. You know, I saw a funny video. I think it was a Buddhist monk. Maybe it was the Dalai Lama on video and there was a mosquito biting him. And, uh, he let the mosquito bite him like twice and then the th like shoot it away. And the third time it came, he went just slapped and crushed it. And then they go, you just killed the mosquito. And he goes, listen, after strike three, that's it. Like <laughs> even he had his limits about life and about killing something like a, a bug or whatever. I really appreciate that Dalai Lama. Seriously. Caleb Jackson is back. Are you there, Carrier? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. Uh, you must be reading. Um, yeah, I am. <laughs> <laughs> um, Whoa, where did we go here? Uh, I think it automatically moved me down. Here you go. What are your thoughts on books like Testing Prayer, C. Brown, Harvard Press, Medical Miracles, J. Duffin, Oxford Press, etc., that attempt to medically document inexplicable cures post-prayer? Thank you, Caleb Jackson, for the super yeah. chat. I got to uh, drop this because this covers most of the screen. Yeah, this, is, this is pseudoscience. Uh, yeah, th there have been actual proper scientific studies of miracles that have proven that they're on they have no efficacious uh, power. So, um, so I would say rather than look at like pseudoscientific crank scientific crankery, look at actual peer reviewed studies, uh, and then ask why these guys aren't producing them. Um, so the that's, books that's, it's straightforward science. Yeah. C Harvard press and medical miracles, J Duff and Oxford press. You're saying those aren't peer reviewed. You're saying those are uh, well, so they're, they're not studies, right? So, uh, they're just arguments based on anecdotes essentially. And then they discuss the studies, but of course they discuss them apologetically rather than actually looking at what the studies actually say. So, um, so if you, if you go look at those, you'll see, uh, you'll you go look at what's actually in them. Uh, you'll see that what, what is being presented is not a scientific argument for a conclusion. It is kind of more of a personal editorial 
apologetic argument for a conclusion. Um, but when you go to the actual peer reviewed journals where actual studies are being done, like we're actually going to test, like actually test prayer in an actual controlled environment uh, or using controls like proper scientific methodologies, the, the results don't come out. So, so these books don't have any of those things. Uh, <clears throat> um, they try to apologetically talk around them, uh, but they don't actually do any actual real studies or they don't actually refer to any actual peer reviewed studies that prove prayer works. Uh, they're just, they're, the results always turn out the opposite. Thank you so much. Appreciate that, Caleb. David Chamberlain said, would you consider walking Derek through on the historicity of Jesus Bayes' theorem and see if he really comes out <laughs> as a historicist? I think we've done this. Yeah, we have. Yeah. I mean, look, it, what you put in is what you get out. And um, we've, we've even talked about this before as well. So um, look, I don't know the mathematics behind Bayes' theorem and like knowing how to calculate these things, but uh I've literally read your book twice through and through, and there's so much rich information in the book. I recommend people read the book, even though I do lean that there was a guy. So uh, what what do you want me to say? You know, I don't know what to say. So that doesn't mean I'm dogmatic. Uh, I don't pretend like mythicism doesn't make sense. Or it's not possible. I just think that I'm more probable in my mind because I factoring certain data that Carrier would take differently than me that uh, at the end of the day makes him think probably not a guy. Um, if you put a gun to my head, I, I'd be whatever you want me to be, though. I can tell you that. <laughs> so thank you, David, for the super chat. Grays174, have you dropped the insane contrived cosmic sperm bank hypothesis yet? No disrespect. <laughs> Laugh out loud. No, it's not insane, actually. Uh, I found more precedence for it since the book came out. Uh, so I actually have this. It's in Jesus from Outer Space. Uh, so I actually mentioned there, there's actually more precedence for it, uh, than I even knew about, uh, when I did the thing in the thing in, on the history of Jesus. Um, we have, there's actually a Talmudic basis for the angel of night, which actually, uh, collected sperm. So the story is this angel, the angel of night would actually collect sperm, <laughs> collect sperm from every man, every night, fly it up to God and present it to God, the sperm itself presented to God and say, uh, will this be a righteous man or a villain? And God would declare which it'll be. And then this, the angel would go back down and reinstall the sperm so that it could proceed uh, to produce something. So if this is the standard angelology in Judaism, like there's absolutely no reason why God couldn't say, let me hold on to that sperm. Uh, I'm going to do some great things with it. Uh, and that's exactly what happened in Zoroastrianism. So Zoroastrianism has the basis of the sperm of... Um, uh, Zoroaster ends up being stored permanently or stored for thousands of years in this particular lake. And then when the virgin goes into this lake, who's going to give birth to the final Messiah, uh, she's impregnated by the sperm that's been banked in that lake. Uh, and so Persian Zoroastrianism already has this. Uh, and we know Persian Zoroastrianism influenced Judaism quite extensively. In fact, most of the things we take for granted as Jewish are actually Persian. Um, resurrection, wow. apocalypticism, the devil is the enemy of God. All of these things come from a flaming hell. All of these things come from Persian Zoroastrianism. So um, so the idea of sperm banking is just mainstream back then. There's nothing weird about it at all. And this is actually one of the main points I bring out in the first chapter of Jesus from Outer Space is that the ancient world was weird uh, compared to us. Like what they, how they thought the world worked. I was going to ask you, have you read this? I have not, but oh, I would recommend you, it because I think she's gonna really good. Want it. You're going to want to, then this goes right into the vein of like all sorts of fun stuff. Yeah, I, she's, I mentioned she's a good scholar. I, I highly and really sharp. I recommend people. I, it's probably a good book. I wouldn't be, I wouldn't doubt it uh, from what I've seen of her and, and read of her stuff otherwise. Um, but no, you got to, if you're going to understand the ancient world, you have to understand how they saw the world, what was normal and what was weird to them isn't weird to us or what's weird to us. It wasn't weird to them. Right. So if you're going to talk about what's weird or insane, quote unquote, you need to go back and in context is, was it insane back then? It was not actually. So th this is actually normal thinking back then. Wow. So just for, just for fun's sake and a quick answer, if let's say, could you still see a possible historicity model using a cosmic bank hypothesis included? Yeah, of course. Uh, it's thought. entirely compatible with it. In fact, it's basically what is being said in Matthew and Luke. Right. Yeah. If you think about it, because both Matthew and Luke say that Jesus is of the seed of David, but he's not. They have these genealogies that explicitly say that he's not. Right. Right. So that means the angel had to have bring the semen, had to bring the semen of David down and put it into Mary because it's not coming from Joseph. Right. 
and it's not coming from Mary. There's no, no contrary to Christian apologists. There's no genealogy of Mary in either of these gospels. Right. So, uh, so the cosmic sperm bank hypothesis is being assumed by both Matthew and Luke. Their nativities assumes cosmic sperm banking that God mm -hmm. has taken semen directly from David, held onto it, and brought it down and put it into Mary. Had the angel put it into Mary, because that's the only way that they could say that he's actually of the seed of David. Uh, it's the only way the prophecy could be fulfilled and that the narratives could make sense. I've never so heard of it that way, but that's right. So even, even on, and I, this is in Jesus from outer space. I talk about this. So even on historicity and even Bart Ehrman admits this now that as soon as Jesus died or very, very shortly after, like as soon as they're formulating their new creed, uh, they've already decided that Jesus is a preexistent incarnated archangel. So even if Jesus existed, as Ehrman would tell you, like they came to this conclusion, probably after he died, probably maybe the night after he died, who knows? Um, they came to this conclusion that he wasn't this secretly this angel all along, uh, which means that most of Jesus' mythicism, the most of the Doherty, most of the Doherty model, actually fits historicity as well. Like you could actually port it over so that you could have like the nativities do. Like you say, well, then that means he had to have been. The seed of David had to have been put into his mother Mary, and they're they're now talking about a historical Mary, his actual mother, and then therefore that's how he's the uh, you know descended from David, but also is a preexistent archangel because that obviously can't be a descendant of David. So how do you get to be both? Which you need to have both because Scripture says it has to be both. Uh, that's what they would do. So you could do this, uh, could have done this for a historical Jesus as well as for a mythicist one. There's there's no um, th this does this fact alone does not allow you to distinguish the two. Thank you so much. Constellation Pegasus, what other Jews like Jesus before and after him were running around Palestine getting themselves in trouble with the authorities? Well, we already know in the New Testament in Acts. Yeah. Uh, no, I think, uh, well, well Acts, Acts is just borrowing badly from Josephus. So it's really Josephus. Right, that we know right, this right. Uh, I have a section, there's, there's six of these guys um, that I talk about. Um, from the mainstream literature, the scholarship is on this. Uh, and it's in um, Josephus. Uh, I think most of it's in the Antiquities. Um, but in my book on the historicity of Jesus, I think like element six, some something like, I talk about the six other guys. John the Baptist is one of them, by the way. Um, uh, so he, he's a classic example of this sort of messianic figure uh, who gets himself, gets in trouble with the authorities uh, and gets killed, right? Uh, the Egyptian is another one. Um, the Samaritan is another one. Uh, Theodos is another one. Um, and all of these guys, you can show, they all have, in Josephus, they all have a um, a Joshua narrative. So they're all like selling themselves, according to Josephus, they're all selling themselves as the new Joshua. So they're going to part the Jordan. They're going to topple, magically topple the walls of Jerusalem. They're going to do these things that, that Joshua did. Now, Joshua is Jesus, by the way. It's the same name, it's the same mm -hmm. word. Uh, so these guys are selling themselves as Jesus, and they're selling themselves as Messiahs, which is Christ. So they're all selling themselves as Jesus Christ. And uh, Josephus never uses those words. He doesn't say Joshua. Right. He doesn't say Messiah. But he describes Joshua and describes Messiah, Mess Messiah right? So, so Josephus, this is kind of, I think Josephus intends his Jewish readers to get this, but his Gentiles do not get this. Uh, so his Jewish readers would get what he's talking about. Um, so, but so he's, Josephus already knows about it, tons of Jesus Christs who are getting themselves killed. And I even uh, hypothesize that they might have been doing it deliberately, that they thought that getting themselves killed would bring on the end of the world. Uh, and, and if you want that narrative, uh, I, I tell it in a kind of humorous talk but fact-filled, but humorous talk on this. For, this is my Wichita talk, which is the, you're all going to die. Um, how how the Jews kept trying to predict the end of the world and accidentally created Christianity. Yeah, um, we we did a video on this, by the way, too. Right, so I, that video is up. You can find it on YouTube somewhere. Uh, and where I go into, I lay this out. So, and you can, you can create a historicity narrative here where you can say that, well, Jesus then did historically exist. He was one of these guys. He just wasn't famous enough, like, to be in Josephus. Like, he was just, there might have been, like, 10 of these guys and Josephus mentions four of them, right? Like, so he picks the most famous ones and forgets the others because they're not important. Um, so Jesus could have historically existed and been one of these guys deliberately trying to get himself killed to bring on the end of the world and claiming to be the new, the new Joshua claiming to be the Messiah and so on. Entirely possible. Uh, and, and I give it like decent odds even in on history right. of Jesus. But um, I think in the end, the overall argument, the overall evidence suggests that's not, that Jesus is a fake version of this. It's not a real version of this. Thank you so much. Appreciate the super chat too. That's interesting. Uh, Kevin Murphy, is it possible he did exist, but much like the cult leaders today where they adopted 
a biblical title, but he actually had a different name. But we know him as Jesus, and the Bible stories inspired yeah. him. Yes, I explicitly say this in um, chapter two of On the Historicity of Jesus when I describe what is the minimal historicity. So, like, what is the least we have to claim to base it, to make there be a historical Jesus? And one of the things, the points I make is that he he did not even need to be called Jesus when he was alive. Because Jesus is a suspicious name. It means God's Messiah or God's Savior, right? So uh, it is deeply suspicious that God's Savior would just happen to have been named God's Savior. Um, it is a common name, so it is entirely possible he was accidentally named that. Uh, it's possible his being named that made him think that he was God's Savior. I don't know. Um, but it is deeply suspicious. Uh, <laughs> but that in and of itself does not argue that he didn't exist because the name might have been assigned to him after the fact in the same way that it could have been assigned to the Egyptian or the Samaritan and so on. Cause they're all representing themselves as Jesus Christ's, you know, the new Joshua, the new Messiah. Do you find it odd that so, they're not actually named? He names them the Samaritan, the Egyptian. Do you think yeah, that's he, odd? He, right. He can speak even Theodos is a fake name. So like he's, he's conspicuously avoiding naming them and he's specifically naming them offensive things. They're all foreigners, right? So Egyptian, Samaritan, these are not proper Jews. Uh, Josephus is doing, I think Josephus consciously choosing that for a specific reason that he, he wants to distance himself and, and Judaism and Jews from these guys. Uh, so he's doing that on purpose, uh, right? So, um, and also he doesn't want to notify his Gentiles to the whole Jewish messianism. So he absolutely does not want to mention Jesus and Christ and have to explain these words, because these, the fact that these words exist and have those meanings in Judaism is a threat to Rome, right? So, uh, so I think that he's consciously avoiding these, this stuff. Um, I think that's true. Uh, and yes, it's entirely possible that Jesus was someone else. Uh, he went by some other name. Uh, and, and even the Bible says like he was named Emmanuel, which isn't also isn't a real name. Um, but, uh, but yeah, he could have had another name and then been assigned that name later, even after his death. Uh, so, um, so that doesn't help us much. Yeah. But yeah, thank I discussed it. I discussed it in on the history of Jesus. Kevin, I, thank you for that. Yeah. I should correct something I said earlier. I mentioned uh, Capernaum was in scripture and that, that's not correct. Galilee is in scripture uh, and Capernaum's association with, Gal with the Sea of Galilee uh, is crucial. So that I think that's how it gets picked up is because Capernaum was an important city with respect to the Sea of Galilee and the Sea of Galilee was scripturally important uh, and thematically important for the gospel authors. So that's how Capernaum gets in. Capernaum itself is not in the Old Testament. Thank you. I just, just want correction. to make sure I corrected that. I, I said it misleadingly before. It's all right. We almost have 666 viewers. At least we're past. <laughs> uh, you know, we're trying to get, look, we just need five more people right now. Three more people. I'm at 662 right now. Just come on. We need to hit the number. <laughs> uh, but seriously, hit the like button while you're in here. Uh, three more people. One more person and we're at 666. Hold on. <laughs> There's probably people running multiple streams now. Just to I got a I gotta screenshot this <laughs> if we can get it. Someone, before we get the next Super Chat, come on. Pop in here. <laughs> Unfortunately, you can't tell someone who's not in here to come in here. I know. Some, here, summon but... <laughs> them. Summon them. Oh, oh, but you God, have 600 people. Down. Maybe they could get someone on. Uh, they could tell someone to get on their computer and log in. Right, right. Yeah. Well, okay. We dropped four or five people. All right. Either ah, way. Right. We're close. We came, we're close. Came, close came close. Uh, well, here we go. 616, which is the other. That's exactly why I was inspired here. He <laughs> is sending a Latin super chat here. And um, we have, uh, you know, our greek uh enter the people who are entering are the 666 but this is the latin version uh thank you joel pearson for the super chat are there any qualified historicists arguing for a historical jesus rather than assuming who are actually historians rather than theologians i can't think of any um e even the ones who aren't theologians the theologian means you're a practicing theologian uh so like bart ehrman for example is not a practicing theologian uh, but all his education, he has no history degrees. Like all his education is in ministry or theology uh, related subjects. So um, usually these guys, usually the people who are promoting or ardently defending historicity rather than dismissively defending historicity, uh, the ones who actually like stand up and say it's ridiculous, it suggests that Jesus didn't exist. All of those scholars typically have theology degrees. Sometimes I'm trying to think if they, if any of them have a proper New Testament studies degree, I can't think of any, there might be one. Goodacre, perhaps, um, who would be an example. But even he's not ardently arguing for history. No, he he's kind not. Of, right? So, um, 
Um, so, so, there, there, so New Testament studies is a degree that at least straddles the line between theology and history because it's a uh, interdisciplinary studies degree. So it's literature, history, theology, etc. So it's it's close to being a proper history degree. Um, although it's typically taught under religious studies departments, not history departments, if that matters. Uh, and so, so even that is, you know, pushing it. Uh, but if you're talking about people who actually got a degree under a history department, uh, in, in a history, it says history on their diplomas and their diploma. Uh, I can't think of any who, who are these ardent defenders of historicity. Huh. Thank you, Joel. Appreciate that, man. We know who the real beast is. So you appreciate the code. <laughs> Uh, Bill Castle, thank you for the super sticker. I appreciate you, Bill. Thank you for the support. I still see some names in here. We're probably way behind on these super chats. See some. We're not going to get to them all. Yeah, we're we're almost uh, out of our two hour time. So I know, I know. Uh, could Joseph of Arimathea have written the Gospels? Uh, unlikely. I, I don't even think he existed. So, okay. Thank you so much. And, and frankly, if he if he had, he would say so. Uh, this is this is the thing. Like, if you were an eyewitness. And you're telling your story in antiquity, that would be priceless information. You would not leave it out. Uh, you would actually say that that was the case. Okay. So just so everybody knows, if you're super chatting from here on out, it's because uh, you're showing love. I'm going to try and push it through. Can we go a little past? I'll pay you a little extra for your time if you don't mind. Uh, okay. Uh, if you're okay. Because yeah. I know, listen, I pay scholars for their time on Myth Vision. Yeah, yeah. I, wondering. So everybody right, who's right. super chatting, you're literally helping me to make these shows possible. Yeah, I'm not I agree. Uh, it's, if, my only limitation is that I've got another show I have to do later and I got to do other things in between then now and okay. then. Um, so, but I, yeah, I, I can hang out for a little bit longer. Let's, let's do it. Okay. Let's cool. see what we can do. I got you. I'll hook you up with a good tip. Jay Victor. Thank you so much for the super chat. Judaism is a national identity as much as a religion. Why would Paul turn to Gentiles to fill the ranks of Judaism 2.0? Uh, well, Jews already were. Um, so it, it was actually, it's become less popular for Jews to evangelize, especially after all the pogroms and Holocaust and all this stuff. Uh, people don't like it. Uh, so, so Judaism as a whole has dialed back on its evangelism. But before the Jewish war, Jewish evangelism was a big thing. Uh, in fact, it was part of the Old Testament scripture taught that all the Gentiles would come to Jerusalem and worship the Jewish God. So th there was there were a lot of like, especially hardcore Orthodox Jews who believed that all the Gentiles would eventually convert. And so they thought they were doing God's will by converting people to Judaism. So there was there was actually a big movement to do this. Uh, and there was a lot of popularity. Judaism was really popular among Gentiles. Most Gentiles who found it popular didn't convert because it was arduous to do so. The, the dietary laws were, were odious. Uh, or onerous, and the circumcision was a definite turnoff. Um, so, con so they would be God fearers. They would be like uh, they would uh, worship Yahweh, and they would associate with Jews and follow as much of Judaism as they were willing to. But they were not proper Jews. But some of them would go all the way to convert and would become converted Jews. And we have this is established. We have examples in uh, tons of the literature. I, I talk about it in the I.O. Uh, Israel yeah. only article that I go into. Um, so uh, so this was a thing back then. It was already a thing. People were already doing it. In fact, the, the original apostles before Paul were probably already accepting Gentiles in as long as they converted to Judaism. They had to circumcise. They had to follow the Torah and everything. So the only innovation that Paul made was he said, well, because Jesus' sacrifice atones for all sins, and it's this is a new covenant, covenant, this is a new agreement that's been made with God now, Gentiles don't need to convert to Judaism. They can jump right into the new covenant. They don't have to jump into the old covenant, then into the new covenant. So his innovation was saying that Gentiles could become Christians without converting to Judaism. And this is the innovation. This is the thing that it was a little bit of a difficult sell. Um, he had to persuade uh, the original apostles to accept it. And according to Galatians, he did. He succeeded at this. I suspect there's some cash value involved in this, but I, that's a whole other uh, speculation based on what we see in the subtext. But um, but one well, he was this thing is this innovation was very successful, right? right. So you've got all these God fearers, tons of these God fearers who are these Gentiles who want to be Jewish, but uh, they don't want to convert because it's arduous. And this guy comes along and says, hey, you can be a Jew without all that arduous stuff. You can actually do the thing that you've been wanting to do all this time. So Paul had this huge market already cater made for him where there's people who already want to do this and he's coming in offering them an easier product, an easier way to get in. And so he's going to suck these people in. So he's probably packing churches everywhere with new converts at a much faster rate than the, the original apostles are. 
And so they, they were stuck with two, well, three options, really. They could oppose this and have their little smaller sect now be at war with this growing larger sect. Or they could accept this and say, like, okay, we'll grant that we'll grant this and then we'll try to control it. Uh, yeah. Right. So um, and now when you think of like this is a lot of members, you're getting a lot of influence, you're getting a lot of money. Right. So the, so the, the option to be at war with this innovation is unattractive, whereas the option to like try and play with it somehow is very attractive. So I, I, I it's there's hardly any reason to need to explain why they would be on board with this. They'd be hesitant for obvious reasons, but that when they think it through strategically like this, we should we should back this now that sealed their fate. Right. So the original Jewish Christianity died out. It got crushed. Darwinian style by the massive overwhelming influx of Gentiles so that the, the Jewish sect version became increasingly hostile to the Gentile sect and then just dwindled and shrank. Uh, and so, um, so, so the original sect of Christianity, the original Christianity died out. We, there's not a single form of it left uh, in the world that I know of. Um, mm -hmm. uh, unless you count Islam, which is a whole other, uh, it actually might be a remnant, uh, an evolved remnant of the original Torah observant sect, but that's a whole other That'd be a can of worms. To, yeah. <laughs> Scott Turf, thank you for the super chat. Would you, uh, what do you think about the idea that brothers of the Lord was very specific group as Robert Price says, and not just random Christians? It's possible. And I've considered it. Um, it unfortunately has a low epistemic probability because it requires more epicycles. You have to invent more back explanation for why it would be the case. And you have no evidence for those back explanations. So you're, you're complexifying the theory. You're making the theory more complicated without backfilling it with evidence. And so what that does is it reduces the probability of your position. Um, so this is the biggest problem with trying to sell a speculation as a fact. Um, the more elaborate your speculation, the less probable it starts. And that's why you need evidence for it. And if you don't have any evidence for it, then you, it just stays improbable. and There's nothing you can do about it. Whereas, for example, Brothers of the Lord is all baptized Christians is in the text of Paul. Like, it's there. Like Paul outright says, all baptized Christians are brothers of the Lord. So mm -hmm. we we have the evidence for that. That's not a speculation. Uh, so we don't need to add more and more epicycles to explain the terminology. Um, but it doesn't mean it's impossible, uh, but it does mean it's it's not the most probable explanation of the evidence. And another point that I've made, I've, I've pointed this out in somewhere in my literature, I can't remember, but if it were the case that brothers of the Lord was a specific group, then that means there had to have been some sort of naming policing because when paul says that all christians are brothers of the lord if it's a narrow sector only allowed to call them be, be called brothers of the lord then that means all other baptized christians who are brothers of the lord someone has to police the terminology and say you can't call yourself a brother of the lord even though i just said you're a brother of the lord right so that so there it would have to be this complex policing of how words get used and we have no evidence of that happening in paul so uh so that's a more that's actually evidence against uh, the price theory. So I, I don't think the price theory holds up, but it is logically possible. Like it's, it's mm -hmm. coherent in this, in, in, in context, but, uh, but unfortunately it just doesn't have a high epistemic probability. Thank you for that, Scott. Ro Joseph Rotoni, Ro Ro Rotoni. I hope I'm saying that right. I apologize if I butchered it. I hear you use probability often. I think you may can help with this. I'm atheist ish. But I've struggled with this. If there is a multiverse for an infinite universe, would God have evolved? Yes. Uh, and I actually have a whole article on this. It's called The God Impossible. So you can go on my blog, richardcarrier.info, type in The God Impossible. And it's an entire article about uh, how multiverse theory entails somewhere in the multiverse there are going to be gods if you broaden your definition of gods enough. Um, most Christians will not broaden their definition of gods enough uh, to allow this. So most Christians will not allow a naturalist, like, naturalist, naturalistically evolved God to be a God. Uh, they find that offensive to suggest that that would be a God. It's just a super powerful alien. It's like, yeah, I know. It's the same thing, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah. So, so, and, and if you want to know what, like how rare this would be or like what the significance of this is and so on, my article, The God Impossible, goes into all the angles on that. Um, now the alternate question is, is it possible for a supernatural God to evolve? And, and no, I would say that if naturalism is true, then the probability of any God in any multiverse is zero, like actually zero, not close to zero, but actually zero. Um, the epistemic probability can't be zero because we don't know for sure with absolute certainty that, that naturalism is true. 
uh, but we know it to a very high probability. Uh, so we can say that supernatural gods in the multiverse are extremely improbable. The epistemic probability is extremely low that there would be supernatural gods, no matter how infinite the multiverse is. Um, but natural gods, like actual mechanistic, uh, naturalistic gods, super powerful aliens, as one would say, um, yeah, that, that's probably inevitable, super, super rare, uh, but inevitable in the whole multiverse. Thank you so much. Uh, makes you think different about people being probed by aliens. Nick uh, Sklavos, thank you so much for that super chat. Marcion travels out to talk to other Christians. He is surprised and eliminated. Who are his eliminators? Why they have so much different path? Strangely phrased. Um, so uh, uh, yeah. Marcion was preaching for decades and actually had uh, persuaded many Christian churches to adopt his sectarian view. So um, if you're talking about like who, who was opposed to him, uh, it would be all the other sects who didn't like him muscling in on their territory and also didn't like his theology. They thought his theology was problematic. Um, so now the specifics of why that is, is hard to discern because we don't have any of the discussion from his lifetime. So we don't have his enemies when he's alive talking about him. We don't have him responding to them. We have nothing. All we have is decades after he's dead, um, and I can't remember if we even have an account of how he died, but um, decades after we have extreme dishonest polemicists like Tertullian. Tertullian's a fucking liar. Like you can't trust anything Tertullian says. So, so when he's talking about Martianism, and most, most modern scholarship about Martianism is just believing what Tertullian says, for example. Right. I don't think that's, that's that is not sound. Like you should David not. David says the same thing. Yeah, you should saying. not trust Tertullian. Uh, and you shouldn't trust any of these guys. You know, Hippolytus. All of these polemicists against Martian are just documented liars. Like you can't count on what they're saying. They're polemicists, right? So they're going to straw man. They're going to make, make up shit. They're going to, uh, you know, so there's a lot of things that, so you can't really get at uh, what Martian really taught or what the arguments were and really were in his day for and against his, his movement. But we, we can maybe guess at what the vague rough outlines might have been by trying to look at the polemics. Like, what, what, why are they so terrified of Martianism? Why do they have to lie? Why do they have to, like, so you, you have to kind of, like, read the subtext. And so you can get, like, maybe some hints, but that's, that's not a terribly reliable way to ascertain what the real reason was. Uh, but, but the short, short answer is the best we can tell is that his theology was unpopular and his influence was unpopular. They, they saw him as a muscle, someone who's muscling in on their territory, trying to take over their racket. Uh, and, uh, and, and certain groups united against him basically. Uh, so they saw more in common with each other than they did with him uh, and his movement uh, and as politically happens all the time. Thank you so much, Nick. I appreciate that. Marcus, Daniel Ponce asked, I think that might've been someone in the chat. Um, what, all, what or where does the word Arimathea refer to the name of Joseph of Arimathea? Could it be a play on the name Joseph Bar Matthias inserted into the gospel narrative? And I think this is the idea that it's like Josephus. Sure. Or something. Um, yeah, if, if that were the case, that's what it would say. And it doesn't, right? So if it's supposed to be Bar Matthias, it, the Greek would say Bar Matthias. Like if that was the the clue we were supposed to get, you, you wouldn't fuck up the clue by mis misspelling it. Um, so, uh, so, so no, I don't think, I don't think that's what's going on here. Arimathea as actually spelled in the, in the gospels, uh, is actually a, um, a neologism. It's, it's a, it's a faux Greek word. It means best disciple or best disciple town. Um, so, and it's very convenient that what is Josephus or what is Joseph in this story do? I think Joseph is coming from Joseph the patriarch. I think this is an emulation because there's another tomb story relating to Joseph that a lot of the vocabulary is drawn from. And this is Joseph in the Old Testament uh, for the Markin story, right? And then you, I think you see it also in Matthew. But um, So they're definitely drawing on ideas from the patriarch Joseph and calling him Arimathea as the best disciple. So we're, we're, looking at a, we're looking at an emulation of a patriarch who's being characterized as someone who comes from the, the region of the best discipleship. And what does he do? He does what the disciples didn't do. He, he stays faithful to Jesus and to the Torah law and make sure that Jesus is properly buried. Even though he's an executed convict, the Torah law demanded that he be buried before sunset. That was the law. And jo Joseph is the only one who follows the law. 
uh, in the whole story. Even the even the disciples run away and, and don't attend to the dead as they're supposed to do. Um, so so this is all fictional narrative, and I think Arimathea is deliberately it's it's a coined word. We know there's no town. Uh, we people have struggled to find an Arimathea. There's no such Arimathea that we have no evidence of it. Now, like there could have been an Arimathea. We don't have the names of all two hundred towns uh, of of Judea. Um, so there could have been an Arimathea, but we don't have any specific evidence of there being an Arimathea. And it doesn't make terribly a lot of sense for, I think, I can't remember if Mark says that Joseph was a member of the council. I think he does. It would make no sense for the Jerusalem Sanhedrin to have a member from Arimathea. They would all be Jerusalemites. Not There would be an Arimathea Sanhedrin, perhaps, or an Arimathea council. Um so anyway, the, the, it's historically anachronistic. It doesn't make a lot of sense. But as literary art, as a fictional name that is supposed to carry symbolic import, the name makes perfect sense in context and, and helps you interpret the story in exactly the way it seems that it's intended. Thank you, Marcus. And you know who else agrees with your interpretation on that? Robert Price likes it. No, <laughs> no, no. You're going to be like, what? Bart Ehrman. Oh, really? Bart Ehrman went on record saying, yeah, I recorded it. Oh, no, it wasn't me. I think it that's cool, though. Um, yeah, it doesn't surprise me, right? It doesn't surprise me because Bart Ehrman does accept a lot of the mythologization and allegorization yeah. of the Gospels. There's, there's, he's not a fundamentalist by any stretch, no, no, uh, yeah. and, and he's comfortable with those kinds of theories. Yeah, he. I just thought it was cool to point that out. It is, yeah. So, I didn't know you that. know, yeah. yeah, Bart. He believes that this is best disciple town. He thinks that makes the most sense. Stephen Burns, thank you for the super chat, my friend. Do you think there would be Christianity without Plato, Doctor Carrier? Uh, yeah, um, because there's more, um, there's more Hellenistic. Well, okay. So if you say without Plato now, is there no Aristotle? Right. <laughs> <laughs> right? So like you take Plato out, what happens? Um, you, you, right. that's a big chunk. Uh, and so the counterfactual history gets really messy here. Um, so Hellenistic philosophy, like how, how dependent was it on Plato? And this is a big problem with counterfactual history is if there was no Plato, who would have filled his role? Right, so like you take something out, something's going to slip back in. Uh, this is the big problem with like you can't just take the piece out and expect it to stay vacant. Um, so this is a big problem with with history. So there would have been some other philosopher doing something. Would they have done the same thing? Would they have done a different thing? How different would it be? Would it matter? Uh, this is this is a really complicated question to ask. Um, I think that the intention of the question though is Christianity after its first formation. So we're talking about Christianity at well post Paul, so second century, third century Christianity definitely fourth century Christianity is extremely highly dependent on Platonic thinking. Uh, they definitely adopted it. They looked at all the philosophical sects. We see this explicitly in origin. I talk about this in uh, my books, the scientist in the early Roman empire. And I have a whole section on origin, uh, third, early third century Christian scholar where he's, Oh, even more better one is science education in the early Roman empire, my thinner volume, because there I talk about how origin talks about what kind of schooling can you give Christians can you teach them philosophy? Because it's this pagan, you know, it's a bunch of sinners. Or do you want to teach them philosophy? And Origen like looks through the schools and says like, which of the schools of philosophy are more have more affinity for what we're teaching? And Platonism is the one, right? Platonism is the mo has the most affinity for what they can use Platonism, twist it, construct it, and make a, a Platonic Christianity, which is what happened. So, hmm. the Vatican Christianity, our Christianity today, is a Platonic Christianity. It's very much. Medieval, like all the medieval greats, you know, Aquinas and stuff, they, they, for all they're talking about Aristotle, they're really Platonists. Um, and so, and, and, and because the core of what they're trying to promote was so integrated with Platonic thinking that they can't, they don't even notice that it's Platonic, right? So they're trying yeah. to make it Arist Aristotelian, uh, but they're really starting from a highly Platonic background. And you see that a lot in the early theologians, Augustine and so on. Um, so, so I think Christianity would have been significantly different uh, without Platonism, but I don't know that it would be different in any way that we care about, uh, right? So like, because what happened here is they had a particular way of seeing the world. They looked around for what was had most affinity for it and picked it. So that if you took that away, they would just pick something else that was similarly close and reconstructed their religion on the basis of it, right? You see what I'm saying? So right. it's like the, the yeah. motivation, it's not that Plato transformed Christianity, it's Christianity already had an attitude and they picked who was closest and then allowed it to transform it a little bit more in that direction. Um, so it would have made some changes, uh, but I don't think it would have prevented the rise of modern Christianity. 
I, I like to equate Christianity to a perfect survival of the fittest religion that is willing to adapt and mutate yeah. to its environment. So whatever would have oh, been yeah. there, it had been the snowball picking up whatever it was to make right. it work. So yeah. yeah, that's really interesting. Grays 174 says, do we know if Joseph, this is great. Joseph of Arimathea got his tomb back after Jesus left since he was really just crashing <laughs> on the couch for a few days. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's funny. It's a joke, but there, there are actually legitimate questions involved in that, right? Is right because right. this gets down to, and this is mainstream scholarship again, have pointed out that, um, that this could have been a temporary resting place because it mentions that it was his tomb, right? So uh, that means that, that Joseph, or Joseph himself expected to be buried there and probably his rest of his family was buried there or is going to be expected to be buried there uh, if this was historically true, right? So like if it was true, then there is a valid question as to what happened. Uh, is it just a temporary holding place? And was because the law required Jesus to be buried in the criminal's graveyard. It's a very specific graveyard. He couldn't be buried uh, in Joseph Arimathea's tomb. That was illegal. Uh, and so, um, but it was legal to temporarily hold a bit body over the Sabbath that way. There's actual explicit law about this. I talk about this in The Empty Tomb, the anthology by Louder and Price, uh, where I have the whole section on the burial of Jesus. We know a lot about burial law at that time. And there are attempts to deny that the laws that we know about applied at the time, but there's no evidence that they didn't. Uh, and so the, the information we have suggests that this could have just been a temporary place and that he, Jesus would have ended up in the uh, graveyard of the condemned uh, mm -hmm. somewhere else by, well, actually it would Saturday night. So by Sunday morning, that Joseph's tomb would be empty again, even though the body just got relocated. So this, so this leads to like a whole other line of thought uh, about this, um, uh, which, so, so yeah, this question uh, is meant to be a joke, but it actually touches on some actual scholarly questions. Yeah, that's, that's why I like this question. <laughs> Good question, Graves. Thank you for that. Bobby B, I appreciate Dr. Carrier's work. How much of your experience is scholarship, books, and how much is experiential beliefs? Well, both, right? So you apply the knowledge you get from books to your experience and then attempt to broaden your experience. Uh, and I, I find um, books is too narrow. Um, so you can benefit from the experience of other people. So I think a, a lot of my knowledge comes from just talking to other people in different walks of life, different racial and ethnic backgrounds, um, so I, different religious backgrounds. Like when I, when you mentioned the debate that I had with uh, Hassanein Rajabali with the uh, it was Dan Barker and me on the one side and Roger Bali and Corey on the other uh, before an audience of a thousand Muslims. And we got flown into Dearborn, Michigan to do this debate. Uh, we got to spend several days. And so I had lots of opportunity to talk to uh, hijab wearing Muslim women. Like I could have long conversations with them, uh, ask them all kinds of questions. I got to be dr driven around and talk to uh, Muslims from all over the world. Like I, I was, my assigned driver was actually flown in from Syria to attend the debate. So I got to ask him about, well, what, what do Syrians think about Americans? And, 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 you know, so I got to ask questions and, and learn a lot from other people's experiences. So, uh, so if you say experiential beliefs, you should include other people that I hear, you know, by report, obviously it's their, their narrative, they're telling me, uh, but I learn a lot from other people's experiences. I learn a lot from people in the upper class, people in the lower class, people who've been homeless. Uh, right. So I, I learn a lot from their experiences and I, to try to integrate that knowledge with the knowledge that I get from books um, to produce some sort of synthesis uh, that fits the explanation of the world. And then of course my own experience, I, you know, I've, I've, I've lived a very strange life. I've done a lot of odd things. <laughs> so, you know, people, people often are surprised to find out that I'm, I'm a military veteran. Uh, I, I served a year at sea that I uh, used to work construction. I was an electrician uh, once. Um, so, that, you know, I've used to operate a jackhammer. Like there's this, this, I've had a lot of, and then, then went to Ivy league schools. <laughs> <laughs> for my PhD, <laughs> right? It just doesn't jo it just doesn't match anyone's assumptions about stereotypes right. as, to, as to who who I'm supposed to be. But uh, but yeah, I've benefited tremendously from having a huge diversity of experiences myself, as well as all the other stuff. So I guess that answers the question. Um, yeah, as best I can. thank you for that, William Ahrens. Good to see you, my friend. Thank you so much. How can conservative Christians dedicated to the Bible use translations that do not include the Apocrypha of the KJV and in other Orthodox canons, creating a long gap in text from 400 BC to 100 AD? How can they? Uh, <laughs> yeah, so that gets into the complexities of the bizarre belief systems they have. I, you know, I, I'm less interested in these kinds of questions because um, whatever the reason is, it's some stupid reason. Uh, and <laughs> right. Like, it's not a reason I can get rationally get behind. Like th their reasoning is just not rational as to why they do this. Um, 
it, it, it is weird, right? Like why you cut the cannon off at like roughly 400 BC and then launch it back up again at 100. Although these, these Christians you're talking about would insist that it starts up again at like 40s. They think Mark was written in the 40s, et cetera, right? So, mm -hmm. but that's a trivial difference. You still have hundreds of years of like, like, and uh, so I guess you could ask the question in, in a different way and say like, what is their explanation? Like, why, why do they, how do they explain the fact that nothing written by Jews for hundreds of years is inspired by God, right? Like, it's like, why, why nothing? Nothing? Hundreds of years? Like, what, why, what's your explanation for that? Uh, and uh, it varies by sect. And even within a sect, the different theologians have different answers. One answer that I've heard uh, is that the, the inspiring spirit of God withdrew from Judaism until the, the fulfillment of all things, which is, you know, Jesus, right? So, uh, so the spirit of God only comes back to inspire proper scriptures then. Um, uh, so that's one kind of anti-Semitic uh, explanation that you will hear from some of the more hardcore fundamentalists. Uh, and the Christians who don't want to sound like anti-Semites will come up with some other reason. Um, so, so you have to go fishing around to see what, what, what reasons there are. They're, they're all dumb reasons that have no basis in fact, but, uh, but they all come up, they will come up with something well, I should say all the sects will come up with something. Individual members don't think about this. So if you ask them this question, they'll have no idea. Like, shit, I never thought about that. Uh, and they might make up something on the fly, or they might just admit that they don't know. Um, but but if you go looking for, like, theologians within specific sects who have actually addressed this question, you'll find a variety of answers. Thank you so much for that. Appreciate that. Um, Osvaldo, hope I'm saying that right. Thank you for the super chat. Appreciate the love and the support, my friend. I really do. David uh, Kruder said, please see my question above. I have fat fingers. <laughs> okay. I'm going to try and hunt your question. And uh, Well, how far up is it? That's I don't know. Maybe you can help me too. Cause you're good at this. Are you in the thing? I'm, I just jumped down, but it, that's a, you mean, you've got, what is it? It's, I think I saw the list. There's like thousands of comments in here. Um, I know. I know. And it, I can't search it. Can I? No, I don't think so. I, I know if he typed it out, it'll be up here. It's just a matter of me finding it. No, Forgive it just, me. It just finds the one on your screen. <laughs> yeah, this is why Super Chats and ab having them attached yeah. is, is yeah. so easy to actually do with the color yeah. and stuff. Is there um, a minimum amount of money you can pay for a Super Chat? I, I you that. think it's two dollars or something. Maybe no, oh, no. Okay. There's people who give like a dollar, just a dollar sticker. So, or whatever. Say like, like maybe just try to revive the question by copying pasting. If, if David himself can find it and just throw a cheap super chat yeah, back in, David, I'm we'll scrolling it. up. I don't know how far up this yeah. goes. And there, there's so up. many. Like I just scrolled down and, and I looked at. If you look, oh no, okay, yeah. Forgive before me, I man. clicked in, it said there were thousands of comments that I hadn't read. So. Oh yeah, so like it's we. I mean, we, we almost had seven hundred people watching live. Yeah, I, I think we're we're gonna have to disappoint. I don't think we can succeed at this task. Okay, all right. Look, uh, David, if just email me too. If if for whatever reason you can't get it in, just email me, my friend. I will be sure to email it over to Carrier and get your question. And yeah, that's good. Yeah, idea. I could get it answered for sure. Uh, Lawrence, what would be your best steelman argument for the Gospels being indeed written by the traditional names ascribed? <laughs> Steel man. Um, it's hard to do. The man is pretty rusty. Uh, <laughs> it's rusted out. This steel man. Um, I love gosh. these questions though, because so here, here's yeah. what I, here's an answer I would give. Um, so I debated this sort of, um, it, so I did this debate about the long ending of Mark being authentic and with, uh, Jonathan Sheffield and Jonathan Sheffield is the kind of apologist I really like because he's totally honest. Like he's not trying to game me. He's not trying to lie or deceive. Like he's, he's actually like legitimate. These are the things he believes and why he believes them. So if you, right. and, and, um, and consequently, uh, he can't resort to tricks, uh, to make a point. So when he is, so we did this debate and you can find it on my blog, but it's a multi, uh, entry debate on, um, the long ending of Mark is the long ending of Mark authentic. And this came up as a question in this, our discussion today, um, right here. But, um, in the process of that debate, he's arguing for, in, in a softly argued for the traditional authorship of these, you know, the, these are authentic texts and here's why uh, they have to go back to the original authors. Uh, and that isn't the main aim that he's arguing, uh, but, it, but it's part of the argument. And so uh, you can see how he's arguing for it. And that is, in my opinion, the best argument that you can make for it. It's a terrible argument, but it is, it is all you've got. 
Like, this is the best you can make. If you want to see what that argument looks like, follow his side of that debate. And you, and you can see my pushback against it as well, but uh, you can see what how he's trying to argue for it. Um, uh, and, and it is like, like I say it's the best only because it's, it's there is no better argument available. Um, and, and the reason that that's it, all that you find in there, and the reason I can recommend it is because uh, Jonathan Sheffield is so honest. Like he's just straightforwardly, like, like he, he looks for the evidence that, that is actually there and makes the best argument that's actually available uh, rather than like William Lane Craig, who will obfuscate and, and use rhetoric and try to avoid, uh, try to sound like he's giving you a rational argument, but in, on analysis, he really isn't. Thank you so much for that. John D, good to see you here, my friend. What are your thoughts about the Kalam cosmological argument? Wow, this is a great question because uh, that I mentioned that I'm on another show tonight. Um, that's what we're talking about. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> so rather than answer here, I'm going to plug H uh, Hanny Salim's show. Uh, you can find it. Uh, oh, Hanny, yeah, my yeah, boy. yeah. So, dude, uh, please go support him. Yeah, yeah, he's, he's a great guy. Yeah, he's great interviewer. Uh, does great show, and he's hitting the other half of the planet. Right. Yes. His, his audience Arabic. is in the, his audience is Australia, Middle East, uh, Asia. Uh, so, um, so he's Coptic Christians. He has like both current and ex Coptic Christians, Muslim audiences. So like, he, that's a great show to hit, uh, because he's going to those audiences. So, so go to Hany Salim's show. Um, it's, uh, let me, I'm going to paste it. Don't worry. I'm, I'm okay, good. It right now. So I good, just good, good. posted it right now, just so everybody sees it. This is it. Critical faculty. Yeah, Please that's the show. Um, yeah. And there's okay. So let me let me get the link to the um, the actual um, Kalam Cosmological to... right here. I'm getting yeah. the specific link. There it is. Yeah, it's got the countdown. Probably yeah, it's live in three hours. There you go. So... Uh -oh, it's going down, baby. <laughs> yeah. So that's where I'm going after this. Um, so that's where I'll be. I have to eat lunch between now and then. Uh, but uh, but yeah. So we're going to talk all about this. I have a lot to say, uh, especially lately. There's been some interesting really cool developments in this uh, of, of late so uh that'll all come up so please go check that out i'm going to be doing a live right after this and so between the time you go to watch his live uh, with hanny you're going to see <laughs> me and dragons and genesis right after this we're talking awesome. about enoch. <laughs> enoch and jesus we're going to be talking about enoch and this jesus is cool so this is a this is an all all philosophy and religion i uh, know history day <laughs> it's great Don't, uh, Elaine Johnson. So we got to fly through these and then I'm going to make sure that I, I pay you for your time too, the extra time sure. that you spent. Yeah. If yeah. you were ever in a debate with Bart Ehrman about the historicity of Jesus and there was a Q and a section, what would you ask him? Wow. Um, on yeah, the spot. I, I, first of all, I, I wouldn't because coming from me, he would give a disingenuous answer. Like he, he would, he would be disrespectful. Um, so I would have to feed it to someone else to ask the question. Um, and if so, the question is, what would I pick of all the questions? Uh, that's the hard one. I, I don't know yeah. what I would pick uh, above them all. But I, in a sense, I've already answered this question, which is in my review of the Ehrman Price debate. So Bart Ehrman and Robert Price did a debate on the historicity of Jesus. And I do a blog article where I do a breakdown of them and I score them. Uh, and I would say, like, if you want to know what, what would I... Uh, uh, what would I have picked if I were to feed a question to someone? And it's funny, I, I might have done this and I don't even remember because I don't, I was there actually, physically there. I might have told someone to ask a question or two and I, I don't remember what the question was. But um, but the ones that's most likely are the ones that I, I thought uh, scored the most poorly for Price and the best for Airmen, right? So, um, and there are a few like, uh, but also where I come down on Airmen pretty hard is not telling the truth or not being accurate. Uh, so I, I would try to find the one that's the most key representative example of him not giving an accurate presentation to the audience and ask him to explain himself. Um, and, and, and I don't mean the lying part. Like, so, so I, I've caught him outright lying to save face a few times. I wouldn't bring those up. I would stick to what was brought up in the debate uh, for that, right? So, um, so something that's actually relevant to the conclusion as argued in the debate, I would only stick to that. But I would pick the one that that where I think he's he's being the most disingenuous uh, to the audience and misinforming them. And I would I would want to have him articulate and explain himself on that point, whatever that is. So if you go look at my review of the Aaron Price debate, you'll see several examples of this. Um, and, and and you, you might even find good questions you'd want to ask him yourself and, and count this as me feeding you the questions if you ever get the chance. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Osvaldo, again, thank you so much for the super chat, my friend. I really appreciate that. 
Matthew Pop, Joseph, uh, Josephus records that Alexander Janaeus, the Judean king and high priest, crucified 800 Pharisee opponents. Do historians believe this happened? So far as I know, I, I haven't actually um, researched this, so I don't know what the scholarship actually says about it. Uh, like, I don't know if there's anybody who doubts it. I don't know if, it is, if, if there's questions about it, if those questions have been debated. I haven't checked. Uh, so, I, so I don't know. Hmm. The impression I get from the readings I've done is that the, there, it's believed that it happened. Maybe that the number might be bogus. Like, we were, historians are deeply suspicious of numbers. Uh, numbers are always exaggerated, often by a factor of 10. Uh, so I wouldn't be surprised if we found a scholar who said, well, it might've been 80 and not mm -hmm. 800, um, or, or it might've been, you know, a few dozen or something. But so the question would be more about, did it happen in general, not the specific number? Okay. Uh, so I think there's willingness to, to doubt the specific number. Um, the reason I think this question comes up a lot is that we have very little source of material for all of this. It comes from the Maccabean literature, which is like the King's literature. It's, uh, not rationalist historical writing. It's it's uh, hagiographic uh, propagandistic writing. It's religious writing. So it's not like Josephus, who is who is also writing propaganda, but he's doing it by using the rationalist model that he inherited from the Greeks. So uh, so he, so Josephus is also not. We don't trust Josephus on a lot of things, um, but he's at least more reliable than the Maccabean literature. And when we get to the Maccabean stuff in Josephus it doesn't appear that he has any source material other than the Maccabean literature, which is problematic for us. So, um, so there are, there are legitimate foundations for wanting to be skeptical, uh, or at least approach it with a position of skepticism. Um, but I think you need more than that to doubt a history historical event. And this is a, a point I make. If you look at my article on Hannibal or Jesus from outer space, which it's in, I use the same material in Jesus from outer space, where I talk about a Hannibal and also Spartacus, where I go into why there's a, there's an a priori reason to be skeptical of the historicity of Jesus that does not apply to mundane political events like this one that's being referenced here. So the historicity of Jesus already starts low in a way an event like this does not. Uh, and and that, that's because of the precedence of the way historians and writers choose to make up things. Uh, what, they, what they tend to most often make up, what they tend least often to make up um, based on precedence like that. So, so I think there's... I don't think we should be as skeptical of this as we can be of Jesus. And you notice that I've already given a one in three chance for Jesus. So that puts pretty good, even better odds on this being historical, right? It, it, using the same methods, even with the same evidence. So um, anyway, so I, I, would, I would warrant caution, but I, I understand the reason to be skeptical. Thank you so much. Dr. Romana, historically, could Christian baptism or sacramentum to a Lord be seen as a rite of Roman and Jewish resistance in the absence of state protection rather than repentance for the coming kingdom? No, uh, no, not, not at all. Um, the the rite is almost identical to the rite that we find in every other mystery cult. Uh, and so mystery cults were already well established as fictive kinship uh, brotherhoods. So everybody's becomes a family. So you, you become baptized into the fate of the, the savior. Uh, and literally often like, uh, Apuleius says of, um, in Osiris cult, it's literally, you're being baptized in the death and resurrection of Osiris. And therefore you're under the protection of that God. So in the afterlife, you get a favorable afterlife. Um, and which is exactly what the Christian baptism is. Uh, so, um, the only twist they add is that it, they make it a, an adoption ritual so that you become the son of God. Uh, you're the adopted son of God. Uh, but that's a Jewish concept uh, of the, the basic of the, the spiritual adoption notion uh, comes from Jewish angelology. So it's, it's, there's nothing a threat to the empire about that. Uh, that was ubiquitous. Like everybody had baptisms into these savior cults, like all the way up to the emperor. Right. So like, like there was nothing politically subversive about this at all. Um, and the Roman state never took it as subversive. Uh, the last time they took it as subversive was centuries before the Roman empire even existed. Right. So you go all the way back to the early Republic. Um, there was hostility to these mystery cults with their fictive brotherhood. They, they thought as traitorous or as a threat. Um, but that they completely abandoned that view and it completely did a 180 on it. And they're completely supportive, even building temples to these cults. Like they supported these cults uh, in the Roman empire. So it's, it's not a subversive element and there's no evidence of um, the particular interpretation that's being asked about here. Uh, the interpretation is all on the side of the mystery cult interpretation that we see. Thank you so much. Osvaldo, thank you for the super chat. In the bitter water, 
story, how does it relate really relate to abortion since it does not so much spell it uh, so much as spell it out or is it strictly related to infidelity? I assume they're asking about the ritual um, Hebrew Bible. Yeah. So there's, so because there's another bitter water story that has nothing to do with abortion in the Bible. That, but anyway, um, that where there there's some sort of ritual where a husband accuses his wife of adultery, and the priest can assemble some of that blood ashes from the altar and mix it a, mix a potion, have her drink it. And there's the Hebrew is very vague, so there's a lot of uh, scholarly debate over what is supposed to happen. Uh, if nothing happens, then she's innocent. And uh, that's that. Uh, but if something happens, like she either dies or miscarries. So there's like some interpretations of the Hebrew imply miscarriage. Um, if she miscarries, which would be an abortion, right? Uh, caused by the potion. Um, so there's complexities here as to what does the Hebrew even say that, uh, that there's a debate in the field about this. And and then if it does say that, uh is that a is that a god sanctioned abortion basically um which yes it would be if that was the case um so uh so it's not yeah i think maybe that's what they're asking is is what what is really going on there the the problem is the language is so obscure and ancient that it's hard for scholars to even agree on what's being described as happening uh and if it is a miscarriage um this is a very primitive ritual it's very similar to other rituals that we know from anthropology of religion, where this is actually a con act. So the priest will have pre-decided whether she's guilty or innocent and will decide what to actually give her <laughs> to produce predictable effects based on his judgment. And then this gets perceived as the judgment of God, right? Because clearly God must have caused the difference of result. Um, so so this, is, this is the kind of, there's this kind of like, manipulation of audiences is common in the in the history of religions like the anthropology of religion is full of discussions of how these kinds of acts are used to sort of manipulate audiences and 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 so so this this reads exactly like one of those so it was probably like that so it doesn't really even matter what the result would be uh, it matters more that this is a game being played on the audiences uh and it's really the judgment of the priest who's just who's deciding whether she's guilty or innocent for whatever on whatever basis um and uh, anyway so that's that's that side of it but that ritual looks like uh, pr very primitive so it looks like yeah. it looks more primitive than most of like deuteronomy and, and the, the context of jewish law so it probably goes back really far so it probably predates any uh opposition to abortion and we don't really actually see any opposition to abortion in the old testament um i know that there's a lot of play up of the uh, assault law there's this if you punch a woman and cause her to miscarry uh, and there's disagreement again about the language as to what does it say uh, is is is, er is early tri early trimester abortion legal according to this text uh, or it's just a property crime because you right. prevented the the heir so so you have to pay for the the kid that you they don't get so um, it's not it's not it's not murder uh, but it also says on, on, if it comes out a certain way then it is murder uh, and so there's a question of how you interpret that I, I have an article on my blog where I go into this. Um, and deal with the, the debate, the ongoing debate in the field today about it, uh, about how abortion is legal in the Old Testament, but homosexuality is definitely illegal in the Old Testament. Um, you can go to my blog and search homosexuality abortion, and then you'll find my article and I'll go, go into it. But there's legitimate ways to look at this. I think what it's actually saying is that uh, a late trimester abortion is murder. Early trimester abortion is property crime uh, and property crime against the father. Uh, so, so according to Jewish law, a mother in like first trimester could go get an abortion, but she'd have to pay 50 shekels to the father. That That's how the law reads. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, um, yeah. And th there's more on this, interestingly, in the Roe v. Wade decision. So, um, if you go, actually people talk about Roe v. Wade, but people rarely read it. Uh, go read the Supreme Court. That's, it's a long, like, uh, ruling they have and they go into the history of abortion in detail through like through, through multiple religions judaism and so on uh and talk about rabbinical attitudes and all kinds of stuff there's a ton of interesting stuff in there about the history of abortion um and it does not line up with what fundamentalists want you to think is the history of abortion Just, um, so if i made one little funny note as we go on because i want to move on to these next ones here a rabbi there's a rabbi wrote in the talmud um that the husband comes to him and says, listen, she didn't have blood on the night we were supposed to do the do. And, uh, you know, what do we do? I think she's cheated on me or she did some things she shouldn't have done fornicated. And 
rabbi takes her and he sets her on this barrel of wine. And he says, if, uh, if I smell the wine through her breath, okay, that meant her hymen was really intact. Like some weird, <laughs> some weird, like old yeah, out. It's bullshit. It's Total bullshit. bullshit. Yeah, but yeah, she right. made the ruling. It's really funny, though. I think and it's that, funny. That, that's a good example of a confidence game because if he tells her this, yeah. the, the actual psychological intention is to make her nervous. Uh, and so it's kind of like a primitive lie detector test. Is, yeah, is the, yeah, yeah. the assumption is that like if she starts to sweat, if she starts to be nervous, then I assume she's lying, which is a bad assumption. We know lie detecting using this technique for lie detection is terribly unreliable. Um, yeah, but it was, it's been believed to be reliable. It's still believed to be reliable. Lie detector tests are still based on it. Uh, so when people say, well, you should take a polygraph and it's like, that's the same crap method as having her sit on a barrel. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> it, it just has wires involved. That's really the only thing that's changed. Uh, but yeah, so, uh, it's the yeah. same crap method, but it's, it's, it shows you like this, these confidence games, these tricks are inherent in religion throughout history. Nikolai, thank you for the super chat. Is God's omniscience different from the idea of the de deterministic universe in terms of free will? That's a big debate in theology, and I find theology boring. <laughs> um, yeah, as theologians debate this, right? As to, to what extent uh, is determinism actually what God wants, or to what extent has he... And, and also this idea of middle knowledge, right? So omniscience. So if God knows everything, then isn't everything already fixed right like how, how can he know the decision you're making in the future if you have free will right that should be impossible uh and so one of the solutions to this is middle knowledge the idea that god knows every possible future it there's a I lot of weird it, let's I, I, mean. I think the question he's trying to get at is the idea of like say an atheistic deterministic universe whereas there's like uh uh and, and, and of course, there's the idea. Well, I think he's, he's, he says omniscience, not omnipotence. Okay, so okay. Om, omniscience, I'm sure he's asking, is there a contradiction between saying God is omniscient and we have free will, right? Because there, there, right. there is an obvious, like if you take their version of free will, I'm compatibilist, so I don't think free will is incompatible with determinism anyway. So, this, so it's, it's a completely moot question for me. Uh, it only matters to theologians who, who bank so much on libertarian free will is contra-causal free will is a concept. I think that's an incoherent concept. It isn't true. That's not what free will is. Right. So the debate is completely moot. It's a waste of time. But within their debate the, between each other, these theologians, um, they're the ones who want free will to be contra-causal, but also want God to be omniscient. And this creates a problem. Yeah. Uh, and, and they solve this problem with one of the solutions to this problem is the invention of middle knowledge. And so if you go, if you Google middle knowledge, you'll find all kinds of like, claptrap about this and so <laughs> just go to william lane craig and you'll find it yeah, I, yeah so he's much. big on this yeah he's <laughs> it's a big it's an important subject for him yeah myth wisdom podcast thank you for the super chat very close to mine the story of jesus curse and the fig tree makes sense when you know the fig tree is a type of goddess jesus reps father god not mother god yes yeah, that's not what's going on in that story um that the fig tree is the jewish temple cult uh, and uh, the Hammerton Kelly did an article on this. I have I cite him and use his work in um, I should say them. I actually don't know if it's he or she. It doesn't matter. Um, but I use their work on this in on the history of Jesus when I analyze this in chapter ten uh, when I go into the section on Mark uh, and I do the fig tree episode. And it's very clear. Like you can you can break it down. The literary structure of this is very elegant. Uh, the fig tree is absolutely is the Jewish temple cult, uh, and it's. This is a story about why God allowed uh, the destruction, not only the destruction of his own temple and the, and the end of the cult, uh, but allowed it to be destroyed by heathens even. like So, and the, the message is, because the story starts before the clearing of the temple and ends after the clearing of the temple. And this this wrapping, this, this sandwiching of stories is a literary technique. So the one story that's wrapping around the other, these are commenting on each other. So this is how you know these two stories are connected. And if you want to understand both of them, you have to understand how they, how they, how each one is a commentary on the other, right? So that's how you know that this is about the uh, Jewish temple cult. And the, the answer is that, like, what does Jesus say? They, you know, he says, uh, it is no, it is no longer, the, or the story is it's no longer the season for figs. Uh, and and God is, is going to curse it and wither it because it's, it's, it's time is done. Uh, and so that that's what this is about. It's, it's why did God destroy the temple? It's, it's time is done. Uh, it's it no longer is bearing fruit, uh, and it's not the season for it anymore. So we're going to move on. And then immediately after, Jesus talks about how it's all about prayer and stuff now, and not not the temple cult. Why, why you don't need the temple cult? Um, so um, 
so anyway, that's that's what that's really about. It, it it has no connection to goddess worship. Thank you so much. Cade Welly says, thank you both for doing this on Saturday. Due to work, I'm rarely able to see these interviews live. I don't have a question. Just sending love again. Thank you. Cade, good to see you here. Thank you so much. Yeah, Seriously. that's good. I mean, I'm I'm usually most available on weekends, so that's, <laughs> it works out for <laughs> me too. Uh, and not because I have a day job. It's it's weird. I have a strange life. But, uh, but yeah, this is uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday are my most accessible days now. Thank you. I've been getting a lot of comments about my hair lately. Thank you, friendly Muslim. Mr. Green Gold, thank you for the super chat. What's your take on the belief that Christianity introduced in India by Thomas in 52 AD? Can it can it prove historical Jesus? It can't do that uh, because it's a late, ridiculous legend that has no support in any reliable evidence. So we can't even prove that it happened. And any of the evidence that we have for it is through and through ridiculous. Like it's like hagiographically, anachronistically unbelievable so uh so it didn't even have sources or if it did it's completely clouded them in bullshit that they piled on top of it so so we don't know we really can't reconstruct the history of christianity in india it's entirely possible that christianity made it to india uh maybe 52 ad is a little early um it's possible but it would be more likely that it would be there by the end of the first century rather than so early um because it got all the way to china uh by at least 700 ad right so the nestorians got made we're preaching Christianity in China. And that's 700 years roughly to get from the Middle East across the Silk Road to China. That, that's a long time. But we know that route can be done in, in a year or two uh, because uh, we have emissaries. We have documentation of emissaries of China that they sent uh, people back to Rome, the Roman Empire, to report back to China about the Roman Empire. And this was done in the Han, Han Dynasty. So, uh, And so we know the route was just a matter of years. Like it wasn't to get all the way and so you could have a missionary who's just committed to skipping all the towns in between and going all the way as far as it went. Uh, that, that's plausible, although usually a missionary can't pass up an opportunity to evangelize. So as soon as they start getting on the road, they're going to stop and they're going to get distracted at this little town evangelist. And they're going to go and they're going to go and they're going to they're gonna die before they get, you know, one province away, right? So, right. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, uh, so it's, but it's possible. It's possible that there was Christianity in India in the first century. Uh, it's just, we have no reliable evidence of that being the case. Thank you. Vesper says, how do you count? And thank you, Vesper. How do you account for Jesus attestation from less conventional sources like Mandeism, Talmud, Indian, Himalayan evidence, mostly during the lost years? It's this all is kind late. of in the vein of the yeah. same. It's it's all too late, right? This is all, these are all made up legends that appear hundreds and some, some cases a thousand or more years later. Um, they're, they're not usable. Uh, they, they have no reliable traceable source back to an antiquity. So um, you just can't use random legends that come up hundreds of years later. The fact that these legends don't exist in any earlier sources is kind of already demonstration that they're made up. So, uh, and, and at, at, that's at worst. And at best, we can't say that they uh, aren't made up. And so they aren't usable. Thank you so much. Onyx Dragon X7 says, hey, Richard, how does your moral philosophy deal with the is ought problem? Do you have a particular name for your moral philosophy? Yeah, I hate names because people will then misdefine it and then misuse the name. Uh, so a goal theory is what I call it when I need a name for it. Uh, it is a species of desire utilitarianism. Um, and I, I emphasize species of because people will misdefine desire utilitarianism and then assume that I endorse everything that every desire utilitarian has said. Uh, that's not the case. But it, uh, what desire utilitarian say is roughly what I'm saying, but I think you can get even more specific than they do. Um, but anyway, so uh, a species of desire utilitarianism uh, and uh, the is not problem. Um, so uh, I actually have a whole chapter on this. That's actually one of my peer reviewed, uh, heavily peer reviewed uh, works in philosophy, which is in um, the end of Christianity uh, by uh, it's another one of the loftus volumes. Um, <clears throat> let's see if I can, Get it yeah, there. is that so on Amazon as well? Oh, of course, yeah. Um, the End of Christianity. It's another anthology with lots of good authors contributing on many different topics. Um, and I have two in there. Yeah, I have one, one on the design argument and one on the moral argument. Uh, and um, in there, I, I do a full analysis of the Izzat problem, um, going into Hume and Kant and uh, in the actual dialectical construction of the concept. Um, so if you really want to dive into that, that's, that's where that is. Uh, if I'm trying to think of a, the shortest way to explain it is that the word ought in all imperative language, it's not, ought isn't the only form, 
um, and, and in all languages too, there's different ways of phrasing the same kind of imperative language. Uh, imperative language is always a subjunctive statement of what someone would do if they were acting fully rationally and informed. So you ought to do X means you would do X if you were fully rational and informed when deciding what to do. Uh, so it is actually a, a future subjunctive. Um, and, and as such has, uh, it, it has straightforward truth values. Um, so there, there really is no is not, uh, is ought dichotomy. Uh, ought does reduce to an is, it just reduces to a very particular kind of is um, that you have to articulate. Hmm. Thank you. Constellation, Pegasus, thank you, my friend. Just bought both carrier books on eBay mentioned here today and uh, add it to the list of books I'm already behind on reading. <laughs> I've got a lot of reading. Uh, <laughs> I'm in the same boat. I've got a couple of books here. I've got the new one by Ibn Warak. I'm supposed to, I want to get to, and uh, I'm supposed to review varieties of Jesus mythicism. And I just haven't found time to get into that either. It's sitting here on my desk. Uh, I know I'm sympathized. There's so many books I want to read and I just don't have time. Thank you for that. Pet Mark, not all epic and legendary literature is about characters that did not exist. The poem of the Cid about a Spanish medieval knight is an example. Yeah, I can't speak to that one because uh, that's outside my field. I don't know the story on that one. But uh, we have the Alexander romances, for instance, mm -hmm. um, which were written in his own when he was, uh, if not when he was still alive, shortly after his death, the first Alexander romances. And these are ridiculous stories, uh, obviously mythical about Alexander the Great. Uh, so, so yeah, we know we know mythical stuff can be written about historical people. Uh, happens a lot. Uh, so the the only question is, how typical is that? So when you when you see a ridiculous mythical narrative, how often in history, it's particularly the relevant history, so the ancient world, so say the Greco-Roman period, how often are those historical people? That's the only question you need to answer. Is like, is is it typically historical people, or is it typically not historical people, or is it 50-50? And that's an empirical question. You have to go and look at comparable cases and see how. And comparable cases, how many of these cases did the person exist, and how many it's, it's not likely that they did. Uh, and that's what I do. So I, I do that in on the historicity of Jesus. I have a whole chapter on how we do this empirically to figure it out. What is the prior probability? And even that just gets you the prior probability. It does not get you the posterior probability, the actual probability you want. Because as the case of Alexander the Great, like having it, even if it's the case that stories like that typically indicate a non-existent person, um, you could have tons of evidence that he's the exception, right? Uh, as we do, we have tons of evidence that Alexander the Great existed. So that hugely overwhelms the prior uh, and establishes that he exists. So it doesn't matter. It, it doesn't affect the probability uh, significantly um, that there were legendary mythologies written about Alexander the Great. It, it doesn't doesn't make him not exist. It, the evidence is overwhelming in the other direction when you add it all up. Thank you. And that's what we would want to be the case for Jesus, and it just isn't. Sorry. With Myth Wisdom Podcast, who was the patriarch of the Roman religion in the first century AD? What was the role of Serapis in first century AD Roman religion? Patriarch. Um, they didn't really have that, right? So uh, patriarchs, if you think in the Jewish model, the patriarchs are the founders of their religion. And they're, they're very important to name and know the founders of your religion and know the stories about them. Um, maybe, maybe Romulus would be the, the example of their patriarch, I guess. Well, sort of. I guess you would include him, right? He would be, if, if you're trying to find something loosely analogous, right. he would be in there. Um, but uh, but the, the Roman religion is hugely diverse and uh, has a variety of different origin moments. Because uh, there's not just the Romulus myth, but there's also the dawn of Romulus religion, which is hundreds of years later where Quirinus gets reinterpreted as this new Romulus thing. And then there's a new introduction. Uh, there's even reference to like discovering, just like in the Old Testament, there's a reference to discovering lost ancient texts yeah. that reveal this new, or reveal this old religion that's actually really a new religion they just made up, but they're trying to sell it as these ancient texts that were buried all this time um, that relate to the Romulus cult. So like, it's like you could talk about like the patriarchs or the patriarchs that found those guys who, who, claimed to find the ancient documents or the patriarchs, the non-existent people like Romulus. Right. Uh, and then there's a ton of religions, right? So Rome is just plastered with religions. Uh, so it's not like, like Romulus cult was the Roman religion. No, there's like a million of these religions. The Capitoline triad doesn't even include Romulus, right? So it's right. like, he's not even the top three uh, of the, of their central God, their central pantheon. But anyway, so the analogies, the analogies don't really work. Uh, between right. Judaism because Judaism is a henotheistic religion. It's very focused on 
one tradition that you have to adhere, adhere to. And for that, your, your patriarchy matters, right? So you, you kind of have to invent these patriarchs to found your, their claim that there's only one way to do things. Um, whereas the Romans didn't believe there was only one way to do things. They, they agreed there's lots of ways to do things. Uh, and so, so they didn't, they didn't need a patriarchy uh, for their religion. Uh, in that sense. What about Serapis S in the first Separate century? question. Serapis. So yeah. Serapis means o Osiris and Apis. It is the merger of these two gods. Um, and so when the Greeks came in, this I think is the Ptolemies. When the Ptolemies took over after Alexander the Great conquered Egypt, the Ptolemies are the descendants of the Greek general Ptolemy who served under Alexander. Alexander. Macedonian. doesn't matter. Uh, by the time we're talking, it's Greek. And um, so uh, so the the Greeks who were running Egypt um, decided they needed a, a version of Asclepius. So in, in Greece, in Macedonia, you had Asclepius, who was the god of healing, had huge temples of healing. They're basically the early versions of hospitals. Um, and so this big, important healing god. And Egypt didn't really have one of those. Uh, you, there, there's, you could pray to a variety of different gods for healing in a variety of different ways. There was no concentrated god of healing, right? Uh, and the Greeks wanted one. So they kind of merged the two gods, Osiris and Apis, and created Serapis. And he became the healing god. And all his iconography shows that he's based on Asclepius. So he's mm. basically a syncretism of uh, Egyptian religion. They took Osiris and Apis cult uh, and then syncretized it, merged it with Asclepius cult, and created a new religion. Uh, which is Serapis cult. Uh, when that began, uh, there's debate. Um, so like legend is it was in the Ptolemies before the first century AD. Um, I, I haven't really looked into like how the evidence holds up as to when we can precisely date it. Um, there's a lot of archaeology. We have statues and inscriptions and things. So there's a lot to work with. It's just not something I've looked into yet. Thank you so much. T Mark. Thank you for that. Uh, T Mark. Sorry. I appreciate the super chat, my friend. Mm -hmm. We should be, man, we're, tr I'm trying, I'm trying. To I know we're, we're not going to get them all. That's Heart sphere. Uh, what do you think about the swoon theory? And could you get a, a, a bit into parallels between Jesus and Jesus being an Ananias? Love your stuff. Thank you so much. Uh, wow. Those are two very different questions. They're not even related. Um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so be mindful. We, we, if you're adding a super chat question, we may not get to it. I'll try and screenshot them Where and send that? all these screenshots to Dr. Carrier in an email. Um, maybe we just do a follow-up episode and we chip away at those at some point or something. You I know, don't know. Robert Price did a really good chapter on the, the whole swim category. Theory. Uh, yeah. Swim theory is a species of what's called rationalization theory. So this is big in the 19th century. The idea that they're going to explain miracles by rationalizing them rather than just admitting they're made up. So like the, when Moses didn't part the Red Sea, but there was a wind that, you know, so like, like you're trying to say like, oh, it really yeah. happened, but it, it happened. It was a natural explanation. Um, when when we know that they just made it up, it didn't happen at all. Uh, so rationalization was popular. Swoon theory is an example of this, and I think it first arises in the 19th century. I'm not sure, early 20th for sure. But um, which is a, a oh maybe the death and resurrection really did happen, but has a rational explanation. And so swoon theory is one. And and there's actually arguments to be made for it. Uh, it's it, it, there's there's clues in the text that actually support it, uh, which is interesting. Um, the best case for it, I'm trying to think of the price did a good chapter in this. I'm trying to figure out where he did that. Where is that uh, chapter? Um, oh yes, here it is. Uh, so it, it's also in the end of Christianity. So the book that I mentioned earlier, the end of Christianity, Robert price has a chapter called explaining the resurrection without recourse to miracle. And the whole chapter is about rationalization hypotheses, inc including the swoon theory and others. Right. So, um, and it's a good chapter because uh, he's right about like when he talks about the evidence that he's that he's presenting for these theories, uh, that evidence is real. Like it's actually there, and that, that you can make it make make these cases. Right. Um, so uh, so it's worth looking into. Like that's the best one that I've seen. I see. Do I, I don't I don't advocate it anywhere because I think in the hierarchy of probabilities it's really low, um, but it's not impossible. And I would obviously admit that it's probability is probably millions of times still higher than supernatural resurrection, right? So uh, even if it's thousands of times less than the most likely explanation, it's still millions of times more likely than an actual resurrection occurred. Uh, and of course, I would say that even if aliens came down and, uh, you know, Klaatu Verata nicked him. Uh, so like, even that is millions of times more likely than a supernatural explanation. And that's millions of times less likely than swoon theory. So... <laughs> 
<laughs> so it's the order, the order of the probability, probabilities here gets pretty steep once you get down to these, the doldrums of these. But what do you? Uh, what about the second part? Uh, Jesus. Uh, yeah. Right? Well, so yeah, that's 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 a long thing. We could do a whole half a show on that, I think. But yeah. Um, so other, other scholars have done this. So that's where I found out about it. Is I actually read the literature, and there's multiple independent discoveries of this matchup, um, where Mark his crucifixion narrative in 20 points, all in the same order, emulates the crucifixion, well, the death narrative of Jesus Ben Ananias. And Ben Ananias was this crazy prophet uh, who, who has a similar storyline towards the end as Jesus does. He's not crucified. He gets killed by an artillery stone um, uh, on the walls of Jerusalem. But um, but there's a lot of similarities. Otherwise, like once once you think like killed by the Romans is, is your analogy, not specific means of killing, once you think in terms of those, uh, you know, loose and an analogs, um, there's a 20 point lineup to the extent that it's highly unlikely to be by coincidence. So Mark is either using the same story as a model as Josephus, or he's using Josephus specifically as his model. I think that's more likely. So I think, uh, Mark is using the Jewish war because this is in the Jewish war, not the antiquities. Um, he's using the Jewish war as his model. Uh, and so this, this would put this fits Mark's date is late seventies. Right. So, uh, so that all lines up. I think that's entirely plausible, but people who want to know more about that, uh, you can look up Jesus Ben Ananias in the index of my book on the historicity of Jesus. I discuss all the 20 points of comparison. I cite the scholarship and so on. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Carrier is, is do you feel comfortable answering this question? Sure. Yeah. How uh, has your life been as a polyamorous man? Do you have any advice for anyone considering the lifestyle? Yeah. Um, for people who don't know, I'm polyamorous, so I don't believe in monogamy as a thing. Uh, so it's ethical non-monogamy. Um, so honest and open, everybody's doing it. Uh, and uh, my advice, my best advice would be, there are some good books. So um, there's a variety, like uh, more than two is kind of the Bible of polyamory. Uh, is but it's really thick, so it might be a tough read. Um, there are shorter manuals. I would say look for the books on polyamory that were written in the last 15 years. Um, so, for example, people will recommend The Ethical Slut, uh, and that's still a good book, but it's kind of outdated in a lot of ways. Um, and so there, there are others. Uh, there have been a few recently that I think are fairly decent. I don't, do I have one here? Um, well, I, I don't, you know, I've got this. I haven't read this one. This is actually one on the list of books I want to read. Um, the Smart Girl's Guide to Polyamory. Uh, and obviously, you know, by the title, it's, you know, ostensibly written for women. Uh, I find those books are often super helpful for guys. So I, I would recommend reading it anyway. Um, but uh, I do this also with um, uh, Math Doesn't Suck by Danica McKellar. People want to learn sixth grade math, which is all you need to do Bayesian uh, epistemology, by the way, is sixth grade math is all you need. Uh, her book, Math Doesn't Suck, is great. And not only does it teach you uh, in a very colloquial, easy way, all the things that you forgot about sixth grade math, uh, but it also teaches you about girls. So it's great to give to like boys uh, in sixth grade. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> so it's, like, it's worth it's worth reading, even though it's supposedly meant for girls. It's actually uh, very educational for both genders. Um, so uh, this also, so I, I know I've skimmed this enough to know that it's, it's a decent introduction. Uh, and even though it is skewed towards the, uh, the women in the audience, um, it's still useful for a guy to read. Um, so it's a good place to start with one of those books, a shorter one. Uh, if you really want the Bible, like more than two is like the most extensive treatment of it. Um, but, uh, so I start with a book, but then start meeting people and talking to them, uh, who actually do it, like hang out with some polyamorous folk, uh, and get their perspective and diversify. So this is the same thing I would recommend for people who want to, you want to understand race relations, you want to understand gender relations. Don't go talk to one woman or one black guy, uh, like talk to many from many different perspectives. So you get a diverse point of view because there are people who are polyamorous who are, I, in my opinion, are doing it wrong. Uh, and so, uh, so you might get bad advice if you pick the wrong, uh, polyamorous group to hang out with. Uh, so you need to get a diversity. So meet a variety of different polyamorous folk, uh, and, and, and ask them questions and hang out with them and see, especially hang out with them, like with their polycules so that you see what a relationship, uh, non-monogamous relationship works like when they're all, not all of you, but maybe at least some of you are hanging out together. Right. So it's not just, you don't silo each other. Like you don't, you don't like only date one person and no one else meets them. Uh, that's, that's not how it works. Uh, at least that's not how it should work. Um, but that, that'd be my advice. So that, like, look for some, look for some books, look for something recent and short to start with. Uh, and then just 
start trying to meet people. Uh, and it can, I, I realize it can be hard. So in the real world, uh, depends on where you are geographically. Like some, like Chicago is great for polyamory. LA is terrible for polyamory. Um, it, and, and then if you're like in Searcy, Arkansas, it's like the worst for polyamory. Uh, so like, you know, so it depends. So you might have to rely on internet, uh, find the internet communities that you can engage with in some way. Um, uh, it, it, you know, in personal interaction with people who are willing to do it. Like it's people's, they're not obligated to like educate you. So you got to find people who are excited by the opportunity to educate you. And th those are the folks you want to talk to. Um, but yeah, get, getting some advice about that. And then the other, the last advice I'd say is like, this is something that people will always say, uh, who are experienced at poly is like, you got to figure out your own shit before you be polyamorous. Like you've, you've got to sort yourself out. Uh, right. So you, you got to like figure out what is it that you really want out of relationships and why. And, and if you have problems with relationships, like if you're doing relationships wrong in general, uh, polyamory is not going to help you. Like you need to solve those problems and sort yourself out as a person before you go successfully polyamorying uh, around the world. Um, but I think people should do that anyway, even if you're not doing polyamory. Uh, there's a lot of like ways you can improve the way you do relationships, even if you're monogamous. Uh, and there's this stuff online that you can go exploring and use your critical thinking skills to see which advice is good and which is not um, online about relationship stuff and about yourself. Uh, Self-knowledge is really important, I think, for it. Thank you. Thank you. David T., the author of Hebrews, writing before AD 70, seemed to anticipate the typical ending soon, Hebrews 8, 13, 9, 8. Paul seems to think the same thing, 2 Corinthians 3, 11. Why do they anticipate this? Um, no, actually, Hebrews doesn't really anticipate it ending. Uh, Hebrews argues that it, it has become obsolete, right? So, so Hebrews doesn't say, like, the Romans are going to come and destroy the temple. Like, it doesn't say that. Uh, what it says is, is God is no longer, no, God no longer cares about it. Um, and so what Hebrews is saying is that, well, Jesus' sacrifice does what the temple already does. So you don't need the temple. Uh, so the Hebrews' entire argument assumes the temple cult is still running, which is why I, I think it's pretty conclusively it had to have been written in the 60s because it's it's after Paul. So it doesn't seem to be uh, contemporaneous with Paul, but it's before the Jewish war. So that leaves the early 60s. It's the only time it could have been written. And what they're trying to argue is they're trying to argue these people who want to go back to relying on the Jewish temple cult uh, and arguing that they don't have to because that's obsolete now because Jesus. And so that's the argument, which means the temple cult was still up and running when that was going on. And so uh, that is not a prediction that the temple is going to be ending. It's basically outright saying that it is obsolete already, even when it's already standing. And that's a different kind of thing. Uh, and Paul, say. the same thing is what you're saying. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, pa Paul is saying the exact exact same stuff as this. Uh, and Hebrews is very much pushing a Pauline epistemology right. and theology. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Ty Bogie. What are your thoughts on Jesus being the son of a Roman soldier? A hypothesis that James Tabor shares. Oh, you're uh, okay. Too, so yeah. I didn't know Tabor adopted that specific. I know Tabor's. He big doesn't. On the family he's of Jesus. not. He's not like dogmatic about this he okay, just all right he does uh, think it's a plausible uh, possibility yeah he does think I, it's possible i always i always worry about that because that that's what the nazis thought too so it's, that is actually a nazi belief <laughs> wow yeah positive christianity the, the aryan uh christ theory is is the Nazi, nazis own sect of christianity i could see why they would want to of course it, yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it, the idea was invented as a polemic a jewish polemic against christians uh, we have multiple attestations of it as a polemic in the second century. So Celsus mentions it. Um, mm -hmm. I can't remember. There's even Jewish, off, Jewish writings. I think the Tsefta. It shows up in the, yes, uh, yeah. and in the Talmud. Yeah, yeah, it shows up yeah. in rabbinical writings. Um, so it definitely was a thing going around. Uh, and and the idea, and, and the Jewish one was based on a pun. So they, they made the joke that, uh, oh, oh, she wasn't a virgin. Parthenos. She wasn't a virgin. She was stooped by a Pantheros. Right, because it's like very similar spelling. Pantheros was a common nickname, kind of like a Rocky or whatever. It means panther. You're for a Roman right. soldier. So Roman, I am Panther. You know, like it was a common kind of dumb name that they would sort of like make them sound masculine and cool. Uh, and so, so it's kind of double mockery, right? Like it's mocking Romans, it's mocking Christian teachings, it's mocking Mary the Virgin, not no nonsense. Everybody gets so um, right, right. So it was originally intended as a joke, like it's a joke, right? Uh, but by the time it gets up to the Nazis, you know, you see Rosenberg and various other um, uh, Nazi thinkers, they start pushing this idea. Like, Actually, this is great because we like this because this means we can say Christianity is anti-Jewish and is really because Jesus was really an Aryan and he was really sticking it to the Jews. Like he, all his 
clearing of the temple and talking about Jewish avarice and stuff, you know, like all this stuff about money and everything is being read through the filter of Jesus as an anti-Semite, just like us. He agreed. The Jews are terrible. Oh Let's look at what Jesus says all the time. Uh, and so, and so that's, that's the Nazi version of this. So, so whenever I hear people like saying, Oh yeah, that's actually plausible. I'm like, Oh, uh, historical context. Not good. <laughs> yeah. Not good at all. But thank you for that. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Ty Bogey. I know there's so many more, man, just real quick. I mean, we're not going to get all of them. I get it, carry. I got to let you go. Yeah, like, actually I do got to go. I got to eat. Yeah. Uh, uh, nice. Another bump to keep so. carry on. We're, we're finally catching up to this, but look, we've oh, gone three hours. Oh, $20, man. Yeah, okay. I know. And, and one more, just, asteroid all right all right we'll do one Father, more. why have you forsaken me i'm going to screenshot these super chats and try to send them to you in an email and see if that's possible that's something there but why have you forsaken me Je jesus went willingly to crucifixion yet felt abandoned like he thought he would be saved this always puzzled me part of why i became an atheist thoughts so this is literary art right um first of all that's a line from scripture um it comes from the crucifixion uh so there's there's uh or at least an execution narrative. So there's there's the Psalms. So Psalms 22, 23, and 24. Uh, they number differently in different texts, but they're they're always in the same sequence. Psalm 22 is the execution narrative, which uh, there's tons of references to it in the crucifixion narrative of Jesus, the casting lots for the clothes, the people condemning you from below, and like all of this stuff uh, is in there, including, uh, you know, why have you forsaken me, which I think is the opening line of the, or close to, of this. Now, Psalm 23, you will recognize is the funeral th psalm. Uh, the shadow of the valley of death psalm, right? So this is the psalm about the journey of the dead, right? And then the tw Psalm 24 is a psalm of exaltation, of ascension through the gates of heaven. So, so here we have crucifixion, uh, burial, and resurrection. So, it's, and so the Christians, Mark especially, used this three psalm pattern. And he starts, Mark 16 starts with the first line of Psalm 24. Right. So uh, so so when he's talking about the resurrection, he's cluing you in. Hey, Psalm 24. I've already done Psalm 23 with the burial. Psalm 22. You got all the links in there. Like catch up. Right. It's like it's what what Mark is doing here. So so he's actually <laughs> using these. Uh, and this is another example of Pesher logic of taking these scriptures and putting them in here um, into the into a new narrative and into a new new sequence of events and to mean a different thing. Uh, and so so why? Like, why would Mark want this line that the. the, the Thing. And this is Pauline. This actually comes from Paul. So Paul says uh, in Philippians, uh, Paul says that Jesus could have chosen to be equal to God, but he, unlike Satan, which is the subtext here, he did not attempt to equate himself to God. He actually humbled himself and gave up. All, he even slightly humbled himself to the status of a slave, which we know from the narrative he didn't, Jesus wasn't a slave. So what does that mean? It means he became a slave to the elements. He, sac he surrendered all his supernatural powers and to the lowest possible state even unto death. This is what Paul says. So Jesus wi willingly, voluntarily humbled himself as far down as you could possibly go so that his sacrifice would be ultimately meaningful and cleanse the world of sin, and then he could ascend to heaven. So that was the whole, and be resurrected, etc. So Mark is representing this here, this, this complete forsakenness concept uh, is this idea that Jesus has gone to the depths of humility as far as he could possibly go. And that's representing the, the Philippians hymn, essentially. And then, of course, he's going to be uh, brought raised raised to glory right he's going to come back and so so that's it's it, he has to get to the bottom he has to bottom out what what is the line and for for people who have drug addictions like you have to uh, yeah bottom rock out, bottom. Right? rock bottom he jesus had to hit rock bottom before he could ascend right to glory and and that's what this represents it's like the, the abandonment by god is the most abandoned you could be right so that's that is the ultimate humble status so, so that's really just a literary way to represent what paul is is conceptually talking about uh that jesus literally abandoned they're literally I think that's why all this that. message grabs so many people because people experience such a pain. Yeah, 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 absolutely. That's why uh, it's uh, religions are always crafted, especially successful ones. Darwinian logic yeah. tells you they they clearly hit on right nerves. That's why they're successful. So they, they come up with messages that resonate with people. Well, just so everybody knows, please go get on his blog, check out Dr. Richard Carrier's blog. Um, his books are on Amazon. Richard Carrier, you could why did it say Richard Scary? What the heck? I don't know. That was an accident. I don't know. How, but it found you anyway. It's a, it's a, it was a typo correction when you did it. That I know. Totally. Yeah. T the, yeah. Join which the Patreon. Sorry, which makes even less sense. But all right. Yeah. <laughs> Please consider joining my, my Patreon. I've got more videos coming soon. The Epic of G All sorts of fun. I mean, literally go all the way down. Then you hit and load more. And there's probably, I'd say, 60, 70 videos with you and, and Dr. Dennis McDonald that I have not made public. 
that yeah. you and Dennis go and hash some things out, etc. Yeah, there's and, a lot of cool stuff coming down the pipe. I know. Yes. So please go check that out. Um, everybody who super chatted, like Dennis has said, in 2011, my master's thesis argued the four horsemen would alter academia. Richard Carrier, his geekness, yeah. uh, Dr. Price, <laughs> David Fitzgerald, and Derek et al. proved my contention. Thank you, Dennis. Look, I'll screenshot yeah. the rest of these super chats and then I'll just send them to you. And if there's any questions and you have time to chip away, if not, our next I mean, live. Yeah, if, there's, if there's enough of them, oh, yeah, next live, right? <laughs> we can do this again. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah, thank I'm you so much. It. Yeah, let me uh, close this out here. Ladies and gentlemen, please go help support Dr. Carrier. Get the works. Join his blog. Uh, you can you can take classes, courses, the books, et cetera, et cetera. The knowledge that this man has is uh, I'd say he knows more than the son of man. Um, he probably knows the day or hour. And so you might want to take him seriously and go consider what he has to say. I really appreciate your time, Dr. Carrier. Thank you. Yeah, always love being on. It's been great. Good questions. Too, if everybody is asking good stuff. Oh, brilliant, brilliant minds. And never forget, we are Myth Vision. Don't any of you have that guts to play for blood? I'm your huckleberry. That's just my game.